Up on the stage earlier, the host of the award ceremony had come over with a tray. The award on the tray was glittering, representing the deep meaning of this award. Are you mad? Gary asked in a low voice. Valerie looked at him with a smile. It is my honor to receive an award from the great Mr. Stewart. Gary held the trophy in his hand. Then he suddenly opened his arms and hugged Valerie. He whispered into her ear, All right, don't be mad. I will apologize to you later. Valerie's pretty face turned red. She heard the rhythmic sounds of jealousy from below the stage. The eyes of those female artists almost shot through her. Valerie pushed him away. Only then did Gary say to her, Congratulations, Miss Dane. You deserve this. Valerie had received the heavy trophy. Gary's hand had just reached out and was about to shake hands with Valerie when she passed by him with the trophy as if she did not see his hand. Gary pulled his hand back in embarrassment. He was not angry at all. There was a helpless smile at the corner of his mouth. He turned to the host and nodded and then followed Valerie off the stage. His gaze was fixed on her because he was scared she would end up falling or tripping on her dress. Valerie safely returned to her seat, but her heart was at unease. She looked at the man who followed her back to his seat after some time. Valerie's small face was expressionless as she stared at her trophy. Valerie, who was sitting in her seat, got angrier the more she thought about Gary's lie. Her eyes were full of resentment as she stared at the man beside her. She could not hear what the host said on stage. Gary did not expect that revealing his identity would cause Valerie to be so mad. However, he was too confident. Anyway, Valerie had never been easy to deceive. Moreover, she had a very strong temper. I'm sorry. He turned to Valerie and apologized in a low voice. Valerie heard it, but she refused to accept it. She did not want to see him anymore. She picked up the trophy and got up from her seat. She planned to leave. She found the phone in her bag and wanted to call Annie. She wanted to leave right now. The moment she stood up, Gary's heart tightened. Where was she going? No matter where she went. He was worried. Gary also quickly stood up. At this moment, the lights below the stage were very dim. Everyone looked at the other awards on the stage. Valerie came out from a door next to her and walked into a corridor. Everyone was engaged in the award ceremony. The corridor was very quiet and there was no one there. Gary pushed open the door and followed. He called her in a low voice. Valerie, stop. Valerie did not want to talk to him. She only cared about herself. She did not stop, which annoyed Gary. He could not help but catch up to her in a few steps and grabbed her wrist. Listen to me and accept my apology, okay? Valerie struggled with her hand and turned her head to glare at him. What else do you have to say? You have been lying to me. You're a liar. I don't want to hear you speak at all. After saying that, Valerie pulled hard and pulled her hand away. Gary did not dare to hold her tightly because he was afraid that it would hurt her. Valerie continued to walk forward and did not want to bother with him. Valerie, stop right there. I am not ordering you as a friend, but as your boss. Behind her, Gary said in a deep voice. Valerie immediately stopped moving. Her chest was rising and falling intensely. Gary saw that this move had worked. He strode to her side and looked at her with a pained look in his deep eyes. If you want to hit me or scold me, I'll let you do whatever you want. Tell me how you want to vent your anger and I'll let you do whatever you want. Valerie bit her red lips tightly. She was so mad that she just did not want to talk to him because she could not accept the feeling of being deceived by him. She could not accept that he had suddenly become her boss. Valerie suddenly punched his chest as if she was venting. You! A liar! A bastard! A big bastard! I hate you! Gary did not move and let her hit him. Valerie did not have any strength after hitting him twice. While she was panting, a strong arm pulled her fiercely into the man's chest, tightly hugging her. Valerie took a deep breath 
and felt that she was firmly hugged. This man still dared to hug her. Did she allow it? The two people in the corridor did not notice that there was an entertainment reporter who had just passed by secretly taking a few pictures, but he was afraid of being discovered, so he quickly fled. But there was no doubt that he had very good material in his hands. It turned out that Valerie's first female lead award was a product of nepotism. After Gary's identity was announced tonight, almost everyone in the entertainment industry was shocked. They all knew this big boss now. That entertainment reporter also knew Gary's identity. At this moment, he saw Gary and Valerie hugging each other. Didn't this mean that Valerie had been kept under wraps? And that was why she was able to win this award? Perhaps someone else deserved this award. Valerie was a little angry as she pushed Gary away. She took a step back and stretched out her hand to make a gesture of rejection. I don't want to see you tonight. After she finished speaking, she strode towards the exit. Gary was also very helpless and annoyed. He bit his lips and followed Valerie. He was at the door and Annie and Sandra were waiting there to pick her up. Gary stood at the side. Annie immediately walked over with a respectful expression and greeted him. Hello, Mr. Stewart. I really didn't know that you were our boss. I was very negligent in the past. Please don't remember this lowly person and forgive us. Sandra also had an expression of disbelief. At this time, Valerie turned to Annie and said, Don't apologize to him. What's so great about being the boss? Annie immediately turned around in panic and looked at Valerie. She had the urge to cover her mouth. Did Valerie not want to live anymore? How could she offend the big boss? Take her home safely. Gary looked at Valerie and said, after you go home, give me a call or send me a message. Valerie acted as if she did not hear him and took the lead to walk out. Annie and Sandra quickly followed. Behind them, Gary sighed bitterly and watched her leave. The moment Valerie sat in the car, Annie and Sandra went crazy with joy. Oh my God, Mr. Stewart is the big boss behind the scenes of Mirage Group. In the future, Valerie might become Mrs. Stewart. Sandra said with a mouthful of nonsense. Annie saw that Valerie was unhappy and quickly gave Sandra a look. Of course, Valerie heard it and she snorted. I don't want to be his wife. Whoever wants to do it will do it. I don't want to bother with him for the rest of my life. Valerie, why? You know he's our CEO, right? At least he will take care of you in the future, Annie consoled. Perhaps Valerie felt cheated. No one could understand what she was feeling. He could have told her his identity when they first met. Even if he found an opportunity to tell her later, she would not be so disgusted. Anyway, she was just angry. That's right, Valerie. Mr. Stewart is the boss. You will have endless resources in the future. You would have endless scenes to shoot. Furthermore, you will be the female lead in every scene. Furthermore, you will be able to enter the international scene. Sandra highlighted the benefits in the future for her. The more Valerie heard, the more unhappy she felt. She said to Sandra, Don't be stupid. Even if he gives it to me, I won't take it. I don't want others to talk about me in the future and turn my hard work into something related to him. That's true. What if others say that you rely on the CEO to get promoted? Sandra curled her lips and said, Annie turned her head and stared at her, giving her a look of warning. Then she reached out to hold Valerie's hand and said, Forget it. Let's film properly and do our best to do our own things. No one is forcing you to talk to him if you don't want to. But know the truth, honey. He is Valerie our boss. Valerie was struck with a sudden realization like a bolt of lightning. She turned towards Annie and inquired, Annie, who recommended me for the leading role in our last movie? Annie was puzzled and asked, What's wrong? I never even met the director, yet I was cast as the female lead. Doesn't that seem fishy to you? Valerie questioned. Annie, grasping the situation, quickly offered her advice. Perhaps the director was too occupied at the time. I know who arranged for me to get the female lead in this movie. Tomorrow, I'll confront that director and tell him I'm quitting the project. After all, I haven't signed an official contract yet, Valerie decided. 
Valerie, you can be headstrong at times, but don't jeopardize your future, Annie cautioned. Valerie closed her eyes and reclined in her seat. She spoke with a hint of weariness. I'm exhausted. I want to take a year off and not accept any scripts during that time. All right, you're rich and willful. I can't argue with you, but let's discuss this matter properly. You're tired today, so go home and get some rest. Annie was left speechless by her determination and couldn't push her any further. Valerie returned home, and although it was 8 p.m., she had no appetite. She allowed Annie and Sandra to leave. Sitting on her sofa, she picked up her phone and dialed Eleanor's number. Meanwhile, Eleanor was at Adrian's villa where she was watching her son practice. She glanced at her ringing phone and kissed her son's head before answering, Flynn, go on with your practice. Mommy will take this call. Okay. The little boy obediently nodded. Eleanor stepped away to a side room to take the call. Hello, what's bothering you, Miss Dane? Eleanor, remember how I've been asking you about what Gary was up to, and you never had an answer? Valerie's voice sounded weary. Eleanor was surprised. Did he finally tell you? What is he up to? Do you know what company I'm signing with in the entertainment industry? Valerie asked. Isn't it Mirage Entertainment Group? Eleanor frowned. Yes, and Gary happens to be the enigmatic CEO of Mirage Entertainment Group. Valerie replied, her voice devoid of enthusiasm. Eleanor was taken aback. No way! So he's your boss? You're one of his artists? Valerie remained silent for a few moments before letting out a sigh. You know what? I can't be happy when someone has been keeping such a major secret from me. I'm not happy at all. In fact, I'm pretty angry. He's a liar. Eleanor could sense the distress in her friend's voice and knew that Valerie was straightforward and valued honesty. Being deceived by someone she trusted and liked was undoubtedly hurting her deeply. All right, don't be too upset. Did he apologize to you at least? Regardless, he's your boss, and that could be a good thing, right? Eleanor tried to console her. At the moment, I don't even want to talk to him. Eleanor, you know what's making me angry isn't just that he concealed his identity. What's truly infuriating is that he wasn't honest with me even when he, Valerie, struggled to express herself. Eleanor, her best friend, had already guessed what Valerie meant before she could finish her sentence. So she sighed and said, You want to say that you have feelings for him, right? It's tough to accept being deceived by someone you like and trust. Valerie responded gloomily, Yes, that's exactly how I feel. Eleanor didn't know how to comfort her friend in this situation. She empathized with Valerie. If Adrian were hiding something from her now, she wouldn't feel good either, especially if she had feelings for him. The betrayal would cut even deeper. Once I will see you tomorrow, let's go out for a while to unwind. Don't dwell on this tonight. Get some good rest, Eleanor suggested. I won an award tonight and he presented it to me. But I feel like the award is a joke. I think he gave it to me intentionally. Valerie lamented once more. Eleanor quickly reassured her. That can't be true. You deserve that award, Valerie. It's a recognition of your hard work, achievements, and the support of your fans. All right, then. I'll tell myself that. Talk to you tomorrow. I'm feeling a bit tired. I'll take a bath and go to sleep. Valerie said with resignation. Sleep well. Don't dwell on it. Eleanor wished her. I won't let it bother me. Valerie replied, trying to convince herself. After hanging up the phone, Eleanor sighed. She hadn't expected that it would take some time for Valerie and Gary to get to know each other better. At that moment, she heard the piano in the adjacent room take on a calm and emotive tone. She knew her son wasn't at that level yet. It had to be one of Adrian's compositions. Eleanor leaned against the doorframe, a smile forming on her lips as she watched him, dressed in a suit, sitting in front of the piano, exuding a captivating masculine aura. She was momentarily stunned, and then her lips curved into a smile. Adrian noticed her and turned his head while still playing. The music he played seemed to be filled with love just for her. The melody lingered in the air and teased her, 
making her hesitant to meet his deep, night-like eyes. She lowered her gaze and smiled. Adrian stopped playing the piano and handed it over to their son, then stood up and walked toward Eleanor, embracing her passionately. Did you miss me? Yes, if I didn't miss you, would I miss someone else? Eleanor responded playfully. No, there's no one else but me, Adrian asserted. Daddy, what about me? Doesn't mommy miss me? A child's voice piped up from behind, sounding a bit sad. Eleanor and Adrian exchanged a glance before bursting into laughter. Eleanor quickly reassured their son, Of course mommy misses you the most. Yeah, I'll always be number one in mommy's heart. Daddy, you can't beat me, the little boy proudly declared. Adrian playfully bit his lip and replied, Little one, don't get ahead of yourself. Without me, you wouldn't even exist. Where do you think you came from? Eleanor gave Adrian a warning look. Be careful with your words. Don't teach our son these things so early. Mommy, how was I born? The curious little boy asked. Eleanor didn't know whether to laugh or cry. She replied somewhat vaguely, Well, it's like you were born just like that. I was just born like that? The little boy looked confused. Because Daddy loves you and Mommy, and you're the product of our love, Adrian explained. That's why you exist. But let's not talk about this anymore. Go to your room and get some sleep. Eleanor and Adrian shared a laugh before Eleanor said, Good night, my love. I'll always be number one in Mommy's heart. The little boy asserted again before obediently heading to his room. Adrian hugged Eleanor and whispered, I missed you so much. Eleanor smiled and kissed him. I missed you too. Their love, like the music that had just filled the room, was harmonious and sweet. In Valerie's serene room, soothing music played in the background, providing a sense of calm. She had just finished her bath and changed into fresh attire. She sat on the couch, hugging herself, lost in thought. In front of her was a gleaming golden statuette, an award that held great prestige. It was her very first Best Female Lead Award, a remarkable achievement. Yet, at this moment, she found herself uncertain about how she should feel about this coveted trophy. Unbeknownst to her, it was now around 10 p.m. In the residential area beneath Valerie's apartment building, an off-road vehicle was parked. Annie sat inside, waiting patiently. Before long, she spotted a high-end black luxury car worth millions approaching from the road. Without delay, Annie exited her vehicle and handed over a set of keys she had prepared. The luxury car window rolled down, revealing the handsome face of Gary. Annie presented the keys with both hands and said, Mr. Stewart, these are Valerie's house keys. Please take good care of her tonight. Of course, Gary replied as he accepted the keys, then proceeded to drive to the parking lot. Annie let out a sigh. She hadn't anticipated that Gary would call her to confirm if she had Valerie's keys, and indeed she did. Hence, he had requested her to wait downstairs at Valerie's apartment building in advance, as he needed access to the keys. Gary had made such a request because he knew that Valerie wouldn't let him in tonight, and he was determined to be nowhere else but at her place. Annie drove away with a sigh of relief, hoping that Valerie wouldn't hold it against her. Ever since Gary's true identity had been exposed, the entire entertainment industry had been a buzz. Everyone was trying to figure out how to get on the good side of the head honcho of the Mirage group as quickly as possible. Undoubtedly, numerous female artists were vying for his attention. Fortunately, Valerie was the luckiest one. She already had Gary's undivided focus. Gary stepped out of his car, his gaze fixed on Valerie's apartment. He quickly entered the building and headed for the elevator. Meanwhile, Valerie sat at home, deep in thought. She hadn't eaten anything since returning, despite having opened a few bags of her favorite snacks. She simply had no appetite. She realized she might have overreacted earlier. After all, Gary's identity had nothing to do with her. Had she been overly dramatic? 
Suddenly, she heard the sound of a key being inserted into her door's lock, causing her to jump in surprise. Besides her key, only Annie had a copy. Could Annie be visiting her so late at night? Valerie waited for Annie to enter, but instead the door swung open, revealing the uninvited presence of Gary. Valerie widened her eyes, looking at the unexpected guest with a furrowed brow. She questioned, what are you doing here? Gary closed the door and, in a calm tone, began to remove his suit jacket. I'm here to see you, of course. Is this how the boss of a big company cares about his employees? Valerie couldn't resist mocking him. Gary looked slightly taken aback. His deep eyes locked onto her, and he responded, You can see it that way. In that case, I'm truly honored, Valerie remarked with a hint of sourness as she crossed her arms. Gary placed his jacket on the sofa and approached her. His gaze remained locked onto her as he said, Please don't be angry. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make it up to you. Valerie met his deep, watery eyes and felt her heart waver. She had been easily angered because she liked him, but that same affection also made it easy for her to forgive him. Upon reflection, she realized that she couldn't find the same mood now as she had in the venue. The presence of his true identity had cast an invisible weight on their interactions. Valerie was lost in thought while Gary, tensed and anxious, interpreted her silence as lingering anger. Valerie pondered for a moment and then raised her eyes to ask, I have a question for you. Go ahead, I'll tell you everything, Gary said. Was it you who selected me for the leading role in that period drama? Valerie gazed into his eyes and inquired. Gary nodded, concealing nothing. Yes, I chose you. I believed you were the perfect fit for the female lead in that movie. And what about tonight's award? Did you have a hand in that too? Valerie inquired once more. Gary adopted a slightly more serious tone as he continued to answer honestly. That was also my doing. Valerie's pretty face blushed slightly. It seemed her award had indeed been embellished. Why did you do all this? Valerie bit her lip her irritation returning. Because you are the person I like and I can't be impartial, Gary stated honestly. Valerie's heart fluttered upon hearing his words. This man had always been straightforward. Valerie, I didn't conceal my identity from you on purpose. If I had told you right away that I'm the president of Mirage Group, I knew it would have made you uncomfortable. We wouldn't have been able to communicate as easily as we did before, and I was afraid it might push you away, Gary explained as he held her hand. Valerie was deeply affected by his words. He was right. If she had known his identity from the beginning, it would have been difficult for them to interact naturally. She would be worried about what others might say about her trying to climb the social ladder by associating with him. Valerie began to feel a little anxious. She had been sitting on the sofa for a while, and now she needed to use the restroom. As she stood up, she was suddenly pulled and forcefully pressed onto the couch by Gary. It was clear he had other intentions. What do I need to do for you to forgive me? Gary's voice was slightly dominant and tinged with frustration. His words carried a hint of heat and pressure. Valerie opened her eyes slightly and felt his overpowering presence. Her pretty face flushed instantly. She had only wanted to go to the bathroom. Gary noticed her somewhat dazed expression and grew anxious, thinking that she still The more Valerie forgive. tried to conceal her feelings, the more Gary believed she wouldn't forgive him. He kissed her passionately, attempting to quell her resistance in his way. Valerie found herself pinned down by him, locked in a passionate kiss that lasted for five minutes. Her face flushed with embarrassment. When he finally released her, she gasped and whispered, Can you please let me go? No, not unless you forgive me, Gary said in a hushed tone, determined to win her forgiveness. Valerie couldn't take it any longer. She needed to use the restroom urgently or she'd go mad. Her face was now as red as a tomato. She bashfully exclaimed, I need to use the restroom. What? Such a strong reaction? 
Gary immediately misunderstood her intentions. Valerie's ears turned crimson. She glared at him and snapped, You're not that charming. Let go of me quickly. I need to use the bathroom. Gary was taken aback and reluctantly released her. She hurriedly made her way to the restroom, leaving him perplexed. What on earth was going on with this woman? When Valerie finally emerged from the bathroom, she saw the man sitting on the sofa, deep in thought, rubbing his chin. She bit her lip with a hint of resentment and took a seat. You don't need to apologize anymore. I forgive you. By the way, why do you have my keys? I asked Annie for them. Gary raised an eyebrow. Even though you're our boss, you can't just barge into my house without permission. Valerie found his actions a bit distasteful. Gary wasn't pleased to be referred to as big boss by her. You don't have to treat me like your boss. Just consider me your boyfriend. Valerie was at a loss for words. I canceled that movie. I don't want to shoot it anymore. I want to take a year off. Valerie sighed. She had always worked hard in the entertainment industry, and suddenly being given special treatment and having doors opened for her made her uncomfortable. Why? Gary inquired. I'm just exhausted. Valerie had longed for a year of rest to focus on improving her skills abroad, but she hadn't found the right opportunity until now. Gary sighed. As you wish. I won't pressure you into anything. In the silence, someone's stomach betrayed them with a loud growl. Valerie's face turned crimson instantly. She waved her hand and hurriedly explained, It's not what you think. Gary burst into laughter. Even if it were, I wouldn't mind. Valerie awkwardly corrected herself. I am just hungry. Gary looked at her with admiration and felt his heart skip a beat. He got up and reached out to tousle her hair. All right, let's see what you have to eat here. Or do you want to order something? Valerie checked the time and whispered, I'll order some takeout. Would you like something? Gary hadn't eaten dinner either, and he was quite hungry. Seeing her enthusiasm for food, he agreed, Sure, I'll eat with you. Valerie smiled, her heart feeling a bit warmer. Unknowingly, her anger toward him had dissipated. Valerie ordered takeout, including two servings of soup and a fruit platter. After placing the order, the atmosphere in the room became more tranquil. Gary picked up the little golden statuette in front of her. This is well-deserved. Didn't you get credit, too? Valerie asked, puzzled. Gary replied nonchalantly, I want to claim the woman who deserves it. No one can object to that. Valerie turned her face away, saying, who said I'm yours? Gary introduced her with a straight face. My woman is Valerie, an artist under my company. She's beautiful with fair skin and long legs, a bit silly, and aside from having a temper, she has no flaws. Valerie glared at him, feeling a mix of annoyance and affection. So you'd still want me even if I were silly? Yes. If I don't use my genes to fix this gene, our future kids might be in trouble, Gary said with a mockingly disgusted expression. Valerie playfully threw a pillow at him. Have some shame. Gary caught the pillow and sat down beside her. Do you envy your friends for having children? To be honest, I envy them too. I want one. Tell me, when should we have one? Valerie's face reddened. She had indeed envied her friends for having children in the past. Now, this man was suggesting having one with her. I'm not ready for that yet, Valerie said, feeling a bit gloomy. All right, I can wait a year. But you'll be mine for the rest of your life, Gary declared before leaning down to kiss her cheek. Valerie lowered her gaze and her stomach made another embarrassing noise. She quickly checked her phone for the delivery status which showed it would arrive in a few minutes. She couldn't wait to eat. Ten minutes later, their food was delivered. Gary went to retrieve it, and they both sat in the living room, enjoying their takeout meal. The atmosphere was filled with warmth and contentment. 
Meanwhile, in a secluded meeting room, a reporter laid out a dozen stolen photos and said to an editor, I secretly captured these images. Valerie initiated an intimate encounter with Gary Stewart, the CEO of Mirage Group. It seems she's playing a dangerous game. This could be a major scoop. I'm concerned about potential backlash from higher-ups, though, the editor said. What's the worst that can happen? It's just a celebrity using controversy for publicity. We can focus on Valerie without alienating Gary. It'll surely grab headlines, the reporter smirked. The editor considered the idea, thinking of the attention and ratings it could bring to their media outlet. All right, let's run this as our lead story tomorrow morning. The reporter then asked, what about my payment? We'll make sure you're compensated well, and remember, if you come across more stories like this in the future, get in touch with us immediately, the editor promised. The reporter left with a satisfied grin. He had just secured another payday. Our media needs to expose these hidden secrets. In the chaos of the entertainment industry, these unwritten rules need to be challenged. Celebrities need to be held accountable, the reporter ranted. Absolutely, it's our duty. We can't let this story slip away, the editor agreed. In the photos, Valerie and Gary appeared to be embracing each other with no hint of conflict. It appeared as though Valerie was the one pursuing Gary, making the story even more intriguing. This was juicy material, and there was nothing more enticing to the media than a celebrity scandal, especially when it involved someone who had always projected a pristine image. Now, she has become embroiled in a controversy with the CEO of a major company. It was sure to make headlines. Valerie was about to face some serious trouble. At midnight, a shocking news story erupted on the internet, capturing the attention of night owls who had yet to go to sleep. The news spread like wildfire, taking everyone by surprise due to its unexpected and explosive nature. The award-winning artist Valerie Dane was accused of using unethical means to advance her career. Alongside photographic evidence, there were pictures of Valerie and Gary kissing near the stage. These photos served as compelling evidence supporting the allegations. The incriminating pictures left no room for doubt, making it an undeniable truth. Within just an hour, Valerie's reputation took a nosedive in the eyes of the online community. She faced a barrage of insults and criticism from all sides. Some envious and resentful female celebrities joined the fray, even hiring internet trolls to intensify the online harassment, leaving Valerie emotionally battered. Annie, who was an early sleeper, was jolted awake by a phone call from Sandra, who was a night owl. Sandra urgently informed her about the news. Annie, still groggy from sleep, was shocked when she heard the news and immediately reached for her iPad to verify the information. It felt like Valerie's world had been turned upside down in an instant. Annie was deeply concerned. Who had leaked these photos and spread such baseless rumors about Valerie? Annie assumed that Valerie was probably with Gary at that moment. She hesitated, wondering whether she should disturb their private time. In Annie's mind, Valerie and Gary had likely crossed the line between friendship and romance, becoming intimate lovers. Despite her reservations, Annie chose to contact Valerie in her time of need. After enjoying a satisfying meal, Valerie retired to her room, overwhelmed by fatigue. She fell asleep almost immediately. Amid her slumber, the persistent ringing of her phone gradually penetrated her dreams. Annoyed, she reluctantly reached for her phone. In her drowsy state, she answered the call. Hello, Annie. What's going on? Valerie, something's wrong. You need to check the trending searches right away. You're already the top topic in less than half an hour. Annie informed her. What's happening? Valerie asked. Someone is spreading a rumor that you received your award by sleeping with Gary. Annie said. What? That's ridiculous! I didn't do anything like that! Valerie, still half asleep, instinctively refuted the accusation. Really? You didn't sleep with him? Annie seized onto this crucial detail, seeking clarification. Valerie, now more awake, clarified. 
We've been sharing accommodations, but we're not involved like that. Valerie, it's not the time for explanations. Please check the trending searches and find Gary to address this issue immediately. Annie urged. Valerie hung up the phone and rushed to check the trending searches. To her dismay, she found herself at the top of the list with a headline that accused her of using unethical means to win her award. The accompanying photos showed her and Gary in the auditorium's hallway, with some images implying an intimate connection between them. Valerie was furious. She grabbed her phone, put on her slippers, and hastily left her room, forgetting to knock as she entered the master bedroom. In the dimly lit master bedroom, Gary was lounging on the bed in nothing but black underwear, engrossed in his iPad. The soft lamplight cast shadows on his chiseled physique, making him appear impossibly alluring. Valerie felt her heart race at the sight. She quickly averted her gaze and sternly said, Please put on some clothes. Although Gary didn't mind being seen in such a state, he covered his private area with the blanket, respecting her modesty. He inquired, What's wrong? Did something happen? Valerie handed him her phone with the disturbing reports. We were secretly photographed, and there's a media report claiming I won the award because of you. Gary accepted the phone and examined it with furrowed brows. His eyes flared with anger as he read the allegations. The report primarily targeted Valerie, without mentioning his name or involvement, instead portraying her as the aggressor in their supposed relationship. I'll handle this matter, Gary declared, reaching for his phone and dialing his assistant's number. Hello? His assistant, Walden, sounded groggy, still half asleep. The latest news about Valerie on the internet. I don't care what it takes, but make sure it disappears from the web by the time I wake up tomorrow, Gary ordered with unwavering authority. Yes, I'll take care of it right away, Walden responded without questioning his boss's directive. Valerie watched as Gary placed the phone back on the bedside table. She felt reassured by his prompt action. She feared that this scandal would tarnish her reputation irreparably. Don't worry, this won't affect your reputation. Gary assured her. Valerie, however, wasn't as optimistic. She believed that although the news might be suppressed, people would still know about her alleged involvement with Gary. Some things couldn't be erased so easily. Gary leaned back with a confident smile. If you're truly worried, there's a way to put all these concerns to rest. Curious, Valerie asked. What's that? Marry me. Let's show them with our actions that your relationship with me is genuine and loving, Gary suggested, his eyes brimming with affection. Valerie, who had reservations about marriage, hesitated. Let's see how this plays out for now. Gary extended his arm toward her and, in a low, a husky voice, said, Tonight, stay with me. Valerie had just seen his enticing figure and felt her heart race. However, upon second thought, she was too nervous to act on her attraction. With a dry throat, she stammered, No, I'll go back to the guest room to sleep. She hastily retreated and left the room, leaving Gary that to wonder night, about her. Valerie attempted to manage the news that was spreading about her. Unfortunately, due to the late hour, Gary's assistant couldn't immediately suppress the news. Consequently, it continued to circulate at a shockingly rapid pace. The relentless barrage of insults left Valerie drained. She couldn't bear to look at the ongoing backlash and chose to escape into sleep, temporarily ignoring the turmoil. Walden, Gary's assistant, tirelessly reached out to various media leaders to collaborate on damage control. Thanks to Gary's prominent position as the CEO of an entertainment conglomerate, these influential figures were eager to assist him in managing the situation. However, while they could contain the scandal on a large scale, they couldn't prevent private conversations and discussions among netizens, allowing the issue to fester in the shadows. Early the next morning, Valerie's father, Brandon, adhered to his morning routine of exercise and tea. Just as he was about to head out for a walk, his phone rang. It was his colleague, Gerald, on the line. Brandon answered, Hello, Gerald. Is there something urgent so early in the morning? 
Brandon, have you seen the news? What's your daughter up to? You can't just turn a blind eye. Even if my son, Francis, isn't good enough for her, your Dane family should take responsibility for your daughter, right? Gerald berated. Due to Valerie's cold treatment of Gerald's son, Francis, this family developed a negative opinion of her. Gerald couldn't resist adding a jab when the opportunity arose. What's going on with my Valerie? Brandon furrowed his brow, inquiring. Your daughter works in the entertainment industry, right? It seems like she got herself into trouble. She's being accused of using unethical means to achieve success, and the news has already spread all over the internet. I'll send you the link. Take a look. It seems that your beautiful daughter has brought us more trouble than we bargained for. Gerald said with a bitter tone before ending the call. Brandon was seething with anger. He donned his reading glasses and opened the link sent by Gerald. As he read the article, his complexion turned ashen. He slammed the table, exclaiming, How could my ungrateful daughter do such a thing? This is utterly disgraceful. She has disgraced our family. Lily, Valerie's mother, had just come downstairs. Upon hearing her husband's angry outburst, she rushed over and inquired, What's going on? Who are you scolding? Isn't it our daughter who's causing trouble outside? She's completely disregarded our family's reputation. Brandon raged. Lily picked up the phone and examined the photos. She couldn't help but smile, saying, This isn't a scandal. This is about Valerie's boyfriend, the man she referred to as Gary. Brandon snorted. Didn't you read the article carefully? Valerie has climbed up to some high branch. This man isn't her boyfriend at all. He looks like a wealthy young heir who's toying with our daughter. No way! He's been very good to Valerie. Besides, he confirmed that he's her boyfriend. Lily countered, disbelief in her voice. He's just spouting nonsense. Brandon snatched the phone back, retorting, I'm going to call that ungrateful daughter of ours and demand that she comes home immediately. She won't be going anywhere else except home from now on. Lily was concerned, but she didn't know how to persuade her husband otherwise. It had always been his decision that determined the family's course of action. Valerie received a call from her father while still lost in thought. She picked up the phone and greeted, Hello, Dad. Valerie, you need to return home before noon. If you don't, don't consider yourself my daughter anymore. Her father angrily declared before abruptly ending the call. Valerie was taken aback. Her father's voice was filled with anger and disappointment. He was obviously aware of the previous night's events. She sighed, a bitter feeling welling up within her. This time, it seemed she wouldn't be able to convince her father otherwise. She got up quietly, leaving a note for Gary, who was still in the master bedroom. She knew she had to go home, otherwise her father would be beyond furious. Valerie arrived at her parents' home at 10 a.m. As soon as she entered, she found her father, Brandon, sitting in the living room, his face a mask of displeasure. How do you explain this? He and I don't like what the news says. We just care for each other, Valerie explained softly. What does this man do? Is he the scion of some wealthy family? Brandon inquired. He's just an ordinary businessman. Valerie replied hesitantly. An ordinary businessman attends your award ceremony with you. Brandon slammed the table again, scolding. He's also the one who presented you with the award. His name is Gary Stewart, and he's the head of Mirage Entertainment Group. What kind of relationship do you have with him that it's being portrayed so ambiguously? Brandon asked. Valerie's face paled. She had forgotten that her award acceptance was broadcast live on television. Her father must have seen it. Valerie, why didn't you tell me he's your boss? Lily chimed in, reproaching her. He's my boss. What's wrong with employees having a relationship with their boss? Valerie weakly argued. I don't care about your relationship. Right now, I want you two separated. You'll take a break from work and stay at home with your mother. Is that clear? Brandon issued the order. Dad, you can't, Valerie cried. Since you acknowledge me as your father, you should respect my decision. You're my daughter, and I've spoiled you too much. That's why you've disgraced our family. 
Brandon declared before heading out of the house. Valerie sat on the sofa, her complexion ashen, uncertain about what to do next. Lily sat beside her, at a loss for words to console her. You know your father's temperament. He says one thing and it's final. Rest at home for a while, Valerie, and don't worry about matters outside. Your sister will return tonight, Lily advised. Mom, even if he's the CEO of the company, he's not a bad person, Valerie defended Gary. This issue can't be resolved hastily. Take your time, Lily cautioned, not daring to push too hard to reconcile them. In the garden of another villa, a lively party was in full swing despite the noon hour. The gathering attracted a crowd of successful men and women, all radiating an air of affluence and luxury. The playing host was Sean, and this time the villa belonged to Melissa. She was elegantly dressed, her arm entwined with Sean's as she graciously offered guests glasses of wine. Kendra, standing behind them, adorned herself with lavish jewelry bestowed upon her by Sean, showcasing it conspicuously, perhaps a bit excessively. Mr. Miller, I wonder when we'll have the pleasure of toasting to your marriage with Miss Melissa? I'm looking forward to it, one guest remarked. It won't be long, very soon, Sean chuckled, holding Melissa's hand even tighter, affection clear in his gaze. When the time comes, you must prepare a generous gift for me, Melissa playfully added. Of course, of course, a substantial token will be yours, he agreed with a grin. Melissa leaned on Sean's arm, her face aglow with happiness, making her the envy of all the women present. With a considerable family fortune and the prospect of marrying into an even more affluent one, she was living the dream. Melissa was undoubtedly the most fortunate person her age. As others witnessed the couple's love and the impending merger of their companies, they couldn't help but shower praise and well wishes upon them. Meanwhile, Kendra couldn't help but feel a bit annoyed in this sea of older guests. As a young girl, she found herself rather bored. She couldn't help but yearn for the company of Adrian, hoping that Sean would invite him. Before long, Sean and Melissa took to a small stage. Sean stood beside them, tapping a spoon against his glass to get everyone's attention. He addressed the audience, mostly consisting of couples, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? I have an important announcement to make. The room hushed in anticipation. Even Melissa raised her head slightly, eager to hear what Sean had to say. Thank you all for joining us at this banquet hosted by Melissa and me. Today, I have some significant news to share. Melissa and I will be tying the knot, and our wedding is just three days away. We'd be honored if you could join us on that special day, Sean announced. The news took everyone by surprise. Mr. Miller, are you in such a hurry to arrange the wedding? Someone asked. I began preparations a month ago. Everything is in place. We're just waiting to be married. Sean said with pride. Melissa couldn't contain her laughter and even referred to herself as Mrs. Miller. At this moment, an unexpected guest entered the room from outside. Sean watched as a young, beautiful woman made her entrance. He was somewhat taken aback. He hadn't extended an invitation to this woman. Who was she? Or was she an uninvited guest? Noel approached Sean with a graceful smile her voice dripping warmly. Congratulations to both of you. Good times are ahead. May I ask who you are? Sean squinted at Noel's beautiful face. To his surprise, a suspicion crossed his mind next to Melissa. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Noel Bran, a businesswoman. I attended uninvited because I have something important to discuss with you both, Noel explained with a calm demeanor. Melissa didn't take kindly to this young, beautiful woman. Her appearance, which was younger and more attractive than hers, ignited a strange sense of hostility within her, especially in Sean's presence. Since you weren't invited, why did you come here without an invitation? Melissa sounded displeased. Because I have something crucial to discuss with both of you. Let's talk privately later, Noel suggested, turning toward a nearby chair. 
She took a seat with a polite smile and even took a selfie with Sean and Melissa in the background. Shortly after, Sean, Melissa, and Noelle found themselves in a quiet living room. Melissa couldn't help but inquire, What business do you have with us? Allow me to introduce myself first. I'm Noel. My background is a bit complicated. I'm Adrian's ex-girlfriend. Sean was taken aback and chuckled. Adrian's ex-girlfriend? The nephew I'm so fond of? That's correct. Unfortunately, he's already involved with someone named Eleanor, Noel replied matter-of-factly. Melissa was also surprised. It seemed this girl was already aware of their affairs. She couldn't help but snort disdainfully. Yes, that's right. She's my ex-husband's daughter. I've come back because I wanted to reconcile with Adrian. But now he's abandoned me for Eleanor, Noel continued. I can't accept that. Knowing about your rivalry with Adrian in the business world, I've decided to align myself with you both and challenge Adrian together. Sean's expression lit up with excitement. Really? You genuinely want to join forces with us? Melissa didn't seem thrilled, but she didn't voice her displeasure directly. A deep resentment flashed across Noel's eyes. She couldn't forget that day when she had dressed up happily for a rendezvous, only to be humiliated. She had struggled in pain in that hotel room, torn between staying or leaving. Yet, she hadn't been able to cross that threshold. So, she sought to team up with Sean to make Adrian pay the price and achieve another goal. That afternoon, Sean didn't conceal the news. He even published it in the newspapers, securing the front-page headline to celebrate the impending nuptials. The news spread throughout the country in an instant. Insiders who had already heard rumors about the affair saw the news and were unsurprised. Adrian calmly observed the newspaper in his hands, a sharp glint in his eyes. His uncle was indeed swift, having exploited Melissa and the Greenwich group. At home, Eleanor kept an eye on the news as well. She had already come to terms with the situation, though seeing Melissa's face still riled her with an inexplicable anger. At that moment, Eleanor's phone rang. She answered and saw that it was a rare caller, her father's assistant, Landon. Hello, she answered. Miss, have you seen the news? It's unbelievable what Melissa has done. She's handed Mr. George's company to someone else, Landon vented. Yes, it's unfortunate for Dad, Eleanor agreed. Miss, why didn't you secure any shares in the company? Landon asked. Melissa's methods are despicable. I wasn't prepared. Even my mother's shares went to her, Eleanor replied, a tinge of frustration in her voice. Eleanor was failing at everything she cared for. Landon was on the call with Eleanor when he asked, Miss, how did your mother end up with that 30% stake? Why did she take what rightfully belongs to you? It was originally mine. However, back then, I was young, and all my shares were in my father's name. So... I didn't have any actual inheritance rights, Eleanor replied with bitterness. No way. I remember Mr. Greenwich never took control of your shares. He drew up a contract and intended for you to inherit them when you turned 18. It's just that you had a falling out with him back then and he probably never mentioned it to you, Landon informed. What? Landon, are you serious? Eleanor suddenly stood up, shocked. She remembered her father mentioning this to her once, but she hadn't paid much attention to it at the time. She never expected her father to pass away so suddenly, and she never thought about reclaiming her mother's shares from him. That was her way of showing respect for him, and after that, her father left many things unfinished, and she heard nothing more about it. Now, hearing Landon mention it, she was genuinely surprised. Miss, it's true! I was with him for many years, and I know a lot about him. Mr. Greenwich had a contract in his possession, signed by him. It's proof that he separated your mother's shares. In other words, you could inherit them when you turned 18, Landon confirmed. Do you know where the contract might be? Eleanor asked, her surprise turning into excitement. She hadn't expected there to be a chance to claim what was rightfully hers. Landon thought for a moment and said, when Mr. Greenwich designed his office, there was a hidden compartment. That's where he kept the most important documents. Only he knows about the secret compartment. Miss, you should go to his old office to look for it. 
Eleanor was grateful to Landon for sharing this information. Thank you, Landon. Thank you for telling me this. I'm just doing what's right. Besides, his death was quite mysterious. This is the least I can do. I thought you had already reclaimed your mother's shares, Landon mused. Of course I want them back. Whether they belong to my mother or my father, I want them all, Eleanor said resolutely. All right, miss. Find an opportunity to search for it. I believe Mr. Greenwich safeguarded that document well. And even Melissa doesn't know about it, Landon said. Okay, thank you again. Eleanor expressed her gratitude once more. After ending the call, Eleanor composed herself. If her mother's shares still existed separately, she could inherit them and regain a 30% stake in the Greenwich Group. She thought to herself, Melissa must not have anticipated this. She had taken control of everything in her father's name, unaware that he had separated her mother's shares. Eleanor grabbed her bag and headed out. She was on her way to see Adrian to discuss this matter. Adrian was currently in a meeting, discussing shipping contracts. He and Sean were now in a state of rivalry, and he needed to make sure he didn't give Sean any advantage. When Eleanor arrived, Arnold, Adrian's assistant, greeted her. Despite her urgency, she didn't want to disrupt his meeting. After informing Adrian, Arnold returned from the meeting room. Soon, Adrian emerged from the meeting and walked over to the lounge. Eleanor was deep in thought, holding a cup of tea when she heard the door open. A hint of joy appeared in her eyes. Why did you come here all of a sudden? Adrian asked in surprise. I have good news. My father separated my mother's shares from the rest. Although they were all under his name, he left behind a document that proves they are meant for me, Eleanor said with excitement. Adrian also felt happy for her. It seems like your father anticipated this day and took steps to protect your interests. But that document is in my father's office, hidden in a secret compartment. Now that the Greenwich Group is under Melissa's control, she won't let me in to search for it, Eleanor said with frustration. Adrian gently stroked her head. I have faith in your abilities, not just mine. Eleanor raised her eyes and smiled. Yes, that's why I came to find you. Don't worry, leave it to me. I have a plan to retrieve that document your father left for you, Adrian said confidently. Eleanor trusted him and looked forward to the day when she could confront Melissa in court. She wanted to make it clear that her mother's legacy could never be taken away. You have a meeting now. I'll go home after picking up our son, Eleanor said with a smile. My parents will pick him up, right? Stay here and wait for me to finish. I'll need about 10 more minutes, Adrian instructed. Wait for me. We'll discuss how to recover the document your father left for you. All right, I'll wait for you, Eleanor agreed. She knew her son was in good hands with Henry and his wife, who had moved nearby. Just as Adrian left, Eleanor's phone rang. She checked it and saw a message from Noel, along with a photo. In the picture, Noel was standing with Sean and Melissa, all three of them smiling. Noel had added a message. Eleanor, thanks to you, I'm now Adrian's business rival. And I'm proud to be working alongside your stepmother. Eleanor's expression changed. Noel and Sean were planning to team up against Adrian in business. Her love for him had driven her to this extent. Eleanor was taken aback. She realized that she needed to quickly retrieve her mother's shares and weaken Melissa's power, not only for herself, but also to ease the pressure on Adrian. Why are you doing this? Eleanor replied to Noel. Noel quickly responded, Since I can't have his love, I'll make him hate me for the rest of his life. I just want a place in his heart. Eleanor thought Noel was acting irrationally out of love, but love had a way of clouding one's judgment. It was clear that Noel was serious about this. She decided to inform Adrian about this development so he could be prepared for Noel's tactics in the future and avoid falling into her traps. Just then, Eleanor's phone rang again. It was Valerie calling. She answered with a smile. Hello, Valerie. Eleanor, my father grounded me, Valerie said gloomily. What happened? Eleanor asked. It's a long story. Can you come to see me when you have time? 
I can't leave the house, Valerie sighed. Sure, let me check my schedule for the next couple of days, Eleanor agreed. And please don't tell anyone, including Adrian. I'm worried he might inform Gary, Valerie requested. Why? Doesn't he know? Eleanor asked in surprise. I never told him about my family situation, Valerie whispered. Okay, I won't mention it to him. I'll come see you in a couple of days, Eleanor agreed. On their way back to the villa, Eleanor showed Adrian the message Noelle had sent her. Adrian's expression remained stoic, but he was somewhat surprised that Noelle had turned against him in this manner. His knowledge of Noelle was limited to her appearance six years ago when she appeared innocent. Now, Noelle gave him the impression of a cunning person. Perhaps over these six years, she had undergone training and become someone who had lost her innocence and naivete. Be cautious of her in the future. Don't let your guard down, Eleanor warned him with concern. Adrian pursed his lips and smiled. Don't worry. Even if they join forces, I'm not afraid. Do you think I can be so easily defeated? Eleanor appreciated his confidence and admired his demeanor. However, she also felt sorry for him. Yes, I believe in you, Eleanor replied, feeling a warm sensation in her lower abdomen. She immediately panicked and covered her stomach. Adrian asked with concern, is something wrong with your stomach? Something good is about to happen, Eleanor said, her face blushing slightly. Adrian sighed in relief, understanding the implication. At the same time, he teased himself, looks like I won't have a chance this week. Eleanor knew what he meant and blushed even more. Ever since Summer had come to stay at the villa and was still sleeping there, Eleanor had maintained a normal distance from Adrian. With Summer around, she couldn't allow her to witness any adult interactions. Adrian took her to a nearby shopping mall. Eleanor changed her outfit and bought some daily necessities before heading home. Have you thought of a way to access my father's old office? Eleanor asked. I have a friend who can help with that. He was a client Greenwich Group was trying to bring on board, and we have a good relationship. I've asked him to bring along Arnold and my bodyguards to try and locate the document your father hid, Adrian explained. Eleanor realized how important Arnold was to Adrian. He trusted him implicitly, which was why he was sending someone he trusted to handle this matter. That's great. When can we do it? Eleanor inquired. The sooner, the better. I've arranged for it to happen tomorrow afternoon, Adrian replied. I'll keep you updated on the progress. Okay, I'll be waiting for your good news, Eleanor said, feeling relieved. She was grateful to her father for leaving her this lifeline. Regaining her mother's shares would secure her a significant position in the Greenwich Group. If you successfully retrieve the shares, what are your plans? Adrian asked. I haven't thought that far ahead. What do you think I should do? Eleanor asked in return. I have one concern. A company as large as the Greenwich Group likely has restrictions on transferring shares. If you regain the shares, you may become a shareholder of the group. But you need to consider the implications of that, Adrian cautioned. Eleanor's eyes flashed with determination. No matter what I do, even if I become the manager of the group, I'll bear the pressure. The Greenwich group is mine and I'll fight for every inch of it. Adrian admired her determination. I'll consider it further after we obtain the contract. With that, Adrian drove her home. At night, he could return to his parents' house for dinner. His home was now conveniently located nearby, allowing him to have three meals a day with his parents. Meanwhile, Valerie was grounded at home. Although she was physically free, her heart was not. She didn't want to be controlled any longer, but breaking free of her father's influence was proving to be a challenge. Her elder sister, Kesha, had also returned home. Compared to Valerie, Kesha led a highly disciplined life. She was like a well-oiled machine efficient in all aspects of her life. To Valerie, the complexities of international diplomacy and the linguistic standards of six different countries were all foreign concepts. Kesha, on the other hand, was proficient in these areas. Although Kesha was 26 years old, her life revolved around work, 
and she had little interest in anything else. Her mind was consumed by work plans, schedules, and translating documents from various countries. At this moment, the two sisters sat beneath a tree, sipping tea and gazing at the stars. It was a rare moment for them to bond as sisters. Kesha, you work so hard every day. Are you truly happy? Valerie asked, genuinely curious about her sister's lifestyle. She couldn't imagine living a life with such strict routines. I've grown accustomed to it. It doesn't feel like hard work to me, Kesha replied, her gaze fixed on the starry night sky. A faint smile appeared on her lips. Everyone has a purpose in life, and what I'm doing now is what I've chosen for myself. My life is also my choice. If only Dad weren't so stubborn, I would be happy too. Valerie sighed, her hand supporting her chin in a somewhat helpless gesture. Mom and Dad have always been fixated on that man. Do you like him that much? Kesha inquired, casting a worried look at her younger sister. Valerie thought for a moment and nodded lightly. He's a good person. Mom and Dad have always been old-fashioned and disapprove of your career choice. Now that the man you like is the CEO of an entertainment company, I'm worried for you. Kesha expressed her concern. Valerie felt the same way. Over the past few days, she had received calls from Gary. She had to make up excuses, claiming there were family matters to attend to, just to avoid returning to her apartment. Sis, have you ever liked someone? Valerie turned to look at Kesha. Their paths had diverged ever since they were young, and she knew very little about her sister's personal life and experiences. A trace of sadness flickered in Kesha's eyes. Yes, but circumstances kept us apart. I don't want to dwell on it anymore. Then you should think about it too. You're older than me. If you don't find someone you like and get married soon, you'll grow old. Valerie teased her sister with a playful smile. Kesha, however, didn't seem concerned about her age. She had maintained her youthful appearance and demeanor. If it weren't for her professional attire, she could easily pass for someone in her prime. The two sisters continued chatting late into the night before retiring to their respective rooms. Valerie had just returned to her room when she noticed her phone. She picked it up and was surprised to see that Gary had called her. She was taken aback. It was already quite late and he was still calling her. Valerie couldn't resist returning the call it was late, but he must still be awake, right? Hello, came Gary's deep voice from the other end. Did you call me? Valerie's heart warmed, feeling sweet. Yes, I wanted to let you know that I'll be visiting your parents tomorrow morning. I wanted to ask you whether your father prefers red Valerie or was white taken wine. Back by Gary's Gary claim explained. and asked, You want to come to my place? What? Is that a problem? Gary asked, sounding surprised. Could you not come for now? My family's situation is complicated and it might not be the right time, Valerie replied, resorting to a white lie to dissuade him. Gary's tone turned more serious. If there's something at home, I hope I can help. No, please don't come. It might just complicate things further, Valerie said with a bitter undertone. What's wrong? Gary immediately sensed something amiss in her tone. Valerie quickly adjusted her voice and said, Nothing. It's just that it's not convenient right now. My parents are busy, so you should focus on your work. We can meet in a few days. It's only been two days since we last met, but I already miss you. Gary's voice was tinged with longing as he deliberately moved his lips closer to the microphone, as if leaving an intimate message in Valerie's ear. It was incredibly endearing. Valerie's pretty face reddened even though they were separated by the microphone. She shyly bit her lip and pleaded, Please don't come yet, okay? But I want to come, Gary replied sincerely. He wanted to meet her parents and show them his sincerity. Please don't come yet. Trust me, it's for the best, Valerie said with a tinge of desperation. Just let me come, Gary insisted determined to see her parents and prove his commitment. Valerie tried to reason with him. Don't you know the saying, 
absence makes the heart grow fonder? There's no need to be together every day. Gary snorted. Are you saying that I'm being too clingy? No, of course not. Being cared for by someone as important as you is a blessing, Valerie quickly reassured him. Gary seemed satisfied. Good. Get some rest and take care of your family matters. We'll meet soon. All right, thanks, Valerie replied, relieved. She thanked him for his support. What did you say? Gary asked, a hint of displeasure in his voice. I said thank you, Valerie clarified. Do we need to thank each other? Gary's tone grew colder. Valerie suddenly felt guilty. She had unintentionally angered him. Okay, let's stop thanking each other then, Valerie conceded. Give me a goodnight kiss, Gary said. But you're not here with me. How can I kiss you? Valerie teased, feeling a bit playful since he wasn't physically present. Gary's request wasn't too demanding, just blow me a kiss through the microphone. I don't know, Valerie replied, feeling a bit shy. Hurry up, or I'll come find you tomorrow and kiss you in person. Gary threatened, trying to entice her playfully. This threat worked like a charm. Valerie immediately panicked and agreed, Okay, okay, I'll give you a kiss. With that, she playfully blew a kiss into the microphone for him to hear. On the other end, Gary chuckled softly. Why are you being so obedient? You aren't so obedient when I'm around. Later that night, Eleanor, buoyed by the good news, couldn't sleep. While she had asked Adrian to look after their son, she couldn't find rest. If Landon hadn't shared this information with her, she might never have known about her father's intentions regarding her mother's shares. Perhaps this was what her father had wanted to tell her before, but they had never found the time to discuss it. She was grateful that she now knew. She could only wait for the events of the following day to unfold. With Melissa keeping a close watch on her and Adrian's people, Eleanor knew that they needed to tread carefully. Other than the plan to enter her father's office, Melissa would likely come up with other reasons to call the police. She hoped that everything would go smoothly. Adrian had been at the company since morning. In the afternoon, he called her to inform her that his friend had taken Arnold and two bodyguards to the Greenwich Group. He believed that they would soon achieve their goal. Eleanor couldn't help but feel anxious as she waited. She immediately contacted Landon, asking if he could guess the location of her father's secret compartment. Landon informed her that it might be hidden behind a painting in her father's office. Eleanor promptly relayed this information to Adrian, who, in turn, shared it with Arnold. Guided by Landon's instructions, Arnold managed to find the hidden compartment behind the painting in less than half an hour. Inside, he discovered a sealed envelope. He didn't open it, but was instructed by Adrian to take it back to their villa. Afterward, Arnold quickly returned from the company. Eleanor anxiously awaited Arnold's return and was filled with emotion when he handed her the envelope. Her father's handwriting was unmistakable and her eyes welled up with tears. It was a letter from her father. Shortly after, Eleanor opened the envelope, revealing a contract signed and sealed by her father. The contract included the original shares that had belonged to her mother. This evidence would undoubtedly enable Eleanor to reclaim 30% of the Greenwich Group's shares. Adrian also breathed a sigh of relief. Though he hadn't been directly involved in this retrieval, he knew that it was a precious gift from Eleanor's father. It warmed his heart. I want to give Melissa a grand gift on the day of her wedding, a court summons. Eleanor's eyes flashed with determination and a hint of resentment. Adrian nodded in agreement. Exactly. On that day, I'll also give her husband a special gift. Termination contracts for all of our business dealings with his company. Eleanor looked at him and smiled. She knew that from this point on, they would face life's challenges together. Adrian held her close, embracing her in his arms. Lowering his head, he asked in a low voice, So, when shall we hold our wedding? I can't wait any longer. Can we discuss it after we've resolved all these matters? I don't want our wedding to be rushed. 
Eleanor replied, gazing up at him. I want it to be a special and meaningful occasion. All right, I promise to wait as long as you need, Adrian agreed, planting a gentle kiss on the tip of her nose. Who told me to fall in love with you? Eleanor couldn't help but laugh. I didn't force you to love me. You did it willingly, but no backsays. Adrian grinned and held her close, savoring the warmth of the moment. Well, I've faced rejection from you too many times, so I've gotten used to it. Three days later, a grand wedding took place at a five-star hotel in the heart of the city. The guest list included prominent figures from the worlds of politics and business. It was the wedding of Sean and Melissa. Due to their family circumstances, the wedding was arranged hastily. Henry had received an invitation, which had been extended by Sean. Henry, who had retired from active business affairs, passed the invitation to Adrian. As Adrian had some free time, he decided to attend the wedding on his father's behalf. Eleanor also planned to join the celebration. In the past, Eleanor had harbored resentment towards Melissa and her daughter. However, she decided to fight back and show Melissa that she wouldn't give up easily. The Greenwich Group would soon belong to Sean, and Melissa had forcefully transferred her mother's shares to Sean's company. Consequently, Eleanor held the opportunity to collaborate with Sean and owned 30% of the Greenwich Group's shares. Even the sector in which the shares were invested was indicated. Eleanor was eager to witness Melissa's reaction and see if she could still wear a smile at the wedding. Three days prior, Adrian had made the necessary preparations for the wedding. Flynn happened to have a two-day break, so he and Summer had been spending quality time together. Children inhabited their world, and adults couldn't intrude. Summer's recent academic performance has improved significantly, especially in mathematics. She had made great strides, and Kayla was delighted. She believed that Marlo deserved credit for this. In class, Marlo fulfilled his role as a teacher. However, outside of class, if there wasn't anything pressing, many female students showered him with gifts, and locating him became a daily morning routine. Marlowe's desk was perpetually adorned with snacks, which he often shared with the female teachers sitting nearby. The homeroom teacher repeatedly emphasized that gifts to teachers were not allowed, but the female students remained undeterred. More students from other classes joined in, leading to a daily ritual of gift giving. Summer was perturbed by Marlowe's desk always overflowing with gifts. However, she rarely showed interest in such matters and was very studious. She had a habit of propping up her chin during lessons and gazing at Marlowe intently while he taught. To her, even complex formulas seemed easy to understand, although she occasionally missed minor details. However, after every class, Marlowe would hand her a notebook containing that day's lesson, allowing her to review it at home. The school was aware that Marlowe was distantly related to Summer, which explained the special attention he paid to her. Therefore, no one thought much of their close relationship. After having breakfast with her son at the Miller Mansion, Eleanor went out with Adrian. Due to the tight schedule, they didn't have time to pick out formal evening attire, so they decided to visit Adrian's aunt to select outfits for the wedding. Jane, upon hearing about their attendance at the wedding, had already begun selecting five dresses suitable for Eleanor earlier that morning. She was well acquainted with Eleanor's body measurements and personal style, so she knew exactly which dresses would suit her best. Eleanor and Adrian arrived at Jane's boutique, where five dresses had already been pre-selected for Eleanor. Eleanor, who had no intention of keeping a low profile this time, opted for a striking red evening gown with a one-shoulder design that didn't reveal too much cleavage. A cluster of red roses adorned her chest, adding an eye-catching touch of elegance. To complement her choice, Adrienne selected a stylish gray suit. With her makeup meticulously done and her attire perfectly coordinated, Eleanor banished the sorrow stemming from her father's loss and her family's troubles. Despite the weight on her heart, she presented herself as confident and composed, as she always had been. Adrian couldn't help but be captivated by her radiant presence, unable to tear his gaze away. 
Regardless of what Eleanor wore, she had an uncanny ability to command attention. Of course, in Adrian's eyes, the most alluring attire for her was wearing nothing at all. After bidding farewell to Jane, Eleanor climbed into Adrian's car and they headed to Sean and Melissa's wedding. Today was a joyous occasion for Melissa, who had found love and was experiencing the happiness of a formal marriage. As a woman, a wedding was undoubtedly one of the happiest moments of her life, regardless of her age. Furthermore, Sean had invested significantly in this wedding, giving Melissa a sense of pride and satisfaction. As Melissa's daughter, Kendra had been living a comfortable life lately. Sean doted on her and showered her with diamond jewelry. Sean was making these efforts to please Melissa. With Melissa now at the helm of the company, even after the merger, she wasn't one to be underestimated. Sean knew that acquiring the Greenwich Group completely wouldn't be a simple task. However, Sean chose not to express any dissatisfaction. He believed that everything connected to Melissa would eventually belong to him. All he needed was time and patience to gradually bring Melissa's company under his control. By around 10 a.m., Sean and Melissa were receiving guests at the entrance of the auditorium. Since most of the attendees were prominent figures from the business world, Sean warmly welcomed them alongside Melissa. As they were already engaged, Melissa dispensed with formalities and joined Sean in greeting their guests. Kendra followed closely behind, holding a bouquet of roses, occasionally glancing at the young men entering the venue. Since her breakup with Ian, she has been single for a while now. Her time had been wasted on someone who didn't love her. She no longer harbored any affection for Ian and was eager to find a new romantic interest. Sean had just finished welcoming another group of guests when he held Melissa's hand and asked gently, Feeling tired? Would you like to rest in the lounge for a while? I'm perfectly fine. Let's stay a bit longer. I think most of the guests have arrived, Melissa replied with a smile, her eyes filled with affection. Sean concurred. Yes, it seems like it. However, he couldn't help but wonder about one person who hadn't arrived yet, Henry. Regardless of the circumstances, he was still a blood relative, and Sean believed that Sean he couldn't possibly Henry would show up way. right in front of the hotel. A luxury car worth tens of millions of dollars suddenly pulled up. Out of the car's back seat stepped Adrian, a tall and commanding figure under the watchful eye of the security guard. He casually reached into the car as Eleanor gracefully emerged, holding on to his hand. Coincidentally, Sean and Melissa happened to be watching. In an instant, they were both taken aback. Sean hadn't expected it to be Adrian, and Melissa was equally surprised to see him with Eleanor. Melissa's smile looked strained and insincere. Sean adopted an elder's tone as he said, Well, look who's here. Adrian, please come in. Where's Henry? My father's tied up. It wasn't convenient for him to make it, replied Adrian with a smile, his arms still wrapped around Eleanor. Eleanor's gaze was icy as she fixed her stare on Melissa, her eyes revealing deep-seated resentment. Kendra, standing behind her, was also taken aback and cast envious glances at Eleanor, who was stealing the spotlight in her elegant attire. Eleanor is here too! What a pleasant surprise! Come on in! Thanks for making it to our wedding despite your busy schedule. Melissa quickly feigned warmth. Eleanor sneered. Melissa, I've got a special gift for you today. Wishing you a blissful wedding. Melissa's expression changed. While she was willing to accept casual remarks, Eleanor's special gift made her uneasy. Do we need a gift between us? I'm already thrilled that you could attend. Melissa replied with a fake smile. Of course, it's customary to bring a gift to a wedding. I wouldn't miss it, Eleanor retorted. Our family didn't send you an invitation, Kendra interjected with a pout. Sean appeared embarrassed. At that moment, Adrian wrapped his arm around Eleanor and coldly replied to Kendra, She's here as my fiancé. Any objections? Kendra turned pale with fear and Sean felt equally awkward. Melissa turned back to Kendra and said, Kendra, don't speak recklessly. 
Adrian led Eleanor inside. Sean's eyes followed Eleanor's figure, and he couldn't help but sigh. It turned out that Adrian's son's mother was stunningly beautiful. Where did George inherit the genes to have such a gorgeous daughter? Melissa whispered to Kendra. Kendra, go inside and check. If Eleanor brought gifts, have someone take them away immediately. Okay, Mom, Kendra complied. After Melissa spoke, her expression remained tense. Sean turned to her, curious, and asked, What's bothering you? I have a feeling that Adrian and Eleanor have ulterior motives, Melissa said candidly. Sean sneered. No matter their intentions, if they cause any trouble at our wedding, I'll have them thrown out. Melissa wasn't worried about that. She was concerned that it might be unnecessary. If Adrian and Eleanor had planned against her, they wouldn't have waited until now to act. At the reception, Adrian and Eleanor were seated in a prominent position as family members. The business guests flocked to greet Adrian, showing great respect to the esteemed head of the Miller Group. Would you like something to drink? Adrian asked Eleanor. Eleanor shook her head, her tone cold as she replied, I can't drink, and frankly, I find it a bit nauseating. Eleanor wanted to avoid this woman who had caused her father's demise. If possible, she never wanted to see her again. Adrian didn't press the matter. They were here to deliver their gifts, and they could leave at any time. Sean and Melissa had returned backstage. Kendra informed Melissa that Eleanor hadn't signed her name on the gift list and hadn't contributed any money for Adrian's gift either. Sean was unfazed by these details. He already anticipated Adrian's presence and believed that there would be room for family reconciliation in the future. Eleanor is quite stingy. She didn't even follow proper etiquette. She just came here to eat and drink, complained Kendra, crossing her arms. Melissa turned to her, saying, Don't take her seriously. She's irrelevant to us now. The entire Greenwich group belongs to me now. She means nothing, Melissa sneered, filled with self-satisfaction. At that moment, Melissa's assistant approached Melissa and Sean. Noel had arrived, a VIP they had specially invited. This is going to be interesting. Adrian's ex-girlfriend is here. Melissa said, looking as though she were in for some entertainment. Sean felt a bit apprehensive, but he couldn't ignore the lucrative projects Noel had brought to him. Thus, he had invited her to the banquet. Noel entered wearing a stunning gold dress. When she spotted Adrian and Eleanor at the second table, she was momentarily stunned. However, she quickly composed herself, knowing exactly what she was here for. She positioned herself where she could keep an eye on Adrian, even if it was from a distance. She couldn't forget him, and even though she couldn't be with him now, she wanted to remain in his heart as a threat. She hoped that someday she'd become the person Adrian needed. If he ever approached her, she'd abandon Sean without hesitation. Noel and Eleanor locked eyes from across the room, cold, emotionless eyes versus eyes filled with resentment and hatred. Oddly, it was Noel who appeared resentful. She couldn't comprehend where Eleanor derived her self-assuredness. Eleanor's reactions had consistently exceeded Noel's expectations. For Eleanor's father's sake, it wasn't worth it. She had lived half her life with a malicious woman who had ultimately killed her father and taken everything from him, all to marry another man. Eleanor tightened her fists, but a warm, large hand enveloped her head. She glanced slightly and saw Adrian gazing at her tenderly, silently comforting her. Eleanor suddenly felt invigorated, and the resentment in her mind began to dissipate, replaced by calm determination. On the stage, as the host finished narrating the love story of Sean and Melissa, the entire hotel auditorium was filled with the sweet sounds of the wedding march. Melissa, adorned in a beautiful white wedding gown, was escorted by Kendra, taking each step with grace down the red carpet. On the stage, Sean stood, hands clasped in front of him, eagerly awaiting his bride. A ceremonial lady stood nearby, holding a tray with a pair of wedding rings. Kendra walked with a proud posture, 
seemingly aware of the admiring glances she was receiving from young men in the audience. However, her attention was secretly fixated on Adrian. Regardless of the occasion, he exuded an undeniable charm. Though he sat still, his focus was solely on Eleanor, who was beside him. Eleanor remained impassive as Kendra regarded her with disdain. She paid it no mind. Melissa, veiled behind a fine gauze, also gazed at Eleanor. She couldn't fathom why Eleanor had chosen to attend her wedding. Hadn't their enmity run deep? Melissa was surprised that Eleanor had shown up at all. Nonetheless, Melissa brushed off her concerns. This was her wedding day, and she wanted to bask in the blessings of others. Eleanor's presence was a dark cloud in her otherwise sunny sky. Eleanor's heart bore not blessings, but a curse. When Melissa reached the stage, supported by Sean, Eleanor couldn't bear to look. The sight disgusted her. The host wasted no time swiftly proceeding with the wedding ceremony. Sean and Melissa were officially declared husband and wife. Following the exchange of vows, Sean delivered a few heartfelt words. Melissa spoke as well and even allowed Kendra to say a few words, her face beaming with joy. After the formalities were completed, Sean and Melissa sat at their table and began their meal. Eleanor had been waiting for this moment. She hadn't touched a thing on the table and hadn't even sipped a drop of water. She patiently awaited Melissa's approach for a toast. Finally, it was time for Sean and Melissa to go table to table for toasts. Kendra followed suit. After their first table, they moved to the second, where Sean approached Adrian's side enthusiastically and addressed him warmly. Nephew, you must join me for a drink today. Adrian offered a subtle smile, his intentions unclear. I think you should have a few more drinks, uncle. Of course I'll have a few more. I'm overjoyed today, Sean exclaimed. He then fixed his gaze on Eleanor. My niece is truly stunning. Adrian is a lucky man. Melissa raised her glass and said to Eleanor, I'm quite surprised that you've come to my wedding. Nevertheless, since you're here, I'll take good care of you. Eleanor regarded her with a mocking smile. I came because I have something I must personally give to you. Oh, what is it? Melissa's smile wavered, her fear of Eleanor souring her mood. Eleanor produced an envelope from her bag and handed it to Melissa. Open it and see for yourself. I'm confident we'll meet again very soon. Adrian saw her retrieve the envelope and leaned closer to Sean, speaking softly. I came here to tell you, since you've married this woman, we are now enemies. Don't blame your nephew for showing no mercy. Sean's smile turned instantly unpleasant. At that moment, Melissa tore open the envelope that Eleanor had given her, revealing a court document and a copy of Eleanor's mother's ownership rights. A glance made Melissa's face blanch, and the fear in her eyes was unmistakable. Eleanor sneered. I look forward to our next meeting. With those words, she turned to Adrian and said, let's go, I don't want to spend another second here. Adrian smiled warmly. All right, let's get some fresh air outside. The newlyweds' faces turned grim, and at a nearby table, Noel turned to watch as Adrian and Eleanor walked hand in hand out of the venue. Jealousy shone in her eyes. Once they were outside the venue, Eleanor let out a sigh of relief. Adrian checked the time and suggested, I've made a reservation at a restaurant. Let's go and eat. Okay, Eleanor agreed, smiling. Seeing Melissa's reaction earlier had brought her immense satisfaction. Back in the auditorium, Melissa clung to Sean's arm, rushing through the remaining toasts. She pulled him into a backstage lounge and showed him the documents Eleanor had given her. I'm furious. This document? Where did she dig it up? Melissa's anger was palpable. Sean's expression soured. He hadn't anticipated such a development on his wedding day. To make matters worse, marrying Melissa had put him on a collision course with Adrian. Don't worry. Let's see what they can do. We'll wait and see. Sean tried to console Melissa. She was now his wife. 
Melissa bit her lip, her anger still trembling within her. If Eleanor manages to regain her mother's shares, won't it throw the company into chaos? We won't let her take them back. Even if she obtains the shares, we'll only grant her the status of a shareholder. We can't let her take control of the shares, Sean reassured her. Yes, I recall that in the shareholder agreement, it stipulates that shares cannot be transferred within 10 years, Melissa recalled. If Eleanor wants her mother's shares, we'll force her to become one of the shareholders of our company. Even so, Melissa's good mood had been thoroughly ruined. She seethed with anger. Meanwhile, in another restaurant, Eleanor faced a table full of her favorite dishes, but her appetite remained weak. Observing this, Adrian sat beside her, picked up a bowl of soup, and suggested, Let me feed you. Eleanor had a small appetite to begin with, and Adrian's offer took her by surprise, causing her cheeks to turn slightly red. She shook her head. No. If you don't want to eat, at least have some soup. Don't let your thoughts consume you. You can't resolve everything by overthinking. Your health is important. Adrian said gently, offering her a spoonful of soup. Eleanor, though not a child, conceded, Fine, I'll eat. She reached out to take the bowl, but Adrian pulled it away. I will feed you. I'm not a child, Eleanor protested. Adrian was resolute. It's my right. You can't take it away. Eleanor saw that he was serious and gave him an exasperated look. She allowed him to feed her one spoonful at a time. The meal was a romantic Eleanor headed home with Adrian. It was best to spend the weekend with her children and family. Summer and Flynn's task for the day was to clean and organize the toys. Out on the lawn, there was a long table filled with toys that the two of them had cleaned. Eleanor and Adrian returned home and smiled when they saw this scene, but it was certainly praiseworthy. Henry and his wife didn't interfere. Adrian went to discuss company matters with his father, and Eleanor came out to help them pack away the toys. Eleanor was looking forward to Melissa's upcoming court appearance in a few days, hoping that the law would help her regain her shares. After Gary's identity was revealed, his life remained undisturbed as he continued to keep a low profile. Gary didn't personally meet the artists under his company, even though all the artists, especially the male ones, were eager to meet this big boss. However, ever since Valerie's incident on the red carpet show, all the artists knew that someone had already taken the top spot and was closer to this big boss than they were, especially Valerie's two mortal enemies. They were so frustrated and jealous. They never expected that the person who had saved Valerie on the red carpet was their boss. He was handsome and wealthy. While others believed that Valerie had climbed to the top, they didn't know that she was stuck at home and hadn't even seen Gary. Valerie had been home for five days. Her father didn't say much to her, and her sister, Kesha, had flown abroad. Only her mother kept her company, and she only contacted Gary by phone. But Valerie could tolerate maintaining the relationship this way, whereas the man couldn't. Even though Valerie was more agreeable on the phone and tried to make him happy, it still wasn't enough. Today marked the last day of the weekend. Valerie woke up early in the morning and went to the supermarket with her mother to buy groceries. Valerie enjoyed this time with her family. In the past, her busy filming schedule left her with little time to spend with her family. Now, with her mother, she felt like she was back to the days when she used to be at home. Mom, I want to get some shrimp. Valerie pointed at the fresh shrimp and said, All right, let's get some. Her mother smiled. Mom, I think we should also get this and this. Valerie rambled on like an excited child. Kid, you're buying so much, can you finish it? Lily said with a loving smile. She had two daughters. One was always busy with her career and the other was constantly filming. It was a rare opportunity for her to enjoy family time with her daughter, so she indulged her. Just then, Valerie's phone rang. She picked it up and her heart skipped a beat. It was Gary calling. Mom, let me take this call, Valerie said and hurried to a quieter area behind a row of snack shelves to answer. Hello, she answered. Let's meet this afternoon, Gary suggested. 
No, I can't leave right now. Valerie hesitated. Her father was at home, and she was a bit apprehensive about going out. Then I'll come to your place, he suggested. Even more so, Valerie whispered. You have two options. You come to see me, or I come to see you, Gary threatened playfully. I said I won't see you, Valerie retorted. In that case, as your boss, I order you to appear in front of me today. Otherwise, I'll come and hide you, Gary playfully threatened. If someone else with his status had said this to Valerie, she would have been worried, but she knew he couldn't do anything to her. You love hiding so much. Worst case scenario, I'll quit acting, Valerie said defiantly. Sharp tongue, but you know I can't do anything to you, right? Gary seemed to be quite relaxed, with time to tease her. My mom and I are shopping right now. I'll let you know when we get back, Valerie said, wanting to end the call. Don't hang up. Let me ask you something. Why don't you want to see me? Is your family stopping you from seeing me? Gary suddenly asked. Valerie's heart raced. How had he guessed? No, Valerie tried to deny it. Annie has told me everything. Your father doesn't like people from the entertainment industry. So, when he saw the rumors about us, he grounded you at home and didn't allow you to go out, right? Gary asked. Annie has such a big mouth, Valerie complained with a bitter smile. She's one of my employees. Do you think she'd dare to hide anything from me? Gary chuckled. Valerie was at a loss for words. Now that you know, I won't hide it from you. But don't look for me for now. Do you think running away is the solution? Your father just doesn't know me and he doesn't understand this industry. I'm a legitimate businessman, Gary scolded. My father has been against me ever since I started acting. We've clashed for years. His misunderstanding of the entertainment industry runs deep. I doubt he can change his mind so quickly, Valerie said, feeling helpless. If your father opposes us being together, will you choose not to see me? Gary asked. Valerie blinked. Then she hesitated. Even if my dad didn't object, we don't know each other that well. Are you daring to say we're not dating? We've already seen through each other, yet you dare to deny that we're dating? Gary's words made Valerie's face turn beet red. She quickly glanced around as if he had said something embarrassing loud enough for everyone to hear. You lower your voice, Valerie whispered. Take a break in the afternoon. We'll talk when we meet. Gary sighed. My dad is at home. Valerie was already tired. Then I'll pay him a visit. Gary shrugged on the other end. Forget it, I'll come out and see you. Where should we meet? Valerie ultimately chose to meet in person. At the coffee shop near your house, Gary said. All right, that's settled. See you later. Valerie saw her mother approaching and hung up the phone. Valerie and Lily returned home. Brandon was reading the newspaper, looking stern. Valerie walked up to him and said in a pleading tone, Dad, I have something to do this afternoon and need to go out. Make sure you're back by six in the evening. And no work, you're grounded at home for now, Brandon said, having noticed that she had been bored at home for the past few days. Thank you, Dad. I promise to come back early, Valerie agreed. Also, don't go see that man. Stay away from him. Brandon ordered. Dad, why do you have such a big problem with him? Valerie asked tentatively. Business people in this industry are not good people. The chaos in the industry is their fault, Brandon criticized bluntly. Valerie was at a loss for words. She thought Gary was quite clean in comparison because he seemed to have a serious aversion to this kind of thing. I'm just going to visit my friend Eleanor and her child to relax. Valerie didn't admit that she was going to see Gary. Brandon didn't mind her seeing Eleanor. She had visited their house a few times and was a well-educated and sensible girl. He liked her a lot. Valerie left her house and headed straight to the cafe near her apartment. As she sat in her car, an indescribable feeling washed over her as if she were harboring a secret love affair behind her family's back. 
She arrived at the coffee shop, having taken precautions to disguise herself with sunglasses, a mask, and a sun hat. She figured no one would recognize her. Upon entering the cafe, the friendly waitress who held the door open greeted her. Are you Miss Dane? That's me, Valerie replied, thinking, today's a weekend, why is the place so empty? While Valerie was still pondering, the waitress continued, Miss Dane, please follow me. A gentleman is waiting for you. Valerie followed the waitress to the innermost seat by the window, strategically hidden behind a pillar, making it a semi-private spot. She looked at the man sitting there, also wearing sunglasses. The afternoon sun cast a warm glow on him, and the wristwatch on his wrist gleamed faintly. Everything about him seemed to radiate an irresistible charm, drawing anyone who laid eyes on him into a trance. Even the waitress couldn't help but steal a glance, her face turning red. Valerie, too, found herself momentarily captivated, her heart fluttering. Gary's lips curved into a charming smile. He slowly removed his sunglasses, revealing a pair of dark, enchanting eyes, like the night sky itself. The infatuated waitress stood by, lost in thought. Valerie sensed the waitress's admiration for Gary and politely ordered, I'll have a cappuccino, please. She was particularly fond of the coffee at this place. Usually, Sandra would pick up a cup for her when she had some free time. After the waitress left, Valerie removed her mask and set aside her hat. Finally, she took off her sunglasses, revealing her natural beauty. With her oval face and slightly tousled long hair cascading to one side, she exuded an effortless allure. Gary's heart raced. Over the past couple of days, unable to see her, he had replayed her movies over and over again, no matter how trivial. However, the more he watched, the more agitated he became. He grew annoyed watching her interact with other men, even in her movie scenes. When he saw her cry for another man, he felt a pang of jealousy. Have you ever considered quitting acting and being a homemaker? Gary suddenly asked. Valerie was taken aback for a moment before comprehending his question. She pointed at herself, asking, Are you talking about me? Gary looked at her seriously. Since your family disapproves of your acting and wants you to get married, why not marry me? Valerie's large eyes widened as she glanced around. Is this appropriate? There's nobody in the cafe today. A certain man was rendered speechless. Of all times to bring up such an important topic, couldn't she be a bit more serious? I reserved this place, he replied somewhat perturbed. Valerie responded immediately, turning her gaze back to him. What did you say? Gary furrowed his brows and seemed quite irritated. Valerie, did you not pay attention to what I just said? Can you not overthink it? Valerie looked at him, feeling wronged. Of course, she heard what he said, but she didn't think it was feasible. Firstly, she loved acting. Secondly, her father wasn't forcing her into marriage. Thirdly, she hadn't even considered marrying him. If you want to marry me, you'll need to win over my father first. My dad is very wary of people in the entertainment industry. He believes that as a bigwig in the entertainment world, your private life must be a mess, Valerie pointed out the main issue. Gary's handsome face tensed. If Valerie's father held such views, then pursuing her would be a rocky path. Would you marry me once I convince your father? Gary asked, biting his lip as he locked eyes with Valerie. Valerie took a sip of her coffee, nearly choking on it as she heard his words. She quickly covered her mouth with her hand, maintaining her composure. Gary leaned closer, his gaze ensnaring Valerie like a finely woven web. With a determined kiss, he spoke softly. All right, the day your father accepts me is the day you agree to marry me. Valerie was momentarily stunned as she stared at him. I just wanted you to deal with my father first. Gary noticed she was still trying to evade the issue. He let out a soft snort. He didn't care, it was a deal. Valerie found it amusing. She wanted to see how Gary would handle her stubborn father. If he succeeded, it meant he was truly determined. Then, 
she'd happily marry him. All right, it's a deal then. You convince my father and I'll marry you. Valerie felt it was a fair trade. Being the lady of the Mirage group seemed to offer a brighter future than acting. A satisfied smile graced Gary's face. All right, it's settled. What's your preference? I want to order a drink, Valerie said as she sipped his coffee. After a taste, she decided it was too bitter. Let's go. Let's take a drive, Gary suggested, eager to leave the cafe. Coincidentally, Valerie also wanted to relax. She had been bored at home for too many days, and she was on the brink of madness. After settling the bill, Valerie signed autographs for all the waitstaff present, and they praised her as kind and adorable, which was true. As they got into Gary's car, Valerie glanced at her wristwatch and said to him, My dad insisted that I be back by six. It's only 4.30 now, so we have some time. Your dad seems quite strict with family values, Gary commented Her father had always been strict with her, and now Gary was getting to understand the situation. My dad has been controlling me since I was young, Valerie complained helplessly. Tell me more about your father. I'll figure out how to make him believe in me, and then you'll be mine, Gary said. Valerie was bored, so she began to recount her experiences growing up. She went into great detail, and Gary listened attentively. Valerie didn't know why, but she found herself sharing everything with him. She continued talking as they drove to the seaside. Gary's car reached an uninhabited mountain near the shore. From there, they had a breathtaking view of the vast ocean, which was incredibly soothing. Gary got out of the car, and Valerie followed. Suddenly, she felt someone embrace her from behind. Valerie stiffened as a cold and captivating aura enveloped her, causing her cheeks to flush. Do you want me to win over your father? Do you want to marry me? Gary's voice, low and husky, echoed in Valerie's ears. Valerie felt a tickle in her heart. She tried to deflect by saying something she didn't mean. I don't want to. If you don't want to, then why did you talk about your father so much along the way? To prove that you want to? Gary's perception was unexpectedly keen. Valerie had been talking to help him understand her father better, but now she felt like she was being thrown off balance by his words. Annoyed, she turned around to face him and said, Fine, I won't say anything more. Gary raised his arms and enveloped her in a hug. He kissed her hair and murmured, Is it that difficult to admit that you like me? Valerie was taken aback. In his embrace, she suddenly fell silent. The mountains around them and the vast sea ahead made it feel like they were the only two people in the world. She tentatively wrapped her arms around his waist, looking up at him curiously. There are so many artists in your company, all talented and attractive. What is it about me that you like? Gary narrowed his eyes in thought for a moment and then replied, I don't know. What do you mean? Valerie was puzzled. I mean, I like everything about you. I can't pinpoint just one thing, Gary explained. Valerie's heart warmed and she nestled into his embrace. She listened to the sounds of the sea and the rhythm of his heartbeat. In that moment, she wished time would stand still. Gary, I like you, Valerie confessed with a hint of melancholy. Gary lowered his head, looking into her eyes. You don't even know how to confess properly. Valerie smiled. I'm just emotionally challenged. If you can't stand my clumsiness, you'll have to love me anyway. Gary's large hand gently cupped her cheek, causing her to tilt her face upward. He wore a faint smile as he said, I like your clumsiness. Was there anything more tempting than hearing those words? Probably not. Valerie's expression became resolute as she said, All right, I'll help you win my father over. Why? Gary didn't understand. Because I want your villa. I want to live there, Valerie proudly declared. My people are also eagerly waiting for you to move in. Gary's husky and warm voice reached her ears. Valerie swallowed nervously. 
Gazing at his handsome face so close to hers, she boldly wrapped her arms around his neck and said, I want to kiss you. Gary chuckled softly and sealed her words with a kiss. Before six o'clock, Valerie returned home and avoided upsetting her father. At Sean's villa, Melissa, who had recently gotten married, found no joy in her marriage. The thought that Eleanor was confident enough to reclaim her mother's shares weighed heavily on her mind. In the end, she had underestimated her opponent. Eleanor had discovered a hidden move left by George, ensuring that even in death, he wouldn't let her rest in peace. She still held the court summons in her hand. If she refused to attend, she would be compelled to do so at the appointed time. The worst case scenario would be Eleanor regaining control of the company's shares. As she left the courthouse, Melissa coincidentally encountered a group of reporters who had heard the news and sought her out. Being one to enjoy the limelight, Melissa reached out to Eleanor in front of the reporters and declared, Eleanor, I welcome you to join my company. Together, we'll shape the future of the Greenwich Group. Melissa extended her hand, but Eleanor simply glanced at it and walked past her without hesitation. Melissa awkwardly withdrew her hand. At that moment, a reporter approached Eleanor, blocking her path and inquired, Miss Greenwich, do you have any comments? What are your thoughts on regaining control of Greenwich Group's shares? Eleanor faced the reporter with unwavering confidence and replied, The shares belong to me, and no one can take them away. Her simple statement left the reporter momentarily dumbfounded. With that, Eleanor walked away, leaving Melissa to watch her back with a touch of bitterness. Inside, Melissa couldn't help but sneer. It was only a matter of time. Eleanor might have won this round, but she was determined to fight back and reclaim everything Eleanor held. Eleanor sat in the back seat with Adrian beside her. He hadn't attended the trial due to his sensitive identity. He had overheard what she said to the reporters and felt a surge of pride. His woman was so confident. Eleanor heaved a sigh of relief. She knew that the battle with Melissa had only just begun. Three days later, a shareholder meeting at the Greenwich Group kicked off at 10 a.m. At 9.30 a.m., a sleek million-dollar car pulled up at the entrance of the Greenwich Group building. The security guard was about to open the door when the bodyguard in the driver's seat intervened, reaching out to open the back seat door instead. A pair of graceful legs emerged, and a young woman dressed in a dark gray suit came into view. Inside the Greenwich Group, Rumors were already circulating that the once young heiress of the Greenwich Group was set to become one of the company's shareholders. During the few months that Melissa had been in charge of the company, she initiated major restructuring efforts and let go of many longtime employees. She had injected fresh talent into the organization, most of whom she had recruited from elsewhere. Many employees had never laid eyes on Eleanor before. At this moment, Eleanor was escorted by two bodyguards into the company's main lobby. The employees were all momentarily taken aback, their eyes fixed on the poised young woman exuding an air of icy confidence. They couldn't help but marvel. She certainly knew how to transform. The young lady of the Greenwich Group not only possessed an impeccable demeanor, but also radiated an air of cool authority. And she was undeniably stunning. Today marked Eleanor's debut at the Greenwich Group meeting, and she was well aware that Melissa would try to meddle with her acquisition of the company shares. As expected, Melissa had laid down stringent rules for the shareholders. Eleanor's shares were not to be transferred to anyone else's control, only she had the authority to make decisions regarding them. No one else, except Eleanor herself, was permitted to interfere with the company's decisions. Any such interference would lead to the immediate revocation of all shares held in Eleanor's name. This was a precautionary measure against Adrian. Eleanor was an unfamiliar face in the corporate world, and Melissa was certain of this. Thus, based on her entry into the company, she had no qualms about making these rules official. As the highest-ranking executive, 
Melissa only needed to sign these rules and regulations to put them into immediate effect. In the spacious conference room, Melissa donned a business suit and occupied the head seat. Beside her sat Kendra, and there were 10 other Greenwich Group shareholders gathered around. Eleanor was positioned next to Kendra and held the second largest shareholding in the company. Eleanor's appearance had rattled Kendra as her expression turned sour. Melissa, on the other hand, maintained a composed demeanor as she greeted her. Eleanor, welcome. Please take a seat. Today, I mainly wanted to introduce you to everyone so we can become better acquainted. Hello, everyone. I'm Eleanor. My father, George, was a former member of the Greenwich Group, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with me. Moving forward, we'll be managing this company together, shaping its future. Eleanor stood up, her voice clear and strong. The force in her voice was palpable, and no one dared underestimate her youthful age and current position. Melissa's expression stiffened slightly, but she was the first to applaud. Well said, Eleanor is the second largest shareholder of our company. We'll need her insights for many decisions in the future. I believe she'll be a valuable partner. Melissa, I'd like to request an active role within the company beyond just being a shareholder. Eleanor addressed Melissa directly. Melissa had expected this request and responded with a smile, though there was a hint of sarcasm in her tone. Eleanor, if you're not proficient in the company's operations, what management role can you play? I assume your expertise lies in the world of pianos. With that comment, there was a touch of mockery in her voice. Eleanor stood her ground and replied, It's precisely because I lack understanding of the company that I need to immerse myself in its operations. I've invested 30% of my shares in this company, and if I don't actively participate in its management, I'll feel uneasy. Melissa's expression shifted and her composure wavered. She had to use a somewhat forceful tone to respond, Eleanor, I cannot agree to this. A corporation isn't a playground. If you have free time, you can explore other interests. It's not a place for you to simply disappear. Eleanor smirked. As a shareholder, I should have the right to engage in management. What if I need to intervene in critical decisions? You? Melissa was growing visibly frustrated. The other shareholders were taken aback, not expecting Eleanor to openly challenge Melissa in this manner. Kendra, too, was seething with anger. Eleanor, don't push your luck. Don't overstep your boundaries. This is my request, and I want at least a position equivalent to a general manager, Eleanor declared calmly. She was determined not to let Melissa have full control over the company. Melissa shot her an unfriendly look and responded, this matter will be subject to the decision of the shareholders. I won't decide it on my own. No need, I have the final say. Eleanor glanced at the shareholders present, realizing that most of them were likely aligned with Melissa. Next Monday, I will request Melissa to arrange a position for me. If there's no room, I'll personally dismiss a management level employee to make space for myself, Eleanor announced before standing up and addressing all the shareholders, I have some matters to attend to, so I'll take my leave. Melissa angrily watched her depart. She hadn't anticipated that Eleanor would be so assertive. This was an entirely different person from the Eleanor she once knew. Eleanor returned to her car, accompanied by her bodyguards. Resentment flashed in her eyes. She was determined to make Melissa's life difficult in the future. In her office, Melissa was livid as she walked in. She approached her desk and slammed her hand down on it. Eleanor is utterly ruthless. She dared to defy me the moment she arrived. Mom, what should we do? Are we going to let her run rampant? Kendra seethed, her teeth clenched. She was furious with Eleanor for not showing any respect to her mother and herself. I understand Eleanor's true intentions very well. She wants to take over my company. Melissa clenched her fists, her determination unwavering. I need to quickly transfer my assets and make the company suffer losses. I want Eleanor's shares to evaporate into thin air. Meanwhile, Eleanor's car was heading toward Adrian's company. She finally arrived at his office. Adrian had just concluded a meeting and hurried over to her, concern etched on his face as he gripped her shoulder. 
He examined her expression and asked, Did she give you a hard time? Eleanor forced a smile. You underestimate me. I wasn't the least bit intimidated. I told Melissa that I wanted to take on a management role, and she rejected me. In truth, I'd rather you didn't do this. It's too risky for you. Adrian frowned, genuinely concerned. He couldn't bear the thought of Eleanor working in the Greenwich Group under such circumstances. I'm willing to take the risk. I'll do anything to regain my father's company, Eleanor stated resolutely. Her primary goal was to uncover the truth behind her father's death, was and she Eleanor's knew quest for revenge against those who had wronged her father. He understood that only when Melissa admitted her guilt would she find closure. Otherwise, this wound would linger, preventing her from reclaiming her former happiness. He genuinely hoped that Eleanor could find a path like the one they had recently encountered, leading a peaceful and carefree life with her son, free from worries and pain. However, he knew it would take time. The individuals who had caused her harm needed to take responsibility. If she sought vengeance on her terms, he would support her wholeheartedly, doing everything in his power to help her achieve her goals. All right, I'll arrange for you a top assistant and bodyguard. I'll ensure your protection, and I'll be your unwavering support. No matter what comes our way, I'll face it alongside you, Adrian declared, locking eyes with her. Eleanor felt a surge of warmth in her heart. He had been steadfast in his support from the beginning, standing by her side through thick and thin. Adrian, when I regain control of the company, I want to marry you. Will you wait for me? Eleanor asked, her tone resolute. Wait? Of course I will. I'll wait for you for as long as it takes, Adrian replied in a low, heartfelt voice. Eleanor didn't want him to wait forever, but she was determined to recover her father's company and give him the rest of her life. Adrian gently pulled her into his arms, planting a tender kiss on her forehead. I'll be waiting for the day you wear that wedding dress and become my wife. Yes, I hope that day arrives soon. Eleanor leaned against his chest, a peaceful smile on her lips. Meanwhile, at the Dane residence, Valerie was growing concerned about how to mend her relationship with her father and make him accept Gary. Given her understanding of him, she knew it would be a challenging task. Currently, Valerie avoided mentioning anything related to the entertainment industry in front of her father. Broaching the topic only seemed to disgust him, as if the entertainment world was tainted. He wanted nothing to do with it. In recent days, Valerie has been striving to mend her relationship with her father. She woke up early, went to bed early, and spent mornings with him, engaging in activities like bird watching, gardening, and leisurely walks. She appeared to be a well-behaved daughter. After several days of consistent effort, Brandon's opinion of her had indeed improved. He no longer wore a stoic mask when looking at her, and his eyes held a hint of paternal affection. As long as the conversation didn't veer toward her work or the entertainment industry, Brandon seemed to genuinely enjoy her company. He recognized her as his daughter. See, our daughter has been so obedient lately, Lily chimed in, trying to bolster Valerie's image. It'd be nice if she were always this well-behaved. I suspect it's just an act. Brandon remained cautious. Valerie approached them, looking somewhat forlorn. Dad, what would you like me to do? I've stopped working and I'm spending time at home with you. Don't you think I'm useless? Don't worry, I've applied for a civil service exam for you. Give it a try. Once you pass, I'll use my connections to secure a suitable position for you, Brandon revealed. Valerie's eyes widened in surprise and she quickly shook her head. I won't pass the exam and I'm afraid I'll bring shame to you. Brandon shot her an irritated glance. I don't believe you're so incapable. Dad, I really can't do it. I can't handle crowded places. I'd be a disturbance, Valerie tried to explain. Brandon remained skeptical. He huffed. I don't believe that you're so famous that you'd create a scene. Dad, do you truly doubt me? All right, 
I'll go shopping with you and mom later. I'll prove to you just how recognized I am, Valerie said with a smile. You're just joking, Lily added with a laugh. Dad, mom, I'll buy both of you some new clothes. Valerie chuckled. That sounds good. I need some new clothes too. Your dad has nothing decent to wear, Lily quipped, joining in the excitement. Brandon rarely had the time to go shopping, and even his clothes were selected for him by Lily. With a newfound free schedule, he agreed, Let's go. It's been a while since I accompanied you two for shopping. With that, Valerie and her parents headed to the mall, Brandon expressing his disapproval of her attire. Take off that mask. What are you hiding from? Do you think you're so unsightly that you can't show your face? Brandon grumbled. Reluctantly, Valerie removed her mask. She had only applied a thin layer of sunscreen that day, but her facial features were attractive and well-defined. She was easily recognizable. Valerie couldn't help but feel uneasy. Upon reaching the mall's entrance, Valerie led her mother out of the car. Brandon walked ahead while Valerie concealed her face behind her long hair. She had a feeling that she was being scrutinized by a young passerby. As they entered the mall, Valerie kept her gaze low, avoiding eye contact. However, she accidentally bumped into a few young girls. Startled, she looked up, and the girls in front of her gasped in surprise. I'm not Valerie. You must be mistaken, Valerie quickly reached to hide her face. She didn't want to be recognized. You are Valerie. You are Valerie. Oh my God, my idol. The girls exclaimed excitedly, their voices rising. Their voices attracted the attention of onlookers who had been watching a performance nearby. Suddenly, hundreds of pairs of eyes were trained on them. Valerie stood among the crowd, dressed in casual attire, but her celebrity aura was unmistakable. Valerie had a sinking feeling. Brandon and Lily were surprised that their daughter had been recognized. In an instant, a crowd of curious onlookers rushed over, and Valerie found herself engulfed by them. Even without bodyguards or assistance, Valerie was now the center of attention, caught in the whirlwind of her celebrity status. Valerie, it is Valerie. Oh my God, she's so beautiful, people mused. Valerie was surrounded by an enthusiastic crowd of fans and Brandon and Lily were pushed to the side. Brandon grew anxious, worried about his daughter's safety. Valerie, meanwhile, felt overwhelmed as countless smartphones were thrust in her direction. Everyone wanted a close-up photo of their idol. The air grew suffocating and she felt extremely uncomfortable. Valerie, Lily called out anxiously from outside the crowd. Brandon tried to push through and rescue his daughter, but a group of excited fans, including one particularly fervent girl, pushed their way in, making it difficult for him to reach Valerie. The power of a celebrity fandom was formidable. Valerie found herself trapped, her head spinning. A multitude of smartphones blocked her view, and the eager crowd showed no signs of relenting. She knew she had to escape this situation. Valerie stood helpless amidst the crowd, feeling watched by those surrounding her. She couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that some of these fans had intentions beyond just taking photos. Valerie even sensed someone attempting to touch her arm and waist. Such encounters made her uncomfortable, especially when they involved male fans. Excuse me, please make way. I need to get through. Valerie maintained a polite demeanor attempting to extricate herself from the crowd. Breathing became increasingly difficult for Valerie, exacerbated by her claustrophobia. The sheer number of people rushing toward her in the enclosed space intensified her distress. As she was caught in the middle of the throng, the situation grew more precarious. Brandon and Lily remained on the sidelines, unable to push through the enthusiastic fans. They were not as agile as the younger attendees. Lily was on the verge of tears, urging Brandon to take action. Hurry, save her, she's surrounded. Brandon knew firsthand the formidable force of a celebrity fandom. He had never fully comprehended its power until now when it affected his daughter. The risk of a stampede or other dangers weighed heavily on his mind. 
Amid the commotion, a few fans who had just arrived rushed toward Valerie upon hearing the news that she was there. In their fervor to approach their idol, they inadvertently pushed forward, triggering a chain reaction. Several girls in the front row were pushed together like dominoes, and they inadvertently pressed against one another. In the chaos, the fans closest to Valerie, who were trying to shield their idol, lacked the strength to protect her. Instead, the collective force of the crowd pushed her down. Valerie was helplessly pinned to the ground by a group of female fans. While onlookers reacted in shock, no one noticed that Valerie's head struck the floor with a loud thud. Seeing the commotion, Brandon urgently pushed aside the frantic fans and reached Valerie. Lily was overcome with fear as she watched Valerie collapse amid the crowd, with a few fans struggling to rise. Valerie lay unconscious, her eyes tightly shut, blood seeping from a noticeable wound on the back of her head. Valerie. Lily was on the verge of tears. Brandon swiftly gathered his daughter into his arms. Behind her head, a few drops of blood stood out starkly. Get her to the hospital immediately! Brandon, get her to the hospital! Lily was panic-stricken. Brandon hurriedly carried Valerie to the parking lot. Lily and Valerie sat in the back seat, and he drove to the nearest hospital in haste. The incident had already been captured and shared on the internet. At the Mirage Group office, Gary was in the midst of a call with several foreign directors when his assistant, Walden, burst into the room without knocking. Walden held an iPad and anxiously informed Gary, Boss, you need to see this. Miss Valerie is in trouble. Gary promptly took the iPad from him and viewed the circulating video. It showed Valerie being crushed by a crowd of fans. Although she managed to maintain a smile, it was evident she was struggling to breathe, her face growing pale as she fought to stay composed. Where is this footage from? Gary inquired urgently, standing up as his handsome face twisted with concern. Walden responded, It's from the mall's entrance. Gary immediately sprang into action, rushing out of the office. His assistant was bewildered by how profoundly a celebrity could impact people. Valerie had been trapped in a perilous situation without any bodyguards or assistance. Walden placed a call, urgently verifying the location. Are you certain? After hanging up, Walden shared the information with Gary. Miss Valerie was pushed down by the crowd and she sustained a head injury. She's been transported to the hospital and now a large group of fans is flocking to visit her. Gary rapidly exited the building. His handsome face was etched with worry, anxiety, and fear as he gazed at Walden. Summon all my bodyguards to the hospital. Do not allow those fans to approach Valerie. Within moments, Gary's car had traveled a hundred meters and was speeding toward the hospital. At the hospital, Valerie remained unconscious. A doctor had bandaged her head, and though the wound was not large, it was undoubtedly serious. Valerie had fainted, and they needed to assess for potential concussions or complications. Her parents, Brandon and Lily, waited anxiously outside the room. I warned you before that our daughter couldn't go shopping. She was wearing a mask as a precaution, and you insisted on making her remove it. Look at the situation now, Lily exclaimed, frustration lacing her words. I never expected her to be this famous. I thought she was just a minor actress working on some TV dramas, Brandon lamented, his remorse evident. But it was too late for regrets. Fear had already taken hold. At that moment, a nurse approached hurriedly. This isn't good. There are many fans in the hospital with flowers, waiting to see Valerie. My daughter is unconscious. What do they want? Brandon exclaimed angrily, his face filled with anxiety. The young nurse was momentarily taken aback, unable to respond. Gary and his bodyguards arrived almost simultaneously. Eight bodyguards in black suits disembarked from two black SUVs. Towering and robust, they followed Gary as he strode into the hospital. A group of fans in the lobby clutched bouquets, eagerly awaiting information about Valerie's ward. They were prepared to take flowers and visit her. Upon witnessing a tall and imposing figure enter the hospital with a cadre of bodyguards, the fans were stunned. 
Recognizing the man, they collectively drew in a sharp breath. Gary Stewart, the rumored boyfriend of Valerie Dane and the CEO of the Mirage Group, with a had a wry expression, seeking out the nurse who had been tight-lipped earlier. He inquired, Which ward is Valerie in? The nurse, who had previously refrained from divulging information to avoid escalating the situation, felt a newfound sense of respect emanating from the man and approached him directly. Valerie is in room 406. The fans overheard this information but remained rooted in place. As Gary ascended the stairs, his bodyguards trailed behind him, effectively deterring any fans from attempting to approach. The incident involving Valerie rapidly spread across the internet. However, the videos were swiftly removed and private messaging platforms prohibited users from sharing any related content. Valerie had just regained consciousness. Her long hair was slightly disheveled and tied behind her head. A few loose strands framed her fair and delicate face, accentuating her vulnerability. Valerie, there is not a significant issue. The doctor said it was just a minor head injury, Lily reassured her daughter. Brandon wanted to offer comfort as well, but found himself at a loss for words. He understood that he couldn't escape responsibility in this matter. Valerie, however, looked up at her father and smiled. Dad, I'm okay. At that moment, the ward's door unexpectedly swung open from the outside. Valerie was startled, fearing that more fans had arrived. To her surprise, a tall and familiar figure entered. Her initial panic vanished, replaced by a sense of security. He was here, and everything felt secure. Gary's gaze shifted to the girl in the bed, his thoughts hearkening back to the distressing video he had seen. He needed immediate assurance of her well-being. Lily, in the process of pouring water for Valerie, retreated to allow the two some privacy. Gary called out softly, Babe, are you all right? He then seated himself on the edge of the bed, and before Valerie could react, he had already pulled her into his embrace. Gently inspecting her, he detected no serious injuries. Valerie leaned into his embrace, half her body nestled against his. She suddenly remembered something and flushed with embarrassment. I'm fine! Gary's large hand caressed her forehead as he assessed her temperature. Valerie gave him a meaningful look. Behind him, a throat was cleared impatiently. Gary realized the presence of others and turned around to find a couple standing there. He stood up and greeted them courteously. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Dane. You're here. Valerie was frightened, Lily said, her eyes filled with warmth as she regarded Gary. I arrived a bit late, Gary reproached himself. He resolved to ensure Valerie's safety whenever she went out in the future. Brandon, with a stiff expression, examined the young man who stood a head taller than him. In terms of appearance, there was nothing to critique. Observing his genuine concern for his daughter just moments ago, Brandon's unease remained. Dad, his name is Gary. He's the CEO of my company. Valerie introduced him, refraining from designating him as her boyfriend in front of her father. Gary offered a friendly greeting. I'm also Valerie's boyfriend. Lily's expression showed satisfaction, and she nudged her husband. Gary is speaking to you. Speak up. Brandon regarded Gary with an air of scrutiny. However, he found none of the arrogance or superficiality he had expected. Instead, Gary exuded a sense of stability. Dad, don't worry. Gary takes good care of me. With him around, you can rest assured that I'll be well looked after. He's very capable and even knows how to clean and cook. He treats me exceptionally well, Valerie chimed in, praising Gary. Gary couldn't help but smile, pleased with her words. Brandon, surprised by his daughter's praise, nodded in approval. Very well, I'll entrust her to you. We'll take our leave now, Lily, noticing that her daughter appeared lively and well, was content to leave her in Gary's care. Brandon and Lily exited the room and found themselves flanked by the bodyguards in the corridor. Their presence reinforced the understanding that this man possessed substantial wealth. 
With the bodyguards guarding the entrance, the fans on the lower floors couldn't even approach the staircase. Lily couldn't help but reflect. Brandon, take a look. Given Valerie's current fame, a man without any power can't adequately protect her. Brandon silently agreed, the words of his wife resonating with him. Valerie had been released from the hospital. A group of fans stood in the distance, watching her closely. The man accompanying Valerie was not someone to be trifled with. Valerie sustained injuries this time due to the excessive enthusiasm of her fans. Now, many of her supporters blamed themselves, while others became more rational. They adored their idol, the goddess, and decided to admire her from afar, making sure not to cause her any harm. Valerie settled into the car, and Gary extended his arm, gently pulling her into his embrace. Valerie rested her head on his chest and looked up at him, her watery eyes filled with happiness and affection. My recovery this time is truly remarkable. You see, my father won't interfere with my freedom. Valerie couldn't help but express her relief. Gary playfully tapped her forehead. I'd rather earn your father's approval through my actions than see you hurt like this. Valerie blinked mischievously. It would take a lot of effort on your part, but I could resolve it with just one simple gesture. What do you say? Gary wanted to scold her, but he couldn't help but feel content. He chuckled softly. Seems like you're even more eager than I am. Valerie's pretty face blushed for no apparent reason. She pretended to be innocent and said, Why would I be eager? I'm eager to marry you. Gary didn't hold back. He teased her and poked her cheek. Valerie didn't know whether to laugh or pout. I'm not. Gary didn't push the issue. He simply held her tighter. Valerie glanced out of the car window and suddenly exclaimed, This isn't the way to my house. Who said we're going to your house? An injured person shouldn't live alone. Gary's voice trailed off. Are we going to your place then? Valerie blinked. Didn't you want to take over my villa? Even if we're not married yet, that villa belongs to you. Gary pinched her cheek affectionately. A spark of excitement flashed in Valerie's eyes. Really? It's mine. Yes. We'll transfer it to your name tomorrow, Gary replied. Valerie mischievously added, Once it's in my name, if I don't marry you, I won't give it back. Annoyance flickered in Gary's eyes. He held her small face and gazed into her eyes. If you don't marry me, who do you plan to marry? Valerie was momentarily at a loss for words. What if you don't want to marry me? I'll marry you in this lifetime and you can't marry anyone else. His voice carried a tone of possessiveness. Valerie didn't get upset. Instead, she grinned so widely that her teeth were visible. Gary lowered his head and kissed her lips in annoyance. At the same time, he reached out and pulled down the car's privacy screen. Valerie's heart raced. She wasn't the type of person who engaged in public displays of affection. However, the man paid no mind. Her previous words had offended him and he felt the need to properly chastise her. Otherwise, he'd be bothered. He kissed her and Valerie couldn't help but protest, I'm still injured. You can't treat me like this. Gary's heart softened at her words. He simply held her in his arms. That afternoon, Valerie called Eleanor, and after Flynn finished school, they went to visit her at Gary's house. Due to various circumstances, the two friends hadn't seen each other for a while. In the past, their lives were simple and carefree, and they could spend time together at any moment. But now, both of their lives had become entangled with men, and in addition to all the family matters they had to deal with, they cherished their moments together. Aunt Valerie! A young, cheerful voice rang out. Valerie immediately stood up from the sofa, welcoming her godson with joy. Hey there, my baby! Come to your godmother! Valerie called out. Flynn rushed into her arms. Valerie picked him up and couldn't help but exclaim, Wow, my baby has gotten so much heavier! Eleanor entered the room with a smile. The teacher said he's been doing well in school and has a great appetite. As a mother, 
What more could she ask for from her four-year-old son? Good health and a hearty appetite. Auntie, why are you injured? Did someone hurt you? Flynn asked. What if someone did hurt me? Valerie teased him. Then I'll protect you, Flynn said with determination. Eleanor and Valerie burst into laughter. Eleanor hugged her son and looked at Valerie warmly. It seems like good things are on the horizon. Valerie used to reject such comments, but this time she simply smiled, tacitly agreeing. Have Uncle Gary and you had a baby yet? When are you going to have one? Flynn asked again. Valerie smiled and hugged him. When do you want us to have a baby? I want you to have one tonight, Flynn said without hesitation. Valerie's pretty face turned red. She smiled and explained, We can't have a baby tonight. It takes nine months to have a baby. Then let's have one next year. Eleanor joined in. Valerie didn't know whether to laugh or cry as she looked at the mother and son. She led Flynn to the nearby playroom to explore the toys she had prepared for him. The two friends then settled in to chat. Flynn played happily, and Valerie shared the recent events of her life, including the discipline she had been receiving at home. Eleanor also mentioned that her father had left evidence to help her regain control of her mother's shares. Valerie was thrilled for her. Really? That's fantastic. This way, Melissa won't be able to take them away. Now I'm the second largest shareholder of the Greenwich Group and will soon become its manager, Eleanor exclaimed. Eleanor, have you thought about this? You don't have much experience in this area, Valerie asked. You can always learn, and Adrian will send his assistant to help me. We can consult with him on everything. Eleanor shrugged. That's true. With the business genius Adrian by your side, you'll reclaim the Greenwich Group. Valerie cheered her on. There was determination in Eleanor's eyes. Besides regaining control of the company, she also had her sights set on Melissa. She hoped to one day force her to confess the truth about what she had done to harm her father. That woman needed to face the consequences of her actions. With so many people who love you by your side, you'll do great things, Valerie encouraged. That's right. That's the most fortunate thing for me, Eleanor smiled. And after this two-day break, she would be heading to the Greenwich Group to work. Her main concern was her son, of course. When Henry and his wife heard about her plans to return to work, they assured her that they would take care of the child. That afternoon, the two friends chatted and looked forward to the future. Valerie had also decided to rein in her temper. She was willing to make an effort to build a good relationship with Gary, eventually leading to marriage, children, Eleanor and becoming a devoted to reclaim her father's life. company and uncover the truth about her father's death. Once everything was settled, she planned to marry Adrian and spend the rest of her life with him while raising her son. One evening, Adrian and Gary returned from outside, having agreed to come back to Gary's place for dinner. Eleanor was already there with Valerie. They also discussed the ingredients for dinner, setting the stage for a pleasant dinner that night. Meanwhile, Valerie had gone to bed early due to her injuries, and Gary slept beside her, embracing her through the night. After Eleanor returned home from Gary's place, she sent her son to the Miller Mansion. Upon her return, she prepared the materials she needed for work on Monday. She was ready to face the challenges ahead. At 11 p.m., Eleanor packed her materials into her bag. Behind her, Adrian, dressed in black silk pajamas, entered with a glass of milk in hand. Are you finished? He placed the milk down and inquired, arms crossed. Eleanor nodded her gaze inadvertently wandering to the man's partially exposed chest, exuding an alluring physique filled with restrained power. She quickly averted her eyes, wondering what he meant by dressing like this at night. With their son not at home, it seemed he didn't even bother with proper attire. Adrian picked up on her shyness and couldn't resist a sly smile. He leaned on the doorframe, folding his arms, and declared, I'll wait for you to sleep together. With that, he left the room. Go to sleep first, Eleanor called after him. No, I'll wait for you, he insisted. 
Eleanor held the warm glass of milk he had brought and smiled to herself, touched by his thoughtfulness. She tilted her head and realized she might have been too cold toward this man. In her heart, she had already considered him her future husband, and she had no intentions of marrying anyone else. So, maybe she should give some things a try. Every night, she would wake up to the sound of him showering, feeling like she had wronged him. Most of the time, his desire was so strong that he couldn't sleep. But due to her convictions, he had been holding back. What if he fell ill because of it? After careful consideration, Eleanor finished her milk and went upstairs. Adrian seemed determined to share the bed with her tonight. Wherever she slept, he would follow. Returning to her room, Eleanor knew Adrian was waiting for her in the master bedroom. She had kept the habit of wearing conservative pajamas in front of him, but tonight she could surprise him. From the corner of her wardrobe, she retrieved the lace-trimmed nightgown he had bought for her. At the time, she had been determined not to wear it, but now she felt her figure wasn't too bad, and it might not look bad on her. Adrian sat on the bed, engrossed in his reading. The wall lamp had dimmed, leaving only the soft glow of the bedside lamp around him, highlighting his handsome features. His long, thick eyelashes grazed lightly over his eyes, and a shadow from the lamp formed a fan-like shape. His lips pursed, and his perfect chin led to his enticing collarbone. His partially unbuttoned shirt oozed masculine charm from head to toe. Adrian had been studying ways to maintain his health, having given up cold showers after deeming them harmful. While it had helped to some extent, he needed something more to occupy his thoughts and keep his desires at bay. Tonight, that was precisely what he was pondering. He had mastered the art of restraint, but he worried that the more he held back, the more passionate he would be when the time was right. Footsteps approached outside the door, and Adrian closed his book, anticipating Eleanor's arrival. The door creaked open, and in the dimly lit corridor, a graceful figure stepped in. Adrian's eyes widened in disbelief. He thought he was seeing things and blinked several times to confirm his vision. Tonight, Eleanor was wearing a lace nightgown. He swallowed hard. The woman before him had shattered his composure while he was engrossed in his book. What's this? His voice trembled as if a fire raged within him. Eleanor bit her lip, her face flushed. She twisted her hands and asked, Do I not look good in this? Adrian burst into laughter. Of course you do. Did I do something wrong? Where did I go wrong? Why do you ask? Eleanor replied, puzzled. Don't you think I've suffered enough? Are you dressing like this on purpose to torment me? I've been losing sleep every day and taking cold showers for you he said with a mix of amusement and exasperation. Aren't you punishing me? Or maybe you're seducing me? Adrian had come to terms with his desires and had grown accustomed to them. This time he pulled Eleanor into his embrace and chuckled. She giggled and sat on the bed, a mischievous smile playing on her lips. Then think about what you've done wrong. Adrian shifted closer, his arm possessively encircling her shoulders as he pulled her closer. Eleanor wore a lace-trimmed nightgown with only one other thing underneath, leaving nothing to the imagination. He gritted his teeth and whispered into her ear, Don't expect my patience to last much longer. I've reached my limit. Eleanor looked up at him, her eyes sparkling. So, what do you want? What do you think? Adrian asked feeling that she was teasing him. Did she believe he would endure it indefinitely for her? I don't know, Eleanor replied playfully. Do you want me to tell you? Adrian teased back. Sure, Eleanor blinked innocently, like a girl unaware of the implications. Adrian's heartstrings were tugged at her response. He couldn't resist anymore and leaned in to kiss her, finding her surprisingly compliant this time. Though inexperienced, her response filled him with sweetness, and he felt that tonight would be a memorable one. At one in the morning, the sound of running water emanated from the bathroom. Eleanor lay on the bed, her gaze apologetically directed toward the bathroom. She bit her lip, 
blaming herself for not being able to fully embrace this moment. But the pain from five years ago still lingered, and she realized she wasn't quite ready yet. After a while, Adrian emerged from the bathroom with a towel wrapped around him, his handsome face displaying a touch of resentment. Eleanor, in a past life, you must have tortured me to deserve this treatment in this one. One day, you'll be the cause of my downfall, he said, his voice tinged with bitterness. Eleanor had no words in response. A row of three sleek black cars lined up in perfect formation. A group of employees who had entered the company from the side craned their necks, eager to catch a glimpse of the owner of this impressive fleet. Could it possibly belong to Melissa? However, a swift bodyguard swiftly disembarked from the rear car and trailed closely behind. He opened the door of the middle black car, revealing a pair of elegant legs that gracefully emerged, followed by a woman in a sharp gray suit. Her long, ebony hair was elegantly tied back, and her makeup exuded professionalism and sophistication. Her appearance left the onlooking employees awestruck. So she was the heiress of the Greenwich Group. When they heard that she was going to join the management team, they didn't anticipate her showing up again. But for the male employees, having such a young and beautiful female manager was undoubtedly a stroke of good luck. Adrian had dispatched his trusted assistant, Arnold, to accompany Eleanor. Arnold had a specific mission on this visit, carrying a handful of documents and dressed in a sharp suit. He followed Eleanor into the building. At the front desk, the receptionist immediately dialed Melissa's extension. Ma'am, Miss Greenwich is here, she reported. In the main office, Melissa's brow furrowed as she supported her forehead with her hand. Eleanor seemed to have come to make things difficult for her. She bit her lip, knowing that she had to come up with a strategy. She had planned to assign Eleanor a minor role, managing a department in the Human Resources Department. Eleanor arrived at Melissa's office door with Arnold and two bodyguards in tow. Melissa's assistant intercepted her with an apologetic smile. Miss Greenwich, Mrs. Miller is quite occupied at the moment, Eleanor replied with a polite smile. Is that so? No worries then. I can wait for her. I apologize, but she isn't available to meet with guests right now, her assistant insisted. All right, I understand. Please let her know that I'll be taking over the role of general manager of the finance department from now on. With those words, Eleanor turned to leave. One of Melissa's assistants quickly informed her of the situation. Melissa hurriedly opened her office door and chased after Eleanor, her irritation evident as she called out, Eleanor, who gave you the authority to randomly start working in my company? Eleanor gracefully turned to face her. Could it be that as the second largest shareholder of the company, I don't have the power to do so? Even though you're a shareholder, I'm responsible for running the company. You don't have the authority to make such decisions, Melissa retorted, her face flushed with anger. Eleanor's lips curled into a knowing smile. This is something I want to do. If you disagree, then I'll simply take my shares elsewhere. You! Melissa pointed an accusing finger, her anger palpable. Eleanor sighed softly. I will assume this position. With that, she turned and made her way to the elevator. Arnold couldn't help but admire her determination. He recalled the fierce determination with which Eleanor had barged into Adrian's office the first time they met. The Greenwich family heiress was not someone who could be easily pushed around. Eleanor, don't act rashly. If anything goes wrong in the company, you'll be held accountable, Melissa warned from behind. Eleanor glanced back at her. While I may not have experience in managing the company, I'll make sure to handle my responsibilities diligently. Eleanor and Arnold entered the elevator with their bodyguards in tow. Meanwhile, Melissa was left seething with anger. She couldn't shake the feeling that Eleanor had ulterior motives for joining the company and might uncover certain irregularities in the finance department, causing problems with the other shareholders. If Eleanor truly intended to meddle in company affairs, the best department for her to oversee would be the industry department, where she could manage various business projects. 
It was a hectic and challenging role that would keep her occupied for days on end. With a wry smile, Melissa contemplated her options as she returned to her office. Eleanor's sudden intrusion had disrupted her plans, and she needed to come up with a strategy to deal with this new development. At this point, her direct line rang. She answered it with a sigh. Hello? President Melissa, this isn't fair. I've been with the Greenwich Group for over a decade. Is it right to dismiss me like this? The voice on the other end belonged to Sheldon, the general manager of the finance department. Melissa quickly realized that Eleanor had likely framed her for this situation. She tried to placate Sheldon. Don't be upset. This isn't what I intended. Eleanor made this choice herself. I had no say in the matter. But what am I supposed to do now? Are you just going to let me go like this? Sheldon sounded flustered and distressed. You know I've helped you a lot over the years. I've assisted with those accounts and lent you a hand. During her time with George, Melissa had been involved in some shady dealings, and Sheldon was aware of it. His words triggered a surge of guilt in her. She hurriedly reassured him, Don't worry, I'll assign you to a subsidiary company as a vice president, and you can start your new role there immediately. Though Sheldon was momentarily pacified, Melissa couldn't help but think that Eleanor was a formidable adversary. She needed to tread carefully and be prepared for whatever Melissa with Eleanor squared shoulders and a confident stance. She squinted her eyes and retorted, Why should I head over to the industry department? Do you think I can't handle finances? Because if you're responsible for the finances, many shareholders will oppose it. They might see you as inexperienced. Any mistakes could result in the loss of tens or even hundreds of millions, Melissa cautioned. Eleanor feigned disapproval and replied, But I prefer staying in the finance department. Eleanor, don't treat this company as your playground. Remember that your father built it from scratch. You can't take it lightly, Melissa admonished. Eleanor sneered. You're well aware that my father worked tirelessly to establish this company, yet you married Sean and took control. It's audacious of you to lecture me. I can't be a widow forever, can I? As a woman, I need to secure my future. Sean is still Adrian's uncle. Technically, you have to address me as an aunt, Melissa retorted. Eleanor scoffed. Don't be shameless. Melissa's expression soured, but she stood her ground, saying firmly, I won't permit you to be involved in the finance department. If you wish to contribute, go to the business department. Eleanor hesitated briefly, but didn't decline, saying, Fine, you won't chase me away. I'm open to working in any department. Eleanor turned and walked away. Melissa breathed a sigh of relief, content that she had directed Eleanor toward the business department. Outside, Eleanor glanced at Arnold. He promptly followed her. Let's head to the business department, Eleanor said, smirking. Arnold's eyes mirrored her amusement. Looks like Melissa played right into your hands and put you in that department. Eleanor wasn't surprised. However, her true goal was not to join the Greenwich Group's finance department, but to work with Adrian on expanding the company's business and gradually uncovering its internal projects. Eleanor didn't plan to remain with the Greenwich Group indefinitely. She had no interest in increasing her share value. She aimed to covertly dismantle the group's internal projects. She believed that, without Melissa realizing it, she and Adrian could take control of all the group's projects. Although Adrian initially opposed her plans, he would cooperate with her if she was determined. Upon arriving at the business department, Eleanor declared her identity, and an assistant promptly arranged a spacious, well-lit office for her. Arnold became her assistant, and his office was nearby. From now on, all her work would flow through him. Meanwhile, at a five-star hotel, Noel had been observing from afar. Ever since witnessing Adrian and Eleanor's affection at Sean's wedding, her resentment had grown. She hadn't thought of challenging Adrian until now. She had been brainstorming ways to regain Adrian's affection. Even though her past love might not sway him, she needed to find another approach to win his heart. 
Days earlier, she had struck a deal with Sean, which had now escalated into a significant project. She intended to use this project to impress Adrian. After all, he was a shrewd businessman who valued his interests. She believed that this project, if executed correctly, could dent Sean's fortune by a third. With this in mind, she dialed Adrian's number, using the hotel line, and anxiously awaited his response. Seven seconds later, his deep voice answered, Hello? Noel's heart skipped a beat at his magnetic voice. She spoke sweetly. Adrian, it's me, Noel. What do you need? His voice suddenly grew colder. Noel, though disappointed, maintained her cheerful tone. I have great news for you. A few days ago, I discussed a collaborative project with your uncle. It's not for my benefit, I'm doing it for you. I want to partner with you to handle Sean. If we act strategically, he'll incur significant losses. Can we meet and discuss this? She believed such an offer would surely entice him to meet her. Once they met, she could rekindle their old flame. However, Adrian's response was icy. There's no need. You shouldn't meddle in my affairs, let alone get involved. Adrian, you know how much I care for you. I just want a chance to speak with you privately. Can't you grant me that? Noel pleaded. We don't need to meet. You can go back to your country, he replied before hanging up. Noel was wide-eyed, unable to believe he had dismissed her so coldly. Despite her efforts to secure the project for him, he didn't even want to hear about it. Noel cried out in frustration, shaking her phone. She covered her face, overwhelmed with anger. Outside the room, Cole heard her and rushed in, asking, Miss, what's wrong? Noel, still teary-eyed, exclaimed, Adrian, why are you so heartless? Don't you appreciate all I've done for you? What's so special about Eleanor? How can she be worthier than me? I've humbled myself, seeking your forgiveness. Is this how you treat me? You're cruel, so cruel. I despise you, she wailed. Miss, please don't be so distraught. Cole tried to console her. Noel bit her lip and suddenly a determined glint appeared in her eyes. No one can have what I can't. I won't allow Adrian to be with Eleanor or any other woman for the rest of his life. I won't let him be taken away. Miss, what do you want me to do? Cole inquired. Noel clenched her fists, her eyes gleaming with a ruthless resolve. I want Eleanor to suffer for the rest of her life. I want her to lose Adrian forever. Do you want me to deal with Eleanor? Cole asked. No, I want you to handle her. Since Adrian doesn't love me, then he doesn't deserve to live in this world. Noel muttered, wearing a chilling smile. Cole's demeanor remained composed, as if he expected the request. He shared the same sentiment. Considering how much this man had caused Noel to suffer, wouldn't her life be better without him in it? After Noel finished speaking, a mixture of hatred and pain lingered in her eyes. Attacking the man she loved the most was an unbearable choice. Summoning all her strength, she sighed, Adrian, you know I'm not one to bear grudges. I used to, and I still can't bear the thought of another woman spending her life with you. It would be my lifelong torment. Miss, don't fret. I'll carry out your wishes and face any consequences that arise, Cole promised. Noel gazed at him with great anticipation. Good. I have faith in you. You'll succeed. With a nod, Cole exited the room silently, his hands hanging by his sides. Noelle hugged herself, gazing into the distance with a deep-seated hatred in her eyes. In the afternoon, at the entrance of the Greenwich Group's office building, an imposing black sports car awaited. Passersby marveled at the sight. Who could be inside such a luxurious vehicle? The sports car's tinted windows concealed the occupant's identity. Nevertheless, the car alone was enough to leave people in awe. Soon, employees spotted Eleanor emerging from the building, accompanied by an assistant and two bodyguards on her first day at work. A bodyguard opened the passenger door for her, and Eleanor, with her graceful figure, settled into the car. It appeared she was being chauffeured. A group of female employees couldn't help but envy her, 
Seated in the car, Eleanor looked at Adrian, who smiled and asked, How was your first day on the job? Exhausted? Eleanor shook her head, smiling. Thanks to your dedicated assistant handling most things, I had a smooth day. I strongly suggest giving Arnold a raise. A hint of danger flickered in Adrian's eyes. If Arnold were present, he would undoubtedly tremble and plead for Eleanor not to praise him in front of the boss, or he'd meet an unfortunate end. Very well. If you say he deserves it, I'll increase his salary, Adrian responded, his gentle smile restored. You can stay here. Arnold will manage everything. Melissa won't discover us, will she? Eleanor asked. No. I'll make discreet acquisitions to divert Greenwich Group's customers and gradually turn it into an empty shell as long as you don't mind your shares, Adrian promised. Eleanor shook her head. I can't access these shares anyway. Instead of letting Melissa profit using my mother's funds and ultimately benefiting Sean, I'd rather see the Greenwich Group crumble. It'll also help weaken Sean's influence. Adrian reached over, gently stroking her hair. Then I must thank you for staying a while. I was delighted to see Melissa fuming with anger today, Eleanor remarked with a joyful glint in her eyes. Give me half a year at most. I'll handle everything, Adrian assured her, holding her hand as the sports car approached the company's main gate. On your first day, I've arranged a celebratory dinner for you, Adrian said. Just the two of us? Eleanor blinked in surprise. Yes, just us, Adrian replied, a hint of possessiveness in his eyes. Today, Eleanor wore a professional gray suit that exuded an air of competence, further captivating him. Eleanor nodded, thanking him. Adrian's car headed to a high-end restaurant in the city center. A romantic, candlelit dinner was more suitable for two, allowing for an intimate atmosphere. As Eleanor sat down at the reserved table, Adrian handed her a bouquet of fresh roses. These are for you. Eleanor rarely received flowers, and she blushed at the gesture. She accepted them shyly, a sweet smile gracing her lips. Adrian noticed her reaction and inwardly lamented his lack of finesse. He understood that he could move her not with his wealth, looks, or gentleness, but with sincerity. After discussing company matters over a delicious meal, it was already 9.30 p.m. Eleanor missed her son and wanted to return home to chat with him before his bedtime. Adrian readily agreed, understanding the importance of family time. Upon their return to the Miller Mansion, Eleanor inquired about her son's schoolwork. He had no homework but was assigned daily learning tasks. He was smart and self-sufficient. Mommy, are you and Daddy in love? Her son suddenly asked. Eleanor blushed and wondered where her son had heard such things. She replied softly, Who told you that? Auntie told me. Flynn blinked. Eleanor chuckled and responded honestly. Yes, Daddy and I like each other. Will you get married soon? Flynn asked. We still need some time before that happens, Eleanor explained. Can I be the ring bearer at your wedding? Flynn requested. Of course, you'll be our ring bearer when Daddy and Mommy get married, Eleanor affirmed, stroking his little head. She was pleased with her son's understanding and acceptance of the topic. Daddy, her son called out in surprise. Eleanor turned to see Adrian behind her. Hadn't he been discussing matters with his father in the study? She dared not meet his gaze, fearing he had overheard her earlier conversation with her son. All right, Flynn, it's time for bed. Get a good night's sleep and wake up early for school. Mommy needs to rest too, Eleanor he told her son, trying to change the topic. Good night, Mommy, and make sure to give me a sister. I promise to be well-behaved and not bother you. Eleanor's face had already turned somewhat red, but now it flushed even more intensely. Children spoke without inhibition, but the listener couldn't help but feel embarrassed. A deep, masculine voice from behind chimed in, responding with certainty, Sure thing. Mommy and Daddy will give you a little sister. Afterward, the voice addressed Eleanor. Let's work on it. 
Hearing the suggestion, Eleanor couldn't help but recall those nights, and she pretended not to hear it. In any case, this matter wasn't urgent. She intended to take it slow, since she was apprehensive of the pain. That night from six years ago had cast a long shadow over her, and she couldn't readily accept him. After leaving the Miller Mansion, Adrian drove Eleanor back to his villa. Eleanor was exhausted after the day's events, and upon entering the foyer, weariness etched into her expression. She turned to the man beside her, saying, I'll take a bath and head to bed. I'm so tired. Adrian stood behind her, his nimble fingers instinctively massaging her shoulders. Eleanor's lips curved into a smile as she relished his gentle touch. Adrian continued to knead her shoulders, his lips landing near her ear where he placed a soft kiss. Simultaneously, his hand had begun to lower, unbeknownst to Eleanor. Eleanor's heart fluttered and she swiftly sidestepped his amorous advances. All right, that's enough of that. Do you intend to take a cold shower? Adrian contemplated his options, realizing he should suggest an alternative. How about a glass of wine? It helps with sleep. Eleanor saw through his intentions, but didn't refuse. Okay, let's have some wine. Adrian's eyes sparkled. He hadn't expected her to agree so readily. It seemed she was giving him another chance tonight. In that case, I'll fetch the wine, he suggested, wanting to use it as an excuse to get closer to her. Eleanor laughed, understanding his intentions. Sure, go ahead. Adrian was tempted to suggest they take a bath together, but thought better of it. They weren't quite that familiar yet. Eleanor retreated to her room for a bath, while Adrian prepared a bath for himself in his master bedroom. When Eleanor had finished her bath, her long hair was damp, cascading down her back like silk. She pushed open the door to the master bedroom to find Adrian at the table near the French window. He had poured two glasses of her favorite sweet red wine. Eleanor had just taken a hot bath and was quite thirsty. She eagerly drank half a glass in one go. This is great, I want more, Eleanor exclaimed, promptly refilling her glass. Adrian watched her, somewhat astonished. This red wine was relatively strong, but she seemed to be treating it like juice. After a second glass, Eleanor swayed slightly and placed the cup down. She felt sleep creeping up on her. Wine had a way of making her drowsy. It's good, but now I'm sleepy, she confessed. Adrian set aside his wine and walked toward her. Eleanor, are you ready to sleep? Eleanor nodded, her eyelids growing heavy. Adrian reached out and pulled her into his arms, cradling her. He whispered, let's not sleep just yet, okay? Eleanor murmured in agreement, but the alcohol had already started to affect her, making her feel too drowsy to engage in anything else. Undeterred, Adrian tried to kindle some passion, hoping she'd follow his lead tonight. However, as he kissed her, he realized she wasn't responding. She had fallen asleep, yet he continued to kiss her lips. Eventually, Adrian paused and noticed that Eleanor was indeed asleep. He gently pinched her hot cheek in annoyance, do you want to suffocate me? Eleanor turned in her sleep, snuggling against his chest. She slept soundly, blissfully unaware. With a sigh of resignation, Adrian decided to let her sleep, even though he was brimming with desire. He turned to his side and faced her, watching her serene face. He never realized his patience was so remarkable, but he couldn't believe how long he'd endured. Adrian gently kissed her lips again. Only you could make me endure this. I'll wait for you to be ready. Meanwhile, in the neighboring villa, Valerie was living with Gary, recovering from her injury. With her head wound healing slowly, Gary wanted her to take it easy. Valerie's work had been temporarily suspended. Although she hadn't officially resigned or received any notice, Everyone in the entertainment circle knew about her relationship with Gary. She was widely regarded as the future mistress of the Mirage group. Those who had wronged Valerie were now terrified. They avoided her whenever possible. 
Valerie was enjoying her newfound leisure. She had never had this much free time before. Now that she had time on her hands, she decided to explore various interests, such as flower gardening and fashion design. While working in the entertainment industry, she had daily exposure to fashionable clothing, which sparked her desire to open her own fashion design company someday. However, these were merely hobbies at this point, and her dreams had not yet materialized. Tonight, she was engrossed in reading a novel, being particularly fond of fairy tales. At 11 p.m., Gary emerged from his study and noticed the light still on in her room. He knocked on her door and entered. He found Valerie engrossed in her book. Still not going to sleep? Gary inquired softly. I'll sleep after a little while. By the way, do you have any plans for fantasy-themed movies lately? Valerie asked with curiosity. Gary narrowed his eyes. What's gotten into you? If there are any, would you consider me for a role when you're casting actors? Valerie inquired, trying to pitch herself. Do you want to star in that genre? Gary observed her. Yes, I do. Valerie nodded enthusiastically, her eyes gleaming with anticipation. Gary pondered for a moment. Go to bed now. I'll find a script for you tomorrow. Valerie couldn't contain her excitement. It seemed that dating an entertainment tycoon had its perks, such as securing roles with just a request. Early in the morning, Eleanor found herself being personally escorted to the entrance of the Greenwich Group by Adrian. She was dressed in a sharp, professional suit that exuded an irresistible charm. As she stepped out of the car, Adrian couldn't resist pulling her back with a playful command. Give me a kiss before you go in. Blushing, Eleanor hesitated for a moment. She was cautious, not wanting to reveal any intimate gestures to prying eyes, even though the car's windows were tightly tinted. No need, she replied. But Adrian, ever the assertive one, insisted, yes. With a resigned smile, Eleanor leaned in and planted a quick peck on his cheek. There, happy now, Adrian, looking somewhat unsatisfied, teased, lips. Eleanor chuckled, trying to keep him at bay. One inch at a time, remember? She recalled how he had moved in next door to her and refused to back down. Conceding, Eleanor held his handsome face seriously and gave him a gentle kiss on the lips. Just as Adrian seemed poised to deepen the kiss, she swiftly retreated with a playful smile. There, a kiss. Can I go now? While Adrian didn't get the deep kiss he wanted, he spoke seriously. Remember in the Greenwich group, don't feel too pressured, I'll handle everything. Eleanor, touched by his words, was surprised. As she stepped out of the car, warmth welled up inside her. She impulsively closed the gap between them and kissed Adrian on the cheek. All right, I'll remember that. Satisfied, Adrian watched her exit the car. At least, he thought, if she felt moved, she would reciprocate. With patience, he waited for her, determined to support her every step of the way. Eleanor arrived at the Greenwich Group's office building, with Arnold following closely behind in another car. It felt like she had begun her new job in the blink of an eye. Her presence here would make it easier for Arnold to access the Greenwich Group's internal projects and client information. Eleanor had also gathered various data to help Adrian strategically reallocate the company's resources and gradually cut off project funding, causing the Greenwich Group to quietly decline over time. In the business world, as long as competition was healthy, legal, and ethical, there was nothing to fear. Adrian was determined to ensure that their actions didn't invite legal trouble. Eleanor was committed to helping Adrian, even if it meant her father's company might face ruin under her watch. She would rather not see Melissa exploiting the company to assist her. She believed her father would understand her actions if he knew the truth. Meanwhile, Adrian's convoy proceeded to the Miller Group's headquarters. Once they entered the underground parking lot, Cole, seated in a black MPV nearby, gazed at the Miller Group's building with a chilling resolve. He was determined to follow Noel's orders and eliminate the threat to her. For her, he could kill without hesitation. 
As a foreigner, Cole knew he needed to assemble a team to carry out his plan. He had already brought in capable individuals from his own country to help. His experience in clearing obstacles for Noel had prepared him for this mission. He was confident that, as long as he kept his actions secret, Adrian would remain oblivious to the impending danger. Adrian, however, had no inkling of the danger lurking from an unfamiliar source. Cole was a stranger to him, and that was an advantage Cole intended to exploit fully. In the office, Eleanor was engrossed in reviewing company projects, while Arnold, seated nearby, pretended to be absorbed in his notebook. The presence of an enemy within the company had made Melissa uneasy, and even Kendra had come to investigate. Hearing that Eleanor had taken a job in the company piqued Kendra's curiosity. Melissa's position had made her a prominent figure in the company, and she was often addressed as the second daughter. Kendra resented being referred to as such, but in Eleanor's presence, she dared not claim the title of the Greenwich family's eldest daughter. Melissa had reassigned the finance manager and was now focused on overseeing Eleanor's activities. She couldn't afford to let Eleanor execute any schemes. Descending from the executive office, Melissa and Kendra made their way to the manager's office. Melissa's demeanor toward the male assistant sitting in the adjacent office was chilly, while Arnold, who had been calmly observing, maintained a polite smile. Melissa, feeling suspicious, fixed her gaze on Eleanor and demanded, What are you up to, Eleanor? Eleanor, unfazed, replied, I'm here to work, nothing more. Eleanor, do you think you can handle a job here? Kendra taunted, crossing her arms. Eleanor's lips curled into a sardonic smile. Incompetence seems to be contagious, but some should be more embarrassed than others. You might want to consider that. Kendra turned red with embarrassment, while Melissa couldn't suppress her frustration. She leaned in, her hands on the desk, and scrutinized Melissa Eleanor glaring at Eleanor until she thought. lost her patience. Eleanor raised her eyes and let out a dismissive snort. I've got my mother's shares here, and I can't trust you to handle them. I need to be involved no matter what. But aren't you worried that your lack of knowledge might cause your mother's shares to lose value? Melissa voiced her concern for Eleanor's mother's investments. Eleanor rose from her chair, arms crossed. Don't worry, I may not know much now, but I'll learn. This is my father's company and I won't let the Greenwich group falter. Melissa narrowed her eyes, casting doubt on Eleanor's words. After scrutinizing her for a while, she couldn't determine whether she was being truthful or not. She pondered whether Eleanor genuinely cared about the company, or if she was simply putting on an act because it was currently under her control. A hint of sadness crossed Eleanor's face as she continued, Even if you married Sean, this company was founded by my father. The name Greenwich Group carries my father's legacy. Even if we merge, I won't allow you to change the company's name. Her last words sounded like a command a firm declaration of her commitment to the company. Melissa, not particularly concerned about the company's name change, merely replied, I have no intention of changing the name. It's well known as the Greenwich Group, and my past achievements in the industry are based on that name. There's no reason to alter it. After escorting the mother and daughter out, Eleanor concealed a subtle smile. Now it was her turn to play her part in front of Melissa. Melissa and Kendra returned to the office, and Kendra expressed her discontent. Mom, I think we should just kick her out. She's so annoying, thinking she can do anything. Eleanor's constant success had always irked Kendra, who loathed being outdone. Melissa tried to console her daughter, saying, Let her do as she pleases for now. When she's had enough and grows tired of it, she'll leave on her own. Kendra remained unsatisfied. Melissa had always been dominant in her life, and even at 25, she still relied on her mother to handle everything, like a child. Shortly after, Arnold approached Eleanor, and she assigned him the task of preparing the work report. Eleanor couldn't help but think that Adrian should give Arnold a raise, and once this mission was over, she would ensure he had an extended vacation to find a girlfriend. 
At four in the afternoon, Eleanor had another assistant deliver the work report to Melissa. After reviewing it, she found no issues, but decided that Eleanor would have to submit a daily report in the future to ease her concerns. Sean and Melissa had recently gotten married, but due to Adrian relinquishing some of their previous business collaborations, Sean had been too busy to spend time with his new wife. This had turned Melissa into a newlywed widow. As Eleanor left the office, Adrian's sports car arrived promptly to pick her up. She couldn't help but admire the man beside her. He wore a simple white shirt and trousers, yet exuded an air of nobility. Eleanor had seen many employees in suits and shoes at the company, but it was only when she looked at Adrian that she truly understood what an elite professional looked like. The difference was as stark as night and day. What's on your mind? Am I not handsome enough today? Adrian teased, grinning at her. Blushing, Eleanor stammered, No, you're already very handsome. Am I the most handsome man in your heart? Adrian asked playfully. Eleanor pondered for a moment, then shook her head. Of course not. Adrian raised an eyebrow, feigning offense. Oh, so you think Ian is more handsome than me? Eleanor hesitated momentarily, baffled by his misunderstanding. No, the most handsome person in my heart is my son. Adrian was taken aback, a mixture of irritation and amusement in his eyes. Are you doing this on purpose? Eleanor chuckled. I'm not. You have to understand that in my heart, your position always comes after my son. Adrian couldn't hide his frustration. Was he going to be jealous of a child? It wasn't very dignified, but he had to admit that if it were anyone else, he'd be jealous. Let's go home. Tonight we'll have dinner and spend time with our son, Eleanor suggested. A smile danced in Adrian's eyes. Yes, let's go home to our son. The implication in his words was clear. Their son and her were now his family. Eleanor glanced out of the car window, a sweet smile curling on her lips. Her heart was filled with warmth. That evening, the family gathered and enjoyed a harmonious time together. Kayla had fully embraced Eleanor as her daughter-in-law, and Summer's piano playing was gradually improving with Eleanor's guidance. Noah, studying abroad, couldn't make it home often, but he maintained regular video chats with his family. Summer was thrilled with her improved grades, thanks in no small part to Marlo. He had become something of a tutor and guardian for her, ensuring no one dared to bully her. Marlo's presence had sought relief for Henry and his wife as they could see their daughter's academic progress. Their invitations for Marlo to dine with them had been declined multiple times, but they didn't push him further. Instead, they decided to invite Gary and Valerie over during the upcoming weekend as they believed the two were neighbors. Eleanor reached out to Valerie, who eagerly accepted and secured Gary's agreement. Valerie, now recovered from her injuries, was able to resume her work, although she couldn't help but worry about her unkempt hair. Before dinner, she expressed her desire to wash her hair. Gary offered, I can wash it for you. Really? That would be wonderful. I apologize for the trouble, Valerie said, beaming with joy. Gary simply couldn't mind it. After dinner, Valerie hurried to Gary's room, requesting his help to wash her hair. Gary prepared a chair and filled half a bathtub in the bathroom. Valerie lay down on a long, soft sofa cushion while Gary gently rested her head on his thigh. A faint blush graced Valerie's pretty face as she lay in this intimate position. Being so close to him in this manner made her conscious of his masculinity. She couldn't help but recall their first encounter, when she had accidentally pulled his towel and a heated flush crept up her cheeks. Gary handled her hair like he was washing a child's. He supported her head, allowing her long hair to fall into the water. He had already checked her wound and found it had scabbed over, so as long as he avoided the scar, it would be fine. Valerie closed her eyes, reveling in the comfort. Looking up at this man from below provided a different perspective. He possessed a perfectly chiseled jawline and a rich aura. 
Further up were his slightly pursed thin lips and deep, ocean-like eyes. Just like his hands, his eyes were extraordinarily gentle. This feels so relaxing. Is my hair clean now? Valerie asked with a smile. Not dirty, Gary replied softly. A sweet warmth filled Valerie's chest, and she didn't press the matter any further. Gary continued to help her wash her hair, lathering it up with bubbles and massaging her scalp with his fingers. The experience was so relaxing that it almost put her to sleep. After nearly half an hour of hair washing, Gary placed a towel on her shoulders. I'll dry it for you. I can do it myself, Valerie responded, picking up a hair dryer and starting to dry her hair. Valerie's hair was smooth and silky, akin to top quality satin. Running her fingers through it was a luxurious experience. Gary found it hard to part with her hair. Once her long hair was dry, Valerie tied it up and felt considerably better. She was unaware of the allure she held for the man next to her. You can leave now, I'll take care of the rest, Gary suggested. All right, good night. With that, Valerie closed the bathroom door behind her, believing that Gary was simply tidying up. She loved to let her hair down when she exited. However, she suddenly remembered that her phone was left in the bathroom. She had been chatting with Annie earlier and intended to reply to her messages. Valerie didn't think much of it and pushed open the bathroom door, intending to retrieve her phone from the cabinet. As she entered the bathroom, she was met with an unexpected sight, a naked male figure. Valerie's eyes widened in shock, and she quickly averted her gaze. Gary calmly picked up a towel to cover himself, amusement dancing in his eyes. Have you seen enough? Only then did Valerie realize that she had inadvertently seen more than she intended. Flushing crimson, she cried out in embarrassment, Why are you taking a bath here? Gary explained casually, While washing your hair, I accidentally splashed water on my pants, so I decided to take a bath. Why did you come in? I came for my phone, Valerie stammered, her face still beat red. Gary, who was now unfazed by the situation, raised an eyebrow. I see. You could have told me you needed it. Embarrassed, Valerie covered her face and hastily left the bathroom, muttering, I'm so embarrassed, I can't believe I saw that again. That night, Valerie stayed in her room, avoiding any eye contact with Gary. She didn't dare to face him, as she feared she'd recall the unexpected sight she had seen earlier. Gary did not attempt to approach her, and he spent the night in his study. The study's light remained on as he reviewed scripts, meticulously selecting the best ones. He had set aside all his other work to help Valerie find the perfect script. However, Valerie did not know about his efforts. The next morning, Valerie woke up early, wondering if Gary had already risen. Peeking at his bedroom door, she found it ajar, which was unusual for someone who rarely slept. She couldn't see anything clearly, and it seemed that he had woken up early. Valerie stifled a chuckle and tiptoed downstairs to the second floor. To her surprise, the study room had a faint yellow glow, indicating that the lights had been left on overnight. Could it be that Gary had been careless and forgotten to switch off the lights in the study room? Valerie walked closer, intrigued by the dimly lit room. Upon entering, she noticed that the desk lamp and the wall sconces surrounding it were all still illuminated. Eyeing the room's corner, she spotted someone lying on the sofa. Her initial reaction was to jump back in shock, but she realized it was Gary, who was resting on his side. On the table beside him lay several scripts that he had printed out. Valerie couldn't help but be surprised. It was already November, and he was sleeping in just a t-shirt. Wasn't he afraid of catching a cold? She reached out to gently touch his forehead and confirmed that it was warm. He had probably fallen asleep due to exhaustion from staying up all night reading scripts. Valerie sighed softly and quickly went to retrieve a light blanket. She covered Gary. As he felt the warmth enveloping him, Gary's lips curled into a satisfied smile. He extended his arms naturally, pulling Valerie closer to him. 
She settled on his chest and he whispered, Go back to sleep. I'm here. Feeling the warmth of his embrace, Valerie settled in and asked, Are you going to return to your room to sleep? Let me hold you for a while, Gary replied, his head bending to kiss her hair. He closed his eyes, Gary content began with to the show signs of, of a low fever. Valerie suggested that he go to the hospital, but he insisted on staying home and taking medication. For the rest of the day, Valerie didn't do much except check on Gary's temperature from time to time. Meanwhile, Eleanor continued to work at the company, creating an opportunity for Arnold to gather internal information about the Greenwich Group. In the morning, Adrian accompanied her as they left together. In the evenings, he made a timely appearance at the Greenwich Group office every day, with his cool sports car becoming a notable sight at the entrance. Eleanor became the object of envy for many women in the company. Rumors began to spread, and people eagerly asked her, Miss Eleanor, when are you and Mr. Adrian getting married? Eleanor would usually smile and reply, We already got our marriage certificates. Wow, congratulations. Your husband is incredibly handsome and treats you so well, the people would then say. Eleanor agreed with the sentiments. Although they hadn't officially tied the knot yet, publicly she wouldn't deny the fact that they were together. However, even in these peaceful times, unexpected dangers were lurking. On a secluded pier used for smuggling, four men carrying backpacks disembarked from a ship. Some had scarred faces, while others had intense expressions. They were not ordinary individuals. Cole donned a hat, sunglasses, and a mask, disguising his appearance. He communicated with them in a foreign language. Mr. Cole, this is a big operation. Is it wise to proceed? Those people asked. The mission's success will earn each of you a reward of $50 million. Whether we can pull it off or not, we need to study it, Cole suggested. Whether we succeed or not, we're taking on this job. You have deep pockets and we have the skills, the four men declared. What's our target this time? One of them asked, is it a government official or a business figure? Or perhaps someone with a high social standing? It's a business figure. You might have heard of him on the global rich list. But don't worry, just treat him as a target, Cole said. When have we ever been afraid? We'll take on any assignment, even if it's the president, as long as the money is good the men assured. Did you bring all the necessary equipment? Cole confirmed. We have state-of-the-art gear. Even if the target had three heads and six arms, they wouldn't be able to escape our bullets, the men proudly boasted. Cole smiled in satisfaction upon hearing their responses. I trust you won't let me down. Next, we'll head to a hotel. Cole took them to a relatively modest hotel and shared the details of their target. He showed them a recent photograph of Adrian taken at an airport. The man in the photo was young, handsome, and extraordinarily wealthy. Upon seeing the photo and hearing the name, the mercenaries were taken aback. He wasn't just an ordinary person, he was listed as one of the world's richest individuals. Moreover, this man undoubtedly had bodyguards. Cole had invested considerable effort into tracking Adrian's recent activities, particularly his overseas travels. Among them, there was an upcoming trip to a foreign country where he had been invited by the country's prime minister to attend a global business conference. Cole decided to take them ahead of schedule to set up an ambush along his route to the conference. Attacking abroad would be more convenient, as Adrian's security wouldn't arrive as quickly. A private plane had already been arranged for their departure later that night. In the evening, Eleanor rubbed her temples, feeling her eyes dry after a long day of reviewing company information. She had gained a newfound appreciation for her father's dedication to the business. She also realized how hard Adrian worked every day. She checked the time and saw that Adrian was about to arrive. She was about to head downstairs when her phone rang promptly. A sweet smile graced her face as she picked up the call. Hello, are you here? Yes, I'm downstairs, Adrian replied. All right, I'll be right there. Eleanor hung up and grabbed her bag before heading to the adjacent room. She informed Arnold, 
Hey, it's time to call it a day. Sure, you can go ahead. I'll leave later. Arnold had been quite busy lately and wanted to finish up some work. Thank you. Eleanor turned to a passing assistant and requested, please bring a cup of coffee and some dessert to Arnold. Of course. The female assistant couldn't help but chuckle. Arnold was not only capable, but also quite popular among the female employees. Eleanor descended the stairs and found Adrian's sports car waiting for her. She opened the car door and settled in, greeted by a beautiful bouquet of red roses on her seat. Her eyes sparkled with delight as she picked up the flowers. Why did you suddenly buy me flowers? If you like them, I can give you flowers every day, Adrian replied, glancing at her. Eleanor took in the fragrant bouquet and nodded. I like them, but it would be a waste to receive them every day. How about once a week? All right, I'll follow your lead, Adrian agreed. As they drove, Adrian suddenly remembered something and turned to her. I might have a business trip in three days. I'll have my bodyguards escort you to and from work during that time. For how long? Eleanor inquired. At least four or five days, possibly up to a week. I'll handle matters there as quickly as possible and return home. Can you bear to let me go? Adrian teased. Eleanor smiled. Of course, work is important. Adrian disagreed, gazing at her earnestly. You are more important than work. You want me to come with you? Eleanor suggested. I do, Adrian replied, also eager to have her by his side. That was true. Melissa would certainly approve. Eleanor held the bouquet and took a sniff. After a brief pause, she made up her mind. Okay, I'll go with you. Eleanor nodded, agreeing to accompany Adrian on his business trip. Adrian stopped at a traffic light and turned to her. It doesn't feel like home when I'm abroad. Aren't you worried that I'll do something foolish? Eleanor understood his concern. She replied shyly, A change of scenery can be good. Hearing this, Adrian began to look forward to their upcoming vacation. He reached out and held her hand. Eleanor, I won't force you into anything. Eleanor didn't feel pressured. She simply believed that this was a hurdle they needed to cross together. She wanted to support him through it. It was all about trying new things. The next day, Eleanor requested time off from Melissa. Her leave was approved without any issues, and Arnold was handling his responsibilities efficiently. He hadn't made any mistakes, was diligent in understanding the business, and hadn't caused any problems for Melissa. Their young son wanted to accompany them on their business trip, but he didn't want to miss school. Instead, he stayed behind with his grandparents and aunt. On the third day, Adrian's private plane took off from the airport. Ever since Eleanor's father had passed away, she had been suppressing her emotions for a long time. She had endured a lot of pain during that period, but she had managed to persevere. Her focus now was on making those responsible for her father's suffering pay the price, and she knew it was a step-by-step -step process. Eleanor looked out the window and then back at the man reading documents. She felt a sense of responsibility towards him. During her most challenging and helpless moments, he had stayed by her side, providing her with love and support. She didn't want to let him down. Adrian was engrossed in reading some documents, but he felt a pair of eyes on him. He turned slightly and saw Eleanor looking at him. What are you looking at? He asked with a gentle smile. Eleanor pursed her lips and smiled. I was wondering if we should get our marriage registered when we return. A warm light sparkled in Adrian's deep eyes and he smiled warmly. I've been waiting for you to say that. Eleanor was momentarily surprised. Do you like me that much? With just the two of them in the cabin, she didn't mind asking candidly. Adrian considered it for a moment, his gaze serious. Initially, I approached you for the sake of my son. But as I got to know you better, I realized you were worthy of my affection. After spending all this time together, I'm convinced you're the one I've been searching for. Eleanor felt warmth spreading throughout her body as she heard his words. She smiled and her sweet and lovely smile revealed her appreciation. 
Adrian extended his hand towards her, inviting her to sit closer. Eleanor unfastened her seatbelt and moved towards him. Adrian kissed her gently and pulled her into his arms. Eleanor settled herself on his lap and looked up at him. He gazed down at her with a serious expression. The bright sunlight from outside illuminated Eleanor's beautiful face, and every feature seemed to radiate beauty. His eyes eventually landed on her rosy lips, and he found himself captivated by the enticing color. Eleanor didn't resist. As he kissed her, she welcomed his affectionate gesture. A flight attendant approached to collect a cup, and as she pulled the curtain aside, she unintentionally caught sight of the intimate scene. Quickly, she discreetly closed the curtain and refrained from interrupting. Meanwhile, Gary had successfully turned his low-grade fever into a high-grade fever. Afterward, Valerie persuaded him to go to the hospital. Since it was nearby, they opted for a public hospital rather than a private one. Once the doctor had prescribed the medication, Valerie helped Gary get an IV drip in a private room. Only then did she remove her mask and hat. Gary, despite being unwell, maintained an attractive charm with a touch of fever flush on his face. He reclined lazily on the hospital bed with an IV drip attached to his strong arm. His gaze remained fixed on Valerie as though she were his prey, and he, the predator, was unwilling to release his hold. Valerie felt uncomfortable under his intense gaze. She reached out to cover his eyes and prevent him from looking at her. Her soft palm shielded Gary's alluring eyes, brushing against his long lashes. His eyelashes felt like feathers, gently tickling the lines of her palm, creating an inexplicable warmth. Covering his eyes, Valerie dared to boldly admire his facial features. This man possessed the looks of a leading man, yet he had become a formidable entertainment industry mogul. It seemed rather unfair. He had money, good looks, and talent. Valerie couldn't help but notice his sexy lips slightly pursed. For some reason, she found herself gulping. She felt an irresistible temptation to kiss him right then and there. How long do you intend to keep them covered? Gary asked in a low voice. Until you stop staring at me, Valerie replied playfully. Does that mean I can look at other women? Gary asked. Of course not. Valerie started to respond, but quickly corrected herself. Yes, that's right. You can't look at other women. But you're covering my eyes, Gary pointed out with amusement. Valerie retorted confidently. You don't need your eyes to look at women. No, you're the only woman in my eyes. Gary reached out to grasp her hand after delivering this heartfelt sentiment. His eyes were as deep as the night, with only Valerie's face visible. Valerie was taken aback by his sudden affection. Her pretty face flushed and she said, But you did mention wanting to look at another woman. Gary chuckled. Are you jealous? Yes, I love being jealous, Valerie declared proudly. Gary burst into laughter despite being unwell. It seemed that having this woman by his side, teasing him, had lightened his mood. Excessive jealousy isn't good for your health. A moderate amount is enough, Gary advised with humor in his tone. Valerie responded with mock seriousness. I don't like men who can't be loyal. In that case, you won't have to be jealous, because I don't like making my woman jealous, Gary assured her. Valerie wasn't opposed to the idea of toning down her jealousy, but she stated defiantly, I enjoy being jealous the most. Gary's laughter filled the room. He might be ill, but his spirits were high. It was probably because Valerie was there, accompanying him and bringing cheer to his day. This is a hospital, Mr. Stewart. Can you refrain from being so self-centered? Valerie joked. You can't act this way in front of everyone. I can't help it when I'm in front of you. It was already Gary one in responded the morning when the plane face. touched down in the country where Adrian was going on a business trip. The autumn weather here was exceptionally crisp, as if snow was on the horizon. Fortunately, they had packed their warm clothes before arriving. Sitting in the car, Adrian's thick trench coat felt unusually roomy. 
The temperature shift was quite sudden, leaving Eleanor slightly taken aback. It wasn't until Adrian drew her into his embrace that Eleanor found herself smiling in his warm arms on this chilly night. His embrace provided a comforting warmth as they drove through the well-lit streets. Eleanor glanced at his handsome face, bathed in alternating light and shadow from the streetlights. It exuded a certain irresistible charm. Eleanor nestled in his embrace, gazing out the window at the city under the night sky. The unique buildings resembled giants crouching in the city's glow, an indescribable sense of grandeur filling the air. Upon arriving at the hotel, their bodyguards transported their luggage to the rooms but remained in the vicinity. They had booked a spacious master bedroom, not a suite. Eleanor observed the large white bed and the massive French window beside it. She drew the curtains open, making the distant cityscape appear even more dreamy. While she was lost in the view, a strong arm enveloped her waist. The man's chin gently rested on her shoulder, his breath tantalizing her ear. Get some rest tonight. Adrian's voice was husky. Eleanor had seen his packed schedule on the plane. He had an early morning appointment with the Prime Minister of the country, and her concern grew. She checked the time on her watch and turned to him, sounding worried. You only have six hours left for rest. Let's take a quick shower and get some sleep. All right, Adrian agreed. Then a thought crossed his mind and he gazed at her intently. To save time, I think we should take a bath together. No need, Eleanor whispered. I saw there's a bathtub here. It's big enough for both of us, Adrian offered. Eleanor's eyes widened in astonishment. Was this a common practice? She wanted to decline, but realized that they would be husband and wife eventually, and intimacy was part of that equation. Adrian didn't wait for her refusal. He simply took her hand and led her to the bathroom. It was indeed a luxurious space, complete with a hot spring. The water flowed lively, clear, and clean. Hurry up. You know I don't have much time to sleep. Let's take a quick bath, Adrian whispered in her ear, drawing closer. Eleanor saw that the man had already begun to undress. Her heart raced, but she managed to strip down to her undergarments. Then she entered the hot spring, sitting with her back to him. Adrian's gaze lingered on her slim figure. Her long hair was tied up with a few strands framing her fair skin. Her black hair accentuated her delicate complexion. He marveled at her perfect shoulders and neck. Her form under the water was enticing. Eleanor's heart skipped a beat as she felt his warm embrace from behind. He pressed her body closer to his. In the hot spring, the old idea of bathing took on a new meaning as Adrian washed her with utmost care. When she was wrapped in his embrace and carried to bed, a sense of desire hung in the air. Adrian's gaze was deeper and darker than the night outside the window. What was she going to do after being washed clean? The answer was clear. Eleanor thought he was going to sleep, but the night was filled with an array of passionate kisses, leaving her breathless. She had to remind him that he had an early start tomorrow. Adrian turned off the lights and the night became more mysterious and warm. His hand gently covered her eyes and Eleanor felt his touch. But suddenly, her fingers clenched tightly into his back muscles. Tension filled her. Adrian paused, feeling a hint of pain in his back. She was not ready. Although she had agreed under pressure, he realized she needed more time. Adrian flipped over, resting beside her. He pulled her into his embrace, a tender smile on his face. It's too late tonight, and I don't want to rush. Let's sleep for now. Eleanor's tense body gradually relaxed. She turned to face him, recognizing that he had backed off because he sensed her nervousness. I'm sorry, I can't control my nerves, Eleanor apologized. Even though she had forgiven him for the events from six years ago, her body still reacted strongly to those memories. Sometimes her physical memory was more intense than her conscious memory. Adrian smiled and gently stroked her head. 
no need to rush. We have a few days to relax here. We've waited this long, we can wait a bit longer. Eleanor's heart ached. She reached out and hugged his waist, burying her face in his chest. As Eleanor drifted off to sleep, Adrian, too, succumbed to the sweet lull of slumber. Meanwhile, in a city car repair factory that night, Cole and his associates were resting and making their plans. What thrilled Cole was the fact that they still had some allies in this city, sparing them the need to reveal themselves by staying in a hotel that day. They were even able to procure some powerful firearms. Noel was consumed by madness, and Cole was no exception. Nothing would bring him greater joy than removing the man from his beloved's life. He didn't harbor hatred for Adrian, but his love for Noel intensified his resentment towards him. This time, they had Adrian's itinerary figured out. They meticulously reviewed the map, coincidentally knowing someone familiar with the city. This made their mission more manageable. Adrian was heading to a secluded manor far from the city. On the way, there were multiple opportunities for an ambush, including a bridge and a quiet forest road. Their primary concern was the number of bodyguards accompanying Adrian. If he had an extensive security detail, it would complicate their plan. Cole was determined not to let Adrian return alive this time. He intended to go into hiding after the assassination so as not to implicate Noel. Let's set up an ambush at this intersection. We'll strike in two groups. If he survives the first attack, we'll force him towards the second location. There. He won't have any escape routes left, the mercenaries suggested. Cole approved of this strategy. They needed to block all of Adrian's avenues of escape. Don't underestimate him. You all don't know him, and neither do I. We shouldn't underestimate him, Cole warned them. What's there to fear? No matter how skilled he is, he can't match the firepower we have. One of the men dismissed the notion, placing unwavering confidence in their weaponry. Let's get some rest. Tomorrow is the day of action. Stay alert, Cole urged, clenching his fists. Failure was not an option this time. Early the next morning, the city was shrouded in mist. Standing in the hotel's top floor suite, one could witness the buildings emerging from the mist as if they were in a celestial palace, a rare sight indeed. Adrian woke up quietly. He didn't disturb the still-sleeping Eleanor. He had always been robust, capable of regaining mental clarity after a few hours of deep sleep. At 8 a.m., Adrian left the hotel with six trusted bodyguards. He was meticulous in his planning and had left two of his men behind to ensure Eleanor's safety during their stay in a foreign country. Two black cars moved along the misty streets. The route was well-defined, and Adrian reviewed documents in the back seat. On the central console rested a cup of rich coffee, which he sipped at periodically while studying the documents with sharp focus. This trip was essential for a two-year-long business collaboration, and Adrian demanded perfection. Success wasn't a matter of luck or chance. It was a result of unwavering dedication and hard work, something he exemplified. He didn't bring an assistant this time because the collaboration wasn't a formal contract, but rather a preliminary discussion. As they moved further from the city center, the fog began to clear. Yet on the highway surrounded by mountains, the mist lingered. Adrian couldn't shake a sense of unease. It was his typical alertness that led him to ask one of his bodyguards to keep an eye on their surroundings. The morning remained uneventful, and the real threat was still behind them. On a small hill, 12 miles from the manor, several pairs of eyes observed Adrian's convoy as it passed by. Cole adjusted his glasses and watched the convoy disappear into the woods. A smug smile crossed his face. He hadn't expected Adrian to be so careless, sending only one car for the escort. Unbeknownst to Cole, Adrian had intentionally left two bodyguards behind with Eleanor on this trip. Typically, when traveling abroad, Adrian would have three cars in his convoy. You guys can rest easy now. Dealing with a few people should be a piece of cake, Cole said confidently. 
Eleanor lay in the hotel room, feeling a warmth in her body. She was surprised when she realized that she was alone. Checking the alarm clock, she discovered it was already past 9 a.m. A smile crossed her face. He should be on his way now. She turned around in bed, wanting to find comfort in the warmth of her own body. Eleanor couldn't help but blush as she recalled her decision. Tonight, no matter how much it might hurt, she was determined to face her fears and surrender in the hotel. herself to him. She wasn't with Adrian, and she didn't feel like going out for a stroll. Around noon, she received a call from Adrian. He mentioned that he would likely return to the hotel in the evening. Eleanor assured him that she was fine and that he should focus on his work. I'll take you somewhere tomorrow. You'll love it. It'll just be the two of us without any bodyguards so we can relax for a few days. Adrian's voice carried a deep, warm smile even through the phone. Only Eleanor could truly understand the nuances of his smile, and it caused her cheeks to flush even though he couldn't see her face. Okay, I'll be here waiting for you to come back, Eleanor replied. After the intimate experience they shared last night, her inhibitions had been pushed aside. What was there to be embarrassed about now? Great, wait for me, Adrian said. I'll handle this matter first. After hanging up the call, Eleanor put her phone down and walked over to the French window. She gazed at the distant scenery with her arms crossed, basking in the warmth of the sunlight that streamed through. The hotel's comfort made her feel at ease. Time seemed to pass slowly. The sunlight in this country appeared unusually fleeting. By the time the sky began to darken, it wasn't even six o'clock. Yet the entire country was adorned with a breathtaking display of dazzling lights as if gold had been scattered across every road. Meanwhile, Cole and his team had spent the entire day waiting on a mountainside. As night fell, their tension grew. They had positioned one of their team members in an ambush near the manor. This time, the Prime Minister was hosting only one guest, Adrian. Inside the manor, Adrian had accepted the Prime Minister's warm invitation to dinner. Naturally, he couldn't decline such a request, especially since this project required the Prime Minister's assistance. Adrian hoped to secure a collaboration that would allow his business to establish a presence in the country. Throughout the day, Adrian engaged in pleasant conversations with the Prime Minister, successfully achieving his objective. Dinner concluded around 8 p.m. Worried about Eleanor's well-being, Adrian bid farewell to the general manager, scheduling the official signing of the contract for the following day. The Prime Minister personally escorted Adrian to his car. As Adrian's car left the manor, two black vehicles slowly followed. Adrian had consumed half a glass of hard liquor at dinner, so upon entering the car, he leaned against the back seat, gently massaging his temples. He intended to rest his eyes during the drive. The car glided smoothly along the flat road, surrounded by lush, dense trees. Even with the streetlights illuminating portions of the road, it felt as if only a small part of the world was visible. The bodyguard in the lead drove with utmost caution. Both black cars were in close pursuit, maintaining a distance of no more than 50 meters. All the bodyguards were skilled drivers and communicated via earpieces to ensure their coordination. There were no accidents like collisions. Five minutes earlier, Cole received a report from his team. Adrian's convoy had departed. The location they had chosen for the attack was a sharp bend in the road, beyond which the bodyguards couldn't see what lay ahead. Their vehicles slowed slightly as they navigated the turn. However, at that precise moment, as they rounded the bend, a long truck blocked the road ahead. The lead bodyguard immediately shouted, Be cautious, something's up ahead. Both black vehicles simultaneously applied their brakes, the screeching sound of tires filling the air. Adrian, who had been resting in the back seat, was jolted forward by the abrupt stop. His closed eyes snapped open, and the bright light flooded his vision. Gears shifted involuntarily, and the lead bodyguard's hurried voice reached his ears. Sir, there's an obstruction ahead. Adrian's gaze locked onto the road ahead, a sense of foreboding rising in his chest. He uttered in a low voice, 
Retrieve your protective gear and stay alert. The cars in front of them suddenly erupted into flames, engulfed in a massive explosion. Adrian and the bodyguards in his vehicle acted almost simultaneously, opening the doors and rolling out onto the ground. In the next instant, their car also exploded from beneath, soaring through the air in a blaze of fire. Adrian stared at the vehicle in front, where several men who had been engulfed in flames rolled down from the car. Yet, they quickly fell still. Fury welled up within him. Who dared to harm his men? In his car, there were only three survivors, Adrian and two bodyguards. Adrian's eyes flared with anger as he observed the burning car on the road. A few fiery figures rolled down, but their movements ceased shortly after. Who could have attacked his men so ruthlessly? Adrian squatted behind a tree. The bodyguards behind him were equally vigilant, brandishing their weapons expertly. Even in this dire situation, safeguarding their boss was instinctual. At that moment, a sound resembling the swish of air being sliced reached Adrian's ears from behind. He whispered urgently to the bodyguard in front of him, Stay on guard. A fiery explosion followed. Adrian heard a bodyguard cry out as he was struck by a bullet. It wasn't just any bullet. It was a massive caliber round, indicating a long-range shooter. Adrian swiftly assessed the situation. Whoever wanted to kill him hadn't yet approached. He instructed another bodyguard, head into the forest. However, the forest wasn't necessarily a haven, for Cole wouldn't give him the chance to escape. He and his subordinates were lying in wait, ready for action. Adrian's eyes, sharp as a predator's, realized that his attackers might have divided into two groups. In that case, Eleanor might also be in danger. The more perilous the situation became, the harder it was for Adrian to remain focused. He simply couldn't, not when it involved Eleanor, the woman he cherished above all. He needed to return immediately and protect her. Waiting for Eleanor to locate him wasn't an option. He had to take the initiative to eliminate the assassins and head back to the hotel. The previous shot had only further shrouded the remaining two hidden assailants in darkness. They had time to strategize and confront him, but Adrian couldn't afford such a luxury. His every movement had to be swift. He couldn't spare a second. Adrian's phone had been left in the car, as he wasn't able to take it with him when he left the vehicle. So, at this moment, he had no way of contacting Eleanor. Without any confirmation of her safety, his mind inevitably conjured the worst possible scenarios. This ordeal had pushed him to the brink, nearly driving him mad. The bodyguard hesitated momentarily, finding the plan a bit risky, but he went along with it. Adrian became the bait, luring their attackers to reveal themselves. As expected, another volley of bullets erupted from a nearby thicket when Adrian turned around. He immediately retaliated with gunfire, joined by his vigilant bodyguards. However, their shots failed to connect with the enemy. Adrian acted swiftly to provide cover for his bodyguard. Time was of the essence. He couldn't afford to wait any longer. Staying in the woods for even one more second was a torment, for he knew that every second counted in ensuring Eleanor's safety. She was all alone in the hotel. Adrian's phone was left in the car, and there was no way to reach Eleanor. The possibility of danger loomed large in his mind. His heartstrings were stretched to the breaking point, his emotions raw. Desperation drove Adrian to take a risk, planning to reach the truck to leave the area and return to the city. Adrian decided to take one more gamble, striving to reach the truck and escape this perilous scene, heading back to the city. With the world spinning around him, he focused on that singular goal. Adrian didn't have the luxury to contemplate the odds. With his mind fixated on Eleanor's well-being, he sprinted out of the forest. However, unbeknownst to him, Cole, lurking in the shadows, couldn't believe Adrian was taking such a risky path toward the main road. His gun was aimed, ready to strike. The gun in Cole's hand fired a shot. Adrian's left shoulder bore the brunt of the bullet's impact, instantly piercing through. Unfazed by the pain, he didn't look back but made a beeline for the truck. 
Meanwhile, the last assassin on Cole's side met his demise. His rage was palpable. He'd witnessed each of his comrades fall to Adrian's hand. The audacity of letting Adrian escape was beyond his tolerance. Just as Adrian reached the front of the truck, he heard the ominous sound of rushing air behind him. He spun around to behold a man clutching the rocket launcher from a deceased comrade and aiming it at the truck's fuel tank. Adrian's expression shifted rapidly. Reacting swiftly, he lunged away, but the fuel tank detonated within moments. An intense wave of heat washed over him, propelling him into a deep trench beside him. His consciousness began to dim. In the last moments of consciousness, he whispered a name softly, Eleanor. The man with fiery eyes cackled, dead, he's dead. Cole had taken the shot. He stood up to verify Adrian's condition. At the same moment, he heard the rumble of an approaching vehicle not far away. His face contorted with ferocity and frustration, and he vanished into the black forest. He believed Adrian wouldn't survive. The point-blank exposure to the explosion's force, coupled with a shoulder wound, were circumstances that would surely spell his end. The sound of an approaching car echoed from the villa, where the incident had unfolded just a dozen kilometers away. The woods were ablaze, and the villa manager's staff hastened to investigate. What they found was a gruesome massacre, and they also discovered a man still clinging to life amidst the carnage in a deep trench. This man had been the esteemed guest of the Prime Minister only a short while ago. Those who had come to his aid promptly informed the Prime Minister of the situation. The Prime Minister, too, rushed to the scene, and Adrian was promptly transported to the nearest hospital. When Adrian arrived at the hospital, he was a far cry from the refined gentleman who had first entered that day. His once impeccable suit had been reduced to tatters. A gunshot wound scarred his shoulder, the bullet still embedded within. His face, marred by a stark gash, concealed an even more profound wound. By all accounts, it was nothing hospital, short of a miracle a high that high-stakes battle breaking. for life unfolded as doctors fought to save Adrian Miller. Back at the hotel, Eleanor anxiously awaited Adrian's return. It was nearing nine o'clock, and despite Adrian's assurance of his late arrival, anxiety gnawed at her. Unsettling thoughts began to creep into her mind, but she pushed them down forcefully, refusing to entertain them. She picked up her phone and reached for Adrian's device, only to be met with a frustrating inability to establish a connection. Panic surged within her. Just then, her hotel room phone rang, momentarily relieving her anxiety. She hurried to answer it. Hello? Miss Greenwich, something has happened to the boss. Please put on a coat and we'll go to the hospital immediately, came the grave voice of Adrian's bodyguard. Eleanor's world teetered on the edge of collapse. Something had happened to him? What exactly? How serious was it? Questions swirled in her mind, but she forcefully suppressed her fear. She couldn't afford to dwell on these thoughts. She grabbed a thick coat from the wardrobe and hastily put it on, slinging her bag over her shoulder. As she exited the hotel, Adrian's two bodyguards, tasked with ensuring her safety, approached with somber expressions. Miss Greenwich, the car is waiting downstairs, one of the bodyguards informed her. Eleanor's heart felt as if it was lodged in her throat. She made her way to the elevator, her voice quavering as she inquired, What happened to Adrian? He was ambushed on his way back. He sustained severe injuries and is currently undergoing treatment at the hospital, the bodyguard relayed with calm resolve. Eleanor nearly lost her composure upon hearing the news, but she clung to the elevator's wall, steadying herself. Her body trembled with an impending sense of dread. Eleanor's legs felt like jelly, but she didn't waver. She had experienced the heartbreak of losing her father, and that had only strengthened her resolve. Regardless of the outcome, she was determined to confront it head on. Simultaneously, she contemplated whether it was time to inform Adrian's parents. While her heart urged her to share the news, 
she recognized that revealing it before the surgery's conclusion would only incite unnecessary panic. She opted to wait for the surgery's outcome before making any decisions, remaining steadfast in her belief that Adrian would pull through. Four agonizing hours later, the operating room's lights finally dimmed. The anticipation outside the surgery room was palpable. Eleanor, now calmer, realized that she needed to be prepared for any outcome. Just as she contemplated these thoughts, the operating room doors creaked open, revealing a group of weary doctors. They approached the Prime Minister to deliver the verdict. Prime Minister, we've saved the gentleman's life, but his injuries are grave. He'll need to be transferred to the ICU. The Prime Minister, a man in his 50s, turned to Eleanor with a reassuring smile. Miss Greenwich, Mr. Miller's life has been saved. You can take solace in that. Although Eleanor had already heard the news, the reassurance brought relief nonetheless. Gratitude welled up within her, and she addressed the Prime Minister. Thank you for saving his life. I'm truly grateful. The Prime Minister shook his head and sighed ruefully. I can't help but feel responsible for this incident occurring in my country. Please be assured, Miss Greenwich, that Mr. Miller's safety will be entrusted to my team for protection. We will ensure your safe return. Soon, a nurse wheeled out a hospital bed. Resting on it was Adrian, unconscious. Tubes and monitors were connected to his battered body, which was swathed in blood-stained gauze. Tears welled up in Eleanor's eyes. Witnessing Adrian in such a state, all semblance of calmness and rationality evaporated. She couldn't suppress her pain and grief any longer. Tightly clasping her beloved's hand, she gazed upon his injured form. Tears streamed down her cheeks, and with every ounce of strength, she willed herself to stay strong. Her voice quivered as she whispered, Adrian, you must pull through. You can't leave me. You must survive. Time seemed to stretch on indefinitely as Eleanor grappled with her emotions. She held his hand gently, cautious not to apply too much pressure for fear of exacerbating his wounds. Her gaze, filled with tenderness and sorrow, never left his face. If only she could nurse him back to health and alleviate his suffering. She had just learned of his close encounter with the explosion, and it was nothing short of miraculous that he had survived. Now, the paramount concern was his recovery. Amidst the hushed atmosphere of the ward, Adrian's hand, resting on the bed, stirred faintly. Under Eleanor's watchful eye, his long lashes trembled and his eyes fluttered open. Adrian, you're awake! Eleanor exclaimed, a surge of joy overwhelming her. She couldn't believe it. The doctors had mentioned he might sleep for days after the surgery. Who could have predicted he'd awaken so swiftly? I'll go call the doctor. Eleanor declared, ready to leave as soon as she spoke. Yet, her hand, resting in his palm, was instantly grasped. Her body, which had just begun to rise, sank back down. She didn't dare to pull her hand away, nor did she attempt to break free. With a mixture of excitement and concern, she leaned closer to his pallid, sculpted face. What's wrong? Adrian's lips curled into a smile. I've just woken up. And you're already planning to leave? While Adrian was undergoing surgery, he had briefly awakened amidst the pain. He knew he was in the hospital, and he knew he was safe. What brought him the most comfort was the sight of the woman he cared for deeply, who now stood before him. But what about your injuries? Eleanor asked. They're all external wounds. I won't die. Adrian reassured her in a relaxed manner, though his entire body was wrapped in gauze, and the blood that had flowed was deeply unsettling. Eleanor couldn't speak easily at a time like this. Her heart felt as though it had been squeezed into a knot, making it difficult to breathe. Don't mention that word. You can't die. You can't leave me and our son or anyone who loves you, she firmly instructed, her tone almost pleading. Adrian quirked the corner of his mouth, though excessive blood loss had rendered his face pale. 
His handsomeness remained intact. Of course I won't die. How could I bear to? After all, I haven't won you over yet. Eleanor's cheeks flushed slightly and her emotions were in turmoil. When did this man become so bold? She felt both embarrassed and anxious that he could joke at a time like this. All right, let's not talk about it. I'll call the doctor. Eleanor summoned the doctor to examine Adrian and the news was positive. Despite significant blood loss and severe external injuries, there were no life-threatening injuries. The bullet in his shoulder was non-lethal and the explosion, while causing severe external wounds, had not harmed any vital organs. Though he would likely bear scars and require several months of recovery, his life was not in jeopardy. Eleanor's heart sank upon hearing the diagnosis. What did scars matter to her? As his partner, she couldn't care less about such things. Shortly thereafter, Adrian summoned his bodyguard and conveyed some instructions, requesting Eleanor to step out. She couldn't help but worry about what he was keeping from her at this moment. Once the bodyguard exited, Eleanor entered the room and inquired about what had been on her mind. Should I inform your parents now? Adrian's expression grew slightly cold. Despite his injuries and the hoarseness in his voice, his resolve remained unwavering. No need. Don't inform them. Eleanor gazed at his pale countenance in astonishment. Her heart ached as she gently brushed the strands of ink-black hair from his forehead. Why shouldn't they know? They deserve to be informed of what happened. I've instructed my bodyguards to enhance security for my family in our country. They won't come to harm. Besides, I won't die. Let's wait until I'm fully recovered, Adrian explained, a clear plan guiding his actions. At this moment, he had no desire to disclose his injuries to anyone. He had a suspicion that someone had targeted him, and his life and death were of paramount importance to that individual. Consequently, he opted to remain low-key, quietly awaiting the moment when his assailant would come forward in desperation. If Sean were behind this attack, shouldn't he keep his father away from him? If Adrian encountered a crisis, his company's stock would inevitably fluctuate. This would be Sean's desired outcome. If he were the culprit, he would seize the opportunity to destabilize the company. By obscuring the circumstances surrounding his life and death, and only reporting that he was on a business trip, Adrian could prevent unnecessary turmoil within his company. But is this the right choice? Eleanor disagreed, her worry evident. Adrian had sustained such injuries. Surely his family should be notified. As long as you're by my side now, everything will be fine. Do you want our son to see me like this? Adrian didn't want to encounter his family while in this state. He had always projected strength and resilience. What do you mean like this? Even if our son knew, he could handle it. Eleanor struggled to comprehend the wounded man's mindset. Trust me on this. Later, we'll board a plane bound for another country. It will be safer there, Adrian. Lying in the hospital bed, his body swathed in bandages, calmly proposed. His plan had been meticulously laid out. Eleanor's concern rendered her speechless, and her heartache only deepened. Wasn't this a time for him to rest and recover from his injuries? Why did he insist on these complexities? That night, Adrian, covered in wounds, boarded a plane and headed straight to another country. Nurses and doctors accompanied him on the journey, but the sole presence he sought was Eleanor's. Even if fatigue threatened to overwhelm him, he clung to her hand as if she would vanish the moment he released it. The flight to the new country was brief, spanning only four hours. Adrian had a villa there, sparing him a trip to the hospital. Instead, he was transported directly to the villa to recuperate. That evening, Eleanor lay beside him. Fatigue weighed heavily on her, and she dozed off on his undamaged shoulder. The aftermath of the incident unfolded smoothly and quietly. The Prime Minister had stepped in, ensuring that the incident was contained. Adrian's bodyguards were repatriated to their families with appropriate compensation. 
The lone guards, who had no families, were provided dignified burials by Adrian. Back in their homeland, Henry and Kayla received a call from Adrian the following afternoon. He informed them that he and Eleanor might remain abroad for a month and requested that they arrange for their son. Adrian also reminded his father to exercise caution when leaving the house. Adrian's injuries were closely guarded secrets. In the tranquil villa, Eleanor awoke after a few hours of sleep. As she beheld the sleeping man beside her, her heart finally found respite. Temporarily, Arnold had assumed responsibility for her domestic affairs. In the days that followed, she remained steadfast by Adrian's side, supporting his recovery and preparing to reunite with her son. During the dressing change, Eleanor couldn't bear to look directly at Adrian's wounds. The nurse proceeded with great care, yet the sight of his injuries caused Eleanor to avert her gaze. These wounds, so severe, would have incapacitated an ordinary person. However, Adrian sat up straight, his brows furrowing in pain. Not a single complaint escaped his lips, as though the flesh Nervous adhered to the gauze she watched was Adrian getting his bandages changed. If you can't bear to look, you can step out and wait, Adrian gently advised as he glanced at the woman with her back turned to him. Eleanor truly couldn't muster the courage to face his injuries, but she didn't want to leave his side either. Summoning her courage, she took a deep breath and turned to approach him. Meeting his narrowed eyes, Eleanor seemed to share his pain. It didn't take long before her eyes welled up with tears once more. Adrian, freshly bandaged, gently wiped them away. Don't cry. It doesn't hurt that much. Adrian comforted her. Eleanor bit her lip, finding it hard to believe him. It does hurt a little. How about a kiss to make it feel better? Adrian smiled and began to flirt with her. Eleanor was taken aback. Could a kiss truly alleviate his pain? Without giving it too much thought, she leaned in, aware that the two nurses were still present, and kissed his forehead. Her lips lingered on his skin for a moment before she pulled back. Does it feel better now? Eleanor wished she could kiss him a few more times if it would help. Yes, much better, Adrian replied with a slight smile. It had indeed worked. The nurse finished changing his bandages and departed. Adrian donned a loose shirt. Regardless of what he wore, it couldn't diminish his natural charisma. He remained as captivating as ever. Is there anything you're craving? I'll make it for you, Eleanor inquired, determined to cater to his appetite to aid in his recovery. Sure, I'd like some chicken soup, Adrian replied eagerly, his desire evident. Eleanor grinned and said, All right, I'll whip it up for you. Let them purchase the ingredients. You just stay here, Adrian insisted, concerned about her safety. Eleanor was momentarily taken aback. To reassure him, she refrained from brushing his hand away. She nodded and agreed. Okay. An hour later, Eleanor returned with freshly made soup. Adrian, in good spirits, sat on the couch. The loss of blood had rendered his complexion even paler and more translucent than before. Under the sunlight, he resembled an ice sculpture, still as handsome as ever. When he saw the soup, he reached for it, but Eleanor moved it out of his reach, cautioning, Your hand is injured. Don't move. Although the injury wasn't severe, it still pained Eleanor to see the external wounds. Let me feed you, Eleanor volunteered. Adrian's eyes registered surprise, and his smile deepened. He was immensely pleased with such special treatment. It seemed that surviving this ordeal might bring him some good fortune after all. Had he known that a single injury could make this woman so amenable, he might have done it sooner. Why are you smiling? Eleanor held the soup and blew on it before offering it to him. However, she noticed that he was still grinning. I'm happy, Adrian explained. What's there to be happy about? Eleanor couldn't fathom it. Adrian's eyes narrowed, warmth glowing within them. I've just discovered how much you love me. His words were like a feather that gently brushed against Eleanor's heart. She pursed her lips and couldn't help but smile. Well, now that you know, remember to treat me well, 
Eleanor teased. Really? Adrian's anticipation was evident. I'll be waiting to treat you like a queen. Eleanor checked the soup's temperature and brought it to his lips. Adrian drank it with a smile. It was early winter outside the window, and a few delicate ice crystals began to fall, signaling the onset of snow. Yet inside, the atmosphere was warm. Eleanor fed him the soup and cleaned up afterward before joining him. She brought a medical book along, realizing that the nurses couldn't be at his side for a whole month. Therefore, she needed to educate herself about wound care. Adrian observed the books she brought with curiosity. It was quite challenging for her to decipher those intricate medical texts. However, the more challenging it was for her, the more warmth it brought to his heart. Whenever Eleanor encountered words she couldn't comprehend, he could explain them to her directly. It allowed her to appreciate his extensive knowledge. As Adrian explained, Eleanor was captivated, her chin resting in her hand, gazing at him with admiration. To love someone was to revere and worship them as though they were a deity. After Adrian finished explaining, he noticed her infatuated expression. He couldn't help but place a kiss on the side of her face. Do you understand now? Could you repeat that? Eleanor realized she had been staring at him, lost in thought, and had failed to listen. Adrian smiled, gently patting her head. He patiently recounted the explanation. Back in their home country. Following that fateful night, Cole didn't immediately return to see Noel. Instead, he eliminated all the individuals he had brought with him. He patiently waited for news of Adrian's demise to circulate. Yet, after a week of waiting, he had heard nothing. At one point, he even went to the nearby hospital to inquire. However, the Prime Minister had managed to suppress the information about Adrian's condition, leaving him in the dark. This left Cole anxious, and ultimately, he decided to return to the country where Noel was residing. However, everything within the Miller Group remained tranquil, and there was no word of any mishap. Is he dead or not? Noel asked upon seeing him. Cole didn't dare to meet her eyes, knowing she was likely disappointed. He shook his head. I'm not certain. But that night, he was indeed shot and exposed to an explosion. At such close range, an ordinary person wouldn't have survived. Tears welled up in Noel's eyes, filled with regret. She could nearly picture the extent of Adrian's injuries based on Cole's account. The pain in her heart was unbearable as she rushed out of the room. Miss, Cole started. Stop! Whether he's alive or not, don't touch me anymore. Noel said with a broken heart, choking back her sobs. Don't follow me. I don't want to see you right now, Noel declared firmly, striding out of the room. Noel left the hotel and started walking aimlessly on the street. She didn't know where she was going, but Cole's words about Adrian's condition replayed incessantly in her mind. Adrian had been shot and he was close to the explosion. Regretful tears began to fill Noel's eyes. Lost in thought, she stepped onto the road without noticing, and a small truck, unable to stop in time, collided with her. Pain surged through Noel's legs as the small truck came to a halt. Her left leg was pinned beneath the vehicle's tires. Wide-eyed, she fainted. Cole rushed to the aid of the unconscious Noel, gently picking her up. As he looked down, his heart raced when he saw her badly mutilated leg peeking out from under her dress. In a panic, he shouted, Take us to the hospital! Please, take us to the hospital! A compassionate taxi driver promptly pulled over and opened the door. Cole urgently implored, To the nearest hospital, please! The nearest hospital! The taxi driver, familiar with the route, arrived at the hospital in less than ten minutes. He was considerate and refused to accept any payment, insisting that they hurry inside. Cole was frantic. It was as if the injured leg was his own. Even if it meant sacrificing his limb, he wouldn't be as terrified. But this was Noel, the woman he loved more than anything else. Inside the hospital, Noel was wheeled into the operating room on a gurney. Cole watched helplessly as the doors closed behind her. 
Clenching his fists, he pounded the wall in a fit of anger and let out a pained cry. He had witnessed Noel standing by the side of the road just moments ago, but inexplicably, she had wandered onto the street, oblivious to the oncoming small truck. Cole saw the terror in Noel's eyes, but he was powerless to prevent her from being run over. He couldn't fathom what Noel's reaction would be when she woke up and realized what had happened to her leg. A doctor emerged from the operating room and approached Cole. Sir, are you related to the patient? The situation is critical. We have no choice but to amputate her leg. No, doctor. Please, I beg you, save her leg. Whatever it takes, please save her leg. Cole pleaded with a face filled with desperation. Sir, there's nothing more we can do. Even with the best surgeon in the world, it would be futile. Failure to amputate the leg could endanger her life, the doctor explained solemnly. Cole couldn't overlook the extent of Noel's leg injuries. Her bones were crushed and she couldn't protect herself anymore. A surge of pain and desperation washed over him. He beseeched the doctor, Please save her. You have to save her. We have a consent form here that requires a family member's signature. Please sign it immediately so we can proceed with the operation, the doctor said, presenting the document. Cole's face turned ashen as he grasped the pen, trembling. He signed the document, knowing that he was effectively agreeing to the amputation of Noel's leg. The doctor took the signed form and hurried back into the operating room to commence the emergency procedure. The operation lasted for nearly five agonizing hours. For Cole, those were five hours of living hell, awaiting news outside the operating room. On the surgical bed, Noel had been changed into a hospital gown. The anesthesia left her feeling groggy and she eventually roused from unconsciousness. As she opened her eyes, she found herself surrounded by a group of doctors. Her voice hoarse, she asked, Is this a hospital? Miss, you were in a car accident. Do you remember? You're in the operating room, a nurse explained softly. Noel's memories flashed back to the accident just before she lost consciousness. Her eyes widened and she gazed in horror at her legs. One was still covered by her pants, but the other was missing below her thigh. My leg! Where's my leg? Noel screamed in horror. Miss, please calm down, the doctor advised. How could Noel remain calm? She was in despair and inconsolable. She reached out to touch the spot where her leg should be, only to find it gone. She cried out, My leg! Why is my leg gone? Give it back to me! Outside the operating room, Cole heard Noel's wailing cries. Anxiously, he inquired, What's happening? Not long after, Noel was wheeled out. She had come to terms with the harsh reality and lay on the hospital bed, her face pallid, tears streaming from the corners of her eyes. Miss, Cole looked at her with heartache, but he found himself at a loss for words to console her. Noel's spirit had crumbled. She had been a proud and self-assured woman, but now, with one of her legs gone, her world had crumbled. Her future looked bleak, and she couldn't see any glimmer of hope. She was in a foreign country. Both of them had been wounded, and they had faced the specter of death together. Adrian had the comforting presence of Eleanor. Despite his extensive injuries, he didn't feel despair. He was content basking in the warmth of the moment. In a week since the incident, Adrian continued his recovery. He had initiated a discreet investigation into the party responsible for the attack, suspecting Sean's involvement. However, Sean remained strangely silent. Even if he couldn't act directly, Adrian was well acquainted with his cunning nature. It was uncharacteristic for him to wait patiently for his recovery. Sean was someone who knew how to seize opportunities, yet he hadn't done so this time. If it wasn't Sean, then who held such a deep grudge against him and was willing to go to such lengths to eliminate him? This had left Adrian pondering. A sense of agony and helplessness washed over him. He needed to get to the bottom of this. During her absence, Eleanor missed her son, 
and their only connection was through video chats. Adrian, despite his injuries, found comfort in Eleanor's presence. It was rare for him to be in such a vulnerable state, yet his face remained unscathed. It was as if fate was on his side. In the video chats, Flynn expressed his yearning for their return. Adrian's father, Henry, sensed that something was amiss and inquired about his son's condition. Adrian, aware that he couldn't conceal the truth of what had transpired at the company, reluctantly shared the details over the phone. Henry was taken aback by the news, but was relieved to learn that his son's injuries weren't life-threatening. Henry agreed to manage the company during his son's absence and offered to take care of Eleanor and him during their recovery abroad. His son's well-being and the pursuit of answers about the attack evening, remained there gently priority. fell from the sky, coating the trees outside the window with a delicate layer of silver. Inside the villa, in front of the French windows, Adrian sat on the sofa, a piano resting nearby. The instrument had been in the villa when Adrian purchased it, and due to its classic style, he had chosen to leave it behind. Eleanor hadn't played the piano in a while. She couldn't resist the urge to tickle the ivories. Adrian's eyes gleamed with affection as he listened to the piano's melody, reminiscent of the tinkling of a clear mountain stream. Eleanor's graceful and alluring silhouette captivated him, evoking memories of when he had pursued her. It had been the most tedious and blissful pursuit of his life. From that moment onward, his heart had been claimed by her, filling his days with anticipation and contentment. Adrian was currently recovering from an injury, limiting his mobility. Most of the time, he had to sit still and rest. Just as Eleanor finished her song, Adrian broke into applause with a smile on his face. Come here, he beckoned. Eleanor obediently approached him, her body softening as she nestled against his uninjured shoulder. She grabbed a cup of warm water and took a sip herself before offering it to him. Adrian reached out and wrapped his arms around her, holding her close. She felt like his cherished toy, and at this moment, he could have his way with her. Gently lifting her chin, Adrian leaned in to kiss her forehead. Eleanor smiled and adjusted her position, making it easier for him to kiss her. Now, she had to take care of this injured man in every way. As their lips met, a glint of desire sparkled in the depths of Adrian's eyes. He let out a sigh of frustration. I'm so frustrated. I can only watch, not touch or taste. Eleanor immediately understood his meaning. She looked at him seriously. We can discuss such matters once you've fully recovered from your injuries. Adrian playfully touched the tip of her nose. What did I owe you in my past life? Money or my life? Eleanor chuckled. You owe me yourself now. Adrian had a feeling that no matter what he owed her, he would never be able to repay her enough. He was willing to spend the rest of his life trying. Eleanor, can you help me with a bath later? Adrian asked in a low voice. I haven't been able to bathe for a few days and it's making me uncomfortable. His injuries prevented him from taking a bath and the usually clean Adrian couldn't bear the feeling of being unclean. Eleanor's cheeks reddened slightly. She knew that going without a bath for a week, no matter how cold the weather, was bound to be uncomfortable. Shyly, she lowered her gaze and didn't refuse. All right, I'll help you with a bath. Adrian ruffled her hair happily, lowered his head and kissed her, expressing his approval. After putting the water away, Eleanor grabbed a towel. She adjusted the bathroom's temperature, ensuring he wouldn't catch a cold. Adrian wore a thicker robe and entered the bathroom, where his tall frame exuded a certain presence. Eleanor saw him remove his robe's belt and instinctively turned around, her back facing him. Behind her, Adrian chuckled, feeling embarrassed. Eleanor bit her lip and reminded herself, why should I be embarrassed? He looks so much like my son. Just think of it as bathing Flynn. No big deal. With that thought, Eleanor turned around, her face flushed. Behind her, Adrian was completely undressed and certain things were happening. Eleanor covered her eyes. Adrian sighed in helplessness. Come on. 
20 minutes later, with a flushed face, Eleanor gently pushed Adrian out of the bathroom. She was covered in sweat and needed her bath. Such playful moments were common between them, especially when Adrian was injured. Eleanor understood that he needed a way to pass the time and alleviate his frustration. Ten days later, a piece of good news finally reached Adrian. The police had successfully identified a gang that was likely responsible for his attack. They might even be his potential killers. Several photos of the gang members were sent to him. As he examined the photos, one face in the fourth photo caught his attention. He felt like he had seen this man somewhere before. Adrian had an impeccable memory. Once he saw someone, he never forgot them. He remembered that this man had been at a restaurant with this group of killers. Adrian narrowed his eyes and thought for a moment. He recalled that this man had been standing next to Noel. He was one of Noel's subordinates. Adrian's chest tightened and he clenched his fists. He hadn't expected that his assailant would be one of Noel's subordinates. Did she hate him enough to want him dead? The police had gathered enough evidence to confirm that the main culprit behind the attack was a man named Cole. He was also from Noel's country, adding another layer of suspicion. Adrian's anger was palpable. He hadn't anticipated that Noel would go to such lengths to harm him. It had been more than six years since their relationship ended, and she had changed, harboring a malevolent heart. Since the police were now involved, Adrian decided to leave it to the authorities. Cole would face the consequences of his actions under the law. Eleanor was aware that Noel was behind the attack, and she shared Adrian's anger. She only hoped that justice would be served, and Noel and her associates would pay for their crimes. Meanwhile, in Noel's country, ever since Noel lost her leg, Cole had been by her side, providing care and emotional support. Noel had never truly noticed his feelings before, but now, in her moment of weakness and despair, she had come to appreciate his unwavering devotion. Sometimes it took a crisis to make one realize the true value of those around them. In the past, Noel had dismissed Cole's love, thinking him unworthy. But today, she saw him as the person who cared for her the most. However, it was too late. The police were granted permission to enter the country to apprehend Cole, and they collaborated closely with local authorities. As Cole was detained by the police, Noel clung to him, overwhelmed with regret. This is my fault, Cole. I'm so sorry, she sobbed, covering her face. This is my responsibility alone. I will face the consequences. Miss... You must continue living and not give up, Cole said, willing to bear the weight of his actions. Noel watched as Cole was led away by the police, filled with immense regret. She realized that she should never have plotted against Adrian and should have accepted Cole's love long ago. Now it was too late. Her leg was gone and her position in the family was vulnerable to her envious cousins. Noel had become a tragic figure. Cole was in the States for the trial. Noelle's family also hurriedly returned to the country and brought her back for treatment. However, in just a few months, this young woman, who had once been famous, found herself confined to a wheelchair due to her actions. It was all her own doing. She had sent the man who loved her to prison and had also caused harm to the man she deeply cared for. Now, she was left in a miserable state. A month later, a plane from overseas touched down smoothly at the international airport. A man and a woman emerged from the aircraft. The man was handsome and the woman was beautiful. It was winter and as they stepped off the plane, a chilly breeze brushed against their faces. Eleanor shivered from the cold and wrapped her coat tightly around herself. An arm appeared on her shoulder, pulling her into a warm trench coat. Eleanor carefully stood closer to him and whispered, Be careful with your wound. It's all right, Adrian replied with a soft chuckle, still shielding her from the cold as they walked forward. As they reached the exit of the VIP passage, Eleanor heard a familiar voice saying, Mommy, Daddy. 
Beyond the passage, a small figure sat in Henry's arms. It could only be Flynn. Kayla and Summer had also come to welcome them with smiles on their faces. Henry noticed that his son was in good spirits and looked healthy. His heart finally eased. He hadn't imagined that his son would be in danger overseas for more than a month. Eleanor rushed to the entrance of the tunnel with anticipation. Little Flynn came down from his grandfather's arms and headed straight for her. Eleanor bent down and lifted him. They hadn't seen each other for more than a month, and she missed him terribly. She couldn't resist kissing his soft cheek multiple times. Mommy, I missed you so much, Flynn pouted, his eyes turning red as if he'd been abandoned. Eleanor held him close, patting his back gently. It's Mommy's fault. Mommy won't be away for so long again. Be good and don't cry. Adrian reached out, and just as Flynn was about to ask Daddy for a hug, Eleanor extended her arm, preventing him from crawling into Adrian's arms. Mommy hasn't hugged you in a long time. You've grown a bit heavier. Adrian caressed Flynn's head and kissed his soft hair. Summer's clear voice reached them. Brother, sis-in-law, you're back. Eleanor was slightly taken aback by the change in address. Her cheeks turned slightly red, but she accepted the new address. Kayla also approached them. Flynn missed you guys so much. Henry had originally intended to pat Adrian's shoulder, but upon remembering his injury, he hesitated. He withdrew his hand and asked directly, Are you all right? Dad, I'm okay, Adrian replied with a smile. Seeing that his mother wasn't worried, it seemed his father had kept this secret. The family returned home and settled into a spacious SUV. Laughter and conversation filled the vehicle. Eleanor breathed a sigh of relief. She was finally back, and she cherished every moment spent with her son. She also missed Valerie and hoped to arrange a get-together soon if they could find the time. Upon returning to their villa, Henry found an opportunity to invite Adrian into his study. Eleanor knew what they were likely discussing. She and Flynn were taken outside by summer to see the plants and vegetables they had been growing, giving them a sense of accomplishment. So beautiful. Flynn, you're amazing, Eleanor praised her son. In the evening, Eleanor put Flynn to bed and told him bedtime stories. Mother and son settled back into their usual routine. Flynn slept in mommy's arms, clutching a plush toy. At around 11 o'clock, Flynn drifted off to sleep. Eleanor gazed at her son's peaceful sleeping face, gently kissing his forehead. In her eyes, her motherly love shone brightly. She heard footsteps and saw the door open slightly. Adrian entered the room wearing pajamas. Eleanor was surprised and whispered, what are you doing here? Sleeping, Adrian replied in a soft voice. He lay down next to Flynn. No, you're injured. What if our son kicks you? Eleanor expressed her concern. Their son could be quite active in his sleep. I'm not worried, Adrian reassured her. As long as he could sleep beside his wife and son, he was content. You, Eleanor couldn't argue with him. If I'm not beside you, I can't sleep, Adrian admitted in a husky voice. His dark eyes were fixed on her and also landed gently on Flynn's face. On this cold winter night, his eyes seemed to radiate warmth, and Eleanor, holding her son tightly, felt herself gradually drifting into a peaceful slumber. On a cold winter night, to someone without a partner, it lacked warmth. Valerie returned to her own home to sleep, as Gary was away on a business trip. Valerie had finally re-established a relationship with her parents, and now she visited them more frequently. With her sister often going out, it fell on her to spend more time with her family. As for Valerie, she was currently out of work, but she had a lineup of several commercials scheduled after the new year. They were all top-tier projects, and when those contracts were finalized, they would bring her considerable fame. This further proved the advantages of having a boyfriend in the entertainment industry. December had arrived, and the new year was just around the corner. Valerie was looking forward to a different kind of new year.
Eleanor returned to work at the Greenwich Group after a few days of rest. Melissa had been managing things efficiently during her absence, thanks in part to Arnold's daily reports, which left little room for error. Melissa didn't say much upon Eleanor's return, and when Melissa Eleanor took over, of Arnold, she felt a bit but she was wary of Eleanor. However, the one Melissa truly needed to fear was Adrian's top special assistant, Arnold. Melissa decided to call Eleanor directly to her office. Eleanor put aside any lingering resentment and faced her with composure. She patiently bided her time, waiting for the day when she could also send Melissa to prison and make her answer for all her crimes. Eleanor, enjoy your time overseas. The company isn't too busy right now, so it's all right if you don't rush back to work, Melissa said with a laugh. Eleanor's presence in front of her made her eyelids twitch. I will be returning to work, Eleanor replied calmly. Arnold is quite impressive. He's done good work, so I even gave him a raise. Melissa smiled. She appreciated Arnold's efficiency. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot to mention it. The company's annual meeting is coming up. Will you be attending? Melissa asked with a fake smile. I don't think I'll have the time to go, Eleanor replied. She wasn't particularly fond of such gatherings. It's no big deal. Get back to work. Melissa pretended to be engrossed in her paperwork. Eleanor turned and walked to the balcony that her father used to use for smoking. She stood there for a moment, reminiscing about her father who had refrained from smoking in the office and often came here instead. There used to be a chair here, but it was now gone, leaving the space feeling particularly cold. Eleanor walked back inside and headed for the elevator. As she reached the elevator, its doors opened, revealing Melissa's assistant, Clara, who was guiding a disheveled-looking man inside. Upon seeing Eleanor, Clara's expression showed clear panic. She urged the man in the elevator, Hurry up! Come out! The man glanced at Eleanor, his eyes lighting up with greed as he stared at her. He licked his lips and said, There are so many beauties in your company. Don't talk nonsense, Clara warned him. The man mumbled, I'm a distinguished guest of Melissa. Eleanor happened to step into the elevator when she heard his words. An idea immediately popped into her mind. Melissa had a penchant for befriending wealthy and influential individuals, but now this unkempt man, dressed casually with a full beard, claimed to be her distinguished guest. If this man didn't have some leverage over Melissa, or if he wasn't particularly important to her, Melissa wouldn't even want to see someone like him. Eleanor instantly thought of Andrew, her father's attending physician who had drowned and died. It was clear that Melissa had been behind it. Could this man have something to do with that incident? Or perhaps he was someone Melissa had used as a bribe? Eleanor's heart tightened. Staying close to Melissa was bound to uncover evidence against her. Back in her office, Eleanor called Arnold over and told him to stop working and wait downstairs. She decided to follow this man and learn his name and occupation. Arnold readily agreed and proceeded downstairs to wait. Upstairs, Melissa, with a disgusted expression, observed the disheveled man sitting on her luxurious leather sofa. She crossed her arms and said, Didn't I tell you? You can ask for money, but you're not allowed to show up at my company. If I could have found you easily, I wouldn't have come to trouble you, the man replied. We settled our previous deal, and I paid you a considerable sum, Melissa said, fixing a cold gaze on him. The man crossed his arms and legs, appearing nonchalant. That's true. The money you gave me last time was substantial, but I've already spent quite a bit. Melissa, in less than a year, you've become the CEO of this company. I've seen you in newspapers, magazines, and on the news. You're quite the celebrity. Enough of your nonsense. Melissa's face turned green with anger. I'm just stating facts. You know better than anyone what's in your heart. I won't expose your background. As long as I have money to spend, my lips are sealed, the man shamelessly asserted. Aren't you worried about revealing your involvement? You'd have to face the consequences too, Melissa tried to threaten him. I'm not in the same boat as you. You have a company, employees, a family, and a daughter. I have nothing, 
My life is practically worthless. I could die anywhere, the man retorted, showing no fear. Melissa was growing increasingly anxious. Fifty million dollars was not a small sum, but if she gave in this time, this man might come back for a third or fourth round. She'd be stuck paying him off indefinitely, which she didn't want. I can offer you a maximum of ten million dollars. I don't have much cash on hand, Melissa said through gritted teeth. A hint of dissatisfaction flashed across the man's eyes. Ten million is too little. Make it twenty million. You! Melissa screamed. If you don't comply, I might just reveal that you ordered me to eliminate Andrew. Then neither of us will have it easy, the man threatened. Melissa was genuinely troubled by this matter. She reluctantly agreed. Fine, I'll give you 20 million. Just don't appear before me again. Then it's settled. The duration of my absence from your life will depend on how long this 20 million lasts me. The man agreed. Zack was content with getting 20 million. It would allow him to live comfortably for a while. He said, All right, all right. Give me the 20 million first. We can discuss further later. You can leave now. I'll settle the payment later, Melissa said, clenching her fists, her face pale with anger. Zack placed a slip of paper with a bank account number on her desk and tapped it twice. Make sure you don't mess this up. I won't keep quiet until I see the money. Zack was in high spirits as he left the building and drove away in an SUV. Arnold's car followed closely behind him. Eleanor remained in her office, eagerly awaiting updates from Arnold. She was anxious about his safety, not knowing what challenges he might face. Unable to contain her worry, she decided to call Adrian. Adrian offered comfort, assuring her that Arnold was a cautious and capable individual. Nearly an hour passed, and finally Arnold called Eleanor with an update. Miss Greenwich, I've been tailing the man. He withdrew a substantial amount of cash from the bank and entered an underground casino. It appears he's gambling there, Arnold informed. Did he withdraw a large sum? Eleanor inquired. Judging by the bag he's carrying, it's at least $500,000, Arnold estimated. Eleanor thought to herself, this man didn't seem like someone who earned his money legitimately. Could it be that Melissa had provided him with these funds? Arnold, can you try to identify him? Eleanor asked. I've already taken a photo of him and I've asked a friend to investigate. We should receive some information soon, Arnold assured her. All right. You can return for now. We'll investigate this matter further, Eleanor instructed him. Eleanor didn't currently have access to the company's finances because her plan was to infiltrate the finance department first. However, if she could gain control of the company's financial department, she might uncover some useful information. She wondered how much Melissa had given to this man, and if the sum was substantial, it could potentially be traced back to the company's accounts. Eleanor sighed, contemplating how she could gain more evidence. She considered asking Adrian if he had any ideas. She decided to call him. Hello. Arnold just informed me, and I think your intuition was right. Adrian answered the call. Eleanor had faith in her instincts and sighed, saying, If I can gather more evidence, I might be able to confirm it. What more evidence are you looking for? Adrian inquired. I believe a life's worth is not insignificant. This man must want more from Melissa, and I doubt Melissa would keep such a large sum of money in her own account. She might have transferred money from the company's accounts, Eleanor explained. Adrian praised her analysis once more. Your deduction is on point, and it's highly likely. If I'd known, I would have focused on the finance department. Then I might have had access to the expenditure records, Eleanor remorsed. Don't worry, I have a solution, Adrian assured her confidently. Eleanor felt relieved. You have a solution? Of course. Hacking into your company's internal network isn't difficult. With the right expert, we can discreetly investigate the accounts, Adrian suggested. Eleanor was delighted. With his assistance, the investigation would yield more results. She couldn't resist playfully saying, So, how will you help me? 
Call me husband and I'll tell you, Adrian teased. Eleanor chuckled, realizing he was teasing her. She playfully acquiesced. All right, hubby, please help me. Okay, wife, Adrian responded gently. Eleanor sat alone in her office, feeling a warm sensation spreading through her despite being alone. She ended the call and continued to wait for updates. After some time, Arnold returned with a young man. The newcomer wore glasses and he exuded an air of sophistication, yet his eyes hinted at the intelligence within. Eleanor knew he was a hacker sent by Adrian. Arnold introduced him, Miss Greenwich, this is my friend. Eleanor greeted him with a smile, acknowledging his role in their operation. He knew her identity and greeted her respectfully. Hello. All right, let's get to work, Arnold instructed him. Eleanor watched as they entered her office. Her goal was to secure evidence against Melissa. Meanwhile, in Melissa's office, the head of the finance department handed her a report. She told him, ma'am, here's the information you requested. Melissa accepted the report, her nerves on edge as she cautioned him, don't share this matter with anyone. Handle these funds discreetly and make sure no one discovers anything. Understood. The reason the head of the finance department still held his position was because he had access to Melissa's off-the-books expenses. Now, he was earning a substantial salary and maintaining a fictitious account for Melissa was no trouble. Melissa watched him leave and sighed in relief. Now that this money had been channeled through the company's accounts, she didn't need to use her own funds. With the company under her control and the shareholders not inquiring about her expenses, she could have her extravagant costs reimbursed through the company's accounts. However, she remained cautious regarding this $20 million debt. After connecting to the company's internal network, Heiser, the hacker's nimble fingers, expertly navigated the system. He broke through the Greenwich Group's firewall and accessed the financial expenditure records. Within moments, he retrieved a year's worth of expenditure reports, which he promptly copied. On Eleanor's computer, Arnold sent her a copy of the data. She didn't expect Adrian's team to work so efficiently. She eagerly opened the files, revealing over a hundred expenses from that day. There were more than 20 entries that had occurred over the past three hours. Among them was an expenditure of $20 million, which immediately caught her attention. Ordinary customers rarely had access to such large sums of money. This transaction seemed suspicious and the client's information was listed at the back. Eleanor quickly searched the company's client database, but couldn't find any record of this particular client. It appeared to be a fictitious entry. She couldn't help but wonder if this individual had ties to Melissa and if the $20 million had been supplied by her. Eleanor sighed, knowing that with the right evidence, she could ultimately send Melissa to prison. In the evening, Adrian's sports car awaited her as promised. Eleanor pulled out the expense records and planned to examine them with Adrian's help since she wasn't proficient in reading financial documents. Eleanor's heart raced. If she could uncover the truth behind Andrew's murder, she would slowly build a case against Melissa, ultimately leading to her imprisonment. As Adrian was about to pull away from a traffic light, his phone rang. He saw it was an international number causing his expression to darken. This could only be one person. His eyes turned cold, almost freezing. He stepped out he onto the corridor the with apprehension in his heart. He knew who was on the other end. Adrian, it's me, came Noel's weak voice. Adrian responded coldly. Is something the matter? Adrian, I'm sorry, Noel sobbed. Adrian remained silent. Cole was one of Noel's associates and she couldn't distance herself from his actions. This incident had effectively severed their ties. Adrian, I'll apologize on Cole's behalf, Noel quaked. Tell him he won't leave prison for the rest of his life. Adrian's voice turned even colder. Adrian, I've lost my leg. I've paid the price. I hope you can forgive me, Noel sobbed. Adrian's gaze remained unmoved as he coldly retorted, Noel, 
From now on, stay out of my life. What you've encountered and the price you've paid are no longer my concern. But if your associates dare to threaten me again, I won't show any mercy to you or your family. With a resounding click, Adrian ended the call. Eleanor, who had been observing from the garden, shifted her gaze toward him. In an instant, his cold, icy demeanor softened when he met her eyes. He approached her and their son. Upon reaching Eleanor, she couldn't help but ask curiously, whose call was that just now? It was a work-related call. Nothing important, Adrian replied with a smile. Eleanor couldn't be easily deceived. She tilted her head and studied him, saying, don't try to evade this, tell me the truth. Adrian's expression turned slightly serious and he admitted, it was Noel. Oh, what did she say? Eleanor blinked, eager to hear more. She apologized and mentioned that she's paid a price. She lost her leg. She asked for my forgiveness, Adrian replied, his expression darkening at the recollection. Eleanor didn't express any sympathy in her tone. I just hope she stays away from our lives. Adrian extended his hand, gently embracing her, and said in a low voice, I'll make sure she never comes near us again. Satisfied with his promise, Eleanor didn't delve further into the matter. Noel had suffered, and whatever had befallen her, she probably deserved it. At the Dane residence, Valerie had finished dinner and immediately dialed a number. She had to come back to her room to make the call, as she didn't dare to speak such intimate words in front of her parents. Although her father no longer opposed their relationship, she refrained from uttering explicit words when her parents were present. Valerie pulled out her phone and eagerly awaited the man on the other end to pick up. At this time, in the country where Gary was located, it was still afternoon, so he should be available to take the call. Hello? A deep, magnetic voice answered. Hey, what are you doing? Valerie pressed her phone closer to her ear, savoring the sound of his voice. Nothing special. I just finished a meeting and am about to return to the hotel. What about you? Gary asked. Of course I'm at home. You'll be back by tomorrow, right? Valerie pouted, feigning disappointment. I'll be back, Gary replied with unwavering assurance. Valerie couldn't help but smile. Okay, I'll be waiting for your return. Why are you waiting for me? Gary inquired, his voice huskier. Are you planning to surprise me when you return? Gary suggested with a teasing tone. All right. What kind of surprise do you want? Valerie chuckled. You'd better give me something substantial, like a dinner, a kiss, or a night with you. His alluring voice had a mesmerizing quality. Valerie's face blushed even through the phone. She turned over in bed and gazed up at the ceiling. Her lips curved into a smile. All right. If you can stand in front of me by 3 p.m. tomorrow, I'll have a surprise for you. If you're late, there won't be any surprises. Valerie also attempted to playfully deceive him. It was a request he couldn't fulfill. After all, it wasn't easy to fly across the globe on short notice. You're cunning, Gary playfully scolded. You're smart. So, do you want a surprise or not? If not, then I won't bother, Valerie quipped. You dare to be so cheeky just because you're on the other end of the phone, Gary warned. You guessed right. Since you're so far away, even if I provoke you, you can't do anything to me, right? Valerie grinned smugly. He then chuckled and added, Just you wait. When I get back, I'll give you a good scolding. I'll be waiting. Valerie hung up, satisfied with the playful banter. If she continued, she might get too flustered. That night, Adrian meticulously reviewed the internal accounts of the Greenwich Group. His keen eye quickly detected discrepancies within the accounts. The transfer of the 20 million had occurred that afternoon, likely hush money provided by Melissa to silence the man involved. Additionally, there were other irregularities in the accounts that raised Adrian's suspicions. However, since these were part of Greenwich Group's internal records, he decided to leave them for now. Eleanor could use her status as the second shareholder to question Melissa about them in the future. 
However, the 20 million transaction was a glaring issue. $20 million is a significant sum, not something an ordinary person would casually give away. Melissa must have had a compelling reason, Eleanor stated with conviction. She believed that this man was their key to uncovering the truth. Tomorrow, once Arnold confirms the man's identity, we can proceed with our plan. We'll make him reveal everything and involve the police, Eleanor continued. If we proceed this way, there's a chance that this man might expose Melissa's involvement, especially if he feels cornered. It won't be difficult to bring her to justice. She clenched her fists in determination. Melissa would have to pay for her actions. Adrian gently held her hand and reassured her, don't worry, her reckoning will come soon. Later that night, Eleanor couldn't sleep because of the ongoing investigation. Beside her, Flynn had already drifted off into a peaceful slumber. It had been about a month since they were separated, but he had clung to her even more after the reunion. Eleanor embraced her son and gazed at his innocent and adorable face. She sighed softly. She didn't want her heart to be consumed by hatred. She wanted to return to her previous self, to be able to accompany her son and live a peaceful and joyful existence. That night, Adrian didn't come to spend the night, as he had an overseas video conference scheduled. He didn't want to disturb their mother-son time. Early the next morning, Arnold delivered some good news. The man's identity had been confirmed. His name was Zack, an individual with no legitimate occupation. Furthermore, Zack had a criminal record and had previously served in the military, giving him the skills to carry out harmful actions. Eleanor was almost certain that Zack was the murderer who had helped Melissa eliminate the doctor. Andrew was the very person who had conspired with her to murder her father, making Melissa responsible for two lives. Eleanor now had a lead. Her next goal was to make Zack confess to his crimes. However, she knew he wouldn't easily admit to murder. Aside from the Andrew case, the investigation had been closed for six months and had been somewhat hasty. To reopen it, they would need new evidence to support their claims. Extracting the truth from Zack's lips wouldn't be straightforward. At this point, Eleanor didn't want to rush. She intended to gradually unravel the case step by step. Before that, she needed to thoroughly investigate the company's accounts and trace the money back to Melissa. With her current status, Eleanor had the authority to access the company's financial records. She just needed to capitalize on Melissa's absence to have the finance department generate a report for her. Although Melissa's schedule was mainly handled by her assistant, Eleanor had a trick up her sleeve. By tracking Melissa's car, she could stay informed about her whereabouts. While Adrian wanted to expedite the process and resolve the matter swiftly, Eleanor was determined to take charge. She believed it was her responsibility. Adrian's bodyguard reported around 11 in the morning that Melissa had left her residence. The bodyguard trailed her to Sean's home, indicating that Sean had returned home after a period of separation from his wife. Adrian executed additional maneuvers, luring Sheldon, the general manager of the finance department, out of the office. Eleanor deduced that only Sheldon was directly involved in Melissa's illicit activities within the finance department, while other employees remained oblivious. Eleanor's sudden visit to the finance department cast an air of seriousness throughout the department. Rumors had circulated that Miss Greenwich and Melissa were involved in a dispute across different branches of the company. Consequently, Eleanor was perceived as a strict authority figure. Standing in the office, Eleanor scanned the employees present and inquired, who is currently overseeing the finance department? The general manager is not in, someone reported. Who is in charge in his absence? She asked. Miss Greenwich, do you have permission for this? A middle-aged man nervously stepped forward. Despite being in his 40s, he dared not meet Eleanor's gaze directly. Eleanor maintained her stern demeanor, stating, I'd like to review the company's financial report for the entire year, and I expect it on my desk within 10 minutes. Miss Greenwich, does ma'am approve of this? 
The middle-aged man, aware of Melissa's leadership, hesitated to comply. Eleanor smiled slyly and said, Are you questioning my authority to access this information? No, the finance department typically operates under Mrs. Melissa's purview. I was merely inquiring as a matter of procedure, the man stuttered. If the report isn't on my desk within ten minutes, consider yourself out of a job today. Eleanor's unyielding tone allowed no room for resistance. The man began to panic. Losing his position wouldn't be easy to accept. Very well, I'll have it printed and delivered to your desk immediately. Eleanor then turned and exited the office. The employees breathed a sigh of relief. While they had heard about Kendra, they never anticipated Eleanor to be someone who held such charm and confidence. Her demeanor, despite her beauty, exuded authority. In less than 10 minutes, an assistant arrived with the annual financial report. Eleanor perused the document and observed no alterations from the one she had seen the previous night. It was not an edited version. The prior evening, Adrian had provided her with over a dozen discrepancies within the accounts. Now, Eleanor delegated Arnold to investigate further. Focusing on the client data in question, they aimed to confirm their legitimacy. Melissa had likely executed her scheme by using a shell company to transfer funds, constituting commercial fraud. Eleanor had a feeling she was on the right track. She felt she had finally found her Noon, evil stepmother to two A charismatic figure emerged from the airport. Gary's assistant handed him the car keys. Mr. Stewart, aren't you returning to the company? No, I have something important to attend to, Gary replied, his eyes filled with anticipation. He glanced at his watch and smiled. For her, he had cut short a meeting and caught a plane. He had to reap tangible rewards. Gary's sports car raced through the streets, heading straight for the Dane residence. Valerie was engrossed in watching a movie and couldn't tear herself away. She admired the female lead's acting skills and indulged in snacks, she had completely forgotten the playful promise she made the night before. Besides, she was confident that Gary wouldn't make it back in time. She chuckled a few times, drawing Lily's attention, who pushed the door open. Hearing her daughter's laughter, Lily couldn't help but glance at her. Her eyes brimmed with maternal love. I've cut up some fresh fruit for you. Don't always munch on snacks. Eat some fruit, she advised. Thank you, Mom. You're so good to me, Valerie smiled. You're my daughter. Being good to you is only natural, Lily chuckled. That's great. Sis isn't as fortunate as me. So lucky. Valerie grinned proudly. The next time she called her sister, she'd have to flaunt her position at home. Lily found her daughter's quirky personality amusing. However, her elder daughter had grown mature and steady over the years, no longer relying on her as she had in her youth. Now, her younger daughter had reverted to a more childlike role, seeking her support once more. Mom, you should eat some too, Valerie offered. Why are you becoming so careless with yourself these days? Remember, you have Gary in your life now. I'm worried about what he will think if he sees you like this, Lily said. Her concerns were understandable. After learning of Gary's background, she was concerned. Her daughter was just a small artist in his company, while he was the big boss. What if he lost interest in her? Valerie's response left her mother somewhat worried. She nodded and said, I'm not bad either. It's just that Gary is exceptionally outstanding and he has the kind of power which can be scary. If he doesn't choose me, then he doesn't choose me. Valerie pouted as she spoke but her heart was slightly heavy, as if Gary genuinely had no interest in her. Lily didn't want to say anything more. Instead, she suggested, don't eat too many snacks, you might gain weight. Valerie watched her mother leave, feeling a bit speechless. She took a deep breath and decided to give up snacks. She didn't want to become someone who wasn't worthy of Gary. She was determined to quit snacking. Just then, her phone suddenly rang on the table. She picked it up and saw that it was none other than Gary calling. 
Her heart raced as she quickly answered, Hello, have you returned? Do you remember what you said last night? He asked. What did I say last night? She pretended to forget about it. If I can stand in front of you before three in the afternoon, you'll reward me. Gary whispered in a husky tone. But you didn't come back, right? Valerie had a bad feeling about this. Stand by the window and look out into the yard, Gary said. Before he could finish, Valerie rushed to the window, pushed it open, and spotted a tall, slender figure standing there. He was talking on the phone and smiled when he saw her. Valerie covered her mouth in excitement. He had returned. Lily also came out to welcome him. Gary, come in quickly. Valerie is upstairs. Gary put away his phone and smiled at her. Mrs. Dane, it's been a while. It has indeed been a while. Have some tea, Lily offered. Let me check on Valerie first. Gary couldn't wait to see her. She's upstairs. Go on up. Lily was also overjoyed and let out a sigh of relief. Gary ascended the stairs step by step. Valerie had already rushed back to her room and was washing her face in the bathroom. Just as she was about to change into something nice, there was a knock on the door. She was still wearing her winter pajamas, which her mother had bought for her. They weren't fashionable, but they kept her warm. Of course, staying warm was good, so Valerie had been wearing the same dark red pajamas all day, from morning until now. Valerie intended to salvage her appearance somewhat before opening the door. However, she barely had a chance to adjust her outfit before the door swung open. She quickly tried to cover what had just been exposed and tugged her attire into place. Standing outside was a man in a black suit, looking like a big shot fresh from an important meeting. Gary smiled and said, I'll claim my reward myself. Valerie was promptly pressed against the wall by Gary. Valerie regretted her words. In the future, she'd think twice before boasting. After all, there seemed to be nothing this man couldn't do. A passionate kiss ensued, leaving Valerie almost breathless. She was left panting and nestled in Gary's arms, her cheeks flushed crimson. She swore never to make such a promise again, as this man was now claiming his reward in such a dominant manner. Gary found himself in her boudoir at this moment. He had savored the reward quite thoroughly, causing a blazing heat to course through his entire body, making him exceedingly uncomfortable. Valerie's thoughts cleared and she realized where they were. She hastily pushed him away slightly, panic in her eyes. This is my parents' home. Don't act recklessly. Gary took a step back and observed the shy Valerie with his arms crossed. Even in simple pajamas, she exuded a pleasant aura. Perhaps this was the essence of love. No matter what she wore, she had become the most beautiful person in his eyes. Valerie was even more embarrassed now. She quickly reached out and covered his eyes, stop looking. Frustratingly, she was too short to fully cover his eyes. Gary reached out, grasped her hands, and pulled both of her arms behind her back, effectively placing her in an embrace. Their bodies pressed together, and Valerie felt even more embarrassed. Let go. When are you planning to move back to my place? Gary asked in a low, husky voice. It depends on the situation, Valerie replied coyly. She truly wanted to move in with him. I want you to move in tonight, Gary declared. All right then, I'll inform my mother. Valerie didn't push the matter further. In her heart, she was already considering it. At home, her parents doted on her, and at his place, he spoiled her as well. She didn't mind where she lived. Besides, her parents had indicated that they wouldn't interfere in her dating life anymore. There's a dinner gathering tonight, and I plan to take you with me to announce our relationship officially to everyone. Are you okay with that? Gary held her tightly. Tonight? Valerie looked at him nervously. She knew that this banquet would be attended by everyone in the entertainment industry. The thought of publicly confirming her relationship with him filled her with excitement. Yes, tonight, Gary replied, 
leaning in and almost touching her ear with his lips. Okay then, I'll go with you. Valerie finally agreed, determined to take this next step with him. Gary took a moment to sit down and enjoy a few cups of tea. Valerie collected her belongings from upstairs and her mother, Lily, had no objections. She believed that matters of the heart were best left to the young and she didn't want to interfere too much. Her elder daughter's marriage was still up in the air and she was glad that her younger daughter was taking steps forward. Valerie gathered a few sets of clothing and descended. Since she often stayed at Gary's place, he had a complete wardrobe for her there. She didn't have to worry about running out of clothes. Mom, we're heading out now. Take good care of yourselves and stay healthy, Valerie said to her parents. All right, go ahead. We'll inform your dad later. Don't worry about us, Lily replied. Mrs. Dane, please come over to visit whenever you have the time, Gary invited. Of course, I'll visit when I have the chance, Lily replied with a smile, waving them off. Gary's car pulled out of the driveway and merged onto the main road. It was getting late, and Gary suggested, Let's head back first. Your gown is already at my place. Did you bring my gown back from overseas? Valerie asked in surprise. I got it just for you for tonight. I was worried it might be too low cut, Gary replied with a smile, demonstrating his impeccable taste. Valerie chuckled. You're considerate. She recalled how many times she'd been upstaged by other actresses because her chest wasn't ample enough. Many actresses had opted for breast enhancements, stealing her limelight during photo shoots and events. When Valerie returned to Gary's villa, a sense of familiarity washed over her, as if she were the lady of the house. She slowly walked in, and suddenly a pair of arms enveloped her. Valerie was lifted off her feet. She quickly wrapped her arms around his neck. What are you doing? I'm carrying you upstairs, Gary declared, carrying her up step by step until they reached her dressing room. There was a mannequin adorned with the evening gown she was planning to wear tonight. Wow, it's so beautiful. Valerie couldn't help but praise him. This man had an impeccable sense of style. Are you touched? Gary inquired. Yes, very much, Valerie replied sincerely. Since you're touched, would you like to express your gratitude? Gary teased. How? Valerie looked up at him inquisitively. In the next moment, she was pinned to the sofa as he kissed her passionately. When Gary finally released Valerie, she was left breathless. She couldn't help but wonder if this man had become addicted to kissing recently. He seemed to miss her immensely. Though he had always respected her and refrained from making advances before their engagement, it didn't mean he had to be a gentleman. Furthermore, tonight held a surprise in store for her. It was already five o'clock and there was plenty of time before the event at seven. Gary instructed the makeup artist and assistant to help Valerie prepare for the night. Valerie sat in her dressing room, having her makeup done by the artist while her assistant took care of her dress. A set of jewelry lay nearby. Gary stood by, watching her intently. Once her makeup was nearly complete, he quietly excused himself and went to his bedroom. From a drawer beside his bedside table, he retrieved a golden box. Inside rested a diamond ring glimmering brightly. Gary picked up the diamond ring and stowed it away in his suit pocket. Although it was light, it held great significance for him tonight. Valerie stood before the mirror, adorned in a graceful white evening gown. The dress exuded elegance and a touch of sacredness. The occasion was grand and her appearance her was nothing short. Next to her, Gary was already waiting patiently. Do I look good? Valerie asked him with a smile. Yes, Gary replied, not sparing any compliments. He reached out his hand and guided her. Valerie gracefully held her evening dress as they made their way downstairs. Tonight, in the heart of the city, a glamorous dream dinner was set to take place, bringing together the top celebrities from the entertainment industry to witness the occasion. Valerie settled into the back seat of Gary's car, gazing at the neon-lit streets beside her. Her delicate and beautiful face was illuminated, 
resembling a fairy from another world. Gary had been holding her hand throughout the journey. His warm touch radiated a comforting warmth, making Valerie's heart feel content and harmonious. Despite the winter chill outside, the inside of the car felt like a warm spring day. Upon exiting the car, Gary's bodyguard draped a trench coat over him, while Valerie was enveloped in a soft white mink coat. He held her close as they entered the inviting warmth of the hotel venue. Inside, they were greeted by a luxurious and grand banquet hall. A red carpet stretched toward the main table, with photographers capturing the moment. Valerie couldn't help but feel a tightening in her chest. Their arrival had garnered the attention of all the reporters. Gary held her hand and guided her down the red carpet. Camera flashes illuminated their path, creating a melody of lights. Valerie clung tightly to his hand and greeted her fellow media friends along the way. After months of relative obscurity, her sudden reappearance in the media's spotlight had drawn everyone's attention. Valerie signed her name, and beside her, Gary picked up a pen and signed his name right next to hers. She couldn't help but feel a sweet warmth in her heart. Being pampered by a man felt wonderful. Inside the banquet hall, female celebrities, entertainment industry professionals, and fashion elites filled the room, all exuding their radiance and vying for attention. As Valerie and Gary entered, there was a momentary hush in the room. After a few seconds of silence, all eyes focused on the couple. While rumors of their relationship had circulated before, this public appearance confirmed the truth. Valerie and Gary were indeed dating. Among the female celebrities, jealousy and envy were palpable. They were curious to see what charm Valerie possessed that had captured the heart of the young and handsome Mirage Group, CEO. Valerie's attire only added to the allure. It was no ordinary dress. It exuded beauty, style, and elegance. Yet her beauty outshone the garment. Mr. Stewart, you've arrived. This way, please. The event organizers immediately approached Gary with the utmost respect. Gary courteously escorted Valerie over. Valerie was acquainted with many celebrities and greeted them warmly. However, she noticed the smiles from some female celebrities were tinged with envy and pretense. Valerie understood that her fellow celebrities couldn't help but be surprised by her transformation from an equal to Gary's girlfriend, a significant status change in their industry. In the entertainment world, genuine friendships were rare, and most connections were driven by self-interest. Valerie, however, didn't want to portray herself as aloof or friendless. That wasn't her style. Even as she got closer to Gary, she remained true to herself and maintained her manners. Tonight, Gary was the center of attention. Several female celebrities approached him immediately upon entering the room, each secretly scheming to make a lasting impression. Yet, apart from basic courtesy, Gary hardly paid any attention to them, except for Valerie. Nonetheless, some female celebrities still attempted to get close. While Valerie was conversing with him and the organizers, an A-list female star, Jenny, took advantage of her past collaborations with Valerie to approach her. Jenny wrapped her arm around Valerie's and feigned familiarity. Valerie, it's been a while. You still look as beautiful as ever. Valerie recognized Jenny and returned the smile. Long time no see. Jenny leaned in and introduced herself to Gary all the while maintaining an intimate posture with Valerie. Hello, Mr. Stewart. I'm Jenny, one of your artists. Gary remained composed and didn't offer a handshake. Valerie, realizing Jenny's intentions, politely disengaged herself and said, excuse us for a moment. Jenny seemed bewildered by the sudden change. Gary's earlier cold demeanor had made it clear he had no interest in her. However, in terms of talent, work, acting skills and looks, Jenny was no less than Valerie. So what had Valerie done to capture the attention of the Mirage Group CEO? Valerie and Gary had only taken a few steps when they encountered another female celebrity with whom Valerie had worked before. Valerie, she called out, running over like a butterfly. 
Hello, Emily, Valerie greeted her with a smile, keeping Gary firmly by her side. Gary's gaze fell upon Emily, who immediately tried to seduce him with her eyes. She reached out and introduced herself. Hello, Mr. Stewart. I'm Emily, a close friend of Valerie's. Gary maintained his aloof demeanor and didn't offer his hand. Valerie looked at him and suggested, Why don't you go greet your other guests? I'll catch up with my friend. I'll find you later, Gary said, moving in closer. He bent down to kiss her lovingly on the head before departing. With that, Valerie let go of his hand and led Emily away. Emily was taken aback. Valerie's ability to attract Gary's attention left her puzzled. Valerie felt his affection and warmth, her eyes filled with love as she watched him leave. Meanwhile, Quincy, who had been observing from the sidelines, couldn't help but envy Valerie. She began to realize just how much Gary loved Valerie. Valerie found herself surrounded by a group of female artists, some of whom had worked with her in the film industry. Naturally, they were curious about her experiences and were eager to know how she and Gary had crossed paths. Valerie smiled knowingly. She understood that in the cutthroat entertainment industry, any careless remark could be magnified a hundredfold or even a millionfold, potentially spiraling out of control. It was best to keep her relationship with Gary under wraps. Valerie, you're incredibly lucky. With so many artists under the Mirage Group, you're the one who caught the big fish. You had already secured your spot with Mr. Stewart before his true identity was revealed. I'm truly envious. Jealousy tainted some of their words, making it seem as if Valerie had used every trick in the book to win over Gary. Valerie simply replied with a faint smile, meeting someone is a matter of fate. While chatting with her fellow artists, Valerie noticed two women not too far away glaring at her with envy. There was no mistaking their identity, her nemeses, Sasha and Hannah. Reflecting on her initial encounters with Gary, Valerie couldn't help but credit these two women for their help. It was their meddling that had caused her to make a fool of herself in front of Gary several times. However, it also helped her forge a deeper connection with him. Valerie had no intention of thanking these matchmakers, though. Their unscrupulous tactics had made her look foolish and had embarrassed her. She maintained her gaze on them, and at that moment, Sasha and Hannah felt a shiver run down their spines. They quickly averted their eyes and dared not meet Valerie's gaze. At that moment, regret filled their hearts. They regretted their previous attempts to set up Valerie. If she ascended to the position of the CEO's wife, where would that leave them in the entertainment industry? Hannah and Sasha exchanged glances, realizing the precariousness of their situation. They felt a sense of foreboding about their future. The two of them slipped away from the crowd and found a quiet spot on the balcony. Sasha clenched her teeth and said, I can't believe Valerie managed to captivate Gary Stewart. When we pushed her into the limelight on the red carpet, we inadvertently helped her gain visibility in front of Gary. We had no idea that such a handsome young man was the CEO of Mirage Group. I'm filled with regret. Hannah was so frustrated she felt like banging her head against the wall. Sasha's eyes burned with resentment as she added, If Valerie truly becomes the CEO's wife, we'll have no place left in the entertainment industry. We'll lose access to all the good resources. That's right. Valerie is no saint. She's petty and holds grudges. Who knows how she'll treat us once she wields power and influence. She might even blacklist us. Hannah shared the same worries. As they continued to discuss their concerns, they couldn't help but feel that their future was bleak. Their faces were etched with bitterness, and they exchanged helpless glances. What should we do now? Do we just sit back and watch her take the CEO's wife's position? Hannah ground her teeth in frustration. No, we can't just accept our fate. Valerie might have won Gary's heart with her beauty, but does he truly love her that much? Sasha wore a determined look. I can read men. I refuse to believe that he's utterly devoted to her. So, what's your plan? Hannah asked. 
We need to do something to sabotage Valerie and Gary's relationship, ideally breaking them up, Sasha declared, narrowing her eyes. Her gaze was filled with resentment. Valerie continued to converse with her fellow artists, unaware of the plotting happening behind her back. Suddenly, the event's host's voice cut through the chatter, drawing everyone's attention. Thank you all for joining us tonight and making this evening so delightful. Next, it's our privilege to invite a distinguished guest to the stage. He is not only the president of Mirage Group, but also one of the organizers of this event. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Gary Stewart. As applause filled the room, Gary's tall, elegant figure ascended the stage. The host, though charming himself, seemed to fade into the background when compared to the charismatic presence of the entertainment industry's supreme figure. Valerie stood among the crowd, her gaze fixed on this remarkable man. At this moment, she couldn't help but feel a sense of vanity and pride because he was soon to be hers. Gary acknowledged the audience with a smile as his eyes scanned the room. Eventually, they settled on Valerie, and his expression became even warmer. His deep, gentle gaze made it evident to everyone where his focus lay. Feeling somewhat bashful, Valerie lowered her gaze. She had become the center of attention under his loving gaze. Gary began to speak, his voice low and magnetic, like a captivating melody. After delivering the opening remarks, his tone grew more serious, and his gaze remained fixed on Valerie. He addressed her directly. Next, I'd like to invite someone to join me on stage. Valerie, please come up. Valerie was taken aback by his unexpected summons. While she had grown accustomed to such events, she couldn't help but feel a bit flustered. She lifted her gown and walked hesitantly toward the stage. Jealous glances followed her ascent. Some people were practically turning green with envy. Among them, Sasha and Hannah stood out the most, their jealousy reaching a boiling point. Watching Valerie approach Gary, they felt a burning sense of envy. Valerie reached the stage, puzzled by why she was being called up. She expected that Gary would continue with the event after she joined him on stage. However, as she stood next to him, Gary suddenly knelt on one knee. His handsome face turned upward as he gazed at her with deep affection. The entire room was taken aback by this unexpected gesture. Even Valerie herself was in a state of shock, her mind going blank. At that moment, Gary revealed a dazzling and exquisite diamond ring, holding it in his hand. The light caught the diamond, making it sparkle like a radiant star, leaving everyone in awe. Miss Valerie Dane, will you marry me and make me the happiest man alive? Gary's voice was filled with profound love and anticipation. Valerie was so stunned that she covered her mouth. She couldn't believe what was happening. Gary was proposing to her. In front of a crowd of witnesses, he had gone down on one knee and proposed. It was a grand gesture, and Valerie momentarily forgot how to respond. Valerie, do me the honor. Please say yes, Gary urged, a hint of playfulness in his voice as he begged her. This utterance sent shockwaves through the audience below the stage. It implied that Gary had pursued Valerie, and now he was pleading with her to accept his proposal. Valerie's eyes welled up with tears. She pulled him to his feet, opened her arms, and embraced him tightly. Then, in a clear and resolute voice, she replied, I will. I'm willing to marry you. Gary's smile of joy lit up his face, and he held her close in his arms. Under the stage, applause broke out, with no one certain who had started it. Everyone began celebrating together, although the enthusiasm of some attendees was feigned. But who would dare to provoke Gary? At this moment, people showered their blessings upon Valerie like a gentle breeze. Little did they know the turmoil brewing behind the scenes as Sasha and Hannah Valerie contemplated there for a moment future. before sensing the hushed atmosphere around her. Swiftly, she wiped away her tears and gently withdrew from Gary's embrace. Her gaze dropped to the ring adorning her finger, and her heart was suffused with a profound sweetness. 
Gary, still holding her hand, led her off the stage. As they entered the midst of the crowd, congratulations poured in from all directions. Valerie, feeling a bit overwhelmed, nestled her head against Gary's chest. With him by her side, she knew that even if some people weren't genuine in their well wishes, they wouldn't dare to show it. Gary continued to clasp Valerie's hand as they made their way to a quiet lounge. He closed the door behind them, and before Valerie could react, he enfolded her in an embrace. With one hand cradling the back of her head and the other gently tilting her chin, he leaned down and kissed her tenderly. Valerie's heart raced uncontrollably. This couldn't be right, could it? The lively banquet was still in full swing outside, and here they were, locked in a passionate kiss. Tonight, her mind was blank, as if all her thoughts and breaths had been stolen by this man. Until the kiss finally ended, Valerie felt her strength drain away. She leaned softly against Gary's chest, her breath slightly labored, and her pretty face flushed with a rosy hue. Why didn't you give me a hint earlier? You made me so flustered. Valerie looked up at him, playfully chastising him. Why would I want to make you flustered? Gary chuckled softly. Valerie couldn't quite explain the mix of emotions swirling within her. She glanced down at the diamond ring and complimented, It's so beautiful. I love it. Gary continued to hold her hand, admiring the diamond ring he had chosen for her. His voice was soft and tender as he spoke. This is just the engagement ring. You can wear it for now. We'll get matching wedding rings when we get married. Sounds perfect. Valerie nodded, a contented smile gracing her lips. Gary bent down and couldn't resist capturing her rosy lips with his, You look stunning tonight. You look incredibly handsome tonight, Valerie replied. Let's leave soon. My purpose in coming here tonight was to let everyone witness my proposal to you. I wanted to make our relationship public and let everyone know that you're mine, Gary explained. Valerie was eager to leave as well. She took his hand and said, let's go. How about grabbing a bite to eat? I'm starving. Gary and Valerie exited the lounge, strolling along the corridor and bypassing the main venue. Unbeknownst to them, however, their engagement proposal had been witnessed by all the media reporters present that night. The live broadcast had been quickly disseminated, and news of their engagement spread like wildfire. In the Greenwich family's villa, Melissa was enraged with Eleanor's audacity. She called the general manager of the finance department over, how did this happen? How could you let Eleanor take advantage of my absence and obtain our company's financial reports? Melissa scolded in frustration. I'm truly sorry, Mrs. Miller. I had no idea that Eleanor would take the opportunity, in my absence, to have my subordinates print out the financial reports for her. Sheldon apologized, feeling helpless. Melissa knew that if Eleanor wanted those reports, she would find a way to acquire them. She realized that there were over 10 accounts in the reports, and it gave her a headache. She could only hope that Eleanor, being relatively new to the business world, wouldn't understand them fully. However, if she showed them to Adrian, things might get complicated. Damn it, I should never have allowed her to join the company in the first place, Melissa fumed, regretting her decision. Ma'am, please calm down. Those accounts were meticulously prepared, and it's unlikely she can decipher them. Besides, we have numerous client companies, making it difficult for her to discern which are real clients and which are just shell companies. Sheldon tried to reassure her. Melissa, though, became even more exasperated. She's in charge of the business department now. Our client list is in her hands. Do you think she won't notice? Right now, my only hope is that she'll merely take a glance and not make any moves. She gritted her teeth, realizing that she needed to find a way to remove Eleanor from the company. She couldn't afford to have her continue in this position. Ma'am, have you considered recruiting the Bureau of Knowledge to help us strip her of her power? Sheldon suggested. Melissa's eyes immediately lit up. You're absolutely right! I can indeed team up with those folks from the Bureau of Knowledge to protest against her position. With her qualifications, she's unfit for this role. Besides, 
Haven't there been recent losses? We should let the people at the Bureau know that she's incapable and would only bring losses to the company. She's utterly inept. Sheldon, seeing her enthusiasm, quickly chimed in. Yes, that's it. You're exceptionally astute. Melissa shot him a stern look. You think it's because of you? Go back and fire that useless subordinate of yours. I don't want to see him again. Of course, I'll take care of it immediately. He'll be gone in no time, Sheldon promised. Good. That's what I want. Melissa glared at him, her eyes filled with disdain. She believed that someone like Eleanor, who was relatively inexperienced, couldn't possibly outmaneuver her. It was laughable. Melissa promptly composed an email to the intelligence department. In three days, she planned to hold a meeting that, on the surface, would discuss the company's day-to-day -day operations. Yet, frequent meetings of this nature had begun to make some members of the intelligence department feel a growing sense of unease. Eleanor, too, received the email, and her heart skipped a beat. It seemed that Melissa had caught wind of her obtaining the financial expenditure report. Was Melissa gearing up to take action against her? She wanted to see how Melissa would handle this, and she eagerly awaited the upcoming meeting. After all, this wasn't about her stepping down. It was about Melissa's imminent downfall. When Arnold delivered the information, Eleanor informed him about the Bureau of Knowledge's meeting three days later. Arnold smiled and said, Miss Greenwich, I've nearly completed my investigation. Over the past year, the Greenwich Group has racked up at least 200 million unaccounted for financial expenditures using eight empty shell companies. Among them, since taking over the position, Melissa has been responsible for more than half of the unaccounted expenses. So, there's nothing to fear. Thank you, Arnold. It's all thanks to you, Eleanor expressed her gratitude sincerely. Arnold smiled and nodded. I'm pleased to be of help to you and Mr. Miller. Eleanor made a call to Adrian, who reassured her not to worry. All she needed to do was attend the meeting three days later. With his support, Eleanor felt a sense of calm. With the day finally approaching, she was eager to take on Melissa. She saw this as her opportunity to regain her father's company. Adrian stood in his office, deep in thought. After a moment of contemplation, he began making phone calls, requesting that Arnold provide him with the list of Greenwich Group shareholders. Melissa was now implicated in embezzling funds from the company, and Adrian needed to ensure that these shareholders would not side with her during the upcoming events. By three in the afternoon, the shareholders had received their invitations and were surprised to be summoned by Adrian himself. They drove to a meeting room he had reserved, as they didn't dare to decline an invitation from someone of Adrian's stature. In a society driven by personal interests, there was nothing more tempting than benefits. Adrian, contrary to his usual aloof demeanor, greeted the six young shareholders with a warm smile. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adrian Miller, and I have some matters I'd like to discuss with you. We've heard your name for a long time and have been eagerly awaiting a chance to meet you, the guests mused. Adrian reached for his coffee cup, took a sip gracefully, and then got straight to the point. Thank you for your kind words. Indeed, the woman I love the most, Eleanor Greenwich, is your fellow shareholder. She is now the second largest shareholder in the group. Yes, she is truly remarkable. She's a perfect match for you. The shareholders got to their bootlicking. He smiled and continued. Thank you for your compliments. She is indeed the woman I cherish the most. However, what I'm about to discuss might pique your interest even more. Eleanor recently asked the finance department to prepare a financial expenditure report. She discovered that the group's spending is riddled with irregularities. Several empty shell companies have been set up externally to manipulate the accounts. This has resulted in an evaporated expenditure of up to $200 million, Adrian remarked. The shareholders were shocked. Who's responsible for this? Who dared to blatantly embezzle the company's funds? They asked in utter confusion. The shareholders were immediately alarmed by the revelations. Not only were they alarmed, but they were also outraged, 
They had a vested interest in the company, and now they had learned that their annual dividends were meager, and they even suspected that someone was siphoning off the company's earnings. They were livid. Don't any of you want to follow in the footsteps of the current company management? Do you think the finance department's general manager would have the audacity to steal such a significant sum? Adrian inquired. The company's finances have always been under Sheldon's control. He is merely her lackey. She makes the decisions they discussed. Could it be Melissa? The speculation started. Adrian's lips curled into a knowing smile. Congratulations, you've guessed correctly. Melissa is responsible for this embezzlement. Since taking on her role, she has been responsible for misappropriating over 150 to 200 million dollars. She disregards you and pays you no heed, even when you're unable to receive any benefits. Are you willing to tolerate such a leader? This is despicable. She's been toying with us, knowing that we're not involved in the company's operations. She's manipulating us like this. One of them stood up with rage. Exactly. No wonder she rejected my proposal to join the company and work in a casual capacity. It turns out she was afraid that we'd uncover her schemes within the company, another one recalled. Thanks to Miss Greenwich's diligence and her discovery of these facts, we can now see the truth. I believe the most sensible person to lead the group is Miss Eleanor herself, they declared, making Adrian smirk. Shareholders were Seemed in an like uproar the having heard about the money laundering. Adrian spoke with utmost seriousness. Eleanor will be my wife soon. I'm going to try taking the Greenwich Group as a subsidiary under the Miller Corporation. I can guarantee that the company's profits will increase several fold every year. That means all of you will be making a lot more money. These words were like music to their ears, and everyone's eyes lit up. If Greenwich Group became a subsidiary of the Miller Group, that would be a win-win. Mr. Miller, you have our full support, one of them declared. Adrian smiled at their enthusiastic responses. Excellent, he said. I'm reassured. So three days from now, at the Greenwich Group's meeting, you all should know what to do. Eleanor will have a lawyer sue Melissa for embezzlement of company funds, and you will work together to push Melissa out. Leave the future of Greenwich Group to me. The group of shareholders eagerly agreed. This time, they were firmly on Eleanor's side and had no second thoughts. Moreover, even if they did have reservations, they wouldn't dare to offend Adrian. What future opportunities could they have? After the secret meeting concluded, Adrian informed Eleanor about the developments and reassured her to stay confident and do what she needed to do. Later in the afternoon, at around three o'clock, Eleanor accompanied Arnold to meet with two experienced criminal lawyers. After handing over the evidence, the lawyers expressed great confidence. If they managed to get Melissa out of her position, Melissa could face charges of financial misconduct. Eleanor would assume the role of the president of the group, while Melissa would become a suspect, unable to manage the company. As long as the evidence against Melissa held up, she would be facing a potential stint in a commercial crime prison, and Greenwich Group would be teetering on the brink of financial crisis. However, the best course of action would be for Greenwich Group to accept a buyout offer from Adrian. Later in the afternoon, Melissa, too, visited Sean's office with a worried expression. Sean was in a foul mood. He had never anticipated that Eleanor would swiftly secure 30% of Greenwich Group's shares. Darling, I have a suggestion. I think we should sign a contract immediately for a secret merger termination between the Miller Group and Greenwich Group. This way, whatever happens in Greenwich Group won't affect my company. It's a protective measure for my business, Sean proposed. Melissa, filled with anger, looked at Sean. What? Are you thinking of abandoning my company now? When I'm in trouble, why don't you help me out and get through it together? It's not that I don't want to help, but I have to safeguard my interests first. Only then can I assist you. Otherwise, both companies could drag each other down and that would be disastrous, Sean explained. Melissa reluctantly agreed, realizing that there was some logic to his words. 
she couldn't shake the ominous feeling that Eleanor had damning evidence against her. Fine, let's do it. Melissa consented. Sean asked his assistant to retrieve two contracts, and as soon as they were signed by both parties, the contract would take effect. Since it was just the two of them signing, there was no need to involve any outsiders. Once both parties signed, the contract would be legally binding. Seeing Melissa signing the contract, Sean breathed a sigh of relief. He felt that Melissa had no more value to offer him. She was simply a helpless figure unable to protect herself. Melissa, don't concern yourself too much with managing the company. I doubt Eleanor will be able to cause any trouble, Sean reassured her. Melissa sighed, her anxiety mounting. Eleanor wasn't someone to be underestimated. Sean, promise me that no matter what happens at Greenwich Group, you'll stand by my side and help me, Melissa pleaded. Of course I'll help you, Sean agreed. But deep down, he didn't think so. If Melissa found herself in deep trouble, he would find a way out on his own. He wasn't about to risk his money to save her company. In the afternoon, Valerie sat at home and watched a replay of the video. She watched herself embracing Gary on the screen. At the time, she couldn't discern his expression. But now, with various angles captured, she saw it. Seeing the tenderness in his eyes and the love that curled at the corners of his mouth, her heart swelled with warmth. A sweet feeling of love enveloped her. Just then, her phone rang, and she saw that it was her sister calling. She smiled and picked up. Hey, sis, congratulations, Valerie. I watched the video. He loves you. Kesha's voice rang through, expressing her happiness. Yes, thank you. Valerie was smiling ear to ear. Mom and Dad have finally agreed for you to marry him. When will the wedding be held? Keisha asked. There's still some time. We'll decide it with both the families together. Keisha, make sure you're back home for that. You must attend the meeting between our families, Valerie said. All right, I'll rush back as soon as possible. I'll be home next week and I'll take a 10-day leave to be with you at home. How are you doing? Kesha smiled. I'm doing fine. But don't push yourself too hard, sister. It's time for you to have some rest, Valerie offered. I don't have time. I can't even finish my work. Moreover, I'm about to be promoted, Kesha informed. Promoted again? Where to this time? Valerie inquired. Perhaps I'll be going to the president's house, Kesha said with a smile. Valerie realized that her sister was tired yet still happy for her and said, Oh, well. When you're back, let's have a good get-together. Sure thing. Once I wrap up my work, I'll rush back as soon as possible. You take care and look forward to the good times ahead. I won't miss a single day with you, Kesha assured her. In the evening, after a long day of work, Eleanor went out for dinner with Adrienne and Arnold. When she returned home, exhaustion overtook her, and she fell asleep in Adrienne's car. By the time it was half past nine at night, Adrian had already called his parents ahead of time and asked them to put Flynn to bed. He decided not to bring Flynn back to the villa that night. Adrian slowed down the car, no longer in a hurry to return. He looked at the weary girl sleeping under the streetlights, and his heart ached for her. It had been a tough day. Upon arriving at the villa's courtyard, it was nearly 10 o'clock. Adrian parked the car and went to the passenger seat, he didn't want to wake the sleeping woman and opted to carry her upstairs. Eleanor was still in a daze and partially woke up as she was being gently placed on the bed. She opened her eyes and saw the ceiling. Quickly turning her head, she spotted the man sitting on the edge of the bed, looking down at her with a smile. Why aren't you sleeping? You carried me upstairs? Eleanor asked anxiously as she sat up but your wounds haven't fully healed. Although Adrian felt some discomfort due to his injuries, he shrugged it off, not wanting her to worry. I'm fine. Let me see your chest, Eleanor insisted. Worried about his gunshot wound, she added. You should be more careful. I'm not sure it's a good idea to carry me like this. Adrian shook his head. It's just a small amount of blood. Don't be too concerned. 
Eleanor's eyes became slightly watery, and she buttoned his shirt properly. You're not allowed to do this next time. Standing up, Eleanor determinedly added, I'll check it later, clean it, and rebandage it. How about giving me a bath first? Adrian suggested with a smile. He knew he could ask for one because he was injured. Eleanor thought of his wound and didn't reject the idea. All right. Why don't we take a bath together? Adrian playfully suggested. Eleanor quickly pulled her hand away. Don't think like that right now. The doctor said you shouldn't exert yourself. That doctor is talking nonsense. Who said I can't exert myself? Want me to test it for you? Adrian asked with a hint of playfulness in his voice. Eleanor didn't dare to joke about such matters. His injuries were severe and she didn't want to take any chances. She rolled her eyes at him and said, Stop kidding. Let's focus on your recovery first. But I will help you with a bath. But I have done enough waiting, Adrian said hoarsely, his voice thick with desire. Are you afraid I won't be able to rise to the occasion? Your future happiness depends on it. Eleanor bit her lip and firmly replied, That won't be necessary. Half an hour later, Eleanor emerged from Adrian's bathroom with a flushed face. Adrian, who followed her with a towel wrapped around his waist, wore a satisfied smile in his deep eyes. He hadn't expected Eleanor to surprise him like this. Despite everything, he felt truly happy at that moment, a sensation he had never experienced before. Eleanor returned to her room, her face flushed for quite some time. It was the first time she had helped him with something like that. At night, they didn't have Flynn between them. He could openly hold her close and sleep peacefully. With the impending confrontation with Melissa over the horizon, Eleanor had dreams that night. She dreamt of her father and even her mother, hoping she could finally give her father the peace he deserved. Early the next morning, Adrian accompanied Eleanor for breakfast at the Miller Mansion. Later, Eleanor took Flynn to school and only then did Adrian accompany her to Greenwich Group. Upon arrival at the Greenwich Group, Eleanor received a call from one of Melissa's informants requesting her presence in Melissa's office. Unperturbed, Eleanor pushed open Melissa's office door. Melissa greeted her with a smile. Eleanor, you've been quite busy lately, haven't you? Didn't I submit the daily work reports as usual? Eleanor replied calmly. Melissa's expression changed immediately and she inquired, I heard you printed a year's worth of expenditure reports from the finance department. What do you intend to do with it? Nothing much. I printed it just to have a look, Eleanor replied calmly. Did you find anything unusual? Melissa fixed her gaze on Eleanor. Eleanor raised her head to look at her and asked, Are you worried that I found something? Melissa couldn't discern Eleanor's intentions and could only put on a smile. I don't see any problems. I've always kept a close watch on financial matters. Just focus on your job in the business department and don't interfere with finance. Eleanor turned to leave and Melissa's eyes grew wary. She couldn't figure out what Eleanor was planning with that expenditure report. Could it be that she truly intended to examine the financial records? Or did she have some ulterior motive in mind? Melissa sat at her desk and made several phone calls in succession, instructing the major shareholders to work together to oust Eleanor from the company the next day. These shareholders had received instructions from Adrian in advance and responded to Gary's Melissa. house as her haven. Ever since she entered the entertainment industry, she had never enjoyed such freedom. She was so liberated that she hardly knew what to do with her time. Coincidentally, she couldn't find time to spend with her friends, Annie and Sandra. So when Gary went out to work, she took the opportunity to invite some of her assistants over for lunch. The group of assistants had seen luxury before, but when they entered Gary's mansion, they couldn't help but exclaim, oh my gosh, this place is incredible. The view is breathtaking, one of them mused. Is that painting authentic? If it is, it's worth millions. Another one gasped. Annie sat calmly next to Valerie, sipping the tea she had prepared and asked, if you don't come back to work, we'll party like there's no tomorrow. 
It wasn't easy for me to convince you to come out, and now you're getting married and leaving us behind. Annie, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to turn down the job. It's just that he doesn't want me to take it. Valerie felt helpless. Gary didn't allow her to accept new projects at the moment. Annie nodded understandingly, but still wished her well, deep down. All right, I'll bring in a new talent right away. You can relax as a bride-to-be. You're bringing in a new talent? Valerie was slightly surprised. Yes, she has potential and just signed with the company. She's already made a name for herself in the industry. I think she has a bright future, Annie said, showing Valerie a photo of the newcomer on her phone. The girl looked innocent and had leading lady potential. Valerie understood that her studio's income had been affected because of her current situation. She reassured Annie. Annie, please take good care of the newcomer. If there's an opportunity in the future, I'll do my best to secure more work for her and help you guys earn more. That's great to hear. I've been waiting for you to say that. Annie smiled and sighed in relief. However, I'll still take on a few advertisements after the new year. I won't leave your company high and dry, Valerie added, not forgetting her financial responsibilities. Really? That's wonderful. Besides advertisements, what else do you have in mind? Annie asked. There's also a promising script that Gary has approved. We might start shooting it next spring. Valerie shrugged. I knew you wouldn't give up on acting. You're a natural talent. Even with Gary, don't give up on your dreams, Annie advised. Yes. Valerie nodded, determined not to be a full-time housewife and to continue pursuing her dreams. Meanwhile, in the Mirage Group general office, Gary had been swamped with work lately, keeping him at the office for extended hours. He was reviewing some scripts that had just arrived from overseas when his internal phone line rang. He reached for the receiver and answered, Hello, I heard you're engaged. Congratulations! A woman's voice on the other end of the line greeted him. Gary's grip on the phone tightened. The woman continued with a smile. Can I attend your engagement party? Don't come, Gary replied, his tone cool. Why not? The woman's voice remained soft with a hint of gentle persuasion. We promised to part as friends after our breakup, didn't we? No need to become enemies, Gary's voice remained firm. There's no need. Just live your life and don't deliberately disrupt mine. No, I'll come. I've been feeling bored lately and have wanted to visit your country for a while, the woman insisted. Consider me your guest this time. I won't cause you any trouble. With that, she hung up. Gary's expression tensed and he put down the phone with a trace of anxiety in his eyes. No one's past was completely blank. He was no exception. The woman who had just called was a part of his past. With no mood left for the script review, Gary grabbed his car keys and left the office. At that moment, he wanted to go home and see Valerie. He had been unusually busy lately, but was trying his best not to neglect her. As an artist, Valerie's job revolved around acting, and she couldn't get involved in his work. Valerie had spent over an hour tidying up the house. The villa was vast, and she preferred not to have servants cleaning up, so she took it upon herself to do what she could. In the courtyard, the sound of a car engine became familiar to her ears. A smile curled on her lips as she recognized it. It was him. She ran out and nearly forgot that it was winter outside due to her excitement. Upon seeing him, she momentarily struggled, but then ran out into the yard. Gary, wearing a black windbreaker over his suit, noticed that Valerie was only wearing a sweater and immediately expressed concern. In a few swift steps, he wrapped her tightly in his arms. Why did you come out without a coat? You'll catch a cold, Gary chastised her sternly. Valerie blinked and looked at him with a pitiful and aggrieved expression. I forgot. I just wanted to see you. Seeing her expression, Gary couldn't stay angry. He quickly took off his windbreaker and draped it over her shoulders. Then he bent down, lifted her off her feet, and carried her back to the house. Valerie breathed in his familiar scent, and a sweet smile graced her lips. As they entered the house, Valerie relaxed in his arms. Why did you come back early today? 
I missed you, Gary confessed. I want to spend more time with you. It's all right. Do you have work? Valerie asked, hugging him tightly. I'm fine being alone at home. I'm willing to wait for you. Gary felt a warmth in his heart. He embraced her and said, I'll arrange a meeting with our families as soon as possible and we'll choose a good day for the wedding. Why so soon? Aren't we supposed to get engaged properly first? Valerie blinked curiously. I don't want an engagement party. Let's just get married, Gary declared firmly. There's no point in waiting. I won't regret marrying you, and I hope you won't hesitate to marry me. Happiness radiated from Valerie's eyes to her chest. She felt warm inside. She threw her arms around him and enthusiastically nodded, All right, let's get married. Gary held her close and guided her to the sofa. Valerie nestled into his embrace. Are we getting married overseas or here? I'll leave that decision to you. Where would you like to get married? Gary asked. Here. My parents are more traditional, and many of my family members are here. We can save the overseas trip for our honeymoon, Valerie suggested. Okay, we'll do it your way, Gary agreed without hesitation. Valerie tilted her head and said, I never expected to get married so soon. Gary's heart tightened and he gazed into her eyes. Are you having second thoughts? Valerie burst into laughter. No! I was just surprised. I thought I'd have more time as a single woman. I didn't expect you to sweep me off my feet so quickly and have us on the verge of marriage. Gary was left speechless. How did I sweep you off your feet? I remember giving my all to win you over. Valerie nodded playfully. Yes, I can see your sincerity. So I won't regret marrying you. Gary looked at her, captivated by her red lips, and couldn't resist bending down to kiss her. Valerie willingly accepted the kiss, letting him deepen it by gently holding the back of her head. She felt that Gary was even more passionate today than before. The weather in the past year had been extremely cold. Even the normally picturesque cityscape had lost its charm. Then, a sudden winter rain arrived, casting a damp shroud over the entire city. In this kind of weather, Eleanor couldn't afford to relax. She had risen early that day, standing before Adrian's French window, gazing at the city in the distance, obscured by mist. A determined glint sparkled in her eyes. She lightly clenched her fists as if gathering strength for an impending storm. At that moment, a pair of strong arms embraced her from behind, enveloping her in a sense of security, and a slight smile tugged at the corner of her mouth. Why are you up so early today? A deep voice whispered in her ear. I couldn't sleep anymore, Eleanor replied with a soft sigh, her petite frame tensing up. Adrian gently rubbed the back of her head, his voice soothing. Relax. Everything will be all right. I'll handle it. His words carried a deep, enchanting resonance. Eleanor's heart eased upon hearing those words. She turned to face him, extending her slender arm to encircle his neck. She pressed her small face against his chest, closed her eyes, and listened to the rhythmic beating of his strong heart feeling a surge of courage welling up inside her. Adrian couldn't resist raising her chin, leaning in to steal a kiss. However, before he could capture her lips, Eleanor's phone rang. Eleanor smiled and pulled away, leaving a hint of disappointment in Adrian's eyes. He maintained his handsome and charming demeanor, folding his arms and narrowing his eyes as he watched her answer the call. Eleanor picked up her phone from the cabinet and answered, Hello. Miss Greenwich, when are you coming to the company? It was Arnold's voice on the other end. I'll be there shortly, Eleanor assured. Eleanor hung up the phone and the man still held her in a possessive embrace. She smiled and hugged his neck, inviting his good morning kiss. As they kissed, she playfully cooed, Okay, we should head out now. Don't be in a rush for just a moment longer, Adrian took advantage of the moment before finally releasing her. They left together. 
Similarly, Melissa had risen early that morning, meticulously preparing for the day. Her assistant had sent her the information she needed early in the morning, and Melissa had the report she had prepared in her hands. She asked her assistant, Have you printed more copies? I want everyone to have a copy in the meeting. Ma'am, don't worry. I've already printed them. Each shareholder will receive a copy during the meeting, her assistant said. Very good. Melissa nodded in satisfaction, though a sense of anger simmered beneath the surface. She wasn't foolish. She knew that Sean had married her to gain control of the company. Now, at the first sign of trouble, he had distanced himself. Melissa settled into her seat, carefully reviewing the financial loss report. She wanted to ensure there were no loose ends. Even though Eleanor had control over the company's finances, Melissa had devised an excuse to cover her tracks and justify her actions. As long as she could explain away those expenses, Eleanor wouldn't have a leg to stand on. In front of the shareholders, she had always garnered their support. This time, she would turn the tables in her favor. Ma'am, did we have to privately terminate the contract with Mr. Miller? Won't this affect the company's prospects? Her assistant voiced concern. Forget it. It's a good thing the two companies aren't entangled. We won't drag them down with us in the future. Melissa consoled herself, though anger still smoldered within her. In the main hall of the Greenwich Group, Eleanor was dressed in her customary attire. However, today she looked even more polished and put together. Her long hair was pulled back into a neat bun, and she wore a sleek tailored suit with a skirt. She removed her cocky windbreaker upon entering the office and carried it in her hand. Despite being a major shareholder, she didn't exhibit any airs or coldness. She was affable and approachable to her employees, earning their respect. Therefore, no one in the company dared to undermine her authority. Eleanor rode the elevator up to her office floor and proceeded directly to her office. Arnold knocked on her door and entered. Miss Greenwich, everything is prepared. I'll join you in the meeting. Great, thank you for your hard work, Eleanor said. It's my pleasure to work for you. Arnold smiled as he handed her the meeting documents. Miss Greenwich, please take a final look at the materials. Eleanor sat down and opened the documents. They contained financial records Arnold had meticulously gathered, revealing a total of 12 instances of financial mismanagement throughout the year. Each case included detailed information about the shell companies, the individuals responsible, and how the funds had been funneled. All documents had Melissa's signature as the approver. This time, there was no escape for Melissa. A battle of wits and wills was about to unfold within the Greenwich Group's office building. The shareholders of Greenwich Group arrived one by one in the meeting hall. These shareholders were typically the senior members who didn't concern themselves with day-to-day -day operations and only showed up for annual dividends and regular shareholder meetings. Today, they were unusually punctual, entering the company together in a silent display of unity. Melissa occupied the central seat at the head of the table and instructed her assistant to serve fragrant tea, not only for herself, but for all the shareholders. Her hospitality was meticulous. Melissa glanced at her watch and feigned a smile. No stragglers today? No stragglers. Everyone's right on time, a mellifluous voice announced from the meeting room's entrance. It was Eleanor, followed by Arnold and her assistant. Melissa put on a courteous smile. I'm pleased you could join us. Punctuality is crucial for a meeting of this importance. Of course, I wouldn't dream of being late, Eleanor replied calmly, taking the second in command seat beside Melissa. The shareholders sensed a brewing conflict as the two women seated themselves at the head of the table, with Eleanor receiving support from Adrian behind the scenes. All right, now that everyone is present, Eleanor began, let's commence today's meeting. First, I have some rather shocking news to share. Our company has recorded losses this month, making it the worst month of losses this year. Melissa's gaze swept over the shareholders who appeared to never give Eleanor a chance to speak in the meeting today. So she stood up. Yes, the company has faced some losses in recent times. 
Why would the company lose money? A shareholder next to her asked. Why? There are many reasons, but the reason this month is due to our company's management. For example, some people entered the company without permission, without any formal interview or examination, and were appointed to important positions. That's also a significant reason, Melissa explained. She then glanced somewhat mockingly at Eleanor. That's right, I'm referring to the young lady beside me, Miss Eleanor Greenwich. Eleanor met her gaze fearlessly. So you're implying that the company's losses are all because of me? Although I don't want it to be associated with you, that's the truth, Melissa replied before instructing her assistant to distribute detailed reports of the losses to each shareholder. Eleanor had a copy in her hands as well. She picked it up and quickly understood the report. The report showed a 40% loss in the business with well-analyzed reasons presented logically. The shareholders examined the report with mixed expressions on their faces. Eleanor then smiled and said, Excellent. I've also prepared some information that I'd like all the shareholders to see. Eleanor, this is a shareholder meeting, not a departmental meeting. There's no need to bring up your report, Melissa interjected. This pertains to the finance department, Eleanor responded, signaling her assistant to distribute the information. As the shareholders received the documents, Eleanor made sure Melissa was the last to receive a copy. Melissa's expression turned unpleasant, and she snapped. What are you doing? Eleanor held on to the report and tossed it disdainfully in front of Melissa. You should be asking yourself what you've been up to this past year. Eleanor's attitude angered Melissa. She picked up the report and started reading it from the first page, her eyes widening as she flipped through the contents. She looked up at Eleanor, panic in her voice. Where did you get these fabricated reports? So you see it too? Would you like me to explain its contents to you? Eleanor sneered, standing up. The shareholders were aware of Melissa's actions and were eager to see a complete report of embezzlement. Moreover, the evidence included her signature and details of the shell companies. Even those who weren't typically involved in company affairs could see the situation. Melissa, you used your authority to embezzle more than $150 million of the company's funds without authorization. You also set up shell companies to launder the money, and ultimately, all this money ended up in your finances, Eleanor declared, her voice echoing in the quiet conference room. Eleanor's clear, melodic voice seemed more terrifying than a death sentence to Melissa. You're talking nonsense, Eleanor. Where did you get this false evidence? Don't slander me. Don't think I don't see what you're trying to do, Melissa retorted, her face pale and flustered. Mrs. Miller, then let me ask you, did you take this money? A shareholder boldly inquired. How could I steal the company's money? I do not need such funds, Melissa replied with a forced composure. Then what does this evidence prove? These signatures are yours. This can't be fake, right? The shareholders inquired. They're just regular expenses. There's nothing suspicious about them, Melissa stuttered. Is that so? Then where did the money go? I've already conducted a thorough investigation. Some of it was spent overseas and some ended up in unknown accounts. But it wasn't invested in our company's projects, Eleanor countered. Melissa, you better explain why the company's money was used this way. How could you sign off on millions of dollars just last month when there were losses? One of the beneficiaries asked. Melissa trembled slightly. She knew where the money had gone, but she needed a strategy to deal with the situation. In the end, she chose to pin the blame on someone else. That must have been done by Sheldon behind my back. I didn't do it. He's responsible for finances and has the authority to sign. Maybe I didn't notice he was embezzling. Melissa was thinking about self-preservation at this point. If the shareholders still trusted her, everything would be fine. Suddenly, someone entered the room. It was Sheldon. He looked at Melissa in disbelief and said, Mrs. Miller, you still need evidence. Which funds under my charge require your signature? You instructed me to do all of this. Melissa stood up in shock. She stared at Sheldon, her face turning pale. She then glanced at Eleanor, realizing she had fallen into a trap. 
What are you all doing? This is a shareholder meeting, not a court trial. Why are you all looking at me? I didn't do anything, Melissa protested. Melissa, we entrusted our funds to you. We counted on you to protect our interests. We never expected this in return. You misappropriated our money for personal use while claiming losses. Do you have any credibility left? One shareholder asked. No, listen to me. I didn't embezzle company funds. It's a misunderstanding, Melissa said with a forced smile. Eleanor crossed her arms and sneered. Whether you understand it or not, you know the truth. Now, please step down as the president of the Greenwich Group. You no longer have the right to hold this position. You! Melissa glared at her, her anger evident. At the same time, Melissa needs to be investigated for embezzlement and suspended from all her duties in the company. I, Eleanor, will take over as the interim president, Eleanor announced. She turned to the shareholders and asked, do any of the shareholders have objections? Eleanor exuded confidence and composure, despite her youth and the shareholders were convinced by her. In an instant, all six shareholders raised their hands in agreement. One of them added, Melissa, you have no right to voice your opinion at this point. First, you need to address the mess you've created. Yes, we won't let this matter go unaddressed. Two police officers in uniform entered the room, their expressions stern as they addressed Melissa. Mrs. Melissa Miller, you're under suspicion of embezzling the company's public funds. Please come with us. Melissa immediately turned her head to glare at the two officers. If you dare touch me, try it. This is my company and I'm not going anywhere except within these company walls. Melissa, please stop resisting. You're the one responsible for the dire situation the Greenwich Group is in. First, you orchestrated a private merger with Sean's company, becoming the majority shareholder. Now, you're accused of embezzling public funds. You owe us an explanation, one of the officers stated. Melissa's face turned ashen, and her expression became despondent. She seemed aged beyond her years, unable to think clearly. Her head shook slightly, and she reached out to steady herself on the table. Her assistant rushed to her side, concerned, and asked urgently, Ma'am, are you all right? Taking a deep breath, Melissa pushed away her assistant's hand, straightening herself and fixing Eleanor with a hateful glare. Do you think you can just push me out of the company like this? It won't be that easy. Now is not the time for personal grievances. It's time to address the allegations and handle the company's finances, Eleanor replied coldly. I have already prepared the necessary documents. How do we proceed legally? Eleanor continued, maintaining her focus on the matter at hand. One of the shareholders spoke up respectfully. Miss Greenwich, we trust your judgment. Please take the lead. Melissa turned even paler with anger. The shareholders had shifted their allegiance to Eleanor, and she feared what Eleanor might do next. Guys, we've been friends for over a decade. What's happening to all of you? I can explain those expenses. Melissa attempted to appeal to the shareholders using personal connections. Melissa, there's no fooling us anymore. We no longer trust you. This matter will be handled through the proper legal channels. Considering the amount involved, you better think about your legal defense, one of the shareholders declared. Melissa's face grew even paler. She grabbed her phone, her hands trembling as she attempted to call someone. However, Eleanor moved forward and confiscated her phone. Calling someone won't help you at this point. No one can save you now. Give me back my phone, Eleanor. Don't push it too far. Return my phone, Melissa shouted, attempting to snatch it back but the police officers restrained her. They firmly took control of Melissa and Arnold followed them out. Once Melissa was taken away, Eleanor took the lead in addressing the shareholders. The Greenwich group has reached this point and it's certainly not what my father would have wanted. Therefore, I've made a decision. After the start of the year, the Greenwich group will issue a purchase order to the Miller group. I hope to have your support at that time. We've been looking forward to the Miller group's development we have no objections, the shareholders unanimously agreed. Eleanor couldn't help but find it amusing. Adrian had apparently orchestrated enough behind the scenes to place her in this position. Every word she uttered received a favorable response. Great, 
Now, let's address Melissa's situation first. We'll do our best to recover the embezzled funds and make up for the company's losses. The meeting is adjourned, Eleanor concluded, leaving the meeting room along with her assistant. As they returned to her office, Arnold called with an update. Melissa had been detained and the legal process was underway. With the substantial amount she had embezzled, her sentence could potentially exceed 10 years and she had no assets in her name. Eleanor felt a sense of relief. This was just the first step. If Melissa only received imprisonment, it would be too lenient for what she had done. The past actions were deserving of a much harsher sentence, even possibly the death penalty. Eleanor was determined to make Melissa pay step by step. Eleanor's phone rang again, displaying Adrian's name. She answered with a smile. Hello! A deep and charming voice responded. Arnold just filled me in. Are you all right? Eleanor felt warmth in her heart upon hearing his voice. It was thanks to him that she had successfully removed Melissa from her position. Without his support behind the scenes, she couldn't have accomplished it so smoothly. I'm fine. I'm very happy. Adrian, thank you, she replied with gratitude, dependence, and deep affection evident in her tone. He chuckled lightly. You want to thank me so much, then you should thank me by giving yourself to me? Eleanor laughed and playfully tousled her hair. All right, that day isn't too far off. I've waited for so long. I've become quite patient. There's no rush. Don't pressure yourself, Adrian reassured her. Eleanor gazed into the distance and smiled. Now that Valerie was getting married, she decided that it would be her turn soon. Eleanor chuckled again and teased him. She checked the time and suggested, Let's have lunch together. I was waiting for your invitation, Adrian said. Yes, come and pick me up later. I'll take care of things at the company first. Eleanor hung up the phone and instructed her assistant, Head to the CEO's office. Melissa's computer and files are off limits to everyone. Miss Greenwich, are you planning to move to the CEO's office now? Her assistant, Denise, asked. Not at the moment. We'll discuss it after we've resolved this matter. Eleanor wasn't in a hurry. Her top priority was dealing with Melissa, forcing her to reveal the truth about Andrew's death and eventually extracting the details of her father's demise. She intended to make Melissa pay step by step. After Melissa's departure, her loyal assistant, Clara, immediately retrieved Sean's phone number and informed him of Melissa's arrest. Although Sean was surprised, he didn't seem overly concerned. He responded on the phone and assured her that he would return soon to handle the situation. Clara had been the only one truly loyal to Melissa, and now, with her husband's lack of concern, her heart sank. She hadn't expected Melissa Clara to choose a man who didn't take her at the moment. She had just recovered from the incident where Melissa fell from grace. As she sat in the coffee shop, her thoughts immediately turned to how she could help Melissa. Sean had proven to be unreliable, and Clara wondered who else was there to support Melissa. Ah, yes. There was Kendra, her daughter. While Clara didn't hold high hopes for Kendra, she still felt it necessary to inform her so that the young lady, who seemed to only care about indulging in a life of leisure, wouldn't be caught off guard. She took out her phone and made the call. Kendra's coquettish voice answered, Hello, Clara, is something the matter? Kendra, where are you? Your mother is in trouble. You should return to the country as soon as possible. Clara urgently conveyed the news. My mother? What happened to my mother? Kendra asked in surprise. Your mother is in serious trouble. Eleanor has accused her of embezzling the company's public funds. She has been arrested, and there's a possibility of her being indicted and facing punishment soon. Clara revealed the grim reality. Kendra was taken aback, and her breathing became rapid. What? My mom? My mom got arrested? Eleanor did this? Clara rolled her eyes inwardly. After all, Kendra was also a member of the Greenwich family, but she often came across as naive. She failed to grasp that beneath Eleanor's usual gentleness, 
lay a strong and determined character. Just moments ago, Eleanor's presence had been almost unrecognizable. Was this the same girl who only knew how to play the piano? The confidence and composure she exuded now seemed to come from deep within. Clara, what's going to happen to my mother? Is she going to prison for a long time? Kendra asked. Well, it's going to be very troublesome. You should return as soon as possible to deal with the situation, Clara advised. Let's first get my new father to help her. He's influential and powerful, right? If he intervenes, he can surely save my mom. Kendra still held on to hope, believing that Sean would come to their rescue. In her heart, Sean loved her mother dearly and treated her well, so at a time like this, he would surely go to great lengths to save them both. Clara sneered. I just called him. He's overseas and he doesn't care about your mother's situation at all, let alone saving her. No, he loves my mother deeply, Kendra insisted. What he was interested in was your company, not your mother. Now that he and your mother have signed the termination contract, anything that happens to your mother's company won't affect him in the slightest, Clara explained. Kendra fell silent for a while, and Clara's last statement seemed to have struck a chord with her. I'll return to the country immediately. I'll be back soon. At noon, in an elegant and upscale Western restaurant, Adrian had his hands clasped together in front of his chest. His chin rested gently on the back of his hand as he gazed at the girl elegantly savoring her meal in front of him. His eyes carried a softness that could melt anyone's heart. Can't you see I'm eating? Why are you staring? Eleanor raised her head and asked with a smile, You look great, and it makes me hungry. Adrian replied, a warm smile dancing in his eyes. Eleanor knew what he meant and turned her head playfully. Why don't you eat as well? Only then did Adrian start to enjoy the food before him, cutting and savoring each bite. As he ate, he inquired, What are your plans for the future? Do you want to continue as the president of the Greenwich Group? Eleanor took a sip from her wine glass and tilted her head playfully. No, I'm too exhausted. I want to take my place as the wife of the Miller Group's president. Adrian's eyes immediately brightened, and her response filled him with joy. This position has been waiting for you for a long time. It's just that you didn't want to take it, Adrian remarked with a hint of helplessness. So while you still want me to take it, I've better grab it quickly. Don't let anyone else snatch it away, Eleanor quipped, her eyes twinkling mischievously. No one but you can occupy that position, Adrian asserted with confidence. Eleanor locked eyes with him and, at that moment, felt a profound connection. She pledged to herself that she wouldn't want anyone other than him. Shortly after their meal, Eleanor received a call from Valerie, who asked if she had time to accompany her to the bridal shop. No matter how busy Eleanor was, she couldn't refuse her best friend's request. She couldn't miss being part of her best friend's wedding. Despite the upheaval in the Greenwich group caused by Melissa's ousting, there was surprisingly no chaos. On the contrary, there was a sense of anticipation among the employees, especially with the news that the group was being acquired by the Miller Group. They saw this as an opportunity for a brighter future. They all pitched in to handle their respective responsibilities. The important documents that had been awaiting Melissa's approval were no longer in her hands. Instead, they were sorted and delivered to Eleanor's office in an organized manner. Valerie's car drove directly to the restaurant to pick Eleanor up. The two friends sat in the back seat and began discussing personal matters. Valerie's lips curved into a sweet smile, a glow nurtured by love emanating from her. She exuded happiness from the inside out. I'm so envious. You're about to become a bride, Eleanor said, hugging her friend and returning the smile. Valerie also put her arm around Eleanor's shoulder. Don't worry, your man won't keep you waiting. He's probably eager to marry you and take you home, right? I'm already living in his house. It's just that we're missing the ceremony, Eleanor replied with a smile. Valerie bit her lip, a touch of shyness crossing her eyes. 
Leaning in closer, she whispered in Eleanor's ear, I want to ask you something private. Have you and Adrian, you know, done it? Eleanor's face turned red in an instant, and she quickly shook her head. No, he and I haven't. Could it be that you and Gary... Valerie also shook her head rapidly. No, we haven't either. We agreed to get married first. Really? Eleanor was slightly embarrassed. It seems that Gary is a gentleman. He does respect me a lot, Valerie said, her heart filled with sweetness and contentment. Loving someone wasn't about taking, but protecting. She was willing to wait. Valerie looked at Eleanor with concern. You don't have any lingering fears about Adrian, do you? Will that affect your relationship? Eleanor pursed her lips and smiled. I don't have any lingering fears anymore. It's just a bit challenging to accept. Do your best. You can overcome your fear. Valerie held her hand. The two friends exchanged smiles, and within those smiles, there was a hint of the transformation from girlhood to womanhood. In the warm winter sun of that afternoon, they leaned on each other and shared secrets, cherishing their precious moments together. In an upscale wedding dress shop, Valerie and Eleanor strolled in, and the attentive staff immediately welcomed them. As soon as they laid eyes on Valerie, recognition lit up their faces, and their excitement was palpable. The two staff members exchanged excited glances, clearly not expecting Valerie to visit their shop for wedding dress shopping. Valerie, however, wasn't in any hurry. After all, the wedding was still some distance away. But every girl dreams of their wedding day, and even just browsing for dresses filled her with a sense of sweetness and happiness. Valerie didn't want to rush the wedding planning process. She had plenty of time to choose the perfect dress, but the plethora of designs and styles made the decision a challenging one. Eleanor, who was to be her bridesmaid, accompanied her on this joyful shopping excursion. How about this one? It's absolutely stunning. Valerie's eyes sparkled with starry excitement as she envisioned herself in the dress, walking hand in hand with Gary down the aisle. She couldn't help but indulge in some daydreaming, her imagination running wild. It does look beautiful, but there's no rush to decide. Let's explore some more. Eleanor suggested. The two beautiful young women leisurely wandered the expansive, circular hall, admiring the wedding gowns displayed in the elegant shop windows. Their eyes were filled with anticipation, and the atmosphere around them was saturated with love. As they gazed upon the bridal attire, they found themselves unable to tear themselves away. The store attendants were in no hurry, discreetly observing the two girls from a few meters away. Valerie was a familiar face, known as the pure and beautiful goddess of the entertainment industry. However, the girl accompanying her exuded an air of wealth and sophistication. A single glance was enough to tell that she came from a privileged background. Simply being in their presence seemed to brighten the surroundings. Wedding dress shopping didn't need to be rushed. So after they had finished browsing, the two friends decided to take a break and chat at the adjacent afternoon tea restaurant. The conversation naturally turned to Melissa's fate, and Valerie expressed her satisfaction with the situation. She's getting what she deserves, Valerie declared. I'm just worried that Sean might try to intervene to save her. Now that they're married, Eleanor's confidence had grown significantly with Adrian by her side. She felt that there was little Melissa and Sean could do to turn the situation around. Valerie gently patted Eleanor's shoulder and reassured her, Don't worry too much. You have Adrian backing you up. He won't let Melissa and Sean overturn things. Eleanor found solace in Valerie's words. She believed that Adrian would not allow any interference from Melissa or Sean. At four in the afternoon, Eleanor returned to the company. The pile of documents on her desk awaited her attention. With a deep breath, she began to review them patiently, completely absorbed in her work. She lost track of time, and at five, Adrian called her. She explained that she was still engrossed in the documents and dismissed the call. Not long after, Adrian arrived at the company. When Adrian's charismatic figure entered the building, 
it confirmed the rumors circulating within the company. The Greenwich Group was indeed becoming a subsidiary of the Miller Group. Otherwise, why would the CEO of the Miller Group personally visit? A few female employees who had just exited the elevator saw who had arrived. Some of the men waiting outside, their hands casually in their pockets, jumped in surprise. Their faces flushed and they quickly stepped aside, their hearts racing. Eleanor was engrossed in the complex numbers on her report. She thought the knock on the door was Denise delivering her a glass of water and called out, Come in! The door swung open, revealing not a glass of water, but a pair of long legs standing beside her desk. She followed the legs upward and was met with really the handsome need to come face over here, of the man who Eleanor entered. said, beaming with happiness. Didn't you mention a bunch of unfinished work? I came to lend a hand, Adrian said as he glanced at her amidst a stack of reports. It looked quite pitiable. He felt sympathy for her. Eleanor immediately felt like her savior had arrived. She smiled and pulled a chair from the side, placing it across from her. Have a seat. These reports are giving me a headache, and there are still a lot of things I don't understand. I'm glad you're here. Adrian couldn't help but follow her lead and said affectionately, I'll always be here for you. Eleanor's heart swelled with warmth. She handed him two documents and said, Then, could you take a look at these first? From there, Adrian began to handle the company's affairs for her. It seemed like this man knew everything. He only needed a quick glance at some reports to determine if they were good to go. As he went through the paperwork, Eleanor played with her pen and waited for him to review the reports and place them in front of her for signing. Outside the window, the night fell, prompting Denise to switch on the office lights. The soft glow illuminated the man's face, and his focused and serious expression resembled a flawless sculpture. Eleanor couldn't help but feel like a smitten girl. Besides being drawn to his good looks, she was left in awe, unsure of what else she could think about. The pile of reports dwindled one by one. Adrian finished reviewing the last one and didn't hand it over to her. Instead, he set it aside, saying, This one needs to be redone by the department. Eleanor looked over in surprise. Already done so quickly? She had expected to spend the entire night going through the mountain of reports. Yet this man had completed it in just half an hour. Thank you for your hard work, Eleanor smiled and put down her pen, gazing at him with admiration. I'd do anything for you, Adrian replied. With that, he stood up and approached her, leaning in and pointing to his perfect cheek. Give me a reward. Eleanor playfully covered her pen cap and leaned in slowly, her pink lips brushed against the side of his cheek. Adrian checked his watch. It's nearly seven. Let's go grab dinner. Sure, Eleanor agreed, feeling her stomach growl with hunger. As they left the company, the evening air was a bit brisk. Adrian removed his suit jacket and wrapped his arms around her beneath it, keeping her warm. He led her to his car and they headed to a nearby restaurant. Meanwhile, in a cold, damp holding cell, Melissa sat alone. She had a thick, dirty coat and a heavy blanket nearby, provided by the police due to her age. However, despite the cold, she stubbornly refused to use them for warmth. She clenched her teeth, her eyes brimming with hatred. Her curly hair was disheveled. The once powerful head of the Greenwich Group was now a prisoner. She was in a pitiful state. Melissa had lost her sanity during her time in prison, but now she was gradually regaining her composure. It was then that she remembered the past year, the year she had lost her mind. She had spent all the company's money during her reign. When she handled the wedding, she treated the company's funds as her personal ATM. She didn't want Sean to underestimate her capabilities. Back then, she had transferred $50 million from the company into her account. She spent it on her wedding, and before that, when she bribed that handyman to eliminate Andrew, she didn't have enough money. She had spent more than $10 million in addition to the last $20 million. A shiver ran down Melissa's spine. Suddenly, another terrifying thought crossed her mind. 
What if Eleanor decided to investigate her finances and discovered her dealings with that killer? Melissa went into a frenzy. She rushed to the iron bars and yelled, Let me out! Let me out! I need to make a phone call! I want to see a lawyer! What are you making a fuss about? The officer asked. Do you even know who I am? Have you seen my profile? I'm Melissa, the CEO of the Greenwich Group. My husband holds power and influence. Hurry up and release me! Melissa shouted at the police officers. In this place, everyone has the same identity. A criminal. I don't care how prestigious or respectable you used to be. Here, you're just a criminal. An old police officer warned her sternly. Melissa clung to the iron bars tightly. At that moment, she could only think of Sean. She knew he could get her out of this situation. Sean was her last hope. The shareholders had all turned their backs on her, aligning themselves with Eleanor. She couldn't rely on anyone else. As for her daughter, Kendra, Melissa had no expectations, so she had to depend on Sean. But when would he come? She didn't even have the privilege of making a phone call now. She would have to wait for her lawyer to arrive tomorrow before she could contact the outside world. Melissa sat back in her cell, contemplating the impending consequences with a heavy heart. If she were found guilty of these crimes, she would lose everything. She would be sent to prison, and her assets would be confiscated. Unease filled Melissa's heart, as did thoughts of her daughter. That night, under the gray blankets, Eleanor was exhausted and fell asleep. She entered a deep sleep unusually quickly. Perhaps it was the fate of Melissa that finally eased her tense heart. When Adrian got into bed, she was already asleep. He looked at her peaceful, sleeping face, his brows furrowing gently. He hoped this winter would pass quickly. In the early morning, Clara received Kendra's hurried return from the international airport. Kendra still wore heavy makeup, clearly living a carefree life overseas. She was dressed in designer clothes and carried a well-known brand's bag. Clara, when can I see my mom? Kendra looked frightened and her eyes were swollen from crying on the way back. We have to wait for the lawyer to visit her tomorrow. Right now, none of us can see her, Clara explained. How can this be? Isn't my mom the CEO? Isn't she the largest shareholder? How did she get arrested? Kendra asked, exasperated. All of this is Eleanor's doing. She infiltrated the company, accessed the financial department's information, and framed her for embezzling company funds. Clara had also been involved in many of Melissa's illegal activities, so naturally she couldn't admit that Melissa had done anything wrong. Upon hearing this, Kendra gritted her teeth in anger. What? Eleanor could be so despicable and cunning? Miss Greenwich, what you need to do now is help your mother clear her name of embezzlement and regain her position as CEO of the Greenwich Group, Clara said. What do I need to do? Kendra immediately became determined. She was willing to pay any price to save her mother. There are two people who can help your mother right now. The first is Sean Miller, her current husband. He has influence and power and might be able to intervene effectively. The second is Adrian Rockstone. You used to date him. Please, go beg him. Clara laid out her options. Kendra hesitated when she heard this. You want me to beg them? How can I possibly do that? No matter what, the most important thing now is to save your mother. Kendra, you must put aside your pride and plead with them, Clara insisted. Kendra clenched her teeth. If her mother ended up in prison, it would be the end for the younger generation of their family. Fine, I'll go beg my father first. When will he be back? Kendra sighed. I believe he'll return tomorrow. Your mother's situation may implicate him, so he'll have to return even if he doesn't want to, Clara informed her. Okay, then I'll go beg him first. Ian, I haven't seen him in a while. I don't know if I can still reach him. Kendra bit her lip. Over the past six months, a significant shift had occurred in the Rockstone Group's operations. 
Ian had also spent half a year living in another country. He couldn't keep up with the country's situation in real time, but today his subordinates were reporting to him via video conferencing. When they mentioned that Melissa had been arrested, Ian was taken aback. He immediately asked, Do you know what happened exactly? I know that the person who has taken control of the Greenwich Group is Mr. Greenwich's eldest daughter, Eleanor. The shareholders unanimously voted for her to become the new president, his subordinate told him. A complex expression crossed Ian's face. He knew that Eleanor couldn't have removed Melissa from power in the group so swiftly without some assistance. That could only mean one thing. Adrian was involved. Greenwich Group was likely falling into Adrian's hands. Keep a close eye on this matter. I don't have time to return to the country. If there are any updates, inform me immediately, Ian instructed. Understood. But what if Melissa asks for help? Should we assist her? His employees asked. A sardonic smile curled on Ian's lips. Let her fend for herself. A person like her isn't worth helping. Melissa's misfortune was seen as a stroke of good luck by many in the business world. She had been ostentatious and had wronged many people in the business world. Especially those affluent women who enjoyed competing with her were delighted to see her down, and she had already managed to drag everyone into her mess. On a flight to the United States, Sean wore a troubled expression as he sat by the window. He pondered how to handle the situation at hand. He had originally believed that he would marry a woman who could help him achieve great success, but instead he found himself married to someone he viewed as a liability. At first, he considered taking a back seat and doing nothing. However, Melissa was his wife, and the business world knew that if he acted too heartlessly, he might fall into someone's trap. Therefore, he felt compelled to return to his country and assess the situation. If necessary, he would request a divorce from Melissa at this point. It would be best to rid himself of such a burdensome woman, otherwise her presence would only irritate him. Sean had reviewed the Greenwich Group's financial records and found that it had consistently been in a state of loss. Melissa didn't have any actual funds at her disposal, so the allegations of embezzlement were highly credible. Not only did Melissa have the audacity to embezzle funds, but she also had the audacity to do so with a daughter who contributed nothing but trouble. Early in the morning, at the entrance of the Greenwich Group, Adrian typically left after dropping off Eleanor. However, today he accompanied her into the office and openly displayed affection in front of the employees. You don't need to worry about me. I can handle this, Eleanor said as she entered her office, turning back to the man who had followed her in. It's all right. I don't have anything else to do today, Adrian replied. He took a step forward and settled on her sofa. Today marked Melissa's first day of legal proceedings, and he wanted to be there for her. Eleanor understood that she couldn't send him away, so she let him stay. Shortly after, Arnold knocked on the door and entered. Seeing Adrian, he directly provided a report on Melissa's legal proceedings. Melissa had also hired a lawyer, and with the evidence presented, her chances of conviction were estimated at 90%. After Arnold left, Eleanor received a call from the police. This time, Greenwich Group had put her in charge of the matter, so she couldn't back down. Adrian draped a scarf around Eleanor's neck and held her hand, prepared to accompany her to the courtroom for the hearing. Adrian's identity didn't pose an issue. Even if he wasn't the head of Greenwich Group, he had another identity that allowed him to participate in the trial. He was Eleanor's fiancé. Clara and Kendra also arrived at the court early in the morning. They were accompanied by a lawyer and waited in the waiting room to see Melissa. However, Eleanor and Adrian arrived first. Kendra had just exited an office after submitting some documents when she bumped into Eleanor. Her eyes filled with hatred and she immediately lashed out, Eleanor, why did you frame my mother? You're despicable. Eleanor hadn't seen her half-sister in a while, and upon hearing the accusation, she looked at her with indifference. I didn't frame her. She brought this upon herself. Clara tried to pull Kendra back and advised her not to provoke Eleanor further. But how could Kendra remain silent? 
In her heart, her mother had been unjustly accused and had suffered a great injustice. Eleanor, I'm warning you. If you do anything to my mother, I won't let you off, Kendra declared vehemently. Adrian's expression had already turned cold and grim. He pulled Eleanor to his side with his arm and fixed Kendra with a cold, ruthless gaze. You don't have any right to talk to my woman like that. Even though Kendra was seething with anger, the pressure emanating from Adrian was too intense. She trembled and took a step back, colliding with Clara. Clara led her away into a lounge. Eleanor observed Kendra, who remained in the dark about the truth and didn't know what to say. When the facts came to light, she wondered how Kendra would react. Nevertheless, this mother-daughter duo had never liked her. Even when they were on the brink of disaster, they would continue to blame and berate her. Don't let them affect your mood, Adrian said, reaching out to take a cup of warm water from Arnold behind him. He held Eleanor's hand and led her into another lounge. Eleanor remained unperturbed. She patiently waited for Melissa's appearance. Melissa had endured a freezing night and could do little to alleviate her discomfort. She had wrapped herself in the only clothes available, which were soiled and tattered. She had spent the night that way. Her hair was unkempt and her face was haggard as she awaited the commencement of her trial. Around nine in the morning, a black car pulled up at the courthouse entrance. Sean appeared reluctant to get out of the car. He sat there for a few moments before finally emerging with an annoyed expression. He ascended the stairs. Clara brought her subordinates to welcome him while Kendra clung to him. The moment Sean arrived, Kendra rushed over and embraced him tightly. Sean was held so firmly that Kendra began to cry. Dad, you must save my mom. You must save her. Only you can save her now. Sean gently patted her shoulder and slowly pushed her out of his embrace. Although Kendra was incapable, she still possessed a pretty face, and her tears stirred Sean's heart. As a man without blood ties to the girl, Sean had always harbored inappropriate thoughts. However, Melissa had kept a close watch on her, and he had suppressed those feelings. Now, Kendra regarded him as her savior and beseeched him for help. An odd sentiment welled up within Sean, and he reached out to wipe her tears. He treated her in a way that defied simple explanation as if he were truly her father. All right, don't cry. I'll do my best. Clara, who was present, was attending to Melissa. Watching this scene, her heart felt conflicted. She wanted to caution Kendra that it was wrong to plead with Sean in this manner, as he was insincere and taking advantage of her. However, Kendra was naive and failed to perceive it. She believed it wholeheartedly, feeling that it was genuine. She thought that Sean was a doting father, and when she heard his words, she felt a measure of relief. It was as if her mother would be saved. Eleanor is here and Adrian is here too. Dad, don't be afraid of them. My mother is innocent and has been framed, Kendra said, her anger palpable. Sean looked at her and sneered inwardly. Melissa was a brilliant and capable woman, but why had she given birth to such a foolish daughter? Kendra only cared about living a luxurious life and didn't grasp even the simplest logic. Furthermore, she truly didn't have any knowledge about Melissa. In the adjacent lounge, Arnold knocked on the door and entered. He spoke to Adrian, who was seated on the sofa, saying, Mr. Miller, Sean is here. He's in the next room. A trace of worry flickered across Eleanor's face. Adrian held her hand and reassured her. Don't worry. His presence won't change anything. Melissa won't escape this time. Eleanor nodded lightly, and Adrian continued to comfort her. Sean is not a kind and compassionate person. His ambition doesn't allow anyone to hold him back. If I'm right, he didn't come here to rescue Melissa, but to seize the opportunity to discuss a divorce with her. Really? Eleanor didn't know much about Sean. Adrian replied with certainty, Once Melissa is convicted, he'll file for divorce. Adrian's speculation was accurate. Sean's intent for coming today wasn't to assist Melissa, but to witness her downfall and rid himself of her. 
Sean was undoubtedly one of the worst kind of people. His newlywed wife was in a jail cell facing trial, yet he was interested in Kendra and used the opportunity to make inappropriate advances towards her. Unfortunately, Kendra interpreted it as love and care, while Clara couldn't help but shiver at the thought. However, she also needed Sean to save Melissa, so she had no choice but to endure it. Besides, Melissa was the one who had been beneficial to her. She had no interest in disciplining the useless Kendra. At 10.30, Melissa, escorted by police, arrived at the courthouse. She stood at the dock, her face pallid, her hair disheveled, and her makeup smudged. It was a stark contrast to her usual image of a powerful female CEO. Mom! Kendra's heart ached as she called out to her. Melissa glanced at her daughter and then at Sean, who was seated in the viewing gallery. She couldn't discern his expression clearly, but his casual posture made one thing evident. In the face of her misfortune, he would watch coldly from the sidelines. The frigid night had awakened Melissa to the fact that Sean was an unreliable man. Melissa's gaze then turned into a sharp glare directed at Eleanor. Eleanor met her with an indifferent expression, unruffled. On the other hand, Adrian, who was in the viewing gallery, couldn't tear his eyes away from Eleanor. As he watched her delicate figure seated there, his heart ached, and he couldn't help but feel a sense of pain. The trial commenced with all the evidence Eleanor possessed presented together. Melissa, on the other hand, struggled to present her defense, and even her lawyer was at a loss for words during the cross-examination. The opposing lawyer was found speechless during the court examination. A trial that involved a significant amount of public funds concluded in just an hour. Under Eleanor's relentless presentation of powerful evidence, Melissa was charged with embezzlement and proceeded to the longer trial phase. This time, Eleanor had seized Melissa by the throat, leaving her with no opportunity for a counterattack. After the court hearing, numerous reporters and media outlets waited outside, hoping to interview Eleanor. In the eyes of the public, this was essentially a battle for a wealthy family's fortune. Moreover, it was a fierce one. Thus, they were determined to secure a piece of the news. However, Adrian would never allow his woman to be scrutinized by others. He had parked the car at the alternative exit to ensure that Eleanor wouldn't be hounded by reporters. Kendra was crying incessantly. She and Clara hadn't anticipated such a large media presence and were immediately surrounded. Miss Greenwich, can you confirm whether your mother indeed misappropriated the company's public funds, as has been reported? The amount is said to be substantial. Is that true? The reporter asked Kendra. Do you plan to appeal the verdict? Another one inquired. Both you and Eleanor share the same father and different mothers. Can you tell us about your sisterly relationship? Another reporter questioned her. Clara pushed through the crowd of reporters and helped Kendra into the car. Kendra was despondent as if she had lost the entire world. Everything felt dark and devoid of hope. Miss Greenwich, you must compose yourself and pull yourself together now. No matter what the outside world says about your mother, you must not believe it, Clara said. Kendra looked up at Clara with reddened eyes and asked in a hoarse voice, Clara, please tell me the truth. Did my mom really embezzle the company's public funds? I need to know the truth. In the courtroom, the evidence had overwhelmingly implicated Melissa in using a shell company to siphon off company funds. Even though she might not be the sharpest tool in the shed, Kendra had some understanding of the situation. Yes, when your mother was with your father, they didn't have much money. Additionally, she had to support you and hold another wedding. When she needed funds, she found ways to tap into the company's resources. Clara told her the unvarnished truth. Why didn't you try to dissuade her? You knew she was breaking the law, Kendra asked in a hoarse voice. Miss Greenwich, you don't understand the situation. Ma'am treats you like a princess. You wear designer clothes, drive luxury cars, and even need money to buy a sports car. You can't blame her for this, 
Clara replied mockingly. Kendra's face reddened with embarrassment. She had a growing sense that her mother's plight was partly Eleanor her fault. Eleanor leaned into Adrian's embrace as they rode in a black car headed for the Miller Group. Weariness was etched on her face. Adrian spoke softly. You can rest in my office. Sure, okay, Eleanor agreed. The car entered from the underground parking lot and made its way to Adrian's exclusive parking space. Adrian exited the car first and walked to the other side, opening the door for Eleanor and helping her out. Inside the elevator, Adrian reached over to tidy her slightly disheveled hair. I'll expedite the purchase contract and have the Greenwich Group shareholders sign it as soon as possible. You don't have to push yourself so hard. Eleanor took a deep breath and shook her head. I'm not tired. I just didn't sleep well last night. Last night had been sleepless for her. She had replayed the trial in her mind repeatedly, fearing that Melissa might find a way to turn things around. But now Eleanor had closed off any escape routes for Melissa. There was no turning back, only a relentless march forward, revealing her father's death inch by inch. When all of this is over, I'm taking you out to relax and help you forget about these things. You shouldn't have to worry about them anymore. Adrian murmured, giving her hand, warm with comfort, a gentle squeeze. Eleanor was led out of the elevator by him, a faint smile tugging at her lips. Thankfully, this man had always been by her side, unwavering. Meanwhile, back at home, Kendra was still with Clara, contemplating her next steps. Her top priority was to plead with Sean. As things stood, no one else would help Melissa. All right, I'll go and plead with him, Kendra stated with unwavering confidence. She believed that Sean would surely come to her mother's aid. But Kendra, be cautious. Sean is quite shrewd. Don't let him manipulate you, Clara cautioned. Don't worry, he's always treated me well. He's even given me plenty of big diamonds before. He must like me, Kendra confidently asserted. Melissa was taken back to the police station once more. In court, when she saw all the evidence laid out before her, she realized the staggering extent of her financial mismanagement over the past year. When she made those decisions, she never anticipated that Eleanor would uncover her financial misdeeds. She had held on to the hope that Sean would rescue her, but that hope had dwindled. At this moment, she couldn't help but think of George. Whenever she faced adversity, George would be there to ask about it. If trouble arose, he would stand up and support her. As she reminisced about George, Melissa recalled his appearance at the time of his death. A pang of regret washed over her briefly, but she swiftly suppressed it. Melissa was not one to harbor regrets, yet there was one thing that weighed on her mind. She was concerned about Kendra, who had been raised in comfort by her side. She was certain that Kendra would implore Sean for help, a move that would only lead to a dead end. However, Melissa also believed that it was high time her daughter learned to distinguish between right and wrong, good and bad in the world. But when she thought of Eleanor, Melissa couldn't help but clench her teeth and cast a hateful glare. Eleanor had always been an obstacle to her and her daughter's happiness. She regretted not eliminating her when she had the chance. If she knew she would end up in this situation, she would have taken Eleanor down with her, even if it meant risking her own life. At six o'clock in the evening, Sean was exhausted. He had returned home early in the morning. At this moment, he was the sole occupant of the villa. Suddenly, the doorbell rang. He approached the door and saw Kendra's figure on the security camera feed. A flicker of surprise crossed his eyes. It seemed that the second daughter of the Greenwich family had come to implore him for help. Sean opened the door, and Kendra stood there, her eyes red as she called out to him, Dad, please save my mother. Come in, let's talk. Sean immediately made a welcoming gesture, half-hugging her as they entered. Kendra grew tense when Sean pulled her inside. She glanced nervously at her left shoulder, which Sean was holding. He guided her to the sofa and sat down with her. 
Kendra, don't worry. I'm making inquiries on your mother's behalf. Will my mother be released? Can she be acquitted? Kendra asked, hopefully. Sean feigned deep contemplation. Yes, it's possible, but I need to seek help from various sources. Dad, I'm willing to do anything as long as you can save my mom. Kendra immediately held his hand and pleaded. Sean's eyes lit up upon hearing that. Kendra, is that true? Are you willing to do anything? Kendra suddenly sensed a shift in Sean's gaze. It was no longer gentle and benevolent, but rather unsettling, as though it harbored ill intentions. I can help you seek assistance from others. Anyone is fine. Kendra nervously began to backtrack. Sean noticed the fear in Kendra's eyes and realized that she had discerned his true intentions. He immediately leaned forward, a sinister grin playing across his face. Kendra, how about becoming my woman? You pervert! Get away from me! You're disgusting! Kendra retorted, her eyes filled with anger and disdain. Sean's expression darkened and he seized Kendra's arm, striking her across the face. How dare you insult me? Now you'll pay the price. Help! Someone! Save me! Kendra's desperate cries echoed through Sean's villa. However, no one came to her aid because she had driven there alone. Sean's estate was vast, and any cries for help could only vanish into thin air. Half an hour later, Kendra was in a pitiful state. Her hair was disheveled as she sat in a corner of the sofa with her clothes torn. Sean had gone upstairs, leaving Kendra with tearful eyes filled with humiliation and shame. Her once pretty face was now swollen. Sean was a creep, and he had pushed Kendra to her limit. As anger coursed through Kendra's veins, she felt a sudden urge for everyone to witness Sean's true nature. With trembling hands, she placed her phone on the nearby table and activated the recording function. In the past, whenever she faced hardships, she would turn to her mother for support. But now, her mother's ill-advised marriage to someone like Sean had exposed Kendra to inhumane mistreatment. Sean emerged from his bath, descending the staircase with a glass of red wine in hand. With a cheery disposition, he asked Kendra, who was seated on the sofa, Kendra, care for a drink? You're not human, you're a monster! Kendra spat out angrily. You're already mine. What's the point of hurling insults? Sean responded dismissively. Why don't you stay by my side from now on? I'll provide you with everything you need. You won't have to worry about anything. What you did to me just now, Kendra muttered, her voice low. You're a hypocrite. Karma will catch up with you. Sean's expression darkened. Kendra, I'm warning you. If you breathe a word about what happened here, I'll make you disappear from this world. Kendra was paralyzed with fear, her tears coming to a halt. She stared at him and said, You wouldn't dare. There's nothing I, Sean, wouldn't dare to do. Go ahead, test me, Sean replied coldly. He then grabbed her chin and forced the wine into her mouth. Drink up, we'll have another round later. Kendra's face contorted in disgust. She resisted drinking and choked several times. When she saw an opportunity, she discreetly placed her phone on the nearby cabinet, facing away from them. At three in the morning, while Sean was upstairs, Kendra seized her chance. She grabbed her phone and bag and fled. Sean's house had her fingerprints on record, so he couldn't stop her. When Sean discovered her absence upon coming downstairs, he didn't think much of it. Someone as concerned about her reputation as Kendra wouldn't spill the beans about their encounter, he assumed. He felt untouchable. Kendra hid in a small park, crying as she called Clara to pick her up. When Clara arrived and saw Kendra's bruised and swollen appearance, she immediately asked, What happened? That bastard Sean? Kendra clung to herself, sobbing in the back seat. After a good cry, she hissed, I'm going to get him. I'm going to make him pay. At that moment, Kendra seemed to have lost her mind entirely. She clutched her phone as if it were her lifeline and lamented, Why did my mother marry such a creep? Clara sympathized with her, but felt powerless to do anything more. 
She knew that Melissa's choices had led to her daughter's suffering. Should we tell ma'am about this? Clara asked Kendra from the driver's seat. Kendra shook her head vehemently. No, don't tell my mother. She won't be able to handle it. So, what do we do? Clara asked. It can't end like this, Kendra gritted her teeth. She wanted Sean to face consequences for his actions. From there, Kendra had no recourse. She realized her helplessness in this situation. All she could do now was watch her mother head to prison. A week later, Melissa's trial concluded. She was sentenced to 15 years and her assets were confiscated. The inheritance rights of her company went to Eleanor, and the shares in her name were taken too. According to the Greenwich family's inheritance rules, the shares should go to the heir of the group, Eleanor. However, this was just the beginning for Eleanor, as Melissa's sins ran deeper. Eleanor provided the police with the lead on the total of 30 to 40 million dollars in Melissa's name, which was traced to an account under the name of a man named Zack. Eleanor intended to recover this money, making Zack a prime suspect. Zack was apprehended at a casino, unaware of the unfolding events. He had 20 million dollars, seemingly clueless about Melissa's downfall. It wasn't until he was brought into the interrogation room, with Arnold and the police ready to question him about the whereabouts of the funds, that Zack began to feel the heat. He had no intention of revealing the truth. Instead, he tried to shift the blame onto Melissa, claiming she had given him the money. However, the police were well prepared for the interrogation. Sheldon's evasive responses and contradictions raised suspicions of his involvement in illegal dealings with Melissa, too. The breakthrough came from an experienced old police officer with over a decade of case-solving experience. Eleanor revealed her father's suspicious death and the subsequent demise of the surgeon, Dr. Andrew. If these events were connected, it could mean a double homicide with Melissa as the mastermind. The police couldn't ignore this lead. Sheldon became crucial evidence, and they were determined to make him confess. Eleanor's tension reached its peak as she monitored these developments over the past few days. With Adrian by her side and the child behaving obediently, she hoped that this time Melissa's schemes would be unraveled. Zack, a repeat offender, proved to be a tough nut to crack. However, the evidence against him was mounting. Surveillance photos from the hospital showed Zack's car near the scene of Dr. Andrew's fatal accident, just seconds after it occurred. This evidence was enough to implicate Zack as a murderer. Why did you want Andrew dead? The police interrogated him. With the murder charge against Zack established, he was set to face trial. In the face of impending death, Zack had no reason to withhold information. He finally confessed to Melissa's involvement in ordering Dr. Andrew's murder. Zack tried to shift the blame onto Melissa, because her husband died after Andrew's surgery. She wanted Andrew dead to silence him and secure her position as president. Are you sure George died after Andrew's surgery? The officer asked. In any case, she wanted Andrew dead, and she wanted it to be permanent, Zack confessed. The old police officer pondered the situation. He revisited Dr. Andrew's financial records, discovering that shortly after George's death, a significant sum had been transferred to Andrew's account, funds originating from an empty shell company under the Greenwich Group. Piece by piece, the evidence pointed toward George's death not being a natural one, but a murder orchestrated by Melissa. In the Miller Group's main office, Eleanor had just received a call from the police. Her father's case was making progress, and the investigation had begun. The day she had long awaited had the year was drawing to a close. A chilly rain pelted the glass, obscuring the distant sky. Eleanor couldn't help but stifle her emotions. Before her father's collapse, only Andrew and Melissa had been present. After all this time, could the police still find evidence related to her father's death? Could they still pin the crime on Melissa? Though Melissa held her father's life in her hands, it had brought her closer to death. Yet she couldn't shake the need to understand the truth. Her father's last moments were etched in her memory, 
his trembling finger pointing at Melissa, a deep hatred in his eyes. What had Melissa done? Behind her, a pair of warm arms encircled her waist. Eleanor closed her eyes, leaning into the familiar presence. Only in his embrace could she cast aside her worries and find solace in his warmth. Soon, the truth about your father's death will come to light, Adrian assured her. For the past month, he had been her steadfast support, always there when she needed him, a comforting presence in her life. Yes, but I have a feeling that even if Melissa faces death, she won't reveal the truth, Eleanor said, her gaze focused on Melissa's impending fate. She believed Melissa would take her secrets to the grave. Then we need to find a way to make her talk, Adrian whispered. I have a plan, Eleanor asserted. She had been strategizing. What's your plan? Adrian asked. Let me confront her, Eleanor shrugged. Adrian hesitated, knowing her intentions. She wanted to provoke Melissa, make her lose control, and spill the truth. People often said the most revealing things when they were unhinged. Eleanor turned to face him. Don't worry, I'll only confront her. She won't be able to harm me. Despite his reservations, Adrian understood her determination. Just promise me you won't let your emotions get the best of you. It's okay. I'm much calmer now. Let me handle this, Eleanor assured him. You promise me you won't go alone. Adrian couldn't stop her, but he could hold her closer, expressing his worry and protectiveness. Eleanor agreed, knowing that she would seek out Melissa once she had been convicted of the murder of Andrew. She needed to confront her, to unearth the reasons behind her father's hatred before his death. At the airport, a white car held a figure curled up in despair. It was Kendra, a shadow of her former self. She had suffered for over a month, her once vibrant complexion now pale, her frame reduced to a fragile form. She had failed to save her mother and endured mistreatment at the hands of Sean. It had pushed her to the brink of madness. However, when a person is at their most desperate, they may do something unexpected. Kendra had learned that Ian had returned that day, and she wanted to confront him. Clara sat in the driver's seat, having resigned from the Greenwich Group. She was offering a temporary refuge for Kendra and understood her intentions. Do you have to do this? Do you think it's worth it? Clara turned to look at Kendra in the back seat. Kendra gazed out of the window with a vacant expression, anxiously searching for Ian's arrival. She bit her lip and replied, It's worth it. I want that pervert Sean to pay for what he did. I want him to regret how he treated me. But didn't Ian also abandon you? Clara asked. Do you know, Ian is the man I love the most. Even though he abandoned me, I still love him. I don't ask for anything. I just want Ian to help me get revenge on Sean. I want him to pay with his life. Kendra clenched her teeth as she spoke the last sentence. Eventually, Ian's arrival was announced, and Kendra opened the car door and sprinted toward him. As she ran, she called out his name. Ian! Ian halted and turned to see a figure racing toward him. He struggled to recognize the girl approaching. It was Kendra. Kendra, is there something you need? Ian asked, his tone detached. He had not forgiven her for the pain she had caused him. Ian, I need to talk to you about something. Please give me some time, Kendra said, her eyes reddened and deep. Kendra, I have nothing to discuss with you. I heard about your mother. She brought this upon herself, and no one can save her, Ian stated, thinking that she had come to ask for his help in saving Melissa. But Kendra shook her head vigorously. No, I'm not here about my mother. I want to propose a deal with you. It's a deal you'll be interested in. Ian narrowed his eyes, skeptical of her words. However, he noticed the change in Kendra's demeanor. She seemed to have lost her innocence and was now driven by sheer hatred. All right, follow me and get into the car, Ian said, intrigued by what she had to offer. What kind of deal did she want to discuss? Could it be related to Eleanor? 
For some inexplicable reason, Ian couldn't turn away from anything connected to Eleanor. He wanted to know everything about her. Perhaps it was the depth of his love for her that he couldn't escape. Kendra's eyes flashed with resentment. She realized what he was thinking. She spoke icily. I'm not here for Eleanor either. I despise her. Ian furrowed his brows. You don't have the right to despise her. She has nothing to do with you. It's always been you and your mother who brought this upon yourselves. Kendra used to be furious to the point of madness, but now she found it laughable. You're right. Everyone says that. Eleanor must be so pleased with herself now. She finally managed to bring down my mother. But what did she rely on? Another man? After her outburst, Kendra turned her attention to Ian. Are you and Adrian business rivals? In the business world, it's often a matter of being either partners or competitors, Ian replied matter-of-factly. Kendra couldn't resist needling him further, hitting a sore spot. But the Rockstone group has always lagged behind the Miller group in every aspect. Ian's expression shifted slightly. He didn't appreciate such comparisons, especially when it concerned Adrian. Kendra, noticing his reaction, quickly bit her tongue to avoid overstepping. She didn't want him to kick her out of the car. Upon arriving at Ian's office, the assistant closed the door, and Ian turned to Kendra. Now, you can tell me what kind of deal you want to discuss. I have evidence that could help you successfully acquire Sean's company, Kendra announced. How is that possible? Sean's company isn't in a position to be bought yet. Even Adrian hasn't made a move. Ian found it hard to believe. Kendra had grown more astute recently and, with Clara's assistance, had devised a plan to force Sean's hand. What if Sean is facing a serious accusation? What if he's about to be imprisoned? Kendra's voice quivered as she recounted her ordeal with Sean. Ian looked at her with surprise. Who accused Sean? Me. Kendra's face was drained of color. She still couldn't accept what Sean had done to her. You. What did he do to you? Ian was taken aback. Wasn't Sean married to Melissa? Why did Kendra harbor such intense hatred for him? Kendra's hands trembled as she retrieved her phone, played a video, and averted her gaze as she handed it to Ian. This is enough evidence to put him behind bars. The video depicted Kendra's humiliating ordeal. Ian felt a rush of revulsion as he watched the video, bearing witness to Kendra's desperate struggle and Sean's beastly actions. Turning off the video, he looked at Kendra with a solemn expression. He now understood why Kendra had lost so much weight. She had been subjected to such cruelty by Sean. Has he divorced your mother? Ian asked. Not yet. He knows my mother is involved in a legal case, Kendra replied. Ian sighed, acknowledging her. What would you like me to do? Protect me? Use this video to pressure him into selling his company to you at a lower price? Or let me use it to send him to prison? Kendra's eyes brimmed with hatred. Ian, who had been in the business world, saw merit in Kendra's proposal. Rather than letting Adrian win, it might be better to strengthen his own company. He already had the necessary funds after a successful project. Kendra. I don't know how to console you. Ian sighed. Don't console me. Buy that bastard's company and make sure he rots in prison for the rest of his life. Keep him there until he's nothing but a memory. Kendra was singularly focused on revenge. Okay. I promise you that if he goes in, he'll never come out. Ian agreed to the deal. Find me a safe place to stay. I'm afraid Sean will come after me, Kendra asked. I will, Ian assured her, feeling pity for Kendra at that moment. The police were meticulously investigating the cases tied to Melissa. Zach's confession confirmed Melissa's hand in Andrew's death. However, the police were now probing further into George's demise. Though Melissa had been interrogated, she vehemently denied any involvement in George's death. She had lost all hope and was consumed by bitterness, resenting everyone and everything. Kendra had visited her a few times, but she hadn't disclosed Sean's actions. 
She knew that revealing the truth would push Melissa over the edge. Unable to dissuade Eleanor, Adrian accompanied her. The winter rain was incessant, and as they stepped out of the car, he swiftly pulled Eleanor into his embrace. She held him tightly, and their faces drew close. Despite the pouring rain, their gaze locked onto each other, and Eleanor discerned the concern in his eyes. She clung to him, her voice hushed. Don't worry, I'll be fine. I know I can't stop you. Adrian sighed, holding her shoulder tightly. He tilted the umbrella to shield her from the rain, his expensive suit already drenched. Though they were only a few meters from the main entrance, the heavy rain made it seem much farther. Eleanor entered quickly, glancing at his wet shoulder. She took out a tissue from her bag and dabbed his wet suit carefully, trying to dry it. It's okay. Adrian put away the umbrella and placed it in a nearby cabinet. Eleanor continued to pat his suit with the tissue, mindful of not causing any damage. The few female police officers nearby found the scene heartwarming. The handsome man and beautiful woman together, it was a sight to behold. Moreover, someone like Adrian wasn't an everyday sight. Seeing such an attractive man was a rarity. If given the chance, they would have liked to steal a few more glances. However, the Greenwich Group's eldest daughter was with him, Adrian and it was clear that the they police were in station. Miss Greenwich, Mr. Miller, you guys are here. Please come with me, a middle-aged police officer greeted them. How is she feeling now? Eleanor inquired. Melissa's mood has been unstable. Miss Greenwich, when you go in to confront her later, we will handcuff her and station two police officers at the scene for safety, the officer assured. We must ensure her safety, Adrian added cautiously. We will. Miss Greenwich's safety is our priority, he said. Eleanor hadn't seen Melissa since they parted ways in court. However, Zach's arrest must have been a heavy blow to her. Will her daughter, Kendra, come to see her? Eleanor asked. She came two days ago, but she left in tears. Her mood is unstable, too, the officer sighed. Eleanor knew that Kendra had relied on Melissa since she was young and was used to depending on her. Melissa was her world, and her mother's fall would shatter her. As her father's daughter, Eleanor hoped that Kendra could finally live her own life and not be shackled by her mother's actions. Her mother had brought this upon herself, and Eleanor harbored no deep hatred, just a bit of resentment. Miss Greenwich, please sign here. We will bring Melissa over promptly at three o'clock, the officer said. Okay. Eleanor signed the form without hesitation, while Adrian appeared tense. With five minutes to go, Adrian guided her to a nearby chair. How do you plan to interrogate her later? I haven't decided yet, but I have many questions for her. I'll figure it out as we go. Eleanor replied, her mind also in a state of confusion. Try to relax. Melissa won't escape justice. Once she faces consequences, you can put this behind you, Adrian assured her. All right, Eleanor nodded. She needed to let go. For Eleanor, letting go meant returning to Adrian wholeheartedly. She didn't want to be provoked or hurt by these people or events. At precisely three o'clock, Melissa was brought into the interrogation room through another entrance, dressed in prison attire. She appeared dazed, with unfocused eyes, and had aged considerably since their last encounter. The door opened, and two police officers entered with Eleanor. In the observation room adjacent, Adrian leaned forward, focusing intently through the glass window. When Melissa saw Eleanor enter, she instantly lost her composure, clenching her fists and glaring with hatred. What are you doing here? The police officers stepped back, allowing Eleanor and Melissa to sit across from each other, separated by the interrogation table. Melissa, have you ever regretted what you did? Eleanor asked directly. Regret? Regret what? Regret that I seduced your father and insulted your mother? Regret for embezzling public funds? Let me tell you, I don't regret anything, Melissa sneered. Eleanor clenched her fists and gritted her teeth. Let me ask you, do you regret killing my father? He was good to you. 
Why didn't you help him when he was in distress? Melissa was taken aback, a flicker of panic crossing her eyes. She quickly composed herself and denied, I wasn't even there when your father fainted. I couldn't have killed him. Can you swear to God that you weren't present when my dad fainted? Eleanor demanded angrily. Melissa stood up in a fit of rage, pointing at Eleanor with handcuffed hands. Eleanor, who are you to make me swear? I've always wanted to harm you the most. I should have poisoned you when you were young. I regret not doing it. Melissa, watch your words, the police officer interjected angrily. Melissa cowered and sat back down, her tone changing. You dare not bully my daughter, understood? If she doesn't commit crimes... No one will bully her. You made her into what she is, Eleanor retorted. Melissa clutched her head and shouted, No, I did everything for her sake. I provided her with a comfortable life. Was I wrong? Eleanor looked at her with pity and continued, Zack has confessed. You paid him to kill Andrew because he had evidence of your involvement in my father's harm. You bribed Zack to do it. Andrew was your high school classmate, yet you killed him. He deserved to die. He dared to threaten me. I hate people who threaten me the most, Melissa muttered. Eleanor pressed on. Did Andrew ask for money from you? How much did he demand? Did he have any leverage over you? Was it related to my father? Did he frame my father during the surgery? A series of questions filled Melissa's mind. She looked at Eleanor, her emotions swirling, and then she laughed coldly. You can't force me to talk. I've said it before, you and your family will meet a terrible end. Your son, Adrian's family, all of you will suffer. Shut up, you're the one who will suffer. Eleanor's emotions got the best of her, and she shouted, Tell me the truth about my father's death. Adrian, standing outside the window, clenched his fists tightly at this moment. Following Melissa and Eleanor's conversation, his mind exploded with thoughts. He suddenly said in a low voice, I know what is going on. Let me go in, okay? The elderly policeman nodded and said, All right, I'll give you a bit more time. Eleanor was seething with anger, but she could tolerate humiliation up to a point. She couldn't allow others to insult her son or curse her family, especially the Miller family. As her body trembled with anger, the door behind her suddenly opened. An arm wrapped around her in a swift motion, and a familiar voice reassured her, Don't let her get to you, Eleanor. Let me handle this. Hey, Adrian, you sure have some nerve, Melissa taunted when she saw him. Melissa, I know why Mr. Greenwich had a heart attack. It's because you were having an affair with Andrew in his office, and Mr. Greenwich walked in on you. Adrian declared loudly. Melissa's previously composed expression twisted suddenly as if she had been struck by a blow. She hung her head in panic, avoiding the gazes of the two people in front of her. Eleanor's breathing stopped and her anger was simmering as she asked again, You had an affair with another man right in front of my father? Melissa, who was feeling guilty, decided to provoke Eleanor further. After all, her death was imminent, and she had nothing to lose. She looked at Eleanor's furious expression and continued to push her buttons. That's right, your father was just unlucky. Andrew and I were together in his office that day. Maybe the door wasn't properly closed. Your dad barged in without even knocking. Unfortunately, he caught us red-handed. I can only say he was unlucky. If it weren't for that, he wouldn't have had a heart attack, let alone die. But alas, anger got the best of him. Andrew was there, so why didn't you let him save my father? Eleanor gritted her teeth. I thought about saving him, but he ruined my relationship. Why should I save him? Saving him would only lead to divorce, and after that, he wouldn't give me a cent. So Andrew and I held on to each other. We let him miss the chance to be saved. Besides, Andrew was the chief surgeon. He could have let your father die at any moment. Melissa replied without a hint of remorse. The police officers present couldn't contain their anger any longer. One of them spoke up, Melissa, you're aware that you have blood on your hands, right? Melissa retorted defiantly. So what if it's three or four lives? 
If you're going to shoot, then shoot. I'm not afraid. Eleanor lashed out. You're not human. You're not worthy of being called human. He was your daughter's father, for God's sake. But he always favored you and never cared about Kendra. He wholeheartedly wanted to groom you. Did he ever take Kendra seriously? Melissa argued. The decisions were yours to make. What kind of example did you set for Kendra? Eleanor's eyes welled up with tears as she hissed back. Adrian was concerned as he held the enraged Eleanor in his arms. He regretted bringing her here. Now that she knew the truth, she was suffering even more. Melissa, what are you so proud of? You have no regrets. Even if I help your daughter find some redemption, I won't allow you to escape responsibility as a human being, Adrian said coldly. Melissa's arrogance disappeared instantly. Adrian didn't want to give her any satisfaction. You don't know what kind of person Sean is. Think about how he'll treat your daughter. This statement struck fear into Melissa. She grabbed her head frantically and exclaimed, No, Kendra, shouldn't go to him. Sean is a scoundrel. He won't help me. Kendra must not go to him. What if that scoundrel? At that moment, Adrian emerged from the interrogation room with Eleanor still in his arms. Melissa, driven mad with anger, was left behind, muttering to herself and on the brink of insanity. Eleanor walked out of the interrogation room with a blank expression. She finally understood why her father had grown to resent her in the end. She felt a deep sorrow for her father, who had died because of Melissa's betrayal. Now, Melissa was paying the price for her actions. It was all finally over. She looked out the window at Melissa being led away by the police officers. That crazed and almost insane look in her eyes didn't warrant any sympathy. Baby, let's go, Adrian said, guiding her away. The police had gathered enough evidence during the interrogation. Melissa was indeed suspected of causing George's death. However, given the complex circumstances, this matter would be added to the evidence against her. Melissa's crimes were egregious, and her final judgment would be made in court. Eleanor sat in the car, her expression still blank. Adrian glanced at her, his heart aching as he realized she was deep in thought. Do you think this is karma? Back then, my father betrayed my mother for Melissa, leading to my mother's death from depression. Now, Melissa's betrayal has also caused my father to pass away in hatred. Is this truly karma? Eleanor's eyes filled with tears, her face etched with sadness. Adrian's heart ached. Seeing her in this state, he couldn't bear it. He leaned over and wrapped his arms around her, gently stroking her head while murmuring soothing words. It's all over now. Don't dwell on it too much. The more Eleanor thought about it, the sadder she became. Why was her family never truly a home, and why did she lose two family members in this way? She despised betrayal like nothing else, hoping that it would never touch her life again. Adrian, if you don't love me, please tell me in advance. Let me prepare to leave. Let me... Before Eleanor could finish her sentence, tears streamed down her face. However, her words were silenced by the man's commanding presence. Adrian didn't want to hear those words. They pained him deeply. What was she thinking? How could he let her leave? How could he not love her? He gently withdrew his lips and gazed at her with slight irritation. Don't ever say that again. Never. Why? Eleanor murmured. Because it's something that will never happen. As long as I'm in this world, I won't allow you to leave me, and I won't love another woman. I won't let you experience what your father did. Adrian's voice was low but unwavering. Eleanor's tears continued to flow, but this time they were not tears of sadness. She sniffled and nodded obediently, saying, Okay. Adrian loosened his hold on her slightly and asked in a low voice, Where do you want to go now? Back home? I'm not in the mood right now. I'll go back later. I don't want Flynn to sense my feelings, Eleanor replied. Then how about visiting your parents' graves and leaving flowers? 
Adrian suggested, knowing that she missed her parents at that moment. Perhaps this gesture would bring her some solace. Eleanor nodded and said, All right. In a small apartment, Kendra had been placed there by Ian. She sat in front of the French window, gazing at the rain outside, feeling like her life was shrouded in darkness with no sign of light. She didn't know how to move forward and was terrified of what her future held. She could no longer see any hint of compassion in Ian's eyes. Even though he was doing everything for her now, it was only because she possessed evidence that could help him. Why am I such a failure? Kendra muttered to herself, her voice filled with self-pity. Why couldn't I meet someone like Adrian, like Eleanor did? Why can't I be loved by a man like her? In just a month, she had grown up and matured rapidly, as if she had experienced Tears a lifetime of Kendra's hardships. eyes. She clenched her teeth, determined to see Sean behind bars. That was her sole objective. Furthermore, a small sense of satisfaction blossomed within her. Assisting Ian was not just about helping him in the business world against Adrian, it was also a way to indirectly seek retribution for her mother. In the cemetery, the rain gradually subsided and turned into a drizzle. Adrian held the umbrella while Eleanor placed two white chrysanthemums in front of her parents' graves. She gazed silently at their graves as if for a moment she could see her parents loving each other during happier times. Dad, Mom, I hope you're at peace below. Please don't worry about me anymore. I'll live a good life. Eleanor spoke softly to the cold tombstone. A chilly gust of wind swept down from the nearby hill. Worried that Eleanor might catch a cold, Adrian gently suggested, let's head back. Eleanor nodded and entered the car. Unexpectedly, she sneezed a few times, feeling a chill seeping into her bones, causing her to shiver. Adrian looked at her with concern and reached out to touch her forehead. Her skin felt warm to his touch, and he furrowed his brow. It seems like you've caught a cold. Eleanor managed to smile and shook her head. It's all right. Let's go back, Adrian said as he turned on the car's heater and drove away. In the winter, Valerie had no desire to leave the warmth of her room and felt like a hibernating snake. She hadn't ventured outside for an entire month, spending most of her time in Gary's villa. Due to Gary's busy work schedule and Kesha's delayed return to the country, the meeting between the two families had been postponed until the following day. Valerie was both nervous and eager for this meeting. She worried that her parents would still be concerned about the Stewart family's background. At seven, Kesha called. She had landed and the two sisters chatted briefly before the sound of Gary's car pulling up outside interrupted their conversation. Kesha, I'll fill you in later. He's back. See you tomorrow, Valerie said. All right, see you tomorrow. I won't interfere with your love life any longer, Kesha chuckled. Kesha, did you misunderstand? We haven't yet, Valerie began to clarify, not wanting her family to jump to conclusions. What, don't you two live together? Keisha was slightly surprised. We live together, but we sleep in separate beds. Valerie explained with a hint of embarrassment. I see. Keisha chuckled. All right, then. You can continue with your night. See you tomorrow. With that, she ended the call. Valerie set her phone down and heard the sound of the front door opening. Gary, tall and handsome in a khaki windbreaker over his suit, walked in. He exuded an air of sophistication and stood out. Valerie's heart leaped with joy, and she couldn't help but approach him. You're back. Did you miss me? She asked with a childlike innocence. Gary, still wearing his coat, impatiently pressed his lips to hers, his answer clear. Yes. How much did you miss me? Valerie tilted her head and inquired. Gary hung up his windbreaker and lifted her effortlessly. Apart from work. I think about you all the time. Valerie was satisfied with his response and nodded. I missed you too. I have some rain on me. I'll go upstairs to take a shower first. Do you want to come up with me? Gary asked. 
why would I go up with you? Valerie blushed and couldn't meet his gaze. Gary suddenly flashed a teasing smile and suggested, aren't you curious about me? Afraid I won't be able to perform after we're married? Valerie blushed even more deeply. I trust you. Her response made him feel at ease and he chuckled. Good, trust me. Valerie no longer dared to look at him and hopped off his lap, saying, Go take a shower and don't catch a cold. Gary headed upstairs for a bath, while Valerie waited downstairs. It was still early, and there was no rush to go upstairs. Meanwhile, Eleanor returned from the cemetery with a high fever. Adrian promptly took her temperature and found it to be 39 degrees. He immediately called the doctor, who arrived with medication to bring down her fever. Eleanor sat quietly on the sofa, patiently awaiting the completion of her IV drip. Mommy, does it hurt? Flynn approached after a while, his concern evident in his eyes as he examined where the needle was inserted. Eleanor gently touched his head and reassured him, Mommy will be fine soon. Adrian chimed in, Flynn, it's getting late. I'll take you to Grandma's place. You shouldn't sleep with Mommy tonight. Why? Flynn questioned. Because it's contagious, Eleanor said. What about you, Daddy? Flynn inquired. Are you going to sleep with Mommy? Daddy can sleep with Mommy. Daddy's strong, Adrian stated, making a case for himself. The two nurses couldn't help but laugh, <laughs> casting envious glances at Eleanor. Having a handsome husband and an equally charming son was indeed a blessing. Eleanor, on the other hand, smiled as she assured her son, Mommy will stay with you at home tomorrow. Okay, good night, Mommy. You should sleep early, too. Flynn, holding Adrian's hand, left the room. When Adrian returned, Eleanor was about to remove the needle. After giving her the medication, the doctor and nurses left. Eleanor's body temperature dropped. If her fever returned at night, she would take the medicine again four hours later. If it persisted the next day, she would go to the hospital. She was completely exhausted, and there was a slight bump where the needle had been injected. After taking a shower, she lay down on the bed. Adrian brought her a hot water bag for the swelling on her arm. Eleanor felt the warmth and her eyes filled with emotion. This man was truly amazing, and she couldn't help but feel the urge to spend her life with him. Adrian lifted his eyes and saw her staring at him blankly. He curled his lips and smiled. What's on your mind? Let's get married, Eleanor suddenly blurted out. Adrian's heart skipped a beat and his eyes lit up. He even chuckled and replied with a low smile. All right, let's get married. We'll plan it after Valerie's wedding, Eleanor said, feeling that this should be a joyful occasion. After attending Valerie's wedding, Valerie would immediately attend hers, just as you wish. I'll go along with your plans, Adrian said as he placed the towel in the basin and sat beside her. He hugged her and kissed her hair. From now on, just relax with me. I won't let you down in this lifetime. Eleanor nestled into his arms, closed her eyes, and smiled. Okay. Her father's company had returned to her control, the truth about her father's death had been revealed, and Melissa had faced justice. She could now let go of the past and focus on building a happy life with this man and raising their children. That night, Eleanor still had a fever, and Adrian took care of her throughout the night without sleeping. Early in the morning, he took her to the hospital. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Valerie had awakened early. She put on her makeup and chose a khaki windbreaker that complemented her fair skin and beauty. Although she was in the entertainment industry, she exuded the grace of a refined lady. Gary was dressed in a dark suit and shoes. Valerie helped him with his tie. She had slept well the previous night, but she knew that it had been tough on a certain man. During winter, she would crawl into his bed when it got cold. Even though they shared a bed, Gary maintained his gentlemanly demeanor. Valerie was earnestly tying his tie when Gary looked at her seriously and lifted her chin in a domineering manner, pressing his lips against her red ones. Stop fooling around. You're making me look bad, 
Valerie laughed and dodged his affectionate advances. Gary couldn't resist being playful. Facing this woman, he felt energized every day. So how could he stop kissing her? When they left the house at nine o'clock, Valerie's lightly adorned red lips had a rose-like beauty that wasn't solely the result of lipstick, but also the work of a certain someone. Valerie called Kesha. They had arranged to leave home at 10 o'clock to go to the restaurant they had reserved. Gary's family had already arranged the dinner. It was the day when the two families' parents were finally going to meet. The restaurant they had chosen was an upscale establishment. Valerie and Gary arrived early. Valerie had met the Stewart family before. Mrs. Stewart, who had been a bit skeptical at first, had even inquired about her from some people in the entertainment industry and had received excellent feedback about Valerie. As a result, the more Mrs. Stewart looked at her, the more pleasing she found her. Valerie, Gary, when Valerie's parents and the others arrive, please go downstairs to welcome them, Mrs. Stewart politely instructed. Yes, we will. I called my sister and asked her to message me when they were on their way. Valerie nodded. Ten minutes later, Valerie received a message from Kesha. She and Gary went downstairs to welcome Brandon and his wife. Valerie also introduced Kesha to him. This was Kesha's first time meeting Gary. They greeted each other politely, and Gary had already known about Valerie's elder sister. Today, they finally met in person. Her demeanor was completely different from Valerie's, exuding a capable and sharp vibe in stark contrast to Valerie's carefree aura. Gary couldn't help but pay close attention to her, feeling an innate desire to protect her. Upstairs, the elders from both families engaged in lively conversation, discussing various topics from their generation. Marlo was there too, and he had been busy teaching high school students. His performance was exceptional, especially in mathematics. Valerie was feeling nervous and perspiring, fearing her parents would lecture her. However, Brandon praised her for being smart and adorable when she was young. Valerie was secretly touched by this. It seemed her father didn't think she was as troublesome as she'd believed. However, compared to Gary's upbringing, where he seemed like an overachiever, Valerie couldn't help but envy him. She wondered if things would have turned out differently if she hadn't given up on her past relationship. When the Stewart family learned that Kesha would be working at the president's house after the new year, they felt that the Dane family's children were all quite promising. They found the couple more and more endearing and couldn't Later, stop showering Lewis's them trial with trial finally concluded, and she received a one-year suspended death sentence. Eleanor accepted this news calmly. With Adrian managing the Greenwich Group, she stepped down from her position as the company's boss. New Year's Eve arrived, and in a year, Eleanor had weathered a storm, reunited with her loved ones, and welcomed a new year with hope for better days ahead. Similarly, this news reached Kendra, who had been hiding in the apartment Ian rented for her. She had cried all night and had grown to despise Eleanor. Kendra's breaking point had changed her. She had become like a vengeful spirit, consumed by bitterness. At just 24 years old, she looked 10 years older, her beauty fading. She was no longer the center of attention, not due to her looks, but because of her gloomy presence. During this period, her only source of support was her desire for revenge. First, she wanted to settle the score with Sean, then with Eleanor and Adrian. She was determined to avenge her mother's death. She lived like a ghost in the shadows, disinterested in her future or life. Greenwich Mansion was sealed off, and she had no place to call home. News of her mother's imprisonment had spread everywhere. Her former close friends kept their distance and avoided her. No one wanted to associate with her anymore. She even recognized some of the people who had written nasty comments about her in the past. It was clear that those so-called friends were just opportunists. This deepened her hatred for society and everyone in it. She loathed them all. Ian would occasionally call to inquire about her well-being, but their conversations had become brief and unfulfilling. After showing him the video of her being abused by Sean, 
she knew that Ian would never look at her again in her lifetime. One night, Kendra saw Valerie's announcement of her marriage on the internet, flooded with blessings. Her fiancé was the president of Mirage Entertainment Group, a prominent figure in the business world, a man that other women envied and longed for. Kendra couldn't help but seethe with jealousy. Why did Eleanor have Adrian? Even her close friends had found such wonderful men. Compared to that, she lived like a shadow, invisible to the world. On New Year's Eve, the Miller family and the Stewart family gathered for a joyful celebration. They visited relatives and friends on the first day of the new year, spreading good cheer. Coincidentally, the Stewart family visited the Miller mansion on the third day of the new year. Noah had also returned, taller and more handsome than ever. Flynn followed him around like a shadow, and even his uncle called him affectionately. Valerie and Eleanor chatted together. Summer felt too shy to face Marlo because her exam results hadn't been up to par. She felt she had no face to see him. Noah and Summer got into their usual playful arguments, with Noah indulging her with gifts. Gary and Adrian joined their parents' conversation. They chatted in the living room. Flynn, on the other hand, was a hit wherever he went, receiving hugs and kisses and being praised for his good looks. After the engagement, Valerie had moved back to her parents' home. Her parents insisted that she stay there until after the wedding. Traditional values and the fact that it was the new year kept her under their roof. Valerie and Eleanor gathered for a chat. Valerie asked her godson, Flynn, would you like a younger brother or sister in the future? I want a little sister, the young boy immediately replied. Eleanor corrected him, no, you should have a little brother. Valerie smiled and said teasingly, anything is fine, but I'd like to have a daughter. Gary also likes girls. Then mommy, you should have a little daughter too, Flynn chimed in eagerly. Valerie hugged Eleanor and said, soon you'll have two little sisters. Mommy and I will both have little daughters. Okay? The young boy nodded enthusiastically. Okay. Valerie and Eleanor exchanged smiles, both feeling happy at the thought of expanding their family. At that moment, Eleanor's phone rang. She picked it up and saw an unfamiliar number. She turned to Valerie and said, Watch the little one for me. I need to take this call. Sure, go ahead. Valerie nodded. Eleanor walked to the window and glanced at the unknown number. She hesitated, but decided to answer it. Hello? On the other end, a familiar male voice spoke. It's me, Ian. Eleanor was taken aback. It was him. What do you want? Her voice was calm with a hint of distance. Eleanor, please don't hang up. I wanted to let you know that Kendra is with me and I've arranged a place for her to stay. Ian's voice was cautious, as if afraid she would hang up. Eleanor had also wondered how Kendra would fare after Melissa was imprisoned. Where would she go? Hearing Ian's words, she was momentarily surprised. So, Kendra had gone to him. How is she? Eleanor asked curiously. She's not doing well. She's thin and looks haggard. Eleanor, it seems like she resents you deeply. Ian sighed. She can do as she pleases. The matter between Melissa and me has nothing to do with her, Eleanor replied coolly. Ian sighed and asked softly, Have you been well lately? Is Adrian treating you well? He's treating me well. We're getting married, Eleanor replied. Ian's breathing could be heard on the other end. It took him a few seconds before he let out a self-deprecating laugh. I envy him. Eleanor remained silent for a few moments before saying, Ian, I hope you find your happiness. But in my heart, no woman can replace you, Ian whispered. Eleanor had no desire to hear his words. She responded in a cold tone, I'll hang up now. Thank you for taking Kendra in. Eleanor, do you believe it'll ever be possible for us? Life is long and many things can change. Maybe one day when you're no longer with Adrian, I'll give up everything to be with you at any time. Ian's voice was resolute. Eleanor's expression shifted slightly. She firmly rebuffed him, saying, 
It's impossible. In this lifetime, I will never love any man other than him. No matter what happens, I will be with him forever. Her voice carried unwavering determination. Ian seemed to be wounded once more, offering a bitter smile. You love him that much? You loved me for ten years, but you fell in love with him within a year? Yes, I love him. I will love him for the rest of my life, Eleanor affirmed before hanging up the phone. She put away her phone and turned around, only to find Adrian leaning against the balcony pillar behind her, a deep smile in his eyes as he gazed at her. Why are you here? Eleanor asked, feeling a twinge of guilt for taking Ian's call. The unknown number had caught her off guard. I heard everything. Eleanor, I'm deeply touched, Adrian said as he approached her with affection, gently resting his hands on her shoulders. His lips curled up and he felt profoundly content. But Eleanor still felt apologetic. She said with regret, The caller ID displayed an unfamiliar number. I didn't realize it was Ian. If I had known, I wouldn't have answered the call. Adrian didn't want her to carry any guilt. He tenderly ruffled her hair. It doesn't matter whether you answered or not. I trust you. Eleanor sighed and said, He called to inform me that he's taken in Kendra. Adrian had overheard the conversation earlier. He nodded in understanding. That's their issue. You don't need to worry about it. Kendra resents me, Eleanor said. Let her resent you, Adrian declared. She doesn't even know that your father was killed by her mother personally. The police promised me that they wouldn't reveal this to her. I hope she can have a future. It's what my father would have wanted in the end. She's still my father's daughter, Eleanor frowned with worry. I hope she finds out, Adrian said, showing no sympathy for Kendra. Let's eat. Eleanor cleared her throat and changed the topic. Yes, let's eat. Let's go downstairs. Adrian led her downstairs. Downstairs, Kayla had prepared a table full of dishes. The large family gathered around, creating a lively atmosphere. The atmosphere remained joyful throughout. Before they knew it, the celebrations were over and people gradually resumed their work and studies, with preparations for the upcoming year in full swing. Eleanor had been on a break during this period. She spent her time teaching Summer and Flynn how to play the piano. She also kept up with her practice to ensure she didn't lose her touch. On the other hand, Valerie had a photo shoot scheduled for early spring. She had been on an extended break and was itching to get back to work. Gary supported her decision, believing that every woman should have independent pursuits. He secured high-end cosmetics endorsements for her, deals that were highly sought after in the industry and impossible for others to snatch. Valerie's wedding, set for early spring, was now just a month away. Both the Stewart family and the Dane family were busy with preparations. Valerie had already filmed her first commercial after the new year and graced the covers of several prestigious magazines worldwide. As the future wife of the CEO of Mirage Group, her popularity surged, earning her a spot in the top rankings for the most beautiful women. Additionally, she was listed among the female tycoons of the country. Her studio's shares were also appreciated as she secured high-paying endorsements. Annie had brought in new talents to support Valerie's growing workload, allowing Valerie to focus on her endorsements while making occasional appearances at the studio. Eleanor stayed home during this period, looking after her son until he returned to school. Now that he was back in school, she found herself with more free time. News of Miller Group's acquisition of Greenwich Group had sent the latter's stock soaring. Shareholders of Greenwich Group were jubilant about the acquisition, feeling they had finally found a strong backer. However, this development had also created unease among others in the business world, particularly Sean. Greenwich Group, which he had coveted for so long, had ended up in Adrian's hands, greatly bolstering Adrian's power. Even Ian felt the pressure but he had some tricks up his sleeve that he had yet to use. 
He wasn't in a hurry. Sean had been expanding his business lately. No matter how big and successful Sean's company became, it would eventually fall into his hands. Ian knew that Kendra would never betray him and seek support from others. She understood that dealing with Adrian, who was now Eleanor's fiancé, would only bring trouble to Eleanor. Ian had no intention of making Eleanor unhappy. Once he squeezed Adrian out of the business world, Eleanor would also suffer. Kendra had placed all her hopes on him. With Sean behind bars, the only choice for him would be to give up the company. Ian would seize control of Sean's company and strengthen his own. His goal was to be on par with Adrian. He hoped that one day, Adrian would be beneath him. No one, not even a man, wanted to submit to another. If he became more accomplished than Adrian, Eleanor might reconsider her feelings. Perhaps she would recall the fond memories she had with him and rekindle her love for him. It was just a distant goal, but at least it gave Ian a reason to strive and work hard. Perhaps he would marry someone else, but he'd always leave a place in his heart for Eleanor, hoping that one day she'd return And before to they knew side. it, spring had arrived. Over two months, Henry and his wife prepared to send Noah abroad. Summer had been entrusted to the care of the Stewart family, where Marlo would oversee her education. Eleanor and Adrian had taken Flynn with them. Henry and his wife would likely accompany their youngest son for another half a month. Summer had protested, but her objections were in vain. She had initially hoped to stay with Adrian for a month, but due to Marlowe's commitment to sending her to school daily and helping with her homework at night, Henry and his wife insisted that she remain with the Stewart family. During this period, Eleanor felt the need to spend quality time with her son. She no longer had to concern herself with the Greenwich Group's affairs. Her routine now involved driving her son to school in the morning, picking him up in the afternoon, and conveniently doing the grocery shopping. Adrian had postponed most of his social commitments to be with his family during this peaceful and serene period. On this particular day, at noon, Eleanor received a call from Adrian inviting her to lunch. His bodyguard had already arrived to pick her up. Eleanor was at home, dressed in her most comfortable attire. She cherished the freedom of being at home, even going brawless for added comfort. However, upon receiving his call, she suddenly felt a sense of excitement akin to a date. She walked into her walk-in closet, where Adrian had got her custom-made outfits tailored to her exact measurements. These were meticulously crafted by his aunt, Jane. Eleanor selected a light blue sweater paired with a long black dress. It was a simple yet elegant ensemble. Running her fingers through her long, jet-black hair, which had naturally reverted from the chestnut color she had previously dyed it, Eleanor gazed at her reflection in the mirror. With age, her youthful radiance had given way to a mature charm and elegance. However, her clear and untainted eyes remained untouched by worldly concerns. She smiled gently at her reflection, feeling pleased. The sound of a car outside her window caught her attention. She grabbed a delicate handbag and made her way out. It was 11.30 and the bodyguard quickly escorted her to the restaurant. Along the way, she marveled at the vibrant colors of spring and found herself looking forward to Valerie's upcoming wedding. Only a month remained and the thought of Valerie's wedding stirred anticipation for her own. The Miller family were due to return soon and they would soon commence preparations for their wedding. Eleanor couldn't help but smile. Upon entering the restaurant, the attentive waiter immediately recognized her. Is it Miss Greenwich? Yes, it is, Eleanor replied with a smile. Mr. Miller is already here. Please follow me. The waiter welcomed her warmly. Eleanor followed the waiter's lead, and soon she stood before a brightly lit private room. The waiter knocked and entered, gesturing for her to follow. Eleanor entered the room with a smile. She found a man seated on the sofa, patiently awaiting her arrival. He held a teacup, indicating he had been waiting for some time. You're here, Adrian said, placing the teacup down and rising from his seat. His eyes gleamed with admiration as he took in her outfit. 
Eleanor blushed slightly and pushed a strand of hair behind her ear. She asked him, How do I look in this outfit? It suits you, Adrian replied, wearing a warm smile as he encircled her waist with his arm. He pulled her into his embrace and whispered in her ear, But you look the best without it. Eleanor blushed even deeper and turned to glance behind her, relieved to find that the waiter had left. She playfully glared at him and he chuckled softly, pinching the tip of her nose. How about you wear nothing for me tonight? Our son is at home. Eleanor didn't reject him, but her son was the primary consideration. Adrian didn't mind, I'll make sure he goes to sleep early tonight. Eleanor blushed a little, acknowledging that she had never successfully resisted him. Although she didn't give in entirely, she knew that she would be getting married soon. She couldn't avoid this aspect of their relationship. You can start by putting him to sleep, Eleanor said with raised eyebrows, smiling at him. Recently, their son had been spending a lot of time with them, and his energy seemed boundless. Coupled with the winter break, his sleep schedule had become irregular. Coaxing him to sleep required patience. Upon hearing her words, Adrian knew there would be an exciting night ahead. His handsome face grew even more alluring, and his deep eyes sparkled with a mischievous smile. All right, I have a plan. Eleanor felt a bit thirsty and picked up the cup of tea he had been drinking. She stood by the French window, savoring the tea and enjoying the view outside. Adrian wrapped his arms around her waist, resting his chin on her shoulder and inhaling the scent of her hair. In two days, go to my aunt's place to choose your wedding dress. We're going to start planning the wedding ceremony, Adrian whispered in her ear. Okay, Eleanor agreed. Do you have any relatives you want to invite? I've never heard you mention them, Adrian inquired, his gaze fixed on her flawless profile. Eleanor blinked her long eyelashes and shook her head. I won't be inviting any relatives. My mother's side of the family is far away, and my father doesn't have any relatives here either. As she reminisced, she felt a pang of sadness. She was essentially alone in her family. After her mother passed away, her maternal grandparents had also left her one by one. Distant cousins had drifted apart, and her father was her only family member. Her memories of her grandparents only extended to when she was eight or nine years old. Now, the faces of her relatives had become distant and indistinct. Adrian sensed the sadness in her voice and held her closer. It's okay. My family is your family. You're one of us. Eleanor sighed in relief. Yes. After their lunch, Eleanor received a call from Valerie, who was at a nearby jewelry store. Valerie asked her to come and help choose wedding earrings. Eleanor was promptly sent over by Adrian to accompany Valerie. Valerie was the bride-to-be, having won her dream job and love. She had a happy family, and her mood was naturally upbeat. Eleanor entered the VIP room, where she found Valerie contemplating her options, with six pairs of diamond earrings laid out before her. Eleanor, come and help me choose. Valerie beckoned to her. Eleanor sat down beside her and examined the various earrings. She quickly spotted a pair she liked. This one looks great. It seems we have similar tastes. This pair is my favorite as well, Valerie said with a smile before turning to the attendant nearby. Please wrap up this pair. This is the one. Sure thing, Miss Dane. I'll get it wrapped up for you right away. The attendant said with a warm smile as Valerie handed her card to be swiped. Later, accompany me to pick out some clothes and bags. I'm going to buy a dress for my sister. She's been too busy to go shopping, Valerie said. Your sister is that busy? Eleanor asked. Ever since she entered the president's place, she's been working nonstop. My heart aches for her, Valerie replied, shaking her head. I'm glad I didn't choose that career path for myself. I wouldn't be able to enjoy this kind of life if I had. Exiting the jewelry store, Valerie was accompanied by four bodyguards sent by Gary. She still wore sunglasses, and as she walked alongside Eleanor, their similar beauty was evident. 
Valerie had a celebrity aura, while Eleanor exuded a different kind of breathtaking charm. Let's go. I heard that Herman's latest design is out in a limited edition. I want to get one for my sister. It's been a while since she changed her bag, too, Valerie said. Okay, Eleanor replied, linking arms with her as they headed toward a high-end handbag boutique. Inside the boutique, there were few customers, but they all appeared wealthy and discerning as the bags were unique and handcrafted. Wow, look, it's Valerie, exclaimed a young shop attendant who recognized Valerie immediately. She excitedly grabbed her colleague's arm. The two attendants hurried over. Miss Dane, hello, how may we assist you today? Has Herman's latest model arrived, the one designed by Starry Sky? Valerie inquired. Oh, Miss Dane, you're in luck. We received it just 10 minutes ago. It's right here, the attendant replied, beaming with happiness. This was a globally released product that couldn't be ordered, making it a highly sought after item. Valerie winked at Eleanor. Seems like my luck has been quite good lately. Of course, can a soon to be bride have bad luck? Eleanor added with a smile. Valerie quickly went over to examine the bag, which featured a unique and stunning design. It was dark gray and exuded an air of sophistication that suited Kesha. What's the price? Valerie asked as she admired the bag. She was determined to buy it. It's around $4.5 million, but esteemed customers like you can enjoy a 10% discount, the attendant replied, aware that Valerie could afford it. Valerie felt that the bag was worth every penny. She realized she hadn't bought an expensive designer bag for her sister, and now was the perfect opportunity. Wrap it up for me. I want it. Okay, Miss Dane, you have impeccable taste, the attendant said enthusiastically, carefully taking the bag and proceeding to prepare it for Valerie's purchase. Valerie handed over her credit card for payment. As the transaction was being processed, two elegant young women entered the boutique. One of them immediately remarked to her more aristocratic companion, Miss, look at that bag. The bag was placed nearby with two attendants in the midst of arranging a box to pack it in. Excuse me, has this bag been sold? Inquired the beautiful woman as she approached one of the attendants. Yes, this bag has been purchased by that customer, the attendant replied, pointing toward Valerie at the counter. The woman headed over to Valerie and, with a smile in her eyes, said, Miss, could you please give up this bag? I've been searching for it for a long time. Valerie, who was completing her transaction, shook her head and replied calmly, Sorry, but I'm buying this bag for myself. Miss, to be honest, I came here specifically for this bag. I don't think it suits your style. How about you do me a favor and let me have it? The woman with her tall and striking figure exuded an aura of fierceness. She was like a diamond with an almost intimidating beauty. Unlike Valerie and Eleanor, who were both beautiful, she had a gentle, tender, and slightly invasive appeal. Valerie chuckled. Who said I'm buying it for myself? I'm purchasing it for someone else. I'll pay you double the price or even triple if you prefer, the woman said firmly. Valerie suddenly felt insulted. She responded calmly. Do I look like someone who needs money? Hello, my lady is a close friend of the bag's designer, Herman. If she calls him, he won't sell it to you, the woman's follower added. Valerie and Eleanor exchanged glances. They had never encountered such arrogance before. Eleanor tried to defuse the situation. Regardless, this bag is for sale. The designer shouldn't have the right to interfere with customers, right? Since you and Herman are such good friends, that's fantastic. Just have him make another one for you, Valerie suggested. I won't give it up. Miss, call Herman right now. Ask him to come here and refuse to sell it to her, the follower insisted. Forget it. I'll let Herman make me another one, the woman replied before turning to cast an annoyed look at Valerie and Eleanor. After Valerie and Eleanor left, the attendant addressed the woman. Miss, do you know who that was? She's a very famous celebrity, Valerie Dane. Valerie Dane? The woman was stunned. She muttered to herself, is it her? 
It seems Gary wants to marry her. She's such a rude and immoral girl. Why would he be interested in her? The follower sneered. A look of deep resentment flashed across the woman's face as she bitterly remarked, So she's the woman he wants to marry. Upon hearing this, the attendant was taken aback. Did they know Valerie? Compared to you, miss, she's not even in the same league, the follower said scornfully. She's just a second-rate actress. What's there to be proud of? Let's go, the woman said to her companion, her expression clouded with anger. Eleanor and Valerie were both seething as they exited the boutique. Valerie bit her lip and said, I've never encountered such a person before. To threaten me after I've already paid. Do they think they're the only ones with money? Don't let it get to you, Valerie. People come in all kinds and we'll just ignore them, Eleanor advised. Although she was also irritated, she didn't want Valerie to be more upset. Valerie clutched the bag in her hand, her once enjoyable shopping experience now soured. Valerie drove them to Flynn's school, and after picking him up, she invited them to her home for dinner. After dinner, it Eleanor had been a and while Adrian took Flynn left. back. Valerie was helping Gary with the dishes in the kitchen. She couldn't help but think of the woman she met today. She said casually, I had a bit of an issue today. Gary looked over with concern as he washed the dishes. What happened? Did someone upset you? I was buying a limited edition bag for my sister. Just as I was paying, two women approached me and asked if I was willing to sell it to them. They were polite at first, but then one of them offered three times the price. It annoyed me. I mean, I can afford the bag, so why sell it to them? Valerie explained. Gary smiled as he continued washing up. He walked over to her and said, Next time, just tell them that no amount of money can make you part with something you love. Valerie blinked and burst into laughter. A hundred times the price might be a bit excessive, don't you think? Gary put his arm around her waist, smiling. If you like it, it's priceless. Valerie gained confidence and raised her eyebrows. You're right, it's mine. My possessions are yours, too. When do you plan to take advantage of that? Gary asked playfully, knowing his charm. Valerie suddenly remembered something. It seems we haven't bought protection measures. Protection measures? Gary inquired with a mysterious smile. About, you know, Valerie blushed. Gary quickly reassured her, I already took care of it. I bought it a week ago, just in case. A trace of doubt crossed Valerie's eyes, but she was relieved that he was prepared. Gary held her hand. I even put the sales receipt in the bag when I bought it. Gary reached into a drawer and pulled out a small bag from the pharmacy, complete with the necessary items and a receipt. Valerie, noticing his nervousness, crumpled the receipt and threw it in the trash. She smiled. I trust you. Gary felt a warmth in his heart. He then held the boxed item awkwardly, wondering where to put it. Valerie couldn't bear to see him uncomfortable and hugged him from behind. Since you bought it, why not use it? Gary turned around and asked in a husky voice, Are you sure, Valerie? Valerie nodded. I am. Gary embraced her tightly, asking, Do you want to wait until we're married? Valerie looked up at him. You asked me to test you, so I'll give it a try. Under the soft light, the two shared an intimate moment. Valerie's willingness only heightened Gary's desire. In Gary's villa, the night was filled with warmth and passion. On the other side, Adrian put Flynn to bed in his room. Flynn seemed wide awake and didn't want to sleep. Daddy, I'm thirsty, Flynn said. Adrian raised an eyebrow. You drank water just now. Are you sure you're thirsty? But I am, Daddy. Flynn insisted, always finding excuses to delay bedtime. Adrian got him some water and tried to coax him to sleep. It's late and you have school tomorrow. You need to sleep. Daddy, I need to use the bathroom, Flynn suddenly said. Adrian took him to the bathroom, but as soon as they returned, Flynn said, I want to sleep with Mommy. Adrian didn't want Flynn to sleep with Eleanor because it would be challenging to move him later, so... He tried to persuade him to sleep in his bed. No, 
Tonight, you should sleep in your bed, Adrian said firmly, hoping Flynn would give in. I want to sleep with Mommy, Flynn protested. Frustrated, Adrian tried another tactic. How about this? If you go to sleep in your bed, we can talk about having a little sister. Really? Flynn's eyes lit up. Adrian nodded. Yes, now go to sleep and I'll talk to Mommy about it. Eager for a little sister, Flynn agreed to sleep in his bed. Adrian sighed in relief, hoping that this promise would help him get some much-needed rest. But why are Mommy and Daddy sleeping together? Flynn blinked his big eyes and asked as he crawled to the bed. Adrian smiled. Mommy and Daddy must sleep together. You're still young. You'll understand when you grow up. When Flynn heard about the possibility of having a younger sister and coupled it with the prospect of getting some sleep, he felt drowsy. Adrian lay on his side and pulled Flynn into his arms, resting his head on his arm. They looked so much alike, one big and the other small, like mirror images. As he looked at the adorable little face in his arms, Adrian couldn't help but feel excited. Having a little daughter would be perfect. He observed their son's peaceful sleeping face with eyelashes resting on his beautiful face and a small pink mouth. He gently kissed his son's face and couldn't help but regret the few years he had missed. If only he had known about this child five years ago, he could have raised him alongside Eleanor. But he couldn't change the past. All he could do now was make up for the lost time, particularly in his relationship with this mother and son pair. Flynn's chubby hands rested against Adrian's face as he slept, as if touching his face was the only way he could sleep peacefully. Adrian had initially intended to leave and search for Eleanor, but seeing his son's tender hands tightly holding his face, he couldn't bear to go. He understood why Eleanor never sought him out when she slept with their son. She simply wanted to stay with him until dawn. Adrian sighed softly. It seemed that he had to suppress his desires for the night. Meanwhile, Eleanor was sleeping in her room with her son not by her side. She checked her phone for a while, but didn't hear her son coming to find her. Fatigue took over and she gradually drifted to sleep. Early in the morning, there was an undeniable warmth in Gary's bedroom, as if a lingering warmth filled the air. Valerie was soundly asleep on his broad chest. A few deep red marks adorned her slender white neck, visible just beyond the thin gray blanket. Gary woke up and opened his eyes, a hint of a smile in his deep gaze. There was a sense of satisfaction in his expression. He kissed her hair and held her close. I don't want it anymore, Valerie murmured in her sleep, pushing him away. Gary kissed her forehead. All right, no more. Valerie drifted back to sleep as if she had heard his response. Gary stayed with her, not getting up until she woke up naturally. Eleanor got up, checked the time, and saw that it was eight o'clock, time to take her son to school. She headed to Adrian's bedroom, pushed open the door, and found her son asleep on the bed. Adrian was lying on his side, wearing only a pair of black underwear. The sight of the man in the morning left Eleanor blushing. She had wanted to wake her son up, but she didn't want to see what she shouldn't do first. Flynn, wake up, Eleanor said, doing her best to avoid Adrian's gaze. She bent down and kissed her still sleeping son's face. Flynn slowly woke up, noticing that his mommy had arrived. He asked in surprise, did daddy and mommy have a younger sister last night? Eleanor's face turned even redder at the question. What had this man been telling their son? No, but we'll do our best to make it happen, Adrian replied to his son. Flynn pouted in disappointment. All right, then. Okay, it's time for school. Get up. Eleanor rushed him. Flynn quickly got dressed, brushed his teeth, and washed his face within ten minutes. Eleanor accompanied her son out while Adrian was already dressed in a white silk shirt and pants, looking incredibly handsome. He exuded the aura of a business world king. Eleanor couldn't help but admire him a few times. Knowing that he was her man filled her with pride and vanity. 
Adrian escorted Flynn to school and then went with Eleanor to a nearby breakfast shop. Breakfast together on a morning like this was the beginning of happiness. Adrian particularly enjoyed having her by his side. It brought him a sense of calm and happiness. Valerie had slept in late today. When she opened her eyes, the sunlight outside was already brighter. The first thing she saw upon waking up was the tender gaze of the man beside her. Startled, she quickly hid under the blanket. She felt that she was at her absolute worst in the morning, like most people. She believed that she looked so awful that she couldn't be seen. Why are you hiding? Gary asked with a gentle smile. I look terrible in the morning. Please don't look at me, Valerie pleaded. I've been looking at you for three hours already. Isn't it too late to hide now? Gary chuckled. Valerie looked up in shock from under the blanket. You've been awake for that long? Yes, I woke up at seven. It's exactly ten now. Gary pulled her into his arms with a smile. Don't worry, you're not ugly, you're beautiful. As Valerie moved, she winced in pain. A look of pain crossed her face and she buried it in his chest. It hurts. Gary's eyes filled with concern and compassion. Is there anything I can do to ease the pain? Valerie shook her head. I think lying like this is the only way. Then continue lying down. I'll bring breakfast to your room, Gary offered. Valerie didn't want to be too pampered. No need. I'll rest for a while and we can have lunch together later. All right. Make sure to eat well and regain your strength. Gary held her face gently. It's my fault for losing control. In Valerie's mind, she could recall everything that had happened last night with a simple touch of her memory. Her pretty face turned even redder, and she dared not dwell on the details. Nevertheless, these experiences were something she would never forget for the rest of her life. I don't blame you, Valerie reassured him, knowing that the pain would pass and she would be fine. Gary kissed her hair. Valerie, I love you. I love you so much. Upon hearing those words, Valerie forgot about the pain. She nestled into his arms, Luxurious feeling overwhelmed by hotel. his affection. A woman stood before a large window overlooking a stunning view. Instead of admiring the picturesque scenery outside, she absentmindedly touched her chin, her gaze fixed on the TV screen beside her. On the screen, Valerie, with her flawless figure, gracefully emerged from the light in an advertisement. The high-end setting exuded opulence, enhancing her beauty to a breathtaking level and leaving viewers breathless and captivated. This ad was crafted by a top international lipstick brand. After finishing her contemplation of the advertisement, a complex and disdainful smile crept onto the woman's lips. It reminded her of the last encounter with Valerie at a store. While Valerie was undoubtedly beautiful, her character left much to be desired. Should she inform Gary about the kind of woman he was going to marry? As his former partner, she felt it was her duty. She picked up her phone from the table, located Gary's number, and dialed the long-forgotten digits. At that very moment, Gary and Valerie were dining at a restaurant. Gary's phone rested on the table and it suddenly rang. He glanced at the unfamiliar number, but chose to ignore it, pressing the button to silence the call. On the other side of the table, Valerie looked up in surprise. Why didn't you answer it? I don't pick up calls from unknown numbers, Gary replied, raising his eyebrows. Valerie pushed her nearly untouched soup forward and said, I'm full. Why are you full? You barely took two bites, Gary questioned, a furrow forming on his brow. Valerie raised her eyebrows and asked, How did you know I only took two bites? Because I've been watching you eat, Gary admitted. He then pulled out a chair beside her and sat down, moving her untouched soup closer. I'll feed you a few more spoonfuls. Valerie felt a bit embarrassed but leaned closer. All right. Gary Spoon fed her, and she gazed at him with a smile in her eyes. What's so amusing? Gary asked, a smile tugging at his lips. I'm happy. I'm happy to have a future husband who treats me so well. Valerie replied, 
her eyes filled with affection. Taking advantage of her happiness, Gary finished feeding her. Valerie was genuinely full now, and before she could reach for a napkin to wipe her mouth, Gary had already done it for her. Her heart melted at his gentleness. She felt like a pampered little girl in his presence. Meanwhile, in the hotel room, the tall and beautiful woman stared at her phone, which had been ignored. A touch of sadness flashed in her eyes. She suddenly remembered that her number was new, explaining why it appeared unfamiliar to him. She knew he had a habit of ignoring unknown callers. She bit her lip and composed a message before sending it. The message contained just one sentence. It's Dahlia. I'm back. Let's meet up. As Gary settled the bill at the restaurant, a message notification appeared on his phone. He glanced at it with indifference, as if he hadn't seen it. He took Valerie's hand and walked toward the exit. Back in the hotel room, Dahlia clutched her phone, hoping for a response. She didn't expect him to ignore her again. This unfamiliar feeling of being ignored filled her with frustration. They had agreed not to disturb each other for three years, but they were still friends. Why was Gary so cold and distant now? She decided they needed to meet again. At the airport, Adrian eagerly awaited his parents' return. He had brought Eleanor and their son to welcome them. Grandpa, Grandma. Their young son rushed toward his grandparents with enthusiasm. Henry had been engrossed in a conversation with his bodyguard a moment ago, but upon hearing his grandson's voice, he instantly transformed into a loving grandparent. He scooped up the boy in his arms and lifted him high. Kayla, his wife, smiled and caressed the child, checking if he had lost weight during their absence. Dad, Mom, you're finally back. I missed you so much, Summer said, pouting and nestling against her mother's arm, feigning a sense of longing. What's wrong, sweetie? Weren't you staying with the Stewart family? Kayla affectionately pinched her cheeks. Summer couldn't complain about the Stewart family because her uncle and aunt treated her exceptionally well. She felt more comfortable and at ease there than at home. However, she complained that she couldn't escape Marlowe's constant gaze as he watched her study for hours on end. She had no freedom at all. Adrian smiled and attempted to take their son from his father's arms, fearing that he might be too heavy. Henry, however, was reluctant to let go, holding on to the child tightly. Eleanor smiled and greeted them. Mr. and Mrs. Miller, welcome back. Eleanor, we rushed back to prepare for your wedding. We returned early for this special occasion, Kayla exclaimed with a smile. Her son was about to get married and there was nothing more important to her. Given Eleanor's background and experiences, they were planning to have an extravagant wedding. They wouldn't spare any expense to make it unforgettable for their son and daughter-in-law. Eleanor blushed slightly and looked up at Adrian, whose eyes were filled with warmth and anticipation. Eleanor met his gaze and understood his thoughts. The blush on her face deepened, but luckily no one seemed to notice as everyone's attention was on Flynn. As they got into the car, Adrian received a call. His expression turned serious and anxious. Okay. I'll be right there. Worried, Eleanor asked. What's wrong? There's an issue with a business deal. I need to return to the company. You go back with my parents and our son and wait for me, Adrian explained. Eleanor knew there was nothing she could do to help in this situation. She nodded and said, All right, you go take care of what you must do. I'll look after our son. Adrian bid his father farewell and drove off alone. Eleanor watched his car speed away, feeling a sense of unease. What could be so urgent that he had to leave in such a hurry? Back at the Miller Mansion, Eleanor discussed the wedding details with Kayla in great detail. She only had a few specific requests, but Kayla hoped for nothing but the best. Eleanor could sense the significance they attached to the wedding, and it touched her deeply. During dinner, Adrian called to say that he wouldn't be able to make it back for the meal due to a social engagement. Eleanor couldn't help but feel a sense of unease as she urged her in-laws to eat without her. She also noticed that Henry was making some phone calls, likely related to the company. 
At nine, Flynn went to bed, this time accompanied by Summer. Kayla assured Eleanor, leave it to us. You should go rest too. Don't worry too much. Adrian should be back soon. All right, I'll head back then, Eleanor agreed. She got into her car, initially planning to go to the villa. However, her worry for Adrian made her change her mind. She had Arnold's number on her phone, so she decided to call him directly. Hello, Miss Greenwich, answered Arnold. Arnold, where are you now? Is something wrong with the company? Eleanor inquired. We've encountered a problem with one of our orders. Mr. Miller is currently negotiating with the clients, Arnold explained. Where are you guys? Eleanor asked. We're at the Century Hotel. Miss Greenwich, are you coming over? Arnold asked. Eleanor was worried, and now that she knew Adrian was there, she wanted to go to him. She replied, I'll come over, but don't tell Adrian that I'm coming. Miss Greenwich, it's quite late. Are you sure you want to come? Arnold expressed concern. I'm coming. After ending the call, Eleanor turned her car around and drove toward the city center. Eleanor arrived at the hotel around 10. She first saw two foreign men in their 40s, clearly intoxicated, being assisted by others as they stumbled out of the elevator. Her heart sank. Were these Adrian's clients? If they were so drunk, what about him? Eleanor felt a deep sense of worry. She then noticed the elevator indicator change from the eighth floor to the first floor. When the doors opened, she fixed her gaze on the elevator. The doors opened, revealing Arnold carrying a man. It was unmistakably Adrian. His tie hung loosely around his neck, and his head was bowed, showing signs of drunkenness. Upon spotting Eleanor at the elevator entrance, Arnold called, Miss Greenwich. Adrian, upon hearing Arnold's call, abruptly looked up in surprise. Their eyes met, and his bloodshot eyes locked onto Eleanor's worried gaze. Eleanor's eyes welled up with tears. How much alcohol had he had to be in this state? When Adrian saw Eleanor, he pushed Arnold away and attempted to walk toward her, but after taking a couple of steps, he swayed unsteadily and stumbled. He eventually reached her, hugging her tightly. Let's go home. Eleanor hugged his waist, her voice trembling with concern. Her throat felt tight, and tears threatened to spill. She had always seen him as a confident and composed man, rarely witnessing such vulnerability. Although Adrian was drunk and tired, at this moment he was strangely cheerful. His smile resembled that of a child. A hint of an okay, intoxicating let's smile go. in Adrian's voice as Eleanor assisted him out of the door. He tried his best to stand up straight so as not to burden her, with Arnold carefully following alongside as if afraid he might stumble. Fortunately, Adrian's footsteps remained steady and he was still in control of his faculties. He turned to Arnold and said, Drive us back. Sure thing, Arnold responded with a nod. The security guards had brought their car to the hotel's entrance, a sleek black vehicle. Eleanor helped Adrian into the back seat and Arnold drove them toward their villa. Eleanor supported Adrian's head, allowing him to rest on her shoulder. Adrian put his arm around her shoulder and rested his forehead there. In a low voice, he asked, When did you arrive? Why didn't you tell me? I was worried about you. So I only came briefly, Eleanor replied seriously, detecting the strong scent of alcohol on his breath. How much did you drink? Eleanor asked softly. Not too much, Adrian lied. Eleanor's heart ached to hear his words. She ran her fingers through his hair and scolded, Why did you drink so much? I can hold my liquor. It's nothing for me. Adrian replied, his eyes filled with intoxication, shining even more brightly in the starlight. Then we'll rest for a while. We'll be home soon, Eleanor said, attempting to guide him to lean back. Unexpectedly, she felt his warm breath on her earlobe as Adrian's lips lightly kissed it. Eleanor's heart raced, but Arnold was still focused on driving in front of them. However, Adrian pulled at the partition, turning the back seat into a private space. Eleanor blushed. 
This man was being quite obvious. Didn't Arnold realize what was happening? In the front seat, Arnold drove even more seriously than before, keeping his eyes fixed on the road ahead without glancing at the rearview mirror. In the back seat, Adrian planted his second kiss on the corner of her mouth. Eleanor shyly reached out, holding his head. She didn't allow him to do anything too bold, but she didn't want to underestimate the desires of a drunk man. Adrian reached out and, in a domineering manner, cupped her face. His lips met hers directly. Eleanor was taken aback, but didn't resist. Tonight, Adrian had stirred her emotions, making her heart race. She didn't dare to push him away, so she kept reminding herself to hurry home in her mind. Even if Adrian might have other intentions at home, it was different here with a third person present. She couldn't let things go too far in this situation. Eleanor refrained from calling out his name or making a sound. Silence was her best option. So she neither pushed nor resisted the advances of the intoxicated man. Adrian grew bolder and kissed her all over her face. This time, he didn't focus on a proper kiss. Eleanor's face grew hot, and she held his face like she was comforting a child, allowing him to press her onto the back seat and kiss her. Fortunately, the more late it got, the roads became less crowded. Arnold took a shorter route than usual to reach the villa complex. Soon they arrived at Adrian's villa, and the lights came on. The entire villa was instantly illuminated. Eleanor smoothed her disheveled hair and clothes that had been tousled by Adrian. She gently comforted the man in her arms, saying, Adrian, we're home. Let's get out of the car. Arnold remained in the driver's seat, not daring to look back. As a man, he understood perfectly well what had transpired in the back seat. This was the first time he realized that his boss could be such a passionate man. Adrian's lips curled into a smile. Are we home? Yes, I'll help you out of the car, she said. Adrian seemed to regain some sobriety. He stood up straight and told Arnold, If I don't have any morning commitments, don't disturb me tomorrow. All right, Mr. Miller, Arnold replied, turning the car around and leaving as if escaping the scene. Once Arnold's car had departed, Adrian turned to embrace the woman beside him, burying his face in her neck. You smell amazing. Eleanor felt somewhat helpless. Adria was still drunk and she knew exactly what he wanted. She swallowed hard and could only nod. Adrian let her assist him up the stairs until they reached his room. Eleanor could smell the alcohol on his breath. She said, go shower to wash off the alcohol. Don't you like it? All right, I'll wash it off. Adrian said, still concerned about her feelings despite his inebriation. Can you manage it? Will you be all right? Eleanor was worried he might have trouble standing in the bathroom alone, especially with the slippery floors. No, come in and help me, Adrian requested, wanting to rely on her completely. Eleanor felt a bit embarrassed. To be honest, she had already mentally prepared herself for the night, but implementing it was a different matter. Okay, she replied in a soft voice. Adrian's intense, fiery gaze locked onto her as if a blazing fire burned deep within his eyes. Eleanor's delicate fingers turned rosy, and her heart raced like never before. In this world, only this man had the power to make her feel this way. As she unbuttoned the last button of his shirt, Adrian's strong upper body was revealed at close quarters. She bit her lip, but before she could regain her composure, the man issued his command once more. Continue. Continue what? Well, of course, it was to help him remove the rest of his clothes. Eleanor felt extremely embarrassed. With the bathtub halfway filled, she had no choice but to assist him, especially since he was not very stable at the moment. It wouldn't be good if he fell. When Eleanor attempted to undo his belt buckle, she encountered a problem. She truly didn't know how to unfasten the man's belt. She tried for a while, but couldn't find a clasp. Adrian's low chuckle came from above her head, accompanied by a hint of satisfaction. It might have been better if she didn't know. 
It indicated that she had never been in a situation like this before. Quit laughing and just tell me how to unfasten it. Eleanor looked up at him. Upon hearing her plea, Adrian suddenly felt a pang of guilt. You want to solve it yourself? Eleanor gazed at him with exasperation. Can you just help me? Yes, Adrian answered straightforwardly. With a light press, the belt was released, and he allowed Eleanor to proceed with her task. She undressed him with an embarrassed but determined effort. Once she was done, Eleanor stood back and heard the man who was sitting in the bathtub behind her. She then said, You go ahead and wash up. I'll follow later. With that, she intended to leave, but she was standing rather close to the bathtub. Suddenly, Adrian reached out, grabbed her wrist, and pulled her slightly. Eleanor lost her balance and fell backward, landing in the bathtub in a rather sorry state. The water filled up to her chest, soaking her clothes. She found herself sitting on Adrian's lap, who was not wearing anything. Before Eleanor could even cry out in surprise, her pretty face turned crimson. What was this man trying to do? Join me, he said after a moment as he started to remove her clothes. Eleanor clutched her clothes, refusing to let him undress her. Adrian was insistent and held on to her. After a while, Eleanor couldn't stop him anymore, so she faced him with nervousness. This bath was driving Eleanor to the brink of madness, but fortunately, nothing more happened in the bathtub. If something were to occur, it was clear that it would be this man who insisted on bathing her. How embarrassing. After both of them had finished bathing, Eleanor was about to get out of the tub. However, she couldn't leave the inebriated man beside her unattended. Adrian had also loosely wrapped a bath towel around his body, though it was quite evident he didn't need it. Go to sleep. Eleanor reached out to assist him. Yes, let's sleep, Adrian concurred. Eleanor was relieved that he was willing to sleep, which was exactly what she had hoped for. She was secretly grateful that she could get through the night without any further complications. As she approached the bed, the mischievous gleam in the man's eyes intensified. Before Eleanor could react, in the next moment, their worlds collided. She quickly protested. Didn't you say you were going to sleep? Yes, I'm going to sleep with you. Tonight, you are mine, the man declared confidently. There was no escaping him. Tonight, she was his. A man whose faculties were impaired by alcohol couldn't be counted on to exercise much restraint. He was determined to take their relationship to a new level. Eleanor's mind went blank for a moment. The intense pain almost made her faint. Tears welled up in the corners of her eyes, and memories long buried in her heart resurfaced strongly. Despite his lack of control, his subsequent actions were surprisingly gentle, as if he was trying to restrain himself. In the end, he couldn't contain himself. Eleanor's body burned with pleasure, and it felt as if a brilliant light had exploded. The room was filled with a sense of intimacy, and the lingering heat hung in the air for a long while. Eleanor's sweat-drenched body was pulled tightly against Adrian's robust chest. His warm breath caressed her ear as he held her close. Eleanor was utterly spent. She was so exhausted that she didn't even bother to open her eyes. She inhaled the familiar male scent beside her and drifted off to sleep. Adrian, on the other hand, was not yet satisfied or at ease. His handsome face remained flushed, and he was remarkably sober now. His drunkenness had faded somewhat after their earlier intimacy. At this moment, there was only one person on his mind, the woman in his arms. His heart ached for what she had just endured. He tenderly kissed her sleeping face and smoothed her sweaty hair. Her fair and pitiful face was etched with exhaustion. A faint smile tugged at the corner of his lips as he lowered his head to brush her lips with his own as if he couldn't get enough of her. Though he had been intoxicated earlier, he could still vividly recall how sweet and enticing she had been. It had been a strenuous workout and Adrian had caught Eleanor's drowsiness. Half an hour later, he too drifted into slumber. The morning sun streamed in through the window, 
Casting a warm and pleasant glow, Eleanor's ebony hair fanned out behind her head, revealing the myriad of love bites on her neck in stark contrast. It looked as if she had contracted some sort of ailment, but only the two of them knew that these marks were the result of settling onto the couch with her freshly blow-dried long hair. She was dressed in a soft white linen dress that gave her an ethereal, almost fairy-like appearance, with a touch of holy grace. Adrian emerged from the closet, dressed in a suit and shoes. He couldn't help but be captivated by Eleanor's stunning presence for a few moments. His eyes softened with affection. Eleanor noticed him approaching, knowing he was headed to the office in his formal attire. Make sure to come back early tonight, Eleanor said as she stood up. Despite his impeccable appearance, she still acted like a doting wife, adjusting his tie and smoothing his suit. Pride gleamed in her eyes for a moment. Adrian reached out and cupped her cheek, savoring the warmth of the morning. Eleanor leaned into his touch, blushing slightly as she pushed him away. Go to work? Adrian hesitated to leave. If it weren't for his work commitments, he would have preferred to stay at home and spend the day with her. I'll take you to my parents' house for breakfast, Adrian suggested as he led her downstairs. No need. I'll cook at home today, Eleanor replied shyly. What's wrong? Adrian inquired, concerned that something might be bothering her. Eleanor couldn't help but cover her neck in embarrassment and frustration. I don't dare to be seen by anyone. Only then did Adrian realize the conspicuous marks on her neck. His heart ached as he gently removed her hand, inspecting her delicate skin covered in traces of their intimacy. He blamed himself. I'm sorry, Adrian murmured. It doesn't hurt, but it's just not easy to face people, Eleanor admitted, feeling self-conscious. Eleanor arranged to meet up with Valerie. Luckily, Valerie was available, and the two friends made plans to spend time together. Adrian, seeing she had company, escorted her to Gary's house before heading to the office. Eleanor had wrapped a scarf around her neck to hide the marks as she left with Valerie. The impending wedding had stirred up emotions in Valerie, causing her to feel a bit anxious. Let's go out for lunch. I'll treat you to a nice meal, Eleanor suggested. Sounds good, Valerie agreed. Mirage Entertainment, located in the heart of the city, stood grand and imposing. Gary was tying up loose ends before taking two months off to accompany his bride. It was still early in the morning and employees bustled in and out, Elegant and tall celebrities mingled among them. A striking figure in white caught everyone's attention. She wore a long cream-colored dress and sunglasses, her thick, long curly hair flowing as she walked gracefully in high heels. Her demeanor exuded elegance. This woman seemed familiar with the place. She approached the front desk and addressed a female receptionist. Hello, could you please take me to Mr. Stewart's office? Hello, miss. Do you have an appointment? The receptionist inquired. I'm a friend of his. I don't need an appointment, the woman declared. May I have your name? The receptionist couldn't afford to be casual. This woman was no ordinary visitor. I'm Dahlia Stewart, she said. All right, please wait a moment. Let me inform him. The receptionist picked up the phone to contact Gary's personal assistant. The receptionist initially had a friendly smile, but her expression froze upon hearing the response. She then said, okay. She turned back to the elegant woman and said, I'm sorry, miss. Mr. Stewart is very busy at the moment and may not be able to see you. Oh, you share the Stewart surname. Are you related to Mr. Stewart? Dahlia's expression instantly changed. She replied firmly, no. The receptionist was taken aback and quickly apologized. I apologize for my mistake. Dahlia's disappointment and frustration flashed across her eyes. He hadn't answered her calls, and now he didn't even want to see her. Did he have a new love interest? Men could be so heartless. Dahlia wanted to stay. She looked at the elevator and said to the receptionist, Please take me to his office floor. I'm sorry, Miss Stewart. This goes against company protocol. The receptionist hesitated. Dahlia smiled. 
Didn't you just ask if we were related? Well, we are relatives. I'm his cousin. Take me up. I'll take responsibility. Are you really Mr. Stewart's cousin? The receptionist asked cautiously. Yes, Dahlia nodded confidently. The receptionist didn't dare to risk offending anyone from the Stewart family. She swiped her card and led Dahlia to the elevator. Gary was discussing the company's direction for the second half of the year with his executives when he heard a knock at the door. His assistant entered and said, Mr. Stewart, there's a guest here to see you. Gary glanced at him and saw someone entering behind him. He turned to his colleagues and said, Continue in the afternoon. You can return to work for now. The executives understood and left the room. Dahlia greeted him with a smile. It's been a while. Gary stood up. What brings you here? Dahlia approached his desk and noticed something. She smiled, reaching out to touch a jade pen holder. I gave you this. You're still using it. Gary was taken aback. He hadn't used his office much, so he hadn't removed any items from his desk. What's the matter? Gary asked quietly as he took his seat. My father received an invitation to your wedding. I've come on his behalf. Dahlia looked at him, her gaze tinged with regret and sadness. Congratulations, cousin. Gary sat down. Since you're here to attend my wedding, you're welcome. What else did you expect? Do you think I'm here to cause trouble? If it weren't for our family connection, your bride wouldn't be her, Dahlia said with certainty. It should have been me. Gary looked at her calmly and replied, Let's not dwell on the past. It serves no purpose. Dahlia bit her lip, bitterness in her voice. Why do I bear the Stuart surname? We're not even blood relatives. Why can't we be together again? If you're here with these emotions for my wedding, I hope you'll reconsider and leave, Gary said sternly. Dahlia looked up at him and smiled. What are you afraid of? Afraid I'll ruin your wedding? Dahlia, Gary said, his tone firm. The name Dahlia had a warning ring to it as it escaped Gary's lips. Dahlia's expression shifted slightly as she smiled. Speaking of which, I've seen your fiancé. She's just a bit more beautiful. But aside from her looks, her character leaves much to be desired. Gary shot her a sharp look, his tone firm. You don't know her at all. Don't judge her unfairly. Dahlia picked up the white jade pen holder and ran her fingers gently across it. So, how much do you know about her? From what I gather, you two have been dating for less than a year. Are you just captivated by her looks? Gary furrowed his brow. If you've come for my wedding, you're welcome. But if you're here to cast aspersions on my bride, I'd kindly ask you to leave. Dahlia heard him refer to her as his bride, and her heart ached. Gary, I'm not trying to sabotage your happiness. I just want you to understand her character. She's an artist, and you know how chaotic an artist's personal life can be. You've mentioned before that you'd never marry or have children with a woman from your company. And now, you. She's different, Gary interjected firmly. Dahlia looked at him, somewhat dazed. She spoke softly. It seems like you won't listen to anything I say now. Your heart is filled with her. Dahlia placed the jade pen holder down and gazed up at the handsome and accomplished man in the boss's chair. There was a trace of unspoken affection and regret in her eyes. Then, does she know about your past and mine? Does she know of my existence? Dahlia questioned. Gary's expression shifted slightly, and he remained silent. True, maybe it's best not to bring up our history. After all, we had a relationship in the past. Talking about it would only be a source of laughter, right? Dahlia rebutted with a hint of reluctance. Gary didn't want to continue the conversation. He stood up and looked at Dahlia with a serious expression. If you've only come to say this, you can leave now. Dahlia bit her lip. As she picked up her bag, she turned away with a touch of reluctance and said, I suppose you won't listen to me now. Your heart belongs to her. Dahlia's departure left Gary brooding for a few moments. 
He picked up the internal phone and instructed, In the future, do not allow her to come up to see me again. Understood. I'll inform the front desk. Walden's voice responded. Dahlia was Gary's ex-girlfriend, and their relationship had taken a dramatic turn four years ago. They had been dating for a year, and when Dahlia introduced him to her parents, it was revealed that their fathers were long-lost cousins. Although they were technically related, the familial connection was quite distant. Dahlia's grandfather and Gary's grandfather had been cousins, but over the years, the families had drifted apart. When Dahlia mentioned her father's name, the two families reconnected nearly three decades later. Upon discovering their blood ties, the elders of the Stewart family vehemently opposed their relationship. At that point, Gary distanced himself from Dahlia and assumed the role of her cousin. Dahlia went through a period of heartache, but eventually gave up her love for Gary under her father's pressure. The elders from both families were insurmountable obstacles to their relationship. Afterward, Dahlia embarked on a journey around the world, putting Gary behind her. Upon her return, she again experienced heartache when she witnessed Gary proposing to Valerie in a video. Since then, Dahlia has been unable to let go of her past feelings for Gary, and she couldn't bring herself to like Valerie. In addition to the incident where Valerie snatched her bag, Dahlia believed that Gary deserved a better match than someone like Valerie. Perhaps Dahlia didn't realize that no matter who Gary married, she would harbor resentment because that woman wasn't her. Her feelings of bitterness and regret clouded her judgment. Gary sat alone in his office, rubbing his temples. He noticed the white jade pen holder and extended it to Walden. This is for you. Take it and use it. Walden looked surprised. But isn't this the one you always use? No need for it now. Take it. I insist, Gary replied, devoid of any emotion that could be read. All right. Walden acquiesced without further inquiry, though he couldn't help but wonder if it had something to do with the young lady who had visited. Valerie and Eleanor strolled through a park in the city center. Valerie's wedding dress had been confirmed and was currently being crafted overseas by a team of dozens of artisans. Though it was still an unfinished piece, they were working diligently to ensure it would be ready in time for her wedding. Eleanor entrusted the wedding dress and the preparations to Adrian's aunt with complete confidence that it would be exquisite. Only 20 days left. Time flies. I need to keep track of it, Valerie mused, her eyes filled with anticipation. Don't worry, you're going to be a beautiful bride. Look at how much Gary loves you. Eleanor replied with a smile. You talk as if Adrian doesn't love you, Valerie teased playfully, ending the friendly banter. The two friends shared a warm smile, their happiness evident. We'll all be happy, Eleanor asserted, gazing at Valerie with earnestness. Valerie dropped the jest and responded seriously, Yes, we will be. News spread throughout the financial world that Sean's company had once again extended a merger proposal to another firm, and that firm was considering the offer. Ian caught wind of this news, and it weighed heavily on him that he couldn't afford to delay addressing this matter any longer. With Sean holding 80% of his company's shares, this was the ideal moment for Ian to acquire the company. If his company became entangled with another, it would only come feeling carefree. Recently, he had been leading a more relaxed and free life. The women around him had never left him wanting more. But what gave him the greatest sense of satisfaction was his time spent with Kendra. Perhaps as a man, he had some unconventional desires. Even if he occasionally engaged in some playful acts with other women, it didn't excite him as much as Kendra did. Sean even entertained thoughts of blackmailing Kendra into more encounters. However, locating Kendra had proven to be a challenge. He had no idea where she was hiding. Sean had witnessed Melissa's fate and wasn't concerned about the repercussions. She was just a girl with no one to rely on, naive and impressionable. He found her innocent advances and her addressing him as her father amusing. Now that he had finally had his way with her, he was content. But Sean was unaware that a major problem awaited him. 
Ian swiftly approached him and arrived at Sean's company. When Sean learned that Ian had requested a meeting with him, he was taken aback. He and Ian had only crossed paths at a few social events, and beyond casual greetings, they were hardly acquainted. However, Ian was a prominent figure worth knowing. Sean instructed his assistant, let him come up. After a brief wait, Ian entered his office. Ian observed Sean's face and reflected on what he had done to Kendra. He was infuriated and disgusted. After all, Kendra was his ex-girlfriend, and witnessing those scenes, he couldn't help but feel sorry for her. Mr. Rockstone, what brings you here? It's truly an honor. Sean greeted Ian. Ian smiled. There's no need for pleasantries. I'm here because I have something to discuss with you, Mr. Miller. Sean chuckled. Whatever it is, it can't be bad news. Not necessarily. Ian's expression carried a hint of complexity. Sean noticed something intriguing in Ian's words. Mr. Rockstone, please get straight to the point. Why have you come here? Sean gestured towards his sofa, inviting Ian to sit. Ian glanced at Sean and suddenly threw a punch. Sean was caught off guard, and he covered his face in anger. Adrian, what are you doing? Let me ask you, what have you done to my girlfriend? Ian sneered with anger. To achieve his goal, he introduced Kendra to Sean as his girlfriend. Your girlfriend? Sean was bewildered. Since when had he been involved with Ian's girlfriend? Ian had some photos in his hand, which he took out and tossed in front of Sean. Sean, take a good look at yourself. Are you even human? You're a beast. No, you're not even worthy of being called a beast. Sean glanced at the photos and was horrified to see himself forcing Kendra into something in the pictures. Where did you get these? What do you want? Sean's face turned pale, then flushed. It looked ugly. Ian sneered. I'm not here for anything except justice for my girlfriend. Sean, you married Melissa, regardless of the circumstances. How could you do that to her daughter? Can you bear this crime? I didn't. Kendra volunteered. She volunteered. Even though he might settle such matters with money if a regular person came to him, Kendra was now standing with Adrian Rockstone, who was far wealthier. Sean couldn't bring himself to cross him. He was gripped with fear. This is just a photograph. I possess the full video of what you did to her. Do you believe that it shows her volunteering? Ian said coldly. This alone is enough to send you to prison for life. Sean quickly snatched the photos and nervously tore them apart, discarding them in the trash can. He attempted to compose himself and said, Since you have come to me, surely there's a way we can resolve this amicably. Ian wasn't inclined to waste more time conversing with him. He said directly, Withdraw your company's merger intentions. Furthermore, you should agree to have my company acquire it and allow me to hold 60% of your company's shares. There's no other way to settle this. Sean's heart sank as he realized that Kendra had been clever enough to record the video. He cursed himself for his reckless actions. I'll consider it. I'll think it over, Sean replied, still unwilling to give up his company so easily. Ian's response was uncompromising. You don't have the luxury of time to think it over. If you don't provide me with an answer by morning, we'll meet in court tomorrow afternoon. I'll hire the best lawyer, and we'll see you there. As Ian left, Sean's anger boiled over. He forcefully swept everything off his desk and let out a furious roar. At this moment, he felt like he was on the verge of losing his mind. Ian had issued a grave threat, unlike anything Sean had ever encountered before. His life was now hanging by a thread, and the company he had painstakingly built was about to be handed over to someone else, someone unrelated to him. Naturally, he couldn't accept this fate. Kendra, you audacious wretch. How dare you plot against me like this? Sean bellowed in anger. His assistant outside the door was too afraid to enter. Everyone in the vicinity was taken aback by his outburst. Sean's panic grew. His mind was consumed by fear and anxiety about the situation. 
At the time of the incident, he and Melissa had not yet finalized their divorce, making his transgressions even more damning. In such a case, the legal consequences would undoubtedly be severe. In the evening, in a dimly lit room, there was a knock at the door. Kendra, who had been lost in thought while sitting on the couch, jumped in surprise. Every noise outside that door had the power to make her tremble. She cautiously approached the door, her heart pounding, and peered into the peephole. She saw the familiar eyes of Ian. She let out a sigh of relief and eagerly swung the door open. Ian stood there, holding a bag of fruits and dinner. Kendra had been on edge for days, and now she couldn't contain her emotions. She rushed into his arms and wrapped her arms around his waist. Ian, you finally came to see me? Kendra exclaimed, tears welling up in her eyes. Ian stiffened, gently pushing her away. I came to check on you. Kendra immediately realized that she no longer held any claim to his affections. She quickly stepped back to allow Ian into the room. Ian set the dinner and fruits on the table. As he looked at Kendra, who seemed to be growing thinner by the day, he couldn't help but worry. Kendra couldn't afford any health setbacks while this matter was unresolved. Currently, Ian's assistant was taking care of Kendra, being patient and attentive. However, Kendra was in a somber mood, often lost in thought. She struggled with insomnia and nightmares, which took a toll on her health. Ian gestured towards the dinner and said, Go eat. Have you had dinner? Kendra inquired. I have, Ian replied, then walked over to the balcony, intending to wait for her. Kendra watched Ian's tall and composed figure against the backdrop of the setting sun. Her feelings for him from the past surged back like a spring. In the past, she had the status and right to pursue him. Now, she was stripped of both. Kendra had truly played her cards poorly. Recent events had forced her to grow up and become more mature and sensible, but they had also left her bitter. Kendra had a small appetite. She picked at her meal, clearly a high-quality spread from a five-star restaurant, but she couldn't muster much interest in eating. She rose from her seat and joined Ian on the balcony, standing beside him. She gazed into the distance and asked in a hoarse voice, have you spoken to Sean? Ian nodded. Yes, his company is on the verge of merging with another. I need to act quickly. I asked for his decision in the morning. A flash of hatred flickered in Kendra's eyes. Don't let him off easily. Take his company and leave him with nothing. I despise the Millers. Ian's expression darkened slightly. He corrected her coldly. You can curse Sean, but you're not allowed to curse Eleanor. Kendra's demeanor shifted. She looked at Ian with a resentful gaze. Do you think Eleanor will come back to you? She's marrying Adrian. She's long forgotten about you. Ian gazed into the distance as if lost in his memories. His eyes were cold as he spoke. I promised her that I would make her happy for the rest of her life. Even if we can't live a peaceful life together, I'll still protect her for the rest of her life. Resentment, jealousy, and hatred welled up in Kendra's eyes. She remained silent, but in her heart, she continued her curses. This time, she added a new curse, wishing that Ian would never win Eleanor's heart again, and that Eleanor would never love him again. Adrian made every effort to return home as soon as possible. He arrived to find a sumptuous, steaming dinner waiting for him. Eleanor had been upstairs with their son, helping him organize his toys. Since there were so many toys, she was teaching him the importance of tidying up and developing good habits. The little boy was the first to spot Adrian entering the room. His initial shyness dissipated and he ran toward him. After last night's awkward encounter with him, every time Eleanor saw this man, it brought back memories of that night. Her face flushed in secret. She raised her head to see the handsome, tall man. Even after a long day of work, he appeared energetic and charismatic, exuding charm. At this moment, his eyes held a seductive gleam. Eleanor gave him a fleeting glance before shyly averting her gaze. Adrian reached out to pat the little boy's head. Son, go wash your hands and get ready for dinner.
Yes. The little boy obediently left. Eleanor was slightly anxious about being alone with him. Adrian had his arm around her, and her face turned redder as she called out softly, Don't be like this. Adrian opened his hand, revealing a small, exquisite box. Eleanor was momentarily stunned and accepted it from him. This is a little gift for you, Adrian whispered into her ear. Eleanor opened the box and found a pair of beautiful diamond earrings inside. Adrian leaned closer to her ear and said, If you like it, I'll give you a gift every day from now on. All right. It doesn't have to be diamonds every day. I appreciate anything meaningful. Eleanor replied with a smile, happy to accept his gesture. Adrian smiled, afraid I'll go broke. Eleanor looked at him and shook her head. I just want something heartfelt, not expensive. Okay, then what do you have for me today? Adrian asked with a sly grin. Eleanor chuckled. I didn't prepare any gifts. Then how about giving me a kiss? Adrian leaned in closer, taking a kiss without waiting for her response. The kiss left Eleanor's face flushed and radiant. Just then, the little boy's voice echoed in the hallway. She quickly stepped back, breaking the kiss. She didn't want the little boy to witness their overly intimate moments. The little boy poked his head in and said, Daddy, Mommy, it's time for dinner. All right, we'll be right there, Eleanor replied and headed downstairs with the little boy. Adrian entered Summer's room and found her looking frustrated, her head in her hands. What's wrong? Having trouble with something? Adrian asked with a smile. Brother, can you help me? I've been overthinking things, Summer asked for assistance. Sure, let's have dinner first. Afterward, I'll give you some guidance. Adrian stayed Adrian to help Summer with her homework until 10 o'clock. Eleanor was waiting for him in the side hall. Their son had already gone to sleep with his grandparents. Around 10 o'clock at night, the entire house quieted down. Adrian held Eleanor's hand and sat in the car, driving towards their house. Entering the living room, there were only two people in the room. Eleanor felt her heart tighten. She said to Adrian, I took my medication. What? Adrian immediately looked at her in surprise. Last night, Eleanor said. Adrian immediately understood. He looked at her with guilt and concern. You shouldn't take too much of that medication. I'll make sure to be more careful in the future. Eleanor pursed her lips and smiled. It's okay for once. Just be cautious going forward. Adrian glanced at the time. It was already half past ten. He was contemplating something. Eleanor had figured him out. She covered her mouth and laughed. Don't tell me you want to buy it now. Adrian had indeed considered it, but the thought of their intimate night just the previous night made him hesitate, fearing that she might not be ready for it again so soon. He sighed softly. Forget it. We'll go tomorrow. Eleanor responded reasonably. You can go. I'll wait for you. A look of surprise flashed in Adrian's eyes. He bent down and picked up Eleanor in his arms. He was so excited that he twirled her around. Eleanor couldn't help but laugh at his childlike excitement. Adrian gently placed her on the sofa and kissed her red lips. All right, I'll be right back. Eleanor nodded and watched him rush out the door. That night, he did not disappoint his partner. After being cooped up for so long, it was only natural that he couldn't hold back. However, this time, everything was gentle and respectful. This change made Eleanor view the matter in a completely new light. In Gary's master bedroom, the atmosphere was equally tender, filled with affection and lingering. Gary gazed at Valerie, who was resting in his arms and let out a soft sigh. There was still something he had kept hidden from her. Today, Dahlia's appearance had left him a little concerned. Valerie had a straightforward personality, and if she discovered his lie, she would likely be very angry. Similar to how he had concealed his true identity before, Gary gently kissed her and whispered, Valerie, are you tired? Yes, I'm tired. What's wrong? 
Valerie responded, not opening her eyes, but her lips curled into a coquettish smile. Gary knew just how tired she was, and although he had initially wanted to tell her, seeing her exhaustion, he couldn't bring himself to disturb her before she fell asleep. He smiled and murmured, Nothing. Go to sleep. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Valerie opened her eyes upon hearing his words. The soft light reflected in her eyes as she looked at him. I can still stay awake. What is it? Tell me. I'm listening. Gary saw her drowsy eyes and felt a pang in his heart. He gently brushed the hair from her forehead and spoke softly. Valerie, there's something I lied to you about. Valerie's eyes widened for a moment and then narrowed again. She propped up her chin playfully and looked at him. What did you lie to me about? I had a girlfriend, Gary admitted honestly. He was like a defendant awaiting judgment, anticipating Valerie's reaction. Is that so? How far did you go in that relationship? Valerie tilted her head and asked with a smile, her tone carrying a hint of jest. Her surprise had momentarily passed, and she needed a moment to process the revelation. In astonishment, Gary looked at her and replied honestly, Not very far, just holding hands. Really? You're not lying to me this time, are you? Valerie sighed in relief. She was grateful that it wasn't what she had initially feared, as she wasn't sure how she would have felt about that. No, Gary affirmed sincerely. Aren't you angry? Valerie settled down and nestled in his arms. She pouted and said, I won't be angry if you transfer a million dollars to my account tomorrow morning. Gary was taken aback by her adorable response. He burst into laughter and agreed, I'll give you a hundred million. Valerie persisted, No, just one million. And if you ever lie to me again, the price will go up. Gary chuckled and kissed her. You have my heart. Everything I have is yours. You decide. Valerie embraced him, her initial panic and jealousy giving way to affection and understanding. You're mine. You'll be mine forever, she declared with a hint of possessiveness. Gary, touched by her words, whispered into her ear, I am yours. That night, Valerie slept soundly. In her dreams, she took what she wanted, and in the end, she had won him over. It was a beautiful dream. The wedding date was approaching, with more than ten days left before it would be finalized. Gary, after waking up, headed to the company and later accompanied Valerie to the wedding venue in the afternoon. Their wedding, which would be held at a five-star villa hotel, would be a grand affair. The entire hotel had been booked for the occasion, and the three-day banquet was a celebration of their love. Valerie had chosen six bridesmaids, including a few close friends. She had also invited five female celebrities to be part of her bridal party. They were all thrilled to attend her wedding. Around 10 o'clock, Valerie was sitting on the sofa, reviewing the bridesmaids' styles. She heard footsteps outside the door. Valerie was momentarily surprised, wondering if Gary had returned. She set aside the book and went to the door. As she reached it, she saw a tall woman ascending the stairs. Their eyes met, and both women were momentarily taken aback. Valerie was even more surprised, as the woman climbing down the stairs was the same one she had encountered at the bag shop previously. What were the odds of such a coincidental encounter? How did she have the access code to this door? Who was this woman? Dahlia wasn't surprised to see Valerie here. She had come to see her today. She had been waiting downstairs, considering ringing the doorbell. However, she tried Gary's old code and found that it hadn't changed for three years. It was still the same as before. Gary had left the code unchanged as he had moved on from their past and had no reason to be guarded. But in Dahlia's eyes, his actions implied something else. Had he not let go of their history? Who are you and why are you here? Valerie inquired, studying the woman. Dahlia smiled. Don't tell me Gary hasn't mentioned me to you. Valerie's heart immediately tightened. She had a bad feeling about this encounter. 
Could this woman standing before her be the ex Gary mentioned last night? No, you should introduce yourself first. Otherwise, I might have to call the police. Valerie's tone was cautious. Dahlia appeared to find the situation amusing. She chuckled and said, Call the police? Have me arrested? Miss Dane, you're making quite a scene. I don't know you and this is my house. Is it wrong for me to consider calling the police? Valerie responded with seriousness. Fair enough. Let me introduce myself. My name is Dahlia Stewart. I am Gary's ex-girlfriend. Dahlia decided to use this identity. Valerie's heart tightened. Her suspicion was confirmed. Although she was slightly disappointed that Gary's previous relationship was indeed real, there was no jealousy on her face. Since you're his ex, may I ask why you're here? Valerie expressed that she had no issue with it. Dahlia was taken aback by this response. It was not what she had expected. She thought her presence would incite hostility, but Valerie remained surprisingly composed. I wanted to talk to you, Dahlia said. Oh, how's your taste in art? Valerie asked casually. What? Dahlia inquired, confused. It's like this. I've been contemplating which artwork to use as a gift. I'm uncertain about my choice. Gary isn't home right now. Perhaps you can help me decide? Valerie smiled. Dahlia was momentarily stunned. Her smile became somewhat forced as she said, Miss Dane, your personal decisions are entirely up to you. Valerie nodded in agreement, saying, You're right. It's my wedding, and I should make my own choices. She blinked and grinned. Dahlia returned to her previous question. Are you truly unaware of my existence? Has Gary never mentioned me to you? Oh, he mentioned it last night, but I didn't dwell on it. Valerie shrugged. You didn't dwell on it? Dahlia found it hard to believe, but it was true. She was just a minor celebrity, and yet she had managed to get close to Gary. How could she endure such a thing? I didn't. As long as I'm his choice, that's fine. Plus, he compensated me. Valerie shrugged. Dahlia's eyes widened in disbelief. You asked him for compensation? Is that how you want him to make amends? How could he be fond of a woman like you? In Dahlia's eyes, Valerie had turned into a materialistic and unscrupulous woman she couldn't approve of. Her moral character was lacking, and her greed for money was unsettling. She worried about Gary's future with a woman like her. Valerie had figured out how to rile up this woman in front of her. She confidently stated, No matter what kind of person I am, he loves me. Dahlia was taken aback. She had seen audacious people before, but never someone as bold as Valerie. She sneered, Aren't you overly confident? Based on the Gary I know, he'd never be interested in someone like you. Maybe you don't have a deep connection with him, and that's why you don't know him well enough. Valerie had already found out the previous night that there was history between Gary and Dahlia, and she had cleared that hurdle. Dahlia was inexplicably angry. She said with a cold smile, I don't have a deep connection with him. We introduced each other to our parents and nearly got married. Valerie's heart tightened. She was regretful for not asking Gary about this the previous night. She had to inquire, then why didn't you get married? Dahlia was stumped by the question. She didn't want to reveal this reason to Valerie as it would only please her. She looked at Valerie and said, I'm not trying to compete with you, but honestly, I don't think you're worthy of him. Whether I'm worthy or not isn't for you to decide. It's up to him. He said I'm worthy, so that settles it. Do you think I'm trying to climb up to him? No, he's the one pursuing me, Valerie confidently affirmed. She then checked the time and added, I won't keep you any longer. I still need to select an art piece. Dahlia was left standing awkwardly in the hallway. She inquired, Is Gary really not at home? He went out earlier and is expected back in the afternoon. Do you want to wait for him? Valerie inquired, looking up. Then she asked curiously, Did you ask them to make the bag for you last time? I love that bag so much. I wouldn't give it to you even if you offered a hundred times its value. Dahlia couldn't help but sneer. 
you wouldn't give it up even if it were worth a hundred times more. That's not what I said. That's what Gary told me. He said not to give it up even if it were worth a hundred times more, Valerie said with a playful smile. Dahlia was once again taken aback. She couldn't believe that Valerie had shared that information with Gary. She pulled the corner of her mouth and said, You don't need to boast in front of me. I'm not interested. Since you're not interested, why did you come before me to make me feel uncomfortable? Your intentions are clear. You want me to be upset with Gary because of your existence? Fortunately, I love him deeply and I won't be jealous of a past relationship I just learned about last night. Valerie adopted a composed attitude. Dahlia's expression turned somewhat unpleasant. Valerie's words left her speechless. She originally didn't want to contend for anything, but now she hoped to make sure Valerie wouldn't have a good life. Do you know the meaning of the password for this door? It's our birthdays combined, signifying that he hasn't forgotten me. Thank you for the reminder. I'll change it to our birthdays in a little while. I want him to update all his passwords, Valerie asserted dominantly. Do you know he has a pen holder on his desk that I gave him? He hasn't thrown it away, Dahlia continued. Anything else? If so, please share it all at once. I'll have everything replaced this afternoon and update everything associated with you, Valerie challenged. Dahlia bit her lip and offered a sly smile. She couldn't help but remark, I selected the location for the villa. Do you want to change this villa as well? Valerie's face paled slightly upon hearing that. So the villa she loved so much was a place Dahlia had chosen. Valerie clenched her teeth and said, Wherever I want to live, he will follow. You're quite confident, Dahlia thought. Everything she had just said, if Valerie truly conveyed it to Gary, would only make her seem petty and capricious. It could harm their relationship. Valerie smirked and asserted, I am very confident. Dahlia smiled cunningly. She couldn't help but say, agitated, when we chose the location for this villa, I mentioned that I liked it because it offers the most beautiful sunrise. He ultimately settled here. Oh, this place is nice. I also adore sunrises. In the future, when I wake up every morning, I'll be greeted by the beautiful morning light. Thank you for selecting such a wonderful place for me back then, Valerie stated, Valerie her face on the showing room sofa, giving a casual wave of her hand without any intention of greeting Dahlia. After a brief moment of awkwardness, Dahlia chose to leave. Once Dahlia left, Valerie let out a slight sigh and bit her lip, regretting not asking Gary for a transfer of one million dollars last night. Why does her last name also happen to be Stuart? Valerie pondered this and couldn't help but feel a bit surprised. She decided to ask Gary about it later in the day. In Sean's office that day, all the employees could feel his anxiety and anger. He seemed to scare everyone who entered his office. Around 10 in the morning, Ian arrived as scheduled, seeking answers. Sean observed Ian's entrance. All his anger had transformed into a desperate plea. He hadn't slept all night and had lost his previous vigor. He now appeared as a desperate and pitiable figure. Mr. Rockstone, you're here. Please have a seat, Sean said. Ian sneered. Your attempts to please me are futile. I'm only interested in getting an answer from you. Do you want to give me your company or face jail time? Sean's face turned pale. He locked his gaze onto Ian and said, I apologize for what happened to Kendra. I can compensate her for her losses. What right do you have to threaten me? Kendra is my girlfriend. Our families were previously friends. I have every right to make decisions on her behalf, Ian responded. Adrian, don't push me too far, Sean angrily retorted. Do you want me to push you, or do you want to make it worse for yourself? You know you don't want to give me the company. Fine, Ian stated firmly. I'll see you in court this afternoon. Wait, please, Adrian, let's discuss this further. Sean quickly stepped forward to block his path. A cold smile flickered in Ian's eyes. There's no negotiation. 
You only have two choices. Either agree to let me buy your company or not. Sean was filled with anger, but Ian held all the cards. Smart people knew when they had no other options. Sean couldn't afford to go to jail. Even if he lost the company, he could at least stay out of prison. All right, I agree to give you the company, but you have to promise not to sue me. Sean begged, fear in his eyes. Naturally, he was afraid. If Ian took over his company and then used the situation to sue him, it would spell his doom. Ian smiled and replied, I only want your company. Okay, please tell me what to do. We need to sign an agreement. You need to promise not to sue me, Sean urged, his fear still apparent. I won't sign that, Ian asserted. With the upper hand, he wouldn't sign any document that could cause problems for him. You, Sean sneered. My company will send someone to contact you in the afternoon. We'll handle the acquisition of the company tomorrow morning, Ian said before leaving. Back at Valerie's place, she waited for Gary to return home in the afternoon. As he walked in, Valerie was already dressed, but didn't seem as excited as she had been in the morning. What's wrong? Gary inquired, sensing her unusual mood. How about we change the password? She proposed. Let's use our birthdays, yours and mine, as the new combination. I've given it some thought. Gary was slightly taken aback, but then grinned. Sure, I'll go along with your idea. Also, after we attend the wedding, let's go to a mall. I want to get you a gift, Valerie continued. Though touched by her initiative, Gary had a sinking feeling. What kind of gift are you planning to give me? He asked with curiosity. A pen holder, Valerie replied, raising her eyebrows. Gary's expression immediately tensed. He fixed his gaze on Valerie, his concern evident. Did someone come home this morning? Valerie nodded and explained. Your ex-girlfriend came. She told me that the password lock was set using your and her birthdays. The pen holder on your desk was a gift from her, and she also picked this villa for you. Valerie bit her lip, savoring the moment. Gary hadn't expected Dahlia to approach her directly. She must have given her quite a hard time. Valerie, I had wanted to tell you this last night, but you were too tired, he admitted. I understand it now. Her name is Dahlia Stewart. She's the woman who wanted my bag last time, Valerie said. She's the one who wanted your bag? Gary recalled that Dahlia had mentioned having seen her before. So it was indeed a coincidence that they had crossed paths. Valerie suddenly embraced him, looking up and asking, How much did you like her back then, compared to how you feel about me now? Gary hugged her tightly and reassured her, You are the one I love the most. Why does her last name also happen to be Stuart? Valerie mused. Gary had no reason to hide the truth, so he explained, She is my distant cousin. Valerie was taken aback. What? You two are related by blood? Gary assured her. Beyond the third generation. We found out about this half a year after we started dating when I took her to meet my parents for the first time. We only dated for half a year and then parted ways. Valerie felt relieved after hearing that. Otherwise, she would have had a difficult time accepting it. What surprised her even more was that Dahlia was a distant relative of the Stewart family. Didn't that mean they would be connected in the future? She doesn't live in the country, so you won't see her in the future. Don't worry, Gary comforted her. Valerie nodded. Now that she knew Dahlia was a relative, she didn't care much about her. Moreover, Dahlia had annoyed her with her words in the morning, so they were even. Before leaving, Valerie changed the password and visited the wedding venue. In the evening, she headed to a special place to select a new pen holder and presented it to Gary. Gary accepted it, wanting nothing more than to make her happy. In the blink of an eye, a week had passed, and Valerie's wedding was drawing near, with preparations in full swing. Eleanor joined a few bridesmaids for a fitting session, and the group of bridesmaids from the entertainment industry was exceptionally good-looking. While Eleanor wasn't from the industry, her exceptional looks didn't leave her feeling overshadowed. 
Once the other bridesmaids learned she was about to become Adrian's wife, they treated her with a certain deference. Valerie's wedding dress had arrived a week earlier, flown in by the designer himself. The white gown exuded a fashion-forward and timeless quality, leaving Valerie thoroughly satisfied. Given her status in the entertainment industry, Valerie didn't have many close friends, so she'd invited fewer than 20 guests. As a result, mixed emotions abounded among those who didn't make the cut. Valerie was now the envy of the entire industry. With her upcoming marriage, she would have her pick of scripts and endorsements, effectively becoming a powerful figure in the entertainment world, thanks to Gary's visible affection for her. Eleanor had also participated in Valerie's wedding preparations and was busily preparing for her marriage. Valerie set the example for many wedding rituals, making the process quite clear. Adrian was the best man, and Gary had chosen several executives from his company as the groomsmen, including his assistant Walden and his younger brother Marlo. The six groomsmen were exceptionally handsome. The wedding had become a hot topic in the national media and the entertainment industry, as everyone eagerly anticipated the wedding. News also surfaced that Adrian, president of the Miller Group, would be having his wedding the following week, creating another sensation. The Stewart family was hard at work, welcoming guests from all over the world. Private planes filled major airports and even required stopovers in neighboring cities due to the influx. Gary's wide-ranging connections brought in friends and partners from all over the globe. The guest list was star-studded, including international celebrities and top stars who were there to support him, as many of his subordinates had investments in two football teams. Valerie was busy with wedding preparations. Today, Eleanor accompanied her and Kesha, and they shared some girl talk about wedding plans. They couldn't help but bring up men and family life. When are you going to find me a brother-in-law? You can't always be so focused on work and neglect your personal life. Valerie playfully brought up the topic of Kesha's future. Kesha looked a bit helpless and said, I want to as well. It's just that fate hasn't brought anyone my way yet. This time, pay attention at my wedding. If you spot anyone you like among Gary's friends, let me know. You don't seem to like Gary's circle of friends, Valerie suggested. Kesha looked at her with a smile. Do you think your sister doesn't have any prospects and can't get married? Sister, that's impossible. You should know that in the family, you've always been the more beautiful and accomplished one, Valerie reassured her. You can talk as much as you want, Kesha responded. She had her reasons for her current situation and couldn't easily change it. Later, Kesha left without staying for dinner. Gary invited Adrian and Summer out for dinner, and Valerie brought Eleanor along as well. The mood was jovial, as Eleanor had gone through dark times before, losing her family and fighting for her property. Now, she was in a much brighter and warmer phase of life. At the dinner table, the two handsome men and two beautiful women sat separately. Summer squeezed in next to Flynn, while Marlo sat beside Gary. Marlo, how is the script coming along? Gary took the opportunity to ask him. Marlowe was skilled in script production, which was why Gary often tasked him with organizing complicated scripts. I need a few more days, Marlowe replied. That's fine. Just hand it over to me before June, Gary said. Gary, can I ask you something? Summer asked innocently. What's on your mind? Gary inquired, flashing a smile. I want to do extra work during the summer break. Can you arrange a role for me in a movie? I don't mind playing a maid or any other minor role, she said excitedly, full of hope. This unexpected idea stunned everyone at the table, with Adrian being the first to reject the idea. He chided her gently. If you're planning to have fun over the summer break, why are you looking for extra work? Marlo also raised his eyebrows, expressing his reluctance. Valerie agreed. Summer. Working as an extra can be quite challenging. Listening to this conversation, Flynn stood up excitedly. Me too. I will also work now. I'm a big boy, he declared, stunning the table and, and surprised at the thoughts running through her son's mind. Did he want to work? Flynn, you're so young, you shouldn't get involved in this. 
Valerie replied with a playful grin. Flynn, you are our little prince. Really? But I want to act too. The young one began to dream of being a star. After all, kids watching TV every day must be curious. Summer, you're still too young for acting. Besides, group acting isn't suitable for you. If you're interested, I can ask Marlo to take you to the production team during summer vacation or visit the film and television base, Gary replied. Although Summer didn't have the opportunity to act in group settings, she was excited about getting a closer look at the show business. Really? Can I go? As long as Marlo accompanies you, you can visit any crew you want, Gary responded. Yes, all right. She turned to Marlo and said, Marlo, it's a deal. You must take me there. Marlo let out a slightly helpless smile. All right. When you get good grades on your exams, I'll take you. This statement caused everyone present to laugh. Eleanor encouraged the young one to finish the food quickly and then wipe his mouth. Valerie couldn't help but feel her eyes welling up. In the past, she had envied Eleanor for giving birth to this little one when she didn't have a man in her life. Now she had an outstanding and charming man by her side. She quietly wondered if she should consider having a child. She gazed at Flynn's face, which resembled that of his father. She couldn't help but wonder who their child would resemble more, her or Gary. Valerie found herself staring at the little one with an inexplicably more intense gaze. Gary, noticing her stare, turned his head slightly and saw her looking at the young one. A faint smile graced his lips. It seemed like they could consider the idea of having a child. Adrian's eyes were naturally focused on the mother and son as well, filled with fatherly love and concern. When they left, it was still early. Eleanor planned to take the little one to a nearby amusement park to play for a while before heading back. It was a rare opportunity to spend time with him. Summer, however, had a pile of homework waiting for her at home. Plus, Marlo intended to help her with math. Adrian asked Marlo to drop her off first and assist her with her studies. He accompanied his wife and son to the nearby amusement park. Summer had to ride with Marlo. Due to the recent stress and the fluctuating spring weather, Summer had a slight cold. She really wanted some ice cream, but Adrian didn't let her have it. Now, in Marlo's car, Summer was quite persistent. Marlo, there's an ice cream shop nearby that's super delicious. I want to get one. Can you take me there? Didn't you catch a cold? Marlo had already figured out her tactics, which seemed to involve a lot of asking. Summer pouted and said, I just have a runny nose, but I won't eat much. I just want one. Can you get it for me, teacher? Pretty please. When Marlo heard her call him teacher, his lips twitched. He didn't like being addressed that way. It made it sound like there was a significant age gap between them. Like I said, you don't have to call me teacher outside of class, Marlo corrected her. Marlo, are you willing to buy me an ice cream? Summer smiled and clasped her hands, gazing at him with her big, bright eyes under the dim light. Marlo's breathing slowed. He couldn't bring himself to refuse. He finally relented, saying, All right, I'll get you one. Great. Just one, Summer clapped her hands. Ten minutes later, Summer sat in the passenger seat of Marlo's car, happily savoring an ice cream. At the amusement park, Adrienne and Eleanor accompanied the little one, who was drenched in sweat in various fun activities. Flynn rode a carousel, played carnival games, and picked out his favorite toys. The simple happiness of a child was a joy to behold. At the villa, Gary carried the sleeping Valerie to their room. He removed her shoes, covered her with a blanket, and sat on the edge of the bed. Unable to resist, he gently kissed her rosy lips. Valerie let out a soft sigh and wrapped her arms around his neck, refusing to let him go. Would you like me to sleep next to you? Gary asked in a husky voice, bending down. Yes, stay with me. Valerie felt a sense of security sleeping beside him at night. All right, I'll go take a shower and then come over, Gary mused. At that moment, Valerie opened her eyes. 
There was a glimmer of desire in her gaze as she clung to him. Skip the shower for now. Stay with me. Gary saw the desire in her eyes and was unable to resist. All right, I'll stay with you. Valerie's drowsiness was soon replaced by her passion for the man. This man was irresistible. Even she couldn't resist his charms. For this man, she was the same, addicted to him just as she was to her favorite snacks. Night after night, she couldn't get enough of his warmth. Marlo dropped off Summer at home and gave her an hour of homework before leaving. The Miller family offered to let him stay, but he politely declined. It wasn't that he didn't want to stay at the Miller mansion. Rather, there was a reason he didn't want to stay there. Marlo was beginning to find Summer's influence over him increasingly problematic. Was it because the little girl was growing up? In any case, Marlo didn't want to give himself any more opportunities to interact with her beyond teaching her. At half past ten, Eleanor brought the little one back to the villa where he was dripping with sweat. Adrian bathed him and dressed him in cartoon pajamas. The little one lay on daddy's bed, occupying the middle, and eagerly awaited daddy and mommy's arrival to sleep together. With Flynn in the middle, even if Adrian wanted to make a move on Eleanor, he had to hold back. At most, he would take advantage of the moments when Flynn wasn't paying attention to sneak in some affection. Eleanor had always been concerned that her son might notice, so she kept pushing Adrian's advances away. There was a clear warning in her eyes, and eventually, her husband complied. Valerie's wedding date was eagerly anticipated. Ever since she saw Dahlia that day, Valerie had not crossed paths with her again. She had forgotten about her existence altogether. Where had Dahlia disappeared to? She had been staying in a hotel, coldly watching the internet and seeing the media celebrate the upcoming wedding on television. Tomorrow, it would be Gary and Valerie's wedding, and she was expected to be a part of his family to attend the ceremony. Before she arrived, she thought she could calmly face Gary, watch him marry someone else, and quietly observe. Now, she realized she couldn't stay calm at all. In the evening, Dahlia booked a flight back to her country. She decided not to attend Gary's wedding and could not bring herself to offer her wishes. She wanted to see when Gary would realize that Valerie was not worthy of him. She also wanted to see if their marriage would be a happy one. Dahlia's flight was scheduled for 6 p.m., and it was still early. She went to the hotel's tea house to pass the time. The tea house was quiet, with no other guests at the moment. Dahlia had barely been sitting for a while when two women wearing sunglasses took a table beside her. They were dressed in a rather ostentatious manner, and their artificial appearances caught Dahlia's attention. The two women placed their orders, and one of them started complaining, why is news of their wedding everywhere now? It's all over the screens. Do they have to make it so flashy? It's all about getting attention. Valerie will do whatever it takes to become famous. Their conversation flowed. I really can't fathom why Gary is so infatuated with her. What's so special about her? I just don't see it, one woman sneered. Maybe she has some hidden talent. The other one mused. Speaking of talents, I'm not so bad either. If Gary just asked me to spend a night with him, I could make him fall in love with me, the woman said shamelessly. The woman opposite her seemed used to her words and replied disapprovingly, First, you need the opportunity to get into his bed. Dahlia frowned, her lips curling in a sneer. Did these two women think they could climb into Gary's bed with their fake appearances? It was laughable. Aren't you worried at all that Valerie will retaliate against us in the future? We've been her sworn enemies for years. I admit I've done some underhanded things to her in the past, snatching her advertisement deals and scripts multiple times. I'm genuinely concerned the woman speaking was none other than Valerie's arch nemesis, Sasha. She often mingled with Hannah, who was also someone Valerie despised. When she takes over as the mistress of the Mirage group, I believe the first ones she'll target are us. We should prepare ourselves mentally for being blacklisted. Hannah wore a worried expression. Sasha immediately cried out anxiously, but I enjoy acting. I don't want to leave this industry. 
I don't either, but who knows how Valerie will deal with us. Hannah shrugged. Dahlia overheard the conversation between these two despondent women and could roughly guess the situation. These two women were Valerie's sworn enemies, and they appeared to be figures in the entertainment industry. Curiosity peaked, and Dahlia wanted to hear how they would discuss Valerie. To be honest, I don't believe that Gary loves her so much. Maybe she used some method to coerce him into marrying her, Sasha said. What method? Hannah asked. Perhaps Valerie climbed into his bed and threatened a shotgun wedding, Sasha contemplated. That's plausible. Valerie may look innocent, but she's no fool. She probably thinks everyone will fall for her just because she's pretty, Hannah sneered. It's just a pretty face. If anything happens to it, I don't believe Gary will love her anymore, Hannah whispered. Sasha shot Hannah a hateful look. What do you mean? Let's find an opportunity to ruin her face. After all, sooner or later she'll target us. It's better if we strike first, Hannah said with intention. When Sasha heard that, her eyes widened with surprise. You're right. We can't just sit here waiting for our downfall, can we? We should be proactive. Of course, let's not wait, Hannah agreed. Dahlia watched as the two of them whispered and schemed. It appeared as if they were planning something. She curled her lips and sneered, thinking she would soon witness Valerie's fate. Dahlia checked the time and the two women beside her. She stood up and left, relieved to have heard this piece of news as she departed from the city. Someone was going to go after Valerie. The night before the wedding, Adrian, Gary, and Marlo celebrated Gary's night of bachelorhood by going to the bar. They brought along their friends, Arnold and Walden. In the private room, their voices filled with camaraderie and they shared jokes as they looked forward to the future. Around 10 p.m., they left the bar, each going their separate ways. Gary and Adrian shared a car ride home while Marlo headed back to the Stewart family residence. He needed to get a good night's rest in preparation for the next day's activities. She sat in the hall, eagerly awaiting Adrian's return. A man with a rosy complexion strolled in, holding his suit lazily in one hand. His tie was slightly loosened, and his entire presence exuded a rugged charm. Eleanor couldn't help but stand up and ask, How much did you have to drink? Just a few, nothing excessive, Adrian replied with a smile. He had been itching to come home from the bar. As he contemplated it, he realized that the bachelor party was meaningless to him, for he no longer wished to celebrate his single life. It was his time to rejoice in the fact that he had found his soulmate and a lifelong partner. Did you have a good time? Eleanor inquired as she picked up his suit and hung it on a nearby rack. Yeah, it was all right, Adrian replied lazily. His deep gaze remained fixated on her, captivated by her alluring figure. Her white dress showcased her curves, making him tense with desire. All right, then let's get to bed early. Tomorrow at seven, I will join Valerie to prepare for her wedding. You should rest too, Eleanor suggested, emphasizing the importance of rest at the very moment. Adrian smiled and approached her, wrapping her in his embrace. Sure, let's get some rest. Eleanor sensed his intentions and raised her face slightly. Early bedtime. Indeed, early bedtime. Adrian responded with a deeper smile, lifting her in a loving embrace. Hey, you've been drinking. Don't stumble, Eleanor cautioned, holding on to his neck tightly and detecting the lingering scent of alcohol on him. Adrian lowered his gaze to meet hers and assured, Don't worry, I've got the strength. Meanwhile, Gary found it difficult to sleep alone, as Valerie had returned to the Dane residence for the night. Even though they were going to live together as a couple, there was a tradition to live with their respective families until the wedding day. The two talked on the phone for half an hour before reluctantly hanging up. The Dane family had always wished for their daughter's happiness and marriage, yet, as the moment drew nearer, their hearts felt a sense of emptiness. During future New Year celebrations, their children would not be by their side. 
It was a bittersweet feeling to watch them find their happiness and independence. The following morning, the sun shone brightly, marking the start of a beautiful day and the prelude to the wedding. At around seven o'clock, Eleanor arrived at the Dane residence to accompany Valerie to the wedding villa's dressing room. The other five bridesmaids had also arrived, each with their makeup artists and light blue bridesmaid dresses looking stunning. Amidst the chatter of young women, they were all excited and full of joy. When Valerie donned her wedding gown, it was a breathtaking sight. The white gown was adorned with delicate cloud-like embroidery, elegantly trailing behind her. Her makeup enhanced her natural beauty, making it impossible for anyone to look away. Valerie, you look incredibly beautiful, Eleanor couldn't help but compliment. Today, all the bridesmaids were stunning, but they willingly took the back seat, as the bride was meant to shine the brightest. Close friends and family had gathered, with the Miller Mansion's entourage arriving at 8 o'clock. Summer was particularly excited and considered Valerie her idol. She had even managed to invite a few A-list actresses to be bridesmaids. Summer was in awe of Valerie's beauty and fantasized about when she would have the opportunity to wear such a stunning wedding gown and be a bride herself. Valerie, you're like a fairy, Summer gushed. At this moment, a group of men from the villa next door entered, surrounding the groom, Gary. Dressed in a tuxedo, he looked noble and was supported by six groomsmen in black suits, exuding an air of charm, akin to a prince on a white horse. Among the groomsmen, Adrian stood out with his extraordinary charisma. He was effortlessly stylish and oozed sexiness. Even as a groomsman, he was undoubtedly a standout figure. Marlowe appeared especially youthful. However, he was the most eye-catching of them all. With a black bow tie, he was fresh and handsome, boasting a princely charm with a hint of melancholy in his eyes, which women found incredibly appealing. Eleanor and Adrian locked eyes and were smitten with each other. Their gaze lingered and they couldn't look away. Summer, on the other hand, couldn't resist a second glance at Marlowe. The second son of the Stewart family was undeniably handsome even though he lacked the maturity and brilliance of his elder brother. He was a charming figure who could capture women's hearts easily. Summer noticed his smile and a trace of affection flickered in her eyes. Marlowe spotted Summer and smiled at her. She blushed and looked away, suddenly feeling a sense of shyness that she couldn't quite explain. Gary stood before Valerie with affectionate eyes, his gaze filled with tenderness. This was his first view of her, and she had blown him away. To him, Valerie was a vision of beauty and shyness. She gently pushed him. All right, you should step out and wait. My mom and the others will be arriving shortly. Gary, let's go to the side and have some tea and relax, Adrian suggested, patting his shoulder. The group of handsome men exited. Shortly after, Lily arrived with Valerie's aunts. Eleanor informed the bridesmaids. Let's go upstairs to take a break, leaving Valerie to spend some quality time with her family. Lily's eyes welled up with tears of joy as she looked at her stunning daughter Valerie, dressed in bridal attire. Although Lily felt an overwhelming urge to cry, she resisted the tears. Seeing her daughter with such exquisite makeup, the last thing she wanted was to ruin it with tears. So, she maintained a warm smile and gently caressed her daughter's face, her eyes filled with tender affection. Valerie, starting tomorrow, you'll be a part of the Stewart family. It's important to grasp etiquette, okay? Lily lovingly instructed her daughter. Mom, don't worry, I understand. If I'm ever unsure, Gary will assist me. Valerie reassured, her eyes glistening with tears. You silly child, you always rely on Gary for everything, Lily said, her heart brimming with happiness. Her daughter was marrying such a wonderful man, how could she not be overjoyed? In no time, the six beautiful bridesmaids descended the stairs. Valerie and her mother sat in the center, surrounded by relatives and aunts. The bridesmaids stood behind them, and a series of photos were taken. Lily then went to find Mrs. Stewart as the two families gathered together for the wedding. 
Valerie also took some individual photos and had her bridesmaids share them online, allowing her fans to witness her most beautiful moments. The photos of her happiness were met with an outpouring amount of well wishes from the netizens. Many were eager to see the groom and the best man. The groom especially had drawn attention when he proposed, and his appearance was now the subject of fascination. Meanwhile, everyone was waiting for the auspicious moment set for 11 a.m. on the wedding stage. Eleanor had some time on her hands and sent a message to Adrian asking him to find Flynn and his parents. They located them in a grassy area by the villa, taking Flynn for a walk amidst beautifully trimmed flowers, plants, and sculptures. Butterflies danced among the flora, creating a picturesque scene. Flynn was dressed in a stylish black t-shirt, denim shorts, and small sneakers. His short hair was neatly trimmed, and his facial features were sharp. It was evident that there were no flaws in his appearance. Kayla held her phone, continuously taking pictures of him, captivated by his handsomeness. Flynn, look at Grandma, Kayla said, unable to resist snapping more photos. Flynn was delighted, running and posing for the camera, each frame capturing his youthful charm. Summer occasionally found her way into the frame. However, with Flynn's presence, she couldn't help but shower him with attention as she fiddled with her phone. At this moment, she was inundated with messages from her female classmates. They were all eager to see a photo of Marlo. He was a highly regarded figure at their school, known for his princely charm and excellence as a teacher. His office often saw a parade of girls who just wanted to catch a glimpse of him, and it seemed like everyone had a crush on him. Summer assured them that she'd share a photo later, but inwardly she was also curious and wanted to see the picture herself. When Eleanor and Adrian approached with smiles on their faces, they observed the warm family gathering. Daddy! Mommy! Flynn dashed towards them, his face beaming with joy. Adrian nodded before Flynn pulled him up and hugged him tightly. Seeing his parents, Flynn was brimming with happiness. The adults conversed about the wedding, discussing the upcoming seaside wedding in a week, which promised to be a beautiful affair. As the clock neared 10, a black car pulled into the parking lot. Kesha stepped out of the vehicle, her slender legs catching the attention of a few male guests, who momentarily forgot to take a sip of their wine as they admired her graceful presence. Kesha approached the villa where Valerie was getting ready. Valerie breathed a sigh of relief. Sis, you finally arrived. I was worried you wouldn't be able to make it. I rushed here as fast as I could, Kesha replied as she greeted her sister with a warm smile. Valerie admired her sister, seeing her in an elegant dark red evening dress with her long, slightly curled hair and impeccable makeup. She looked graceful and stunning to all those around her. Several male guests were captivated by her beauty and couldn't help but wonder where such a stunning woman had come from. They hoped to get to know her better if dignity and experience, likely shaped by her involvement in politics. Her presence carried an air of gravitas. Valerie, it's time. We're almost ready. We should make our entrance. Your carriage is waiting outside the door, one of the bridesmaids informed her. At that moment, Mrs. Stewart and Lily arrived to welcome her at the door. Valerie, in her white wedding dress, was assisted by her elder sister as they walked out of the villa's entrance. She seated herself in one of the six elegant white crystal carriages adorned with jewelry. It was as if a sacred princess was setting out. The bridesmaids flanked her on both sides and they made their way back to the hall. Photographers on the sidelines captured this beautiful moment, focusing on the bride's radiant smile. They didn't miss the joy on her face as she made her way. Kesha walked arm in arm with her mother, accompanying Valerie on her journey to wedlock. Valerie sat in the carriage, her heart yearning for the hall where Gary eagerly awaited her. From this point on, she was his, and he was hers. The feeling of belonging was truly delightful. At the entrance to the hall, Brandon and Mr. Stewart stood, ready to receive her. Valerie alighted from her carriage, her wedding dress cascading like layers of snowflakes. As she walked, the embroidered flowers seemed to come to life. 
the long veil followed and her delicate face remained a mystery, adding to her allure. Brandon watched his daughter as she made her way to get married. He couldn't help but regret the previous arrangement, the forceful union that his daughter had initially opposed. Seeing her now, deeply in love and about to marry the one she cherished, filled him with paternal pride and satisfaction. Eleanor stood by her side, her eyes filled with awe. Among the bridesmaids, her wishes were the most sincere. Valerie, holding her father's arm, raised her head and smiled at him beneath her veil. Brandon sighed and patted her back. Let's proceed. I will escort you. All right. Valerie smiled, holding her father's arm as they ascended the stairs. The six bridesmaids trailed behind, accompanying her as they walked past the ceremonial stage. On the stage, there were a thousand red roses in the background, flanked by white flowers. The entire red carpet exuded a faint mist, enhancing the fragrance of the blooms. At that moment, on the stage, Gary led a row of distinguished groomsmen, all anxiously awaiting the bride. Gary's eyes were locked onto the entrance, filled with anticipation. Marlo stood in the third position, his face beaming with joy for his older brother. Unbeknownst to him, someone was among the bridesmaids, her gaze locked onto him with desire. She hoped that he'd glance her way. Just one look from him would comfort her at that moment. She longed to get to know him better. Summer, too, held on to her hopes, filled with anticipation. Valerie looked stunning, and she dreamed of wearing a wedding dress like hers one day. While she hadn't given much thought to her future husband, she yearned for the day she'd wear a wedding gown. Valerie's gaze met Gary's as she slowly approached. Although her view was obstructed by the veil, she could sense his gentle, unwavering, and focused gaze. He was patiently awaiting her arrival. Brandon gazed at Gary, feeling a deep sense of gratitude as he watched his daughter get married. Eleanor stood beside Adrian. She held a single flower in her hand while reaching out with her other hand. Before she could look, it was enveloped by a warm, large palm, as if it didn't want to let her go. The corners of Eleanor's lips curled up, and as she looked up, Adrian met her gaze. Their smiles intertwined, and the atmosphere stirred their feelings, awakening the love in their hearts. Gary gently lifted Valerie's veil, and her face gradually came into view. It was a face that deeply moved him, and for a moment he was lost in admiration. He was tempted to kiss his bride before the priest could speak a word. The solemn priest stood on the stage next to the best man with an oath book beside him. Adrian gently squeezed Eleanor's hand, smiled, and whispered in her ear, Wait for me. He then took the microphone and began, To the world, you are just one person. But to me, you are my entire world. Now we are about to witness the most sacred moment of the wedding, where our groom, Gary, and our bride, Valerie, will exchange their vows. They will promise to stay together for the rest of their lives. Eleanor's heart skipped a beat. She hadn't realized that Adrian was the host, but at this moment all her attention was on him. She saw the seriousness and focus in his eyes and couldn't help but love him more. Valerie used the opportunity to playfully wink at Eleanor, as if to say, See how handsome your man is? Gary held Valerie's hand and they stood before the priest. The priest began, Mr. Gary Stewart, do you willingly take Valerie Dane to be your wife, in sickness and in health, in poverty and wealth, to love and cherish her for the rest of your life? I do. Gary declared, his voice unwavering. Valerie felt her eyes well up with tears as she gazed at him. Gary gently held her face, his eyes full of love and reassurance. The priest continued, Miss Valerie Dane, do you willingly take Mr. Gary Stewart as your husband, to love and cherish each other for the rest of your lives, in sickness and health, through all life's ups and downs, and never to forsake each other? I do, Valerie replied with enthusiasm. Congratulations, I pronounce you man and wife. You may, the priest began, 
But before he could continue, Gary had already kissed his bride passionately. Applause erupted from the audience. On the stage, Eleanor's hand was once again held by Adrian. She looked up at him and found warmth in his deep, affectionate eyes. Summer half covered her face, her cheeks flushing with embarrassment. She was still young and felt shy seeing such an intimate moment. However, Flynn was excited, exclaiming, Godfather is kissing Godmother! Brandon and his wife looked on calmly while Kesha's eyes glistened with unshed tears. Her sister's happiness served as a poignant reminder of the love she once missed. On the stage, Valerie's face turned red, and she couldn't bring herself to look at the expressions of the people below. Gary, however, smiled and embraced her slender waist to complete the ceremony. A host took the microphone and asked, Would the bride like to say anything to the groom? Gary also looked forward to hearing her words. He lowered the microphone and placed it near her lips, waiting with a smile. Valerie smiled and responded, Today I will make you the second happiest person because the first happiest person is me. From today onwards, it's not just you and me, but we. And we'll grow old together with our children. Okay. Okay, Gary said gently. A round of applause erupted from the audience. Everyone was moved by the genuine love of the happy couple. Eleanor's eyes welled up with tears, as she hadn't expected that Valerie, who had always claimed she'd stay single and noble, would enter into marriage before her. The commitment was so unwavering and beautiful. Love was simple, and when you found the right person, no matter how long or short the time, fate arrived instantly, bringing dependence and love. As Eleanor was moved to tears, she continued clapping, her smile radiating joy. Adrian's throat tightened, and he couldn't resist the urge to kiss her. At that moment, the bridesmaid, Sharon, standing by Marlowe's side, secretly hoped he would turn and look at her. She noticed that she looked beautiful and outstanding that day. But to her surprise, Marlowe's gaze shifted from his brother and fell on the first table beside him. Summer was sitting there, her eyes wandering around. When she thought no one was watching, she quickly grabbed a piece of candy and popped it into her mouth. This small act didn't escape Marlowe's notice. He smiled as he looked at her, and when Summer realized she had been caught, she puffed up her cheeks in warning, as if to say, don't tell my parents. But Marlowe had no intention of heeding her warning. To him, Summer was like a child, but he saw no need to tattle on her. Back on the stage, the bride and groom began to descend. Valerie went backstage to change into a different outfit for the reception, with Eleanor accompanying her. The bridesmaids and groomsmen returned to their seats. Backstage, Valerie to handed her flowers reception. to Eleanor, saying, I've held on to these flowers all this time because I wanted them to pass on my happiness to you. I'm not going to throw the bouquet. It's all yours. Eleanor was deeply moved as she accepted the flowers and embraced Valerie. Valerie, I hope you'll always be happy. I am so happy for you. You are glowing. Yes, I know, and I wish you the same, Eleanor. Valerie replied with a smile, hugging her friend tightly. The two friends shared a moment, but their embrace was interrupted when Kesha entered the room. Quickly change into your dress and join the guests. Also, make sure to eat something. You might not get the chance. There are a lot of people who want to meet you. Of course, I'll change right away, Valerie replied as she was assisted by the staff to change into a white cocktail dress. The dress emphasized her hourglass figure, making her look stunning. When the three of them came out together, they left everyone in awe. The bride was radiant, and the bridesmaid, Eleanor, was equally breathtaking. Kesha, who resembled the bride, was no less striking. Eleanor sat beside Flynn. Flynn quickly hugged her and exclaimed, Mommy, you look so beautiful today. Aunt Valerie is beautiful too. Today, the most beautiful person is undoubtedly your godmother. Eleanor responded with a smile. Kayla fed Flynn his meal, making sure he ate properly. 
At that moment, an empty seat next to Summer was suddenly occupied by Marlow. Summer, somewhat displeased, asked, Why are you sitting here? My table is full. Is it okay if I sit here? Marlow asked with a smile. Kayla scolded Summer for her impolite remark, but her attitude changed quickly as she welcomed Marlo with a kind smile. Marlo, of course. Please join us. Sure, Marlo agreed with a smile, taking a seat. He exchanged glances with Summer, who felt slightly embarrassed. Today, Marlo exuded an even more mature and dazzling aura than usual. Somehow he seemed different than the boy who taught her. He seemed like a man, and this realization made Summer blush. Adrian sat next to Eleanor, and Henry was called to sit with Mr. Stewart. The older generation was engrossed in conversation, enjoying their drinks. Adrian wasn't particularly fond of participating in the older generation's activities, but he was soon called over by Mr. Stewart. The seats at Eleanor's table had emptied, and Annie approached with a smile. Miss Greenwich, do you mind if we sit here? We just arrived. Of course not, Annie. Please have a seat. Eleanor graciously agreed. Sharon was accompanying Annie and naturally sat beside Marlo. She greeted him with a bright smile. Hey, Marlo, I'm Sharon, and I'm Valerie's junior. Marlo knew she was one of the bridesmaids and politely replied, Hello. Summer noticed that Sharon seemed to admire Marlo and was trying to get closer to him. She couldn't help feeling a bit nervous, worried that Marlo might give out his phone number. Summer glanced at Marlo, who appeared to be deep in thought. To her relief, Marlo didn't seem inclined to talk to her. Summer decided to help Sharon. She smiled and said, Hey, I know his number. I'll give it to you. Make sure to remember it. Really? That's great! Sharon replied gratefully, fearing that Marlo might decline. If Summer was willing to help, it would be a relief for her. Marlo stared at Summer, who recited the number, intentionally making a mistake in the middle. Summer gave a pretend smile and looked at Sharon. Remember it well. I will, Sharon assured. She was thankful for Summer's warm-hearted gesture. Marlo didn't say anything, but his eyes held a smile. He was the only one who knew the number was incorrect. However, he had a feeling Summer had given the wrong number deliberately. Eleanor and Kayla kept a watchful eye on Flynn. They occasionally glanced at Adrian, hoping he would avoid drinking too much alcohol. Before long, the two elders from the Stewart family went to the table where Valerie and Gary were sitting to offer toasts. As Valerie and Gary raised their glasses, Flynn's voice, sweet and clear, piped up, Godfather and Godmother, now that you're married, are we going to have a little brother or sister soon? Gary patted Flynn's head and replied confidently, Of course we'll have a baby for you soon. Valerie blushed a shade of dark red at his remark. There were so many people there and Gary still couldn't care less. Hearing these words, the two elders of the Stewart family were overjoyed. Though they didn't ask such a direct question, they were delighted to hear their son's response, and it brought a happy atmosphere to the occasion. The wedding was lavish and opulent. Valerie and Gary finished their wine and returned to their table. Valerie appeared a bit fatigued, and Gary held her hand lovingly. After dinner, I'll take you to the hotel to rest. You must be tired. Okay, Valerie replied, smiling up at him. She still hadn't wrapped her head around the fact that she was now Gary's wife, Valerie Stewart. Adrian also returned to Eleanor's side after mingling with some guests. His handsome face had acquired a hint of a rosy color, exuding a more mature and charismatic aura. Despite being in a committed relationship, he still caught the attention of many women. Eleanor offered him a glass of water and said, Have some water to help with the alcohol. Adrian accepted the glass, taking a sip. Eleanor then refilled his glass. She asked, You're not too tipsy, are you? Not at all, Adrian replied, his eyes filled with a knowing smile. After dinner, let's head back to the hotel. We can continue the festivities there, Eleanor suggested. All right, Adrian grinned. He had noticed a hint in what she said. Maybe she was suggesting something. 
Today, Adrian couldn't stop thinking about his life with Eleanor as her husband. Their wedding was around the corner, and soon they would become family. Even though marriage was just a formality, the idea of getting married to Eleanor gave Adrian a sense of security. Marlo had already returned to his parents' table. Summer, who was sitting in her seat, noticed Sharon across from her. Sharon held a glass of wine but didn't drink it because her mind was elsewhere. She gazed at Marlo and observed his interactions. Marlo, not wishing to consume more alcohol, politely declined additional drinks from the groomsmen. However, the persistence of the groomsmen made Marlo uncomfortable, and he reluctantly drank several more glasses. Summer was worried that Marlo would get too drunk, so she stood up and approached his table. Meanwhile, Marlo was holding a glass, sipping from it, and Summer was trying to divert the attention from the groom's younger brother. He turned to Summer with a friendly smile and asked in a low voice, I hope you're not drinking. Summer had been observing Marlo's actions and she sensed that he was just pretending to drink. She answered, I'm not drinking and now no one should force you either. Saying this, she glared at the group of men at the table, almost challenging them to argue back. She was determined to help Marlo escape this situation. The groomsmen found themselves in an awkward situation, challenged by a young girl's boldness and determination. Summer's stern words were taken seriously. Marlo was touched by Summer's courage. He patted her head and reassured her, Don't worry, they were just joking with me. Summer had indeed played her role well, standing up to the groomsmen on her own. But she was too young to understand that adults sometimes engaged in friendly banter during celebrations. Marlo smiled at her warmly and placed his hand on her head. Marlo's face, now rosy from the alcohol, displayed a unique charm, reminiscent of an ancient hero. Summer couldn't help but feel her heart race before she turned and rushed away, her cheeks flushed. What was happening? She used to find him so annoying, but today he was just so charming that it was confusing her. After Summer left, Marlo appeared to be deeply contemplating something, while Sharon was trying to engage him in conversation. It was clear that he wasn't interested. He kept looking at Summer's back, blocking out anything that Sharon was saying. Flynn, being the restless child he was, couldn't sit still for long. Henry was busy drinking and chatting with his other guests of the same age. Kayla turned to Eleanor and said, Eleanor, take Adrian back to the hotel and get some rest. We'll take Flynn for some fun. You guys should spend some time together. With that, she winked and called out to Summer, Honey, come with us. Sure, okay, Summer agreed, but not before casting an anxious glance in Marlo's direction. She bit her lip, realizing she had to go. Marlo was still looking at her, and Marlo she was the grand hall of the villa, and the door behind her swiftly closed. She was lowering her head, slipping the key card into her bag. When she turned around, she collided with a strong embrace. In the next moment, she was lifted off her feet. Eleanor opened her eyes slightly. Adrian, who had pretended to be drunk just moments ago, still had the strength to carry her now. She had driven him back to the villa to get some rest, but now it seemed he had other plans in mind. Put me down quickly! I don't want to fall with you, Eleanor protested. She had assumed a drunk man wouldn't be able to walk steadily, but Adrian held her and ascended the stairs with remarkable stability. You weren't drunk, were you? Eleanor playfully pounded his shoulder. Adrian lowered his gaze and looked at her. Do you know how stunning you look today? Do you realize how deeply I've fallen for you? Eleanor caught her breath. Under his intense gaze, she swallowed hard and realized his intentions. She blushed and stammered, We can't do it right now. Why not now? Adrian continued towards the master bedroom on the second floor. No, I can't. Eleanor was still quite bashful, aware of a wedding happening not very far away. They had sneaked out with the intention of resting. The door swung open and Eleanor continued her protests. Please put me down. I need to find Flynn. 
Our son can wait, he said. I want... Before Eleanor could finish, Adrian silenced her with a soft sigh. You want me? This time, Eleanor couldn't deny that she did want him, more than anything. In a beautiful garden, a young child squatted on a patch of grass, collecting beautiful, smooth stones and stacking them together. Summer watched with a hint of unhappiness, her thoughts drifting to the banquet hall. She understood that in everyone's eyes, she was still a child who couldn't understand the workings of the adult mind. Hence, on occasions like this, she didn't even have the privilege of caring for him. That's right! Only a beautiful woman like Sharon had the right to care about him and have wine with him. Summer, what's bothering you? Is something on your mind? Kayla noticed her daughter's silence and asked with concern. Summer pouted and shook her head. Nothing. If there's nothing, why do you look upset? Did someone upset you? Kayla persisted. Summer didn't want her mother to figure out her thoughts, so she quickly put on a smile. No, Mom, let's stay here tonight. Let's not go back. All right, we can stay for one night. It's a rare gathering and your dad can't leave for a while. He's been drinking, Kayla agreed. Yes, I want to stay too. There's a fountain music performance tonight and I want to watch it, Summer exclaimed. Summer looked up and saw Marlo leaving the banquet hall, holding his forehead. He was alone. Mom, I'll go say hello to Marlo. With that, Summer hurriedly ran in Marlo's direction. Marlo had a mild headache. He hadn't had too much, but a few strong drinks in a row had taken their toll. Marlo, a clear, youthful voice called out to him. Marlo halted his steps and turned towards the approaching young girl. Are you feeling okay? Summer's face clearly showed her concern, and her emotions were transparent. She was still learning to hide her feelings. Marlo smiled and replied, I'm fine, just need to rest. Didn't Sharon accompany you? Summer looked behind him and then apologized. I'm sorry for giving her the wrong number earlier. I'll tell Sharon to change it. This way you two can contact each other. Marlo's handsome face tensed slightly. No need. But then Sharon won't have your number. Summer felt guilty. Marlo shook his head. I don't have time to sort out my contacts right now. Plus, I need to teach you math. Summer couldn't help but feel happy hearing this. Well, go rest. Drink some water. Looks like the little girl is learning to care for others. Marlo smiled and ruffled her hair. Her soft hair was pleasant to touch. Summer blushed slightly. She stood still obediently, letting his hand caress her head. When Marlo's hand moved from her head to her face and gently pinched her cheek, she was momentarily stunned. Marlo quickly retracted his hand and said, Go back to your mother's side. I'll go rest. With that, he walked away swiftly. Summer watched his departure, and when she saw him walking unsteadily, she was worried he might stumble. Fortunately, he maintained his balance. In the banquet hall, some guests were still chatting and drinking, while others had taken a break, wandering around the villa grounds. The scenery was beautiful, with a serene lake and a gentle spring breeze. After chatting with Kesha for a while, Valerie, who had risen early that morning and had been toasting back and forth, had grown exhausted. Gary, take Valerie to rest for a while. There's dinner later, and it might get busier. Mrs. Stewart suggested to her son. Gary agreed. Sure. He walked over to Valerie and said, I'll take you to your room to rest. Okay. Valerie didn't object and turned to Kesha. Sis, you stay with mom and dad. I'll go lie down for a bit. Go ahead, Kesha agreed, and Valerie and Gary headed to the banquet hall's exit. Along the way, Gary waved to the guests and exchanged pleasantries. As they made their way through, Gary received blessings from the guests. He remained polite and composed, and Valerie's eyes were filled with admiration and affection. Valerie strolled toward the wedding venue they had arranged, with Gary by her side. It was a standalone villa adorned entirely in vibrant red, creating a festive atmosphere. Ouch! Valerie exclaimed. 
Her high heels suddenly wobbled. She had been wearing high heels all day and her feet were aching. She didn't want to complain, so she endured it until now when her heel wobbled again, becoming unbearable. What's wrong? Gary inquired. Let me see. Gary promptly squatted down, inspecting her swollen red legs. It's okay, Valerie reassured him. I've been wearing them for too long. She shook her head and attempted to help herself up. Gary rose and, without warning, he lifted Valerie off her feet. She blushed and glanced around as if worried that others might see. Gary read her mind and couldn't help but chuckle. What are you worried about? I'm carrying my wife, who could object? Valerie burst into laughter. You're right, I forgot. I'm already your wife. Gary lowered his head, kissed her on the cheek, and teased, I won't let you forget this. Despite the awkwardness, Valerie was delighted. She enjoyed being carried back to the villa by him. At that moment, she forgot about her aching feet. Her heart was filled with love. Upon reaching the villa's main hall, Gary gently placed her on a sofa and knelt beside her feet, removing her shoes. Valerie felt somewhat self-conscious. She wasn't used to having people take off her shoes. No need to remove them. They're dirty. Valerie was also concerned about dirtying his hands. Gary gazed at her with a smile. I don't care. Gary continued carefully, removing her high heels, discovering a red, swollen mark on her bare feet. It seemed to be from the shoes. His heart ached. Why didn't you tell me the heels were uncomfortable? It's not that they were uncomfortable. It's just that high heels can be demanding when worn for too long. Your feet will look like this. I'm used to it. It's not a big deal. Valerie replied, downplaying her discomfort. She remembered having to wear high heels throughout the filming of a movie, causing her feet to swell and redden every day. Then don't wear high heels for dinner tonight. Just wear those flat shoes that you find comfortable, Gary said. No way! I have to wear a beautiful evening gown tonight. Without high heels, it won't look good. Valerie was a beauty enthusiast, willing to sacrifice comfort for her appearance. Gary looked at her with a mix of frustration and amusement. As long as I think you look good, it's fine. Who else's opinion matters? That won't do. I want to present the most beautiful side of me on our wedding day. Don't worry, I'll be fine after a little rest, Valerie declared. I'll get you a basin of warm water to soak your feet, and you can relax while sitting, Gary said, heading upstairs to fetch a basin. He soon returned with a basin of comfortably warm water and, cradling her delicate feet, helped her soak them. Valerie felt immediate relief from the warm water. She let out a contented sigh and gazed at him as he attended to her, feeling extremely happy. Husband? Valerie blinked her eyes and softly uttered the word. It felt somewhat awkward because she had never used it. Gary raised an encouraging eyebrow and said, Say it again. With a shy, timid expression, Valerie said, My husband? Her voice was sweet and gentle, melting his heart. Gary urged, Again, my darling husband, I love you. Valerie immediately followed, shy but sincere. Gary smiled and was pleased. Her adorable expression amused him. He fetched a towel to dry her feet and then bent down to lift her. I can walk on my own, Valerie insisted, not wanting to burden him further. It's okay, I enjoy carrying you, Gary replied, holding her weight with ease. She was so light that it wasn't tiring. Valerie snuggled into his chest and wrapped her arms around his neck. Gary carried her into their wedding room. On the spacious bed, rose petals were arranged in a heart shape. A pair of teddy bears, dressed as a bride and groom, sat in the center. Valerie was instantly smitten by them and held the bears close. They're so cute and they look beautiful. I love them. Gary observed her childlike delight. If you like them, I'll buy a few more for you in the future and place them in our room. Really? Valerie responded happily. Seeing the pile of rose petals on the bed, she became a little troubled. These flower petals are so beautiful. I hate to ruin them. What should we do? 
Gary sat on the edge of the bed. If we don't remove them, how will we sleep? Would you rather sleep on the couch with me? Why can't we sleep on the couch? It's also quite spacious, Valerie remarked. Are you sure you want to sleep on the couch? Gary's eyes sparkled with a hint of amusement and complex emotion. Valerie didn't think too deeply about it, but blushed when she heard him. No, I don't want to sleep on the couch. My back hurts. Gary chuckled. She got it. He gently reassured her. All right, if you don't want the couch, we'll sleep on the bed, so these roses have to go. Valerie had no choice but to give in slightly. Gary, with a swift motion of his hand, caused the roses to fall like raindrops, creating a beautiful pattern as they scattered onto the pristine white carpet. Just like the woman beside him. She was so beautiful and pure that any man would want to make her his own. They are so beautiful, Valerie sighed, expressing her love for roses. In my eyes, nothing is more beautiful than you, Gary said lifting her chin and gazing at her red lips, his body growing taut with desire.